partially transcribed. The National Broadcasting Company presents Earl Stanley Gardner's A Life in Your Hand. Was the car running? How did he die? Where was the body? Listen while we place A Life in Your Hand. You never know when you step from the safety of your home when you may witness a violent death and be called upon to testify as to what you saw and heard. Murder is a dark enigma that strikes fear into the heart of man. Strange, baffling, mysterious. But the darkest crime one man can invent, another man can unravel. Such a man is Jonathan Kegg, created by Earl Stanley Gardner, the world's most popular writer of mysteries, creator of Perry Mason, Doug Selby, and other outstanding characters. Good evening, Mr. Kegg. How are you? Fine, thank you, William. And you? Up and down. You know how that is. <laughs> I haven't seen you around the county building lately. Been busy catching crooks, have you? No, I let the authorities catch them, William. That's their job, not mine. Hey, Mr. Keg, uh, just what do you do anyway? I see your name in the papers all the time, but, uh, well, I don't quite get it. The Latin name for my work probably throws you. Amicus Curiae, friend of the court. Not a private eye, huh? No, indeed. In some cases of murder or larceny or whatever it is, I try to help the authorities find the guilty person. Through cross-examination. Can you stay working at a job like that? <laughs> There's more work than I'll ever get around to. An act of violence comes suddenly. The witnesses aren't expecting it, so they fail to notice details. Well, if I saw a guy knocked off, I'll bet I could tell you what went on. You may have a chance to prove your powers of observation someday, William. You never know when you may be called upon to testify to an act of violence in which you have become involved quite innocently. Even now... Somewhere in the city, there may be a crime in the making. Get out of my house, Loray. Get out. Bart, listen to reason, will you? We used to be friends. I started you in the construction business. Yeah, you made the dough and I did the work. Now I'm squaring. There's enough building going on in this county for both of us. Your bids are so low, you're losing money. What's the idea? Okay, I'll give it to you straight, Loray. I'm going to run you out of business. That's the idea. I'll undercut every bid you make until you have to fold up. And that goes for the Tahoma River Bridge, too. You've never done a bridge job in your life. After the meeting in Humboldt tonight, I'll do one. I'm offering them a bridge for less than you take to build a house. You're through, Jack. Washed up. I teach you the business. I bring you up from a pup. I told you to get out. Go on. I'm leaving. Sure. Might as well stay out of the bidding tonight. I'll be there, Clayton. I'll be at that meeting. Leave your boys at home if you know what's healthy for you. What's that mean? This busted nose. I know who paid those goons to rough me up last week. Not me, Bart. I wouldn't pay anybody. No, no, we're pals. <laughs> That's all I'm going to take from you. Oh, Bart, listen. You're ruining my company. I've had to lay off men, my foreman, my best truck drivers. Now you're saying I had you beat up. You can't touch me as a businessman. Your reputation. <laughs> Don't push me too far. I'm warning you. Get out. I didn't tell you to come over here and cry. Well, you hear me tell him? I heard you. That's the last of Jack Luray. You did a swell job, Bart. What's the matter with you? Luray's tough. You know he's tough. You can't stand up to him like that and expect to... You're begging for trouble, Bart. I can take care of him. Look at you. If somebody hadn't come along, those men would have killed you the other night. Bart, you told me so yourself. I was doing all right. I knocked out two of them. There were four. Quit worrying about me, kid. Jack LeRae hates you, Bart. I can't blame him. I'm wrecking his company. He has reason to hate you. He did teach you the business. You were friends, and now oh, you're... Oh, sounds like you're on his side. I'm just trying to make you be careful. A man like LeRae... When he knows he's been double-crossed, really double-crossed, he might do anything and think it was right. Okay, okay, I don't want to hear any more about it. Don't bid on the Tahoma Bridge. Stay away from that meeting in Humboldt tonight. 
Let him have the job. You don't need it. I need the work. I need work so Jack Loray won't get it. I'm going to smash him. Hit him where it hurts. His precious reputation. His company. Watch Bart Clayton go, baby. Ha, 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 ha. Your supper's ready. Go ahead and eat. Yeah, big-hearted tonight, huh? Don't I have to wait around for your kid brother to show up? You might be late for the meeting in Humboldt. Yeah. Hey, it's 8 o'clock. Where is brother Joey boy, anyway? I don't know. You're gonna wait and eat with him, huh? Our big happy family. I'm not hungry. Doris, when's Joe gonna move? Get out on his own. He's been hanging around here two years ever since he got out of college. He's been helping you with your work. That's what he thinks, him and his engineering degree. Joe does it college style, and I go along behind him, patch up what I can, junk the rest. He's costing me money. I'm telling you, Doris... Get that punk kid out of our house or so help me, I'll... Hello, sis. Hi, Joe. Give me some more coffee. Supper's ready, Joe. Sit down, Joey boy. Sister's waiting for you. I've got to wash up first. Here's a towel. Thanks, sis. How's things out on the job? Rain held us up. We may have to lay off tomorrow. What's the matter? Didn't the professors let you work in the mud? No use to pay men for standing around in the tool house. Nobody stands in the tool house when Bart Clayton's around. Sure, Bart. Sure. Yeah. Oh, I, uh... I, I drove one of the trucks home. It's, it's in the garage. I, I'm catching cold and didn't want to stand around and wait for Limey to come pick me up. The trucks stay on the job. I told you that. I want them ready to go when the drivers get there in the morning. I'll have it back by then. Since when do you get to work on time? I'll drive it and leave it on the job tonight on my way in from Humboldt. You're going, huh? Who said I wasn't? I didn't think you'd take another job. We're behind on this one. I'll get the bid. We start building that bridge the first of the month. Eat your supper, Joe. Okay, sis. The uh, boys are complaining. We're, we're driving them too hard. Complain and complain and tell them to go to work for Lure. You too. I wouldn't mind losing you. I'll tell them, Bart. You want some more potatoes? I lost my appetite. I better get started. Maybe you ought to leave the truck here. It was missing when I drove it home. I'm going to take it back to the job. Bart, if the truck doesn't work right, drive our car. It'll be dark in an hour. I'll and... fix the truck before I leave here. I don't mind getting grease on my hands. I'm no college boy. I'm a mechanic. I'm a ditch digger. I'm a truck driver. I did it the hard way. I was just trying to save you trouble. I'm not going to have trouble. I'll fix the engine before I leave. How many times do I have to tell you? Stop it! The engine? Stop it, both of you! I can't stand it anymore. You pick at each other like... I'm going out. It's raining, sis. Where are you going? Out, out, out to the store. I don't care. Maybe you'll be gone when I get back. Both of you. Now, take it easy, honey. We Leave can... me alone. I hope you get to build your bridge. I hope hurting Jack LeRae makes you very happy. I hope... Goodbye. More coffee, see? I haven't finished this cup yet. Oh, the rain sounds pretty. Nice to be under a roof, though. Wouldn't want to be out walking in it. <laughs> like poor Miss Clayton. We can see real good living next door. <laughs> yes. She ran out the back door kind of sudden. She slammed it hard. Crying, too. Oh, I suppose they were all fighting again. <laughs> poor little thing. Yes, poor thing. I think it's the brother. Two's a family. <laughs> Unless they have youngsters. Oh, that's different. You just said two's a family. I think it's the brother. But I don't suppose he has any place else to live. Poor thing. That's oh, a pity. Oh, how I would hate to live with that man, Barton Clayton. Say, well, you know what I mean. Well, it just sounded funny. Well, he is a terror when he gets riled up. I've heard him say terrible things to Mrs. Clayton and her brother, and... But he does work hard. Yes, that's a strain on a man. Oh, poor thing. Yes, it's just too bad. Oh, here. Yeah. Mm. Want to put your feet up on the chair? Yes. Might be comfortable. They say it helps to circulation, too. Oh, look. Look, look. There he is. Oh, he's mad, too. Going in the garage. Maybe he's going to leave her. Mm, didn't take a suitcase. Huh? Probably wanted something out of the tool shed. He's starting his car. <laughs> Sounds big. Maybe it's the truck. We don't know much about trucks. Don't know about cars at all. Oh, I always wanted one. Well, maybe someday. I always wanted one with white spokes in the wheel. <laughs> they don't make them that way anymore. I thought about driving right up to prayer meeting in a car with... Blue. Oh, there she is. Oh, came back from the alley. Back in her arms, went to the store, I guess. 
It's a wonder she stays with him the way he talks to her. Oh, no way to understand why people love each other. No. <laughs> it's nice, though. It is. It is nice. Somebody else back there in the alley. Oh, I don't see anybody. I'm gone now, I guess. Uh, where were they? Oh, the garbage cans. Oh, probably a stray dog. Well, I know somebody when I see somebody. I, I don't mistake stray dogs. Hard for... to understand why people love each other. Yes, yes, it is. Oh, dear, more coffee? Oh, I haven't touched this yet. Well, you just tell me when you're ready. I'll tell you, Lou. Rain sounds pretty. Uh, nice if you're inside. I never was one to go paddling around like a duck when... Lou, she's coming out again. Oh, my, she's mad, too. Going to the garage. Oh, they're going to have a terrible fight. I just know it. Maybe we can hear. Ah! Lou, say something terrible. Something awful. Oh, Joe, Joe, Mrs. Say, somebody's running up the drive with the man who was here earlier. It's Mr. Clayton's friend. Get Lorraine. I heard her daughter scream. But you killed Mark. Yes, you did it. I know it. I know it. Don't let him get away, Joe. Stop him. Hold on to him. <laughs> Uh, sit right here, Mr. Keg, behind the desk next to me. Thank you, Coroner Willett. Uh, I don't mind telling you this inquest is wearing me down. Three days, same stories over and over. I still think there's more to Mark Clayton's's death than accidental. Your carbon monoxide's are tricky. I, I don't know whether... We'll see what we can find out. Oh, I sure do. Thank you, Mr. Keg. I debated with myself all night about calling you and having you drive way out here to Caney County, but I... I'm glad to help if I can, Coroner. Oh, it'll be a big help, all right. I don't mind telling you that I've been... Oh, what are they all jabbering about? Quiet! Quiet in here! And the minute people heard I called you, they started piling into the room. Uh, some uh, here at dawn this morning. Uh, I don't know... Are you them. ready to begin? Uh, oh, uh, sure, sure. Uh, quiet! Quiet! <laughs> now, uh, this is Jonathan Keg. You all know his reputation. Uh, those of you who don't, I'll explain uh, Mr. Keg isn't here to represent any side. He's not for or against anybody. He's what they call an amicus curiae, a friend of the court. In this case, friend of the coroner of Caney County. He's after truth and justice. Uh, you want to take over, Mr. Keg? I'd rather you'd ask the questions, if you don't mind. All right. Uh, Joseph Kerwin. Kerwin, come up here where we can talk to you. Uh, take a chair. I've been over this so often, I feel... Um, you're a full name. Joseph Harlow Kerwin. A brother-in-law of Barton Clayton? Yes, sir. Uh, describe your activities the night of the murder. Well, I came home from work, drove the truck into the garage. I, I went in the house, washed up, and I was finishing my supper when my sister screamed. Uh, you and Clayton quarreled that evening, didn't you? Well, it wasn't exactly that. I, I, I'd been working for him. He told me I was fired. Might as well go somewhere else to look for a job. He was kicking you out of his house, in other words. I guess that's right. Well, you know whether it is or not. That's what he was doing. You'd had a lot of fights before. Maybe motive enough to kill a man. I didn't go out of the house. My, my sister told you I was there when she came back from the store. Uh, calm down, Sandra. Calm down. Now, uh, you didn't like the way your brother-in-law treated your sister, did you? No. He was mean to her, talked rough. If he ever laid a hand on her, I would have... I would have killed him. Uh, quiet. Now, you're a graduate engineer, aren't you? Yes, sir. And the night of the death, you... Excuse were... me, Mr. Coroner. Mr. Kerwin, was Mr. Clayton also a college-trained engineer? He was a self-made man. Made it the hard way, and he never forgot it. And he probably never let you forget you made it the easy way. Is that correct? Yes, sir. You resented this, didn't you? Yes, sir. You're excused. Mr. Coroner, Clayton died from carbon monoxide poisoning. Could that be the sole cause? Well, there was a lump on his head, but the carbon monoxide killed him. Then it might have been accidental death. I don't think it was. Uh, Clayton got beat up by goons a week or so ago. They broke his nose, but there was a fresh lump on his head when I examined him. I think somebody knocked him down, and the carbon monoxide finished him. <laughs> 
It couldn't have been suicide. Not Bart Clayton. Who's your most logical suspect? Jack LeRae. Let's talk to him. Hey, LeRae, come up here. <coughs> Mr. LeRae, why were you at the Clayton house that evening? I wanted to find out why he was bidding low on every construction job in the county. So low that he lost money. Bart told me why. He was out to ruin my company. What did you plan to do about it? Clayton drove a truck for me 15 years ago. I taught him everything he knew about the construction business. I helped him start his company. Do about it? Well, I left, but I was mad. I drove around a while, thinking. Then I went back to talk to him again. You were supposed to be going to a meeting in Humboldt? That's right. Weren't you going to see Clayton there? I wanted to get to him first, try to talk some sense into his head. Like I say, I drove back to the house, parked, and then I heard Doris scream. I ran down the driveway. She and her brother saw me. Doris started to yell. Joe said I'd killed Bart. And Mrs. Clayton says you engineered a beating for her husband sometime last week. Oh, I didn't. Bart thought I did, but I didn't. I'm a businessman. I wouldn't do a thing like that to a competitor. You hated him. You know you hated him. You'd have done anything Mrs. Him. Clayton... I've warned you before. Another outburst like that, and I'll have you taken out of here. Let's talk with Mrs. Clayton now. I'd like to hear her story. All right, Mr. King. Uh, go on back to your chair, Larry. Up here, Mrs. Clayton, please. Mrs. Clayton, I want to make this as comfortable as possible for you, but you'll have to help me. I'm very tired. I, I've answered questions for days. I Go on, Mr. King. You understand that it's quite possible that your husband was not murdered, that he met his death accidentally. He was killed. I know he was. How do you know? Luray threatened him. They quarreled not more than an hour before. Your brother admits he didn't like Mr. Clayton either. Well, Joe was in the house all the time. Bart was killed in the garage while trying to get the truck fixed. Somebody came up behind him and... What was wrong with the truck? Well, I don't know. When Joe came home, he, he told Bart it wasn't working right. I... I tried to talk him into driving the car, but he... Didn't you drive it to the store? No, I, I walked. Do you often walk in the rain? The store's only a block away. How did you happen to go out to the garage after you came home? Joe told me Bart was going to make him leave the house. That made you angry? Yes. So you went to the garage? Yes, I, I found Bart lying on the floor. Was the truck engine running? No, I... I heard him trying the starter when I came back from the grocery store. Were the garage doors open? They were all closed. The door to the tool shed, the small door into the garage, and, and the big doors were all closed. You didn't hear an engine running? No. Yes. Yes, I did. It, it must have been when I came back from the store. But you just said you heard the starter as you returned from the store. I, I'm confused, but, but I did hear the starter, and I, I think the car must have started. Oh, I... I don't really know. Then you believe your husband died between the time you came home from the store and went out to the garage? I don't know what happened, except that Jack LeRae killed him somehow. Well, now, Mrs. Clayton, what did you do after you discovered the body? I, I called Joe. And what did he do? Well, he, he stopped to talk to LeRae. Did you see LeRae? I saw him running up the driveway. If your accusation is correct and Jack LeRae did murder your husband... Why did he return to the scene of his crime a few minutes later? Well, he... he... Had that question occurred to you, Mrs. Clayton? No. Can you prove you didn't quarrel with your husband in the garage and... Stop! Stop it! You're trying to confuse me. That man killed Bart, Jack LeRae. He did it. He threatened my husband. Bart kicked him out. LeRae came back to the garage and... Maybe he was hiding. Well, that's it. He, he tried to get away. We saw him running away. Why? Why did I... Quiet. Quiet, quiet in here. Coroner Willett. Quiet, everybody. Yes, Mr. King. Coroner Willett, I would like to request a recess until tomorrow morning. At that time, I would like to cross-examine an innocent bystander. I can't stand any more questions. He's guilty. I want the rape punished. I'm running this inquiry, Mrs. Clayton. In compliance with Mr. King's request, this coroner's jury is now adjourned and will meet again tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. <laughs> Jonathan Kegg is about to call another witness. That witness could be you. If it were, could you remember what you have heard? It would be vital that you do, for in this coroner's inquest, you would hold a life in your hands. (laughs) 
Are you going to Chicago to attend the Democratic Convention? You can, you know, just by dialing your NBC station. For NBC will bring you right into Convention Hall by giving you the most comprehensive coverage ever accorded the nomination of a Democratic presidential candidate. From keynote address to final ballot, the NBC microphones will be listening. You'll hear the speakers, the delegates, the reaction of the onlookers in the gallery, and all in the comfort of your own home. Remember to dial your local NBC station, and you too can be right in Chicago, listening to history as it is being made. Jonathan Kegg has called his next witness, two witnesses in fact, two old maid neighbors of the Clayton family, Sade and Lou Trescott. The coroner's jury is in session, the sisters are before the coroner. But ladies, it's not proper practice. We couldn't, Mr. Willard, we just couldn't do that. We go every place together. I wouldn't know what to say if Lou wasn't with me. Oh, one witness testifies at a time, that's the standard procedure. Then we'll just have to refuse, refuse. Why, I'd be too nervous up here alone. Nervous and upset. Under the circumstances, Coroner Willett, I'd recommend that this inquest grant special privileges to these ladies and allow me to cross-examine them together. They both heard sounds surrounding the death of Barton Clayton. Sounds that I believe have an important relationship to the death of Bart Clayton. Uh, quiet. Under the circumstances, Mr. K, we'll waive our rule and grant your request. Uh, please go on with your question. Uh, bring another chair over here, Jones. If you will take your seats, please. Uh, yes, sir, certainly. Now, you ladies, Lou and Sarah Trescott, live next door to the Clayton home. Is that correct? We're neighbors on the east. Where were you between 7 and 8 o'clock on the evening of Barton Clayton's death? On our back porch. It screamed. Will you describe in your own words what transpired during that time? Uh, go on, see. You start, Lou. Well, I'd rather eat... Well, all right... Well, right after we'd finished supper, Joe drove in the driveway with a truck. Did he usually and... bring a truck to the house? Not often. Uh, once in a while. According to other witnesses, the truck was not performing properly. Did you notice any indication of mechanical difficulty? I beg your pardon? Uh, he means, was the truck running all right? Oh, we don't know much about cars. Uh, we've never had one. Did you notice the engine coughing or sputtering? No. It was all right so far as I could tell. Joe left it going when he got out to open the garage doors. Then he drove it inside and closed the door. And we heard it running fine after that. Will you describe the Clayton's garage? It's big. And there's a tool shed on the west side. Do you know the construction material of the building? Well, it looked like cement before it was painted. Coroner Willett, such a building is practically an airtight room. Entered through double doors from the outside, through the tool shed. Now to continue. When did you see Mrs. Clayton? After Joe went in the house. A few minutes later. She ran out the back door. How was she dressed? In a, a light coat. And no hat on her head. She looked very angry. Was it raining? Well, we thought it was strange that she'd go for a walk. She always did that when they quarreled. Go for a walk to cool off. When did you see Mr. Clayton? Uh, just before Mrs. Clayton came home. Uh, she'd been to the store. She was carrying a grocery sack. You saw Mr. Clayton go into the garage? Yes. Oh, he looked mad, too. We heard him trying to start his car. Are you sure whether it was the passenger car or the truck? Well, Lou said at the time she thought it was the truck. I did say that, but I, I couldn't be positive. Did you hear an engine running? Well, I'm not sure. Uh, no. No, just the starter going round. Mrs. Clayton? Yes? Did you hear an engine running? Yes, I, I did when I came back from the store. Are you sure it was not running when you left the house before you went to the store? Now, remember, you were angry. You might not have noticed as you walked out. I don't know. I don't know. Leave me alone. I believe we have a clear picture of what happened up to the time Clayton entered the garage. I saw somebody in the alley by the garbage can. Oh, it was a stray dog. I told you that, thing. I know a stray dog when I see well, one. I didn't see anybody. Too late. Oh, there wasn't anybody there in there. Too. Ladies, ladies, please. Oh, dear. We're very sorry. We apologize. Now, tell me when you saw Jack LeRae. He ran up the driveway from the front after Doris and her brother were out in the backyard. And Joe yelled, you killed Bart. Then she said, he's dead. You murdered him. It's true. He's guilty and you're right. Who's threatened Bart? That ought to be enough for any jury. Quiet. Quiet, both of you. A few more questions, ladies. Yes, Mr. Kegg. In this inquest, the sounds you heard are important. I'll try very hard to remember accurately. We certainly will. Joe Kerwin drove the truck into the garage. He closed the big doors. Then he walked out through the tool shed. 
Is that correct? Yes, yes, it is. Did you hear a car engine running after Joe Kerwin entered the house? Oh, yes. It ran quite a while. The motor was running after he entered the house. You're sure of that? That's why we thought it strange that Mr. Clayton had trouble starting the truck. It had been going quite well. Thank you, ladies. We're now on the track of a killer. Yes, Mr. K? Bart Clayton died of carbon monoxide poisoning. The garage was a lethal chamber before he walked into it. Deadly fumes had come from the truck engine. He was working on the motor when he was overcome and fell to the floor, injuring his head. What's your evidence, Mr. King? The Trescott sisters have told us they heard the engine running and heard it stop before Clayton went into the garage. I heard it running, too, on my way home from the grocery store. No, Mrs. Clayton, on your way to the store. You were upset, angry when you left the house. If you had not been, you might have noticed the engine running in the closed garage. If you had noticed, you could have saved your husband's life. Oh, no! (laughs) Coroner Willett. The only way the testimony of our innocent bystanders, Sade and Lou Trescott, can be interpreted is that Joseph Kerwin planned the death of his brother-in-law, Bart Clayton. You better be able to prove that. Joe, you knew Clayton was to leave the house a few minutes after you came home. You left the truck running in the garage with just enough fuel to fill the room with gas before the engine stopped. That's a lie. You hated your brother-in-law. You wanted to take over his construction company. And knew you could if your widowed sister asked you to. Oh, Joe wouldn't do it, When you saw Jack LeRae running towards you, it was your brother who shouted, You killed Bart. Oh, yes, that's right. Until that moment, you had no idea your husband was dead. Only the murderer would have known. Oh, Joe. Don't try, sis. I thought you'd be better off. I thought... Coroner Willett, I recommend that your jury find that Barton Clayton died at the hands of Joseph Kerwin. Oh, my Mr. Keg, now that it's all over but the trial, there's one thing about this case that still bothers me. What is it? The Trescott sisters, one of them anyway, was sure she saw someone out in the alley just before the murder was discovered. That's right. Sade saw it and Lou didn't. What do you think it was, Mr. Keg? I didn't bring it out in court. But for the rest of my life, I will believe sincerely and without question that what Sade Trescott saw... Yes, Mr. Keg? ...was simply a stray dog. (laughs) <laughs> well. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, oh, uh, Mr. K. Yes, Coroner Willett? As uh, coroner of Caney County for the people, I want to thank you for finding the real murderer of Barton Clayton. I appreciate that, Coroner. Uh, when will we see you again, Mr. K. as amicus curiae? I don't know just where I'll be, but whatever crime occurs, you may be sure I shall again offer my services as amicus curiae, whether it be in criminal court, at a coroner's inquest, or in the judge's chamber. Good night, Mr. Kay. Good night. A Life in Your Hands is created by Earl Stanley Gardner with script by Doug Johnson, directed by John Cowan. Jonathan Kegg is played by Carlton Cadell with musical effects by Adele Scott, conducted by Whitey Berkwith. Engineering by Bill Knight. This has been a partially transcribed Bell production, and this is George Stone, extending a cordial invitation for each of you to be with us again next week, when the National Broadcasting Company will again place a life in your hands. Tonight, join the chase on NBC. See. 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 Rolly Cigarettes present Earl Stanley Gardner's A Life in Your Hand. Did you hear him threaten her? What was the position of the body? Was she still alive at 8.30? Listen while we place A Life in your hand. Smokers, when you buy a pack of cigarettes, remember this. It pays two ways to smoke Raleigh cigarettes. It pays with top quality smoking enjoyment. It pays with luxury premium. So get the pack with the premium coupon on the back. Raleigh cigarettes. <laughs> You never know when you step from the safety of your home 
when you may witness a violent death and be called upon to testify as to what you saw and heard and suddenly find yourself with a life in your hand. Murder is a dark enigma that strikes fear into the heart of man. Strange, baffling, mysterious. But the darkest crime one man can invent, another man can unravel. And such a man is Jonathan Kegg, created by Earl Stanley Gardner, the world's most popular writer of mysteries. Mr. Gardner is also creator of the famous Perry Mason, Doug Selby, and dozens of equally outstanding fictional characters. Jonathan Kegg is a lawyer, but of a very special sort. When he appears in court, Jonathan Kegg acts only in the capacity of amicus curiae. And here is Mr. Kegg himself to tell you what that is. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Kegg, just what is meant by amicus curiae? Translated from the Latin, amicus curiae simply means friend of the court. It refers to a lawyer or an expert who enters a case neither on behalf of the prosecution nor the defense. He acts impartially, seeking only the truth. How does an amicus curiae go about finding the truth? It is my belief that by cross-examination of witnesses, the truth can usually be learned. And as amicus curiae, you conduct such cross-examination in the hope of seeing justice done? Exactly. All we need is testimony from witnesses who remember what they hear. The basis of our system of justice is the ability of witnesses to relate accurately what they saw or heard. You never know when a crime is going to be committed. Even now, somewhere in the city, there may be a crime in the making. Electrician? I, uh, I'm here, Miss Marley. Ah. But I guess there's nobody else in the theater. It's only about four in the afternoon. Anything I can do for you? Well, then who might you be? Uh, no. Well, you might be all sorts of people. <laughs> you might even be another bartender. I'm Tom Kalish, Miss Marley, the new assistant stage manager. I just started today. Fine, fine, fine. A career in the theater. <laughs> I, I, Victoria Marley, have a career in the theater. You know that, did you? Well, of course, Miss Marley. I, I Vicky Marley, am an actress. Worse, I'm married to an actor. The highly paid, thoroughly successful, extremely talented Mr. Peter Barnes is my husband and the star of the show. Very good for Peter. Peter is starred. Victoria's featured... Uh, do you know, uh, are, are you aware, Mr. Uh, 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 Kalish? Mr. Kalish, are you aware of the subtle distinction between a star and a feature player? Huh? Are you? Well, uh, uh, yes, Miss Marley, but in this case... All I... right, all right. I, I'm embarrassing you. But it's something you'll just have to get used to. Three, four days a week I come in like this. It's part of the plot. The lady drinks. <laughs> but I have a lady. I get around it. I come here to the theater early and nap. I nap it off, and by curtain time, I'm as good as new. Very simple, don't you think? Miss Marley, I figure what other people do is their own business. And, and you know something else? I've never missed a show, or an entrance, or even a cue. Never. Got an understudy. Pretty little tramp, Lucy Devereaux. Peter, my Peter, Mr. Barnes, he thinks very highly of her. As an actress, I tell myself. Yeah. But Lucy, my understudy, she's never had to go on for me, but never. Now, isn't that a shame? For Peter, isn't it? Miss Marley, I'm brand new with the show. I... I... Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I know. This is just talk, that's all. Do you know whether Charlie finished repainting the second act job? He said he'd have it done in time for the show tonight. Uh, the head stage manager, you mean? Yeah, Charlie wanted me to speak to you about well, that. Don't tell me you forgot it again. Well, he... Oh, I told him at least a dozen. Have you seen the drop? 
I walk on, a blonde. The rub is about three shades lighter than my hair. It makes me look terrible. It's like a golden ball behind me. That's what Charlie wanted me to tell you. He didn't forget, Miss Marley. Mr. Barnes told him not to repaint it, and the producer, Mr. Walters, okayed that. But they what? Well, Charlie said he was all set to go ahead when Mr. Barnes called him. Well, we'll just say about this thing once and for all. Ball, you got any change, Nichols? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. Here. Oh, thanks. Oh, here, keep it all. Oh, no, no, just for a couple of nickels. That's crazy, Miss Marley. I'll keep it. Hello, what's this about not repainting the second act drop? Don't now, Victoria, me. Why isn't it being repainted? You just try that. You just... Try putting me out of this show, you two big Casanova. I'll blow you and that cheap little French reputation to pieces. No, no, I won't be reasonable about anything of the kind. You're trying to make a big fight with her. Don't lie about it. Forget it, baby. Just plain forget it. Before that girl takes over my part, I'll go to my grave. <laughs> Smokers, it pays two ways to smoke Raleigh cigarettes. It pays with top-quality smoking enjoyment. It pays with luxury premiums. Yes, magnificent premiums, each the finest of its kind. Lovely Oneida community silverware. Handsome inlaid coffee tables by Castlewood. Gotham Gold Stripe Nylon Hosiery. Schick Super Electric Shavers and more than 50 others. And you can have any of these beautiful premiums simply by saving the premium coupons you get with Raleigh cigarettes. And remember, Raleigh premiums are made possible by reduced advertising expenditures and by accepting a smaller profit than the usual rate for the cigarette industry. Thus, the Raleigh premium plan is a profit-sharing plan. Raleigh premiums are a bonus to the Raleigh smoker. Yes, it pays two ways to smoke Raleigh cigarettes. It pays with top-quality smoking enjoyment. It pays with luxury premium. So get the pack with the premium coupon on the back. Raleigh Cigarettes. And now back to the theater. The echoing emptiness of the stage is now electric with the tension that comes just before curtain time. Three minutes. Three minutes. Curtain in three minutes. Uh, Mr. Barnes, three minutes. Uh, Mr. Barnes? That's funny. He's not... If you're looking for Mr. Barnes, he's in his wife's dressing room down the hall. Oh, thanks, Miss Devereaux. He's on in three minutes. You'd better go and remind him, then. Yeah, I guess I had. And don't let the sound and fury bother you. It's just Victoria giving him his nightly lecture. Okay. Three minutes. Curtain in three minutes. First act curtain going up in three minutes. Oh, don't give it to me. I can add drinks around Devereaux. Drunk all sober. The last time you lower your voice. No, no, I won't lower my voice. I'll talk as loud as I can. I swear you don't shut up. Three minutes, Mr. Barnes. You're on in three minutes. All right, Kalish. Thanks. I'll be down in just a minute. <laughs> They go for him, don't they, the audience? They ought to. He's wonderful. You've been with the show long, Miss Devereaux? Since it opened last November. Uh Uh-huh. For all the acting experience has given me, I might just as well have stayed in Des Moines. Yeah, I know. Miss Marley was telling me she's never missed a performance. It's sort of tough in a way, huh? Mm, I don't mind too much, but I can't see why Peter puts up with it. She's terrible. Hello, Lucy. Oh, Mr. Wallace. Hi. Where did you come from? Can the producer watch his own show? <laughs> ah, Lucy, you're beautiful. I love it. <laughs> I've been out front. How are things going back here, Kelly? Just fine, Mr. Wallace. Like the show? I think it's great. And Peter Barnes, our star of stars? Hey, he's got the stuff all right. Yes, he has. I say, how's the house? Not bad for Monday. And the mezzanine's full up. Fine, fine. Uh, Kayla, you'd better give Miss Marley a call. She's on shortly. All right, Mr. Wallace. Oh, Si, give me a break, huh? Maybe she's asleep. I'm all ready to go on, please. Just this one. Now, darling, be reasonable. I can't do that. Please, Si. Now you know it's out of the question. Come on, be sweet, darling. You'll get there on your own, Lucy. Don't bother with tricks. <laughs> okay. I'll be sweet. 
You want me to call it? Now, that's very sweet. Yes. You'd better appreciate me. I do. Very much. <laughs> She's a cute kid. One of the cutest. One of the very cutest, Kalish. Ah! That's Miss Deverell. In the oh, name of heaven. Guys, my good Lord, come and see. She's in there sitting in a chair. Who, Lucy? Miss Marley. Somebody stabbed her. Oh, Miss Marley. There's a knife in her throat. Oh, die. She's dead. She's dead. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Keg, I should begin this discussion by telling you that I am absolutely certain Peter Barnes did not kill his wife. Very interesting, Mr. Walters. As you know, they've brought an indictment against him, and the trial has been underway for a couple of days now. The prosecution is making a good case against him, but the charge is absolutely baseless. Uh, just what exactly do you want me to do, Mr. Walters? I believe Vicki Marley committed suicide. But the police and the D.A. seem to have overlooked or at least discredited the possibility completely. Did you suggest this theory to them? Yes, and, well, they were very polite about it, but... Mr. Keg, I would like you to volunteer your services to the court as amicus curiae. And by examining all the evidence, I believe you can prove it was almost a physical impossibility for Peter Barnes to kill his wife. Have you evidence to support that? Yes. Peter is on stage during most of the show especially the first and second acts. Vicky's body was discovered during the second act, while Peter was in plain sight of the audience. Have you considered that he might have killed her between the first and second acts? No. According to her maid, she was still alive when the second act curtain went up. Have you considered that someone else may have killed her? Miss Devereaux, perhaps? Yes. Yes, I have. But, well, it doesn't add up. Lucy could have killed Victoria, but I can't think why. She had replaced Victoria, at least as an actress, in Peter's estimation, as well as my own. I'll admit it presents a fascinating challenge, Mr. Walters. And you may name your own fee, Mr. Keg. No, no, Mr. Walters. The Nickers Curiae will never accept a fee. I am particularly fortunate in that I'm financially secure. Therefore, I'm able to serve in that capacity and to indulge my passion for helping to see justice done. Then you will do so in this case? Remember... If I do offer my services to the court as amicus curiae tomorrow morning, my object will not be to prove that Peter Barnes didn't kill his wife. I shall seek only to uncover the facts and fit them together in a logical pattern, no matter whom it may help or hurt. Your Honor, it is my belief that the testimony, as so far presented, does not form a true picture of the facts. I respectfully request the court's permission to serve as amicus curiae and in that capacity to cross-examine some of the witnesses. Very well, Mr. Keg. Permission is granted. Mr. Barnes, you say the last time you saw your wife alive was when you left her dressing room a minute or so before the first act began. That's right. It has been conclusively established that Miss Marley was still alive when the second act curtain went up. Would you mind telling me, Mr. Barnes, just how long you were on the stage during the second act prior to that point at which Miss Marley makes her entrance? I go off just once. I'm supposed to make an exit onto a veranda. And then I reappear a few minutes later through a French door in the back wall of the stage. How much time would you say elapses during that period? As I say, a few minutes. I've never given it much thought. I see. This letter opener with which your wife was stabbed, do you recognize it? Yes. It's mine. When was the last time you saw it? I don't really remember. A few days ago in my dressing room, I think. In your dressing room? I think so. Thank you, Mr. Parnes. That'll be all. <laughs> your Honor... I believe there are additional facts which have not been brought to light in the testimony so far. I understand that the entire cast and the people sitting in the front row of the audience have been subpoenaed and are here in court. I would like to talk with one of those people. We will call to the stand any person you desire, Mr. Keg, and that person must testify. Thank you, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen... 
Few of us ever consider that we might at any moment be witness to a crime. The crimes of violence and passion that you read about in your newspapers are not committed in a vacuum. Much of the evidence which could solve them is frequently witnessed by many people. If you should be the one called upon to testify, as our next witness is about to do, you would surely have a life in your hand. Smoke Raleigh's cigarettes, the pack with the premium coupon on the back. Because it pays two ways to smoke Raleigh's cigarettes, it pays with top-quality smoking enjoyment, it pays with luxury premium, and don't forget this. We guarantee that no other cigarette gives you finer quality tobaccos than Raleigh. That no other cigarette is easier on your throat, richer tasting, more satisfying than Raleigh. Yes, and Raleigh is the only popular brand of cigarette that gives you luxury premiums. And remember, Raleigh premiums are made possible by reduced advertising expenditures and by accepting a smaller profit than the usual rate for the cigarette industry. Thus, the Raleigh premium plan is a profit-sharing plan. Raleigh premiums are a bonus to the Raleigh smoker. That's why it pays two ways to smoke Raleigh cigarettes. It pays with top quality smoking enjoyment. It pays with luxury premium. Smoke Raleigh cigarettes. The pack with the premium coupon on the back. We return now to the courtroom where the well-known stage star, Peter Barnes, is on trial for the murder of his wife, Victoria Molly. Jonathan Kegg, serving as amicus curiae, a friend of the court, is about to call his next witness from those members of the cast and theater audience who have been subpoenaed as witnesses. If you were this witness, you would have a life in your hands. I would like to have Tom Kalish, the assistant stage manager, take the stand. Tom Kalish appeared before you entered the case, Mr. Kegg. He's already been sworn. Come forward, Tom Kalish. Mr. Kalish, the court record shows that when you testified before, you told briefly about a quarrel you overheard between Mr. Barnes and Miss Marley. What were they quarreling about? Well, first I heard Miss Marley yelling, Don't give me that. I can act rings around Devereaux, drunk or sober. And then Mr. Barnes said something about lowering her voice. She said she wouldn't lower her voice. And then he said, I swear if you don't shut up, and by then I was knocking on the door to give him his call. I didn't hear the end of what he said. Did Mr. Barnes come to the door? Yes, he did. And he said he'd be right down. You saw him? Yes. Now, Mr. Kalish, I want you to consider this next question very carefully before answering it. How long was Mr. Barnes off the stage during the second act? I'd say at least four minutes. That's a very accurate estimate. Actually, Mr. Barnes, or rather the person who is now playing his part... He's off the stage for four minutes and 35 seconds. I clocked it at last night's performance. <coughs> Mr. Kalish, Miss Devereaux has testified that she was the first to discover Miss Marley's body. In your own words, will you please tell the court exactly what you remember is taking place just before that discovery? Well, <coughs> Miss Devereaux and I were watching the show from the wings when... Mr. Wallace came in. From where? From out front. And he asked how things were going backstage and did I like the show. Uh, Mr. Kalish, will you try to tell the court as nearly as you can the conversation that you and Miss Devereaux and Mr. Walters had at that time? I'll, I'll try, Mr. Kalish. Please do. Mr. Barnes' fate may depend on how well you remember it. Well, let's see. Uh, Miss Devereaux and I both said hello to Mr. Walters. Then he said, sort of kidding... Lucy, you're beautiful. And then he said to me, I've been out front. How are things going back here? And I answered that it was going all right. Yes, go on. Uh, and uh, then Mr. Walters asked, how's the house? And Miss Devereaux and I both jumped in to answer that it was pretty full for Monday. And then Mr. Walters asked me to give Miss Marley a call because she was on pretty soon. And, and Miss Devereaux said, oh, give me a break, Si. Maybe she's sleeping. I'm all ready to go on. But Mr. Walters wouldn't go for that. How do you mean, Mr. Kalish? Well, he talked her out of it. Something about Miss Devereaux's getting there on her own and not having to bother with tricks. So Miss Devereaux offered to call Miss Marley herself. And then a few seconds after she'd gone, we heard her scream, and she came running back crying and told us Miss Marley was dead. I see. 
Earlier in your testimony, Mr. Kalish, you stated that Miss Marley made a phone call in your presence. Will you tell us about that? Well, that afternoon when she came to the theater, she'd had a few drinks, like I said, and was kind of talkative. And after we'd got acquainted, she asked me if Charlie, he's a head stage manager, if he'd had a certain piece of scenery repainted that she wanted done. When I told her that Mr. Barnes had told Charlie not to repaint it, she blew up and called him on the telephone. She called Mr. Barnes? Why, yeah, yeah, I think it was him. Did she address him by name? No, but she bawled him out something awful. Did you, uh, did you hear her place the call? Yeah, I heard her dial a number. Do you know what number she dialed? No, sir, I had no way of knowing. I understand. Now, is this phone she used a pay phone? Yes, it is. And she didn't have any change she borrowed from me. I see. She had to borrow a nickel from you to make the call. Yeah, except it was two nickels she borrowed. Two nickels? Did you make a second phone call at this time? Uh, no, sir. She used both nickels on the same call. You mean that before she dialed the number, she dropped two nickels into the payphone? Yes, sir. I figured it was because she wasn't quite herself, you know. I see. Hmm. Can you remember what she said when the party at the other end of the line answered? Well, like I say, she was sore as a boil, but she said, Hello, what's this about not repainting the second act drop? All at once in a big rush, and she said something about his being a two-bit Casanova and trying to put her out of the show. Oh, yeah, and she wound up by saying, before that girl takes over my part, I'll go to my grave. Then she hung up and walked down to her dressing room. I want you to think carefully, Mr. Kalish. At any time during Miss Marley's phone conversation, did she ever explicitly address the person to whom she was talking as Peter or Mr. Barnes? No. No, she didn't. Thank you very much, Mr. Kalish. That'll be all. Your Honor... I would like to recall Mr. Cyrus Walters to the stand. Very well, Mr. Keg. Mr. Walters will take the stand. Mr. Walters, would you mind telling the court why you asked me to intercede in this case? I ask you to offer your services to the court because, in my opinion, Miss Marley had not been murdered. I thought she committed suicide. You thought she did? Don't you still think so? I, I honestly don't know. When you originally appealed to me to appear in court as a makers curiae, you stated that apart from your personal conviction of Peter Barnes' innocence, there was factual proof of it. Would you mind telling the court of what you felt that proof consisted? Not at all, Mr. King. I told you that I regarded Peter's murdering Vicky as physically impossible. She was alive when the second act curtain went up. I thought Peter was on stage for all but a few moments of the second act, and I couldn't see how he could possibly have committed the crime. But... Uh, now, in view of what evidence you've uncovered, I, I'm i not so sure. I am, Mr. Walters. I'm absolutely certain that Peter Barnes did not murder his wife. Order. Order in the court, or I'll clear it at once. Mr. Walters, this is one little drama you bungled very badly. I, I don't know what you're talking about. It's now a matter of court record that you, by your own testimony, requested me to determine whether or not Peter Barnes had sufficient time to murder his wife. But because you must have known, through your long association with the show, that he did have sufficient time to commit the crime, I can only assume that your intention was to ensure that point being brought out strongly in the court, thus strengthen the case against him. But that wasn't all you were asking. Now listen here, you I felt it. sure that Mr. Kalish, being new to the cast would place great emphasis on the quarrel which took place immediately before the first curtain. Well, uh, I... But you did not expect him to know about the telephone call Miss Marley made during the afternoon. Because you didn't know he was at the theater early when Victoria Marley arrived. You're crazy. Furthermore, Mr. Kalish remembered quite a few things you said to him and Miss Devereaux. I said nothing of any consequence. Do you disagree with Mr. Kalish's account of the conversation that took place in the wings between you, Miss Devereaux, and himself? Why, I... I... Uh... Don't perjure yourself, Mr. Walters. Remember, Miss Devereaux was there, too. All right. Kalish's account of what was said is, well, substantially true. Really? Well, then will you please tell me, Mr. Walters, why, after having announced to Miss Devereaux and Mr. Kalish that you had, and I'm quoting you, come in from out front, why, a few moments later, you asked, how's the house? Meaning the size of the audience. Why, I often ask, if you had been out front, as you stated... You would have certainly known the answer to that question. Was it because while everyone else was watching the second act from backstage, 
You crossed behind the darkened set, entered Miss Marley's dressing room, and stabbed her to death? Of course not. You're crazy, Kate. I had no motive for killing her. Oh, yes, Mr. Waters. Yes, you did. A twisted, futile motive, perhaps. But motive enough for you. It was Lucy. Shut up! Lucy Devereaux, the one girl you couldn't... Will you shut up? The one girl you didn't want is a hand-me-down from Peter Barnes. And it was the phone call Victoria Marley made to you in the afternoon that first put the idea in your head. It wasn't Peter she called, was it, Mr. Walters? Not with two nickels. His phone number carries a local exchange. So it must have been a toll call to a suburban home, to a house like the one you own in Floral Heights. It was that phone call that decided you. So you conceived an elaborate plan for getting Lucy the role you'd promised her and eliminating Peter in the same stroke by seeing him convicted of his wife's murder. Keg, I... I, I... Did Miss Devereaux know you were in love with her? I... I... All right. Yes. Yes, she did. I'd ask her to marry me a number of times, but it was always Peter, Peter. I like you a lot, Si, and maybe if it weren't for Peter, everything he is, everything he says, every clever mannerism he has, I gave them to him. It drove me crazy that she was so blind to it, that she couldn't see that he was nothing but a puppet. And Victoria Marley, was she another one of your puppets, Mr. Walters? No, no, I... That that was different. I, I... I didn't want to kill Vicky. But you couldn't think of an easier way. One that would end things so tidily and with all your characters just where you'd planned. So you fell back on an old stage trick. You killed one of them off. But I I, I didn't as want to. bloodedly as you'd snip the strings of a marionette, you walked into Victoria Marley's dressing room and murdered her. It, it, it was all I could think to do. Yes, I guess it must have been, Mr. Walters. But certainly, if you had foreseen how the play would end... I doubt that you would have included that situation. Thank you, Jonathan Keg. May I ask you now to tell us something about next week's show? <laughs> Inasmuch as no man can predict the future, Mr. Wallace, I honestly can't tell you just where we'll find ourselves next week. Whether it be in the criminal court... Uh, coroner's inquest or judge's chambers, I shall again offer my services as amicus curiae. Friends, here's a cordial invitation for each of you to be with us next Tuesday when you will again hear Jonathan Kegg, created by Earl Stanley Gardner, author of the internationally famous Perry Mason stories and many others. Smokers, send for your free copy of the Raleigh Premium Catalog. More than 50 luxury premiums are pictured in full color. Just write Raleigh's Hollywood, California. Pipe smokers, you'll like Sir Walter Raleigh pipe tobacco. You'll like the rich, full-bodied flavor of Sir Walter Raleigh. Never bitter, never biting. You'll like the way Sir Walter Raleigh smokes cool, clean. Never leaves a soggy heel in your pipe. Just a nice dry ash. And you'll like that grand aroma of Sir Walter Raleigh. You and your pipe will be welcome everywhere. Yes, men, you'll like everything about Sir Walter Raleigh. It's the quality pipe tobacco of America. <laughs> A Life in Your Hands is created by Earl Stanley Gardner with script by John Kelly. The program is produced by Jack Simpson, directed by Homer Heck. Jonathan Kegg is played by Ned Lefebvre. This is Myron Wallace inviting you to be with us again next week when Raleigh Cigarettes, the pack with the coupon on the back, will again place A Life in Your Hands. <laughs> This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. NBC, the national broadcasting company. NBC, the national broadcasting company. NBC, the national broadcasting... Partially transcribed. The national broadcasting company presents... Earl Stanley Gardner's A Life in Your Hands. What was she wearing? Was the door open... Where was the weapon? Listen while we place a life in your hands. You never know when you step from the safety of your home when you may witness a violent death and be called upon to testify as to what you saw and heard. 
murder is a dark enigma that strikes fear into the heart of man. Strange, baffling, mysterious. But the darkest crime one man can invent, another man can unravel. Such a man is Jonathan Kegg, created by Earl Stanley Gardner, the world's most popular writer of mysteries, creator of Perry Mason and many other outstanding characters. Here's your key, Mr. Kegg. Room 102. Thanks, Jim. I can always count on you to remember my room number. I guess so. It isn't often we have famous people staying at this hotel. How come you stay in a little town like this when you could go to someplace important? Well, when I'm on a vacation, Jim, I like to take it easy. Fly in the sun, swim, eat good meals, and relax. Most of all, I like to avoid crowds. I bet you like to get away from crime, too, don't you? Yes, Jim, but I've found, much to my dismay, that no matter where you go, crime is not far away. You never know when or where violence will strike, or when you'll suddenly become a witness to a crime and be called upon to testify as to what you saw and heard. Even now, somewhere nearby, there may be a crime in the making. Dr. Matthews' office. No, the doctor is out. May I help you? Yes, we have office hours tonight. Oh, you'd like your eyes examined? Mm, yes, we can take you at seven. Your name, please. Mrs. Sellinger? Thank you for calling, Mrs. Sellinger. We'll see you tonight. Bye. What are you doing here? Dr. Matthews isn't in. I know. That's why I came. Why don't you leave me alone? How many times have I told you I don't want you around? My dear Miss O'Connor, being the owner of this building gives me every right to be here. Don't you dare come near me. I just want to talk to you. I wouldn't think of touching a hair of your innocent head. Don't forget, I know all about your pretty past. Take your hands off me. Uh, don't pull that coy act on me. You let me go. Bite me. I'll teach you. Liz! Crane, get away from her. Well, Sir Galahad the dentist to the rescue. We're just having a little fun. This is the first time she's objected. You ought to be killed. Those are harsh words. Liz, are you all right? Yes, Paul. Please get him out of here. Crane, you get out of here. Temper, temper. Your fair damsel isn't hurt. And she's not so fair. Get out. It's hardly the way to talk to a man you owe 15000 You get your money. I'm sure I will. The next payment is due Tuesday. Either you pay or out goes your precious equipment. I don't know why Beggars I... can't be choosers. <laughs> I haven't had so much fun in years. Ah, oh, the illustrious Dr. Matthews. What do you want here, Crane? Maybe your rent. I paid it yesterday. David, he's been bothering Liz. I have to get back to my office. I left a patient in the chair. Are you out of your mind, Crane? I'm just a bit taken with your assistant. Get out of here. Look, I'm the one who does the evicting around here, and I don't take a lot of guff from tenants. What did you come here for? Just to bother Miss O'Connor? This is a professional call. I want my eyes examined. Why don't you go to someone else? Because you're the best. I'll be here at seven. We have an appointment for seven. You'll take me first. You'll always consider me first. All right. Come at seven. I'll put drops in your eyes. By the time they take effect, maybe the other examination will be finished. Count the minutes, Miss O'Connor, until you see me again. How long has he been bothering you? Months. I haven't said anything. He could ruin me. He knows all about Paul and me. If it got back to Paul's wife, he'd lose his practice. It's none of my business, but you're playing with fire. No, it's none of your business. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Matthews. On edge, I guess. Oh, one of your earrings is on the floor. Oh. Here. Thanks. Good heavens, Liz. Was he so rough that he knocked an earring off? No, I always take one off when I answer the phone. These dangle kind get in my way. What are we going to do, Doctor? I mean about Crane. I don't know. But something has to be done. <laughs> I'm home, Helen. And only an hour late for dinner. Who's the girl this time? Does my being late always have to involve a woman? Being you, it always does. 
Your dinner's cold. And so are you, my dear. A walking refrigerator. If you divorced me, Henry, you wouldn't have to put up with it. For the hundredth time. Oh, you obviously detest me. My utter dislike for you is surpassed only by my utter delight in tormenting you. Once and for all, no. I can't take much more of you. I'm about at the end of my rope. I'll give you a little more. Maybe you'll hang yourself. <laughs> you're the most despicable man I've ever But you married me. For your money. Now you're paying for it. It all comes out, Helen. You always have to pay for what you get. Someday you're going to get something you haven't counted on. Look, I'm going over to Dr. Matthews at 7 o'clock to have my eyes examined. It shouldn't take longer than an hour. I'll expect you to pick me up. Why? Can't you drive? He's going to put drops in my eyes. I won't be able to see. In that case, no. You be there. As long as I have money, you'll do what I say. Good evening, Mrs. Ballinger. Uh, good evening. The doctor will be right with you. Oh, isn't he here yet? Oh, he's in the treatment room. I've never had an examination before. He won't put anything in my eyes, will he? Yes. Will it hurt? Will I be able to see? Oh, there's nothing to become alarmed about. The drops are merely to dilate your pupils so the doctor can better test your eyes. Oh, your sight may be hazy for a while, but you don't have anything... Mrs. Salinger, will you come in, please? Oh, thank you, doctor. Now, if you'll sit in this chair... Yes. Now, lean back. Please look up at the ceiling, Mrs. Salinger. That's it. There. <laughs> cold, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Now, look up. There. Uh, All uh, finished. Just close your eyes. Mm. It will only be a few minutes. Mm. I'll be back. Thank you, Doctor. Paul, are you working tonight? I want to be right across the hall if you need me. No telling what that fool crane might try. He won't try anything tonight. I know. How can you be so sure? He wouldn't dare while I'm in the office. But you have another patient. That means you'll be in the other room most of the time. Don't worry. I'm putting drops in his eyes. He's so far-sighted, he'll be practically blind. He won't even be able to find Liz. Oh, as uh, long as I'm over here, could I borrow a hypo of sodium pentothal? I've got a wisdom extraction coming in tonight. Certainly. I'll get it for you. Thanks. Here you are, Paul. Thanks, David. Liz, as soon as I get the drops in Crane's eyes, you can go home. Yes, Dr. Matthews. Good evening. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. I'll be across the hall, Liz. Ah, I see you're here to protect your, uh, uh, interests. You try one more trick like this afternoon and I'll beat you to a pulp. No, you won't. Because I dispossess you of your equipment and your office space so fast you'd be selling pencils in the street. I'm not afraid of you, Dr. Moore, because I have you right where I want you. Under my thumb. Uh, you <laughs> go to blazes. <laughs> the age-old battle of love versus career. <laughs> Shall we proceed, Dr. Matthews? I'm ashamed to even treat you. Careful, your ethics are showing. Ethics should never show. Isn't that right, Miss O'Connor? I don't know what you're talking about. You've never let them color your life. I... Don't <sighs> protest, please. I've followed your career, or uh, rather your past, very revealing. I'm sure Mrs. Paul Moore would find it fascinating. Either you shut up and let me start the examination, or... Or what, Doctor? If someone doesn't kill you someday, it will be a miracle. Blow the other way, please. You must have had onions for dinner. Come on, Crane. Into the side room. Sit here. Now, look up. Oh. The other eye. Look up. Hey, that's cold. Sit here till I get back. Mrs. Salinger, you may open your eyes. Just lean your head back on the headrest. There. Let me take a look. I want to be sure the drops have taken effect. Mm-hmm. Just sit here a while longer and look into those lenses. It's a refractor. I want you to get used to it. Now, please excuse me. Oh, of course, Doctor. Liz, you can go home now. Where are you going? Down to buy some gum. I have enough change. I'm ready to leave. Uh, don't forget to turn the sterilizer off. I won't. Good night. Good night. See you in the morning. Thanks for staying down.
Matthews? Matthews, how long do I have to sit here with my eyes closed? Matthews, answer me. What's that bubbling noise? Matthews, where are you? I, I know it's you. Answer me. everyone. Dr. Matthews? Henry? Oh, there you are. Henry, how soon will you be finished? I've got to go over to... Henry? Oh! Henry! Oh. Liz! What, what is it? What's Liz? Oh, oh Mrs. Crane. It's Henry. He's been stabbed! <laughs> I have my key, please, Jim. Oh, oh, Mr. Kegg. Sorry, I was reading about the murder. Yes, it was a terrible thing. Mr. Kegg, I know Dr. Matthews didn't do it. I know. What makes you so sure, Jim? Well, I go to him for glasses. He's been swell to me. Never charged me the full price because he knows I can't afford it. Mr. Kegg, he couldn't have killed Henry Crane. It seems like an open and shut case. Dr. Matthews had the motive, the opportunity, the weapon, and the flimsy excuse. Practically everybody in town had a motive for killing Crane. Nobody liked him. Oh, Mr. Keg, you're so good at being a lawyer. Well, I don't mean exactly a lawyer. Uh, amic, uh, amicus curiae? Yeah. Well, what does it mean? Well, amicus curiae, literally translated, means friend of the court. An amicus curiae works neither for the prosecution nor the defense, only in search of the truth. I cross-examine witnesses. Why aren't there more like you? <laughs> well, you see, you don't get paid for it, Jim. I'm fortunate enough that I can do this kind of work gratis. For free. Well, if you don't get paid for your work, then I can't very well ask you to... Jim, my work is done purely in the interest of justice. I'll tell you what. I'll review the facts of the case and see what can be done for your doctor friend. Quiet. Quiet, please. Your Honor... There are certain weaknesses in the evidence against Dr. Matthews. In view of his fine reputation as a doctor, I should like to enter the case as amicus curiae. Your reputation as an expert in cross-examination is well known, Mr. Kegg. We are fortunate to have you with us. You may proceed. I should like to recall Mrs. Henry Crane to the stand. Mrs. Crane, will you tell the court again precisely what occurred when you went to Dr. Matthews' office on the night of the murder? Well, I, I came in the front door of the office. Is there more than one entrance to Dr. Matthews' office? I, I don't know. I, most doctor's offices have a rear entrance, don't they? It depends on the layout of the building. I went into the waiting room. There was no one at the reception desk where Miss O'Connor usually sits, so I called to see if there was anyone in the office. No answer. I went through the little reception room and into the hallway that leads to, well, to the treatment room. There was Henry sitting in a chair with his eyes closed. Did you notice whether the door to the, uh other treatment room was closed. I didn't notice that. Oh, yes, yes, it was open. Yes, it was, but it, it was very dark inside. Well, uh, Henry had his eyes closed, as I was saying. I I started to talk to him, and then I saw the blood on his shirt front. I screamed, he's been stabbed, and Dr. Matthews and Dr. Moore came running in. How did you know your husband had been stabbed? Why, because he was bleeding down the front of his shirt. Couldn't the blood have come from another type of wound? Anyone knows the difference between a knife wound and a wound which makes a large hole at the point of entrance. You're a registered nurse, aren't you, Mrs. Crane? Before I was married, I was a trained nurse. Then you know how to administer a hypodermic. Yes. Did you know that your husband had been given a hypodermic of sodium pentothal before he was stabbed with a scalpel? I heard the coroner's report. What do you know about sodium pentothal, Mrs. Crane? It's an anesthetic that acts very quickly. You and your husband weren't getting along, were you? <laughs> I don't see how my personal life has any bearing on this case against Dr. Matthews. It may have a bearing, Mrs. Crane. Look at it this way. You entered the office and found no one there but your husband with drops in his eyes, practically blind. You're a trained nurse. 
So you go back to the treatment room, fill a hypo with sodium pentothal, take a scalpel, inject the anesthetic, stab your husband, wipe the scalpel and hypo syringe clean, put them in the sterilizer and scream that your husband has been killed. Ridiculous. I didn't kill Henry. I may have hated him, but I didn't kill him. I'm not saying you did, Mrs. Crane. I'm just saying you could have. And I'm showing you that your personal life could have quite a bearing in such a case. That will be all, thank you. Now, wait just a minute. I'm not going to sit here and... Is there something more you would like to tell us? I I didn't have time to kill him. Did it enter your mind? I didn't say that. Henry was dead when I got there. Thank you. That will be all. Dr. Paul Moore, please. (laughs) Dr. Moore, you have testified that Henry Crane threatened to dispossess you of your expensive equipment in your office space. That's right. Everyone had some reason to dislike Crane. He made it his business. Do you keep office hours every night? Only when needed. Your office is right across the hall from Dr. Matthews? Yes. Did you hear anything unusual at the time of the murder? No. No, I can't say I did. I heard Dr. Matthews and Liz, uh, Miss O'Connor, leave. And then a little while later, I heard Mrs. Crane's screams. Did they leave together? Liz left by the elevator, and then right after, Dr. Matthews went down the stairs. How do you know? I was watching. Sort of peeking out your door? Well, I... When you knew the two had left... You knew Crane was alone. I knew Mrs. Selinger was in the treatment room. I'd been over earlier to borrow something. Anyone who knew Mrs. Selinger was there and planned to kill Crane would have made sure it was a soundless murder. Probably. Do you have an assistant when you work at night? I work alone. That rather limits you to fillings and cleanings and such, doesn't it? Yes, I don't usually do it. Yet Miss O'Connor testified earlier that you had borrowed a hypodermic of sodium pentothal from Dr. Matthews for an extraction that night. I meant it for the morning. Couldn't you have borrowed it in the morning? I suppose so, but as long as I was there, You I... just stated that you went to Dr. Matthews' office to borrow something. Wasn't the something the anesthetic? I didn't mean that. What did you mean? I don't know. That'll be all for now, Dr. Moore. I would like to recall Miss O'Connor to the stand. In your earlier testimony, Miss O'Connor, you stated that Henry Crane had made advances. He was unbearable. He seemed to enjoy frightening me. I see. Where did you go when you left the office? Home. I was quite tired. I'd had a hectic day. Do you live alone? Yes, I live in an apartment. Did anyone see you come home? I doubt it. I went right up and went to bed. No one saw you? Now think. Dr. Matthew saw me leave. And anyway, why should there have to be anyone's word besides mine? When I leave the office every day, I don't think of establishing an alibi for something Very true. Miss O'Connor, how long have you worked for Dr. Matthews? Four years. Do you get along as employer and employee? Dr. Matthews is one of the finest men I've ever known. He hated Crane. We all did. But I feel sure he didn't kill him. Miss O'Connor, do you realize that if Dr. Matthews didn't kill Crane, the murderer made every attempt to make it look like he did? That's true. But... That will be all, thank you. Will Dr. Matthews please take the stand? Dr. Matthews, you state that you left the office to buy chewing gum. Yes. I had onions for dinner and didn't want to offend my patients. (laughs) Is it customary to leave a patient in the treatment room? After administering drops, I had my patients sit with their eyes closed for a while. That night, neither of the patient's pupils had dilated enough, so... I left them for a while longer in the dark room. I see. Where did you go for the chewing gum? There's a little old man who runs a candy stand on the floor below. Did the man recognize you? He wasn't there. I waited a few minutes. Then I heard Mrs. Crane scream and ran back upstairs. Did anyone see you? I'm afraid not. Dr. Matthews, why didn't you kill Crane? Well, I... I I thought of it, but I... I knew I couldn't. I couldn't jeopardize my family, my profession. I... I never dreamed the insignificant act of buying chewing gum could be so important. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. Your Honor, there are many obvious aspects to this case. But I have found in my experience that with every murder there is a sound pattern. A sequence of sounds or absence of sounds that when placed in proper order must spell the truth. I ask the court to adjourn until tomorrow. At which time I shall recall a completely disinterested witness. Permission is granted. Court is adjourned until tomorrow morning at ten o'clock. Jonathan Kegg is about to call another witness. It could be you. If it were, could you remember what you have heard? It would be vital that you do, for you would hold a life in your hands. To build our strength against possible aggression... 
we must equip our armed forces with the weapons of war. And at the same time, in order to defeat inflation, we must produce adequate supplies of civilian goods. There's only one way to meet this double challenge, and that's by turning out more goods and services for every hour we work. Remember, the better we produce, the stronger we grow. Mrs. Salinger, who was in the other treatment room when Henry Crane was murdered, has been recalled. Court has convened. Jonathan Kegg commences his cross-examination. Mrs. Salinger, I understand from a review of the records that you have already been called in this case. Uh, yes, Mr. Kegg, but I couldn't be of any help. What makes you so sure? Well, as you know, the, the pupils of my eyes had been dilated, and I was in a dark room sitting behind a big machine. I couldn't possibly see anything. Well, frankly, Mr. Selinger, I'm not interested in anything you could or could not have seen. Now, will you please tell the court exactly what you heard when Henry Crane died? Well, uh, I heard talking out in the reception room. Whom did you hear? Oh, uh, Miss O'Connor and, and Dr. Matthews and Dr. Moore. Uh, they were talking about Crane. I, I couldn't hear much. And then Crane came in. Did you know Mr. Crane? By then, I'd heard about him. Uh, go on, please. I heard Dr. Moore threatened to beat up on Crane and... And Dr. Matthew said, real loud, if someone doesn't kill you, it'll be a miracle. Order! Order in the court! Then what happened? Then uh, Dr. Matthews took Crane back to the other treatment room and, and put drops in his eyes. Yes, and then? Well, uh, then he, uh, the doctor, uh, came into the side room and, and put a big kind of machine up to my eyes. Your Honor, I have brought an actual refractor into court. With your permission, I would like to exhibit it. You may proceed. Will you roll it over here, please? Is this what you mean by a machine? Yes, that's it. Mrs. Selinger, what did you hear next? Well, the doctor excused himself, and, and I heard coins jingling in his hand. How did you know they were coins? Well, why, I heard them. But you couldn't see them. Well, no, I couldn't, but I know they were. I heard Dr. Matthews tell Miss O'Connor he was going to buy some chewing gum. And then? Well, Miss O'Connor said she was ready to leave. I heard her high heels clicking. It, it, it was real quiet. And then I heard a, a bubbling sound. A crane called out to ask what the noise was. I started to tell him that the doctor was out. But then I, I heard the jingling of coins. So I guess the doctor must have come back. Did you hear footsteps? N no, none. Had you heard Dr. Matthews' footsteps before? No, he, he was wearing rubber-soled shoes. What did you hear after that? Well, I heard this jingling some more and, and the bubbling and... And then a, a metal click. The jingle was real faint then. I see. Was this jingling sound constant? It was in, uh, oh, spurts, uh, uh, like the coins were in his pocket when he walked. Then the sound pattern went like this. A bubbling sound in the background, a sporadic jingle, loud, then faint, then loud, then faint, then a metallic click, and then the jingle became louder, then faded. There was silence except for bubbling. Yes. Yes, th that's right. Your Honor, I would like to place the refractor up to Mrs. Selinger's eyes. I have asked each of the people involved to wear exactly what they wore on that night. With your permission, I would like each to walk by Mrs. Selinger. Also, I have brought a sterilizer, which is now boiling. Now, Mrs. Selinger, I'll bring the refractor up to your eyes. There. Now, first, I would like you to come forward. Would you please remove your shoes and walk past the witness? This is ridiculous. Thank you. You may sit down. And now, you please. Quiet, please. There must be absolute quiet. My Phi Beta Kappa key hitting my keychain. Is that the sound you heard, Mrs. Selinger? Mm, no, it wasn't. That'll be all, Dr. Moore. Uh, here, please. Here's some change. Will you put it in your pocket, please? And I'll just walk past Mrs. Selinger. Now, think carefully, Mrs. Selinger. Was that the sound you heard? Uh, well, uh, I'd like to hear it again. Of course. But first, I'd like another person to walk by. Will you please take off your shoes? Yes, Mr. Cade. Before you start, what were you wearing on the night of the murder? I had on this file suit. High heels? I always wear heels. And jewelry? Of course. 
I don't see what difference my appearance makes. I asked you to wear exactly what you wore that night. I am. Jewelry, too? Well, I didn't think you meant down to the exact jewelry. That night, were you wearing the earrings I saw you take off just now? I believe you put them in your purse. Oh, yes. They were hurting my ears. Will you put them on, please? Now I must ask for a complete silence in the courtroom. All right. You will be first, and you will follow. Uh, that's it. That that last one, I'm sure. The coins. Yes, the coins. That last sound you heard was the jingling of Miss O'Connor's dangling earrings. Oh, no, no. After appearing no. to take the elevator downstairs, you, Liz O'Connor, <laughs> went back into the office, passed Crane and Mrs. Sellinger, filled the hypodermic, took a scalpel, gave Crane an injection, and stabbed him. You then wiped the instruments and put them in the sterilizer. Hence, the metallic click of the lid heard by Mrs. Sellinger. You then left by the back door. Thanks to Mrs. Sellinger's testimony, to her keen perception, we now know it was you who came back to the office that oh, night. No, I knew all along I couldn't get away with it. But I'm not sorry, Mr. Kay. I'm not sorry. <laughs> Golly, Mr. Keg, you were wonderful. Uh, how, how'd you get on the track of Liz O'Connor? Jim, if Matthews weren't guilty, then the jingling sound must have come from some wearing apparel. Miss O'Connor's choice of clothing is quite extreme. I imagined her jewelry was just as extreme. The testimony of Mrs. Sellinger, the innocent bystander, again proved that with such cooperation, the truth will out. Yeah, I guess you'll be checking out now, huh? Yeah, I hate to see you go. Guess your vacation was kind of ruined. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. But my stay wasn't ruined. Well, I hope I see you again soon. Goodbye, Jim. Bye, Mr. Keg. And thanks. A Life in Your Hands is created by Earl Stanley Gardner, with script by Marty Everts, directed by John Cowan. Jonathan Kegg is played by Carlton Cadell with musical effects by Adele Scott, conducted by Whitey Burquist. Engineering by Bill Knight. This has been a partially transcribed Bell production. And this is George Stone extending a cordial invitation for each of you to be with us again next week. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Listen to Man from Homicide transcribed starring Dan Duryea following this reminder. Henry J. Taylor, author, journalist, and ABC commentator, whose commentaries on world events are heard every Monday evening on ABC, is on a fact-finding tour of European countries. Periodically, Mr. Taylor takes trips abroad to examine activities at first hand and to get his own reactions. During the week season Europe, his Monday evening commentary, Your Land and Mine, will be broadcast each week from a different European capital. He'll speak tonight from Zurich, Switzerland. So listen for Henry J. Taylor's Your Land and Mine tonight on ABC. The Man from Homicide. According to Webster's Dictionary, homicide is the killing of one human being by another. According to Lieutenant Lou Dana... It's the beginning of a dirty, dangerous job. It doesn't end until the killer is found. I don't like killers. Every week at this time, the American Broadcasting Company brings you transcribed the star of stage and screen, Dan Duryea, as Lieutenant Lou Dana, the man from Homicide. The job a man does leaves its mark on him. Generally, you can spot a doctor, a lawyer, a butcher, a baker, half a block away. But what kind of a mark is left on a man who work out of homicide? Dave carried his 300 pounds into my office at headquarters. It had been a long time since he pounded a beat. Lou? Yes, Pappy? Martha Kent has come home. 
Martha Kent. Yeah, she was spotted coming into the Cleveland train, picked up, and... Where is she now? Her apartment. A couple of men are covering. Now all we got to do is let a little time pass, and we've got Eddie Kent, Lieutenant. Like that? Well, he can't keep away from her, whatever it costs him. She must be, um, interesting. Oh, (laughs) I seen her once a couple of years ago. I'm an old fat cop, Lou, but I'm glad she never smiled at me. Eddie Kent killed three men we know of. The last one was a bank job we can pin on him. Dave? Yeah, Lieutenant. Those men covering her apartment. Uh Uh-huh. Pull them out. But Lou... Do it right uh, away. Okay, Lieutenant, only I don't... She uh, came in by train. How much of an effort did she make to shake anyone off her tail? Uh, well, not much the way I got it. And headed straight for her apartment. Uh, no, Dave. Too pat. Uh, well, I see what you mean a little, only... What would she be after? Maybe she wants to be Mary. Huh? A Mary Widow. What's her address? 49 South Grover. 49 South Grover. If I'm not back in a little while, send my mail there. Maybe she'll smile at me. I spent the trip to South Grover thinking about Eddie Kent. After I got finished thinking about him, I wished there was a way a man could wash his mind out. Martha Kent would be what? Something shrill? And heels an inch too high? Brassy hair? A runway figure? Yes. No. Something a lot more dangerous. What? Excuse me. Mind if I come in? Well, who are you? The name's Dana. Oh. That's right. Lou Dana. There's nothing much I could do about keeping you out, is there? Nothing much. Come in. Well? Eddie in? You should know. Uh Uh-uh. Don't your men tell you things? I took them off you. You did what? Sent them back to the precinct. Why? Their feet hurt. That was very kind of you. Thanks. Eddie isn't in. That's too bad. Do you plan on waiting for him here? No. Do you? That's all, Lieutenant. Mrs. Kent, does Eddie know you don't, uh, care anymore? Why not ask Eddie? Because he doesn't know. That was when she turned her back on me. Being a cop blunts the finer sensibilities. I only noticed your stocking seams weren't crooked. I'm tired. I'm going to bed. If you like, you can tuck me in. There's probably a police regulation about it. You don't have to worry. I wouldn't like. Oh, you wouldn't. Good night, Mrs. Kent. Eddie should be along any time now, huh? Get out. Sure. She hadn't smiled at me once. Cops and hallways are unnatural. I didn't enjoy it. I stayed with it an hour and then moved out. There'd be two of them. One for the front, one for the back. I took the back. He'd be the easier of the two. There was an alley, garbage cans, and... Thank you, but... Hey, cut it out. Don't reach for it. Oh, it's a big idea. Not very big. Is it? Out in the light, huh? Uh, now, look, mister, if you think you're tough, you... Oh. Hello, Boiler. Dana. I think I'm tough. Well, I... I, I, I didn't know it was you, Lieutenant. What's uh, special about that alley? Oh, I just happened to be passing by... Nobody passed any law about passing by. Boiler. Well, it's like this. I, 
I had a date to see a fellow, and he says, meet me there. You know, in that alley. Let's go down to the precinct. No. No, you ain't got nothing on me. Would you like to try resisting arrest? You throw me in the can, I'll get a mouthpiece. He'll spring me so fast, you will Twenty-four all... hours before I have to book your boiler. Nothing to eat. Nothing to drink. Not even, uh, tea. Oh, I'm off the stuff, Lieutenant. I ain't touched the stick and... I'm not narcotics, spoiler. Yeah, I, I know. Somebody like you, narcotics would be better. They make arrangements. They don't like their arrest to be screaming. Scraping cement with bleeding fingernails. Lay off, will you? In homicide, we can't accommodate you properly. In homicide, we don't especially care. Guys like you ain't human, Dana. You guessed. Well, Boiler? It's a dame. Dame up in that house. Eddie Kent's wife, she... She's kind of worried he, he might show. She doesn't love him? I wouldn't know. Orders was, you he, he don't get to her. What does he get? I'd say eight hours before you break. No. No, look, look, Lieutenant. It was a, only a job. They don't tell me anything. They, they give me orders. And Who they... gave you orders? I can't, Dana. The precinct. Come on. Hey, look, look, Lieutenant, I start spilling to cops. What would my life be worth? What's it worth now? Okay. It's McGrath. McGrath, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Good night, Boiler. You won't tell him that I... Oh, what's the use? He'll know. You don't care what happens to a guy, do you, Dana? Not if he carries a gun. That's only in case Eddie was to get A tough. man with a gun, all he's got to do is crook a finger and he's a killer. I don't like killers. Good night, Boiler. Boiler went back to the alley in the garbage cans. I went to visit Mr. McGrath. Boiler had the best of it. Start with the kid stuff, snatch and run. Knock over a couple of small stores. Move up into hot cars and cold decks. Pick up a few houses, take over a few wheels, buy a few deaths, and you wind up Mr. McGrath. But you wear tailored suits by then, and handmade shoes. And you got a hood for a doorman. Hey, what's the idea of this, uh... Copper. Copper? No, you don't. You got a paper copper? Uh-uh. Turn around and go away. Uh-uh. No warrant? You keep coming? I got a legal right to blast you. Sure. But have you got the guts? Okay. Come on, we'll find out. I'm coming. Max! Yeah, Mr. McGrath? What's the trouble? I'm having words with a cop. He wants in. He ain't got no paper. Put your gun away and let the fool in. Okay. It'll be a pleasure to have him thrown off the force. Hello, McGrath. Lieutenant Dana. Max, you've been rude. Huh? Lieutenant Dana isn't an ordinary policeman. He's a personality. My door's always open to him. Apologize to the lieutenant, Max. He's a cop. I said... A... Forget it, McGrath. Very well. You may leave us, Max. Okay. Max is a trifle crude, I'm afraid. Have a drink, lieutenant? No. Never drink on duty, huh? I wouldn't like your brand. Not raw enough, I suppose. I got work to do. Haven't we all? What's half of $80,000, McGrath? $40,000? That kind of money worth a death? I haven't seen the latest quotations. Eddie Kent knocked over a bank two months ago. Killed a guard and collected 80000 He had help. Indeed. 40000 for Kent. 40000 for, uh, the help. Seems equitable. How do you share the death... He needed a little time to think for an answer. I looked around. There was a charming room. 
mostly Chippendale pieces, oak paneling on the walls. A small Renoir hung where the sunlight would hit it in the mornings. A girl brushing her hair before a mirror. She looked like someone I'd seen, and for a minute I couldn't remember where. Then I remembered, but the girl in the painting was smiling. You've uh, evidently decided to be nasty, Lieutenant. Why? Martha Kent. I beg your pardon? Martha Kent. A lovely girl, as I recall. Pity she's not in town anymore. She's in town. A pleasant thought. Eddie Kent alive gets $40,000. Eddie Kent dead gets a mouthful of dust in Potter's Field. You're picturesque. How do we kill Eddie Kent, McGrath? It's not exactly my problem. How do we kill him safely? Got it. We bait a trap. The lure? Martha Kent. Fine. Eddie goes for her. How does that kill him, though? I couldn't say. We make sure the cops know where Martha Kent is. We fake it a little, so the cops think it's their own idea. They stake out. Eddie makes a beeline for her lovely arms. Runs into a couple of cops. So? You picked us to kill him for you. No, no, no. Be, be careful. I'm very careful. Ooh. That was from me, personally. You'll be sorry for this. The department will mail you a written apology. <laughs> Headquarters was where I'd left it. They'd built it a stone. Hi, Lieutenant. You got out of that one fast. Who was asleep? Uh, I was. <laughs> Go on back. It's cold out here. Yeah. How's it set up, Lou? Oh, stalemate, I guess. McGrath's got a couple of men covering for Mrs. Kent. They'll keep Eddie off. McGrath, huh? No good, Lou. Uh, he was in on the bank job with Kent. You got proof? No, but it has to be that way. He was the one set up Mrs. Kent as a decoy. When I pulled the cops out, his men moved in. Don't want to split with Eddie, huh? Forty thousand reasons against us. Yeah. Lou, it looked beat. Occupational disease, Dave. Yeah. Martha Kent do any smiling? Uh, not in my direction. Uh. I'll be in my office for a while. Doing what? Waiting. I wouldn't know for what. Don't ask me, huh? It might be nice if I had a Renoir. It could be a small Renoir on the wall. I thought what Captain Kowaleski might have to say on the subject. I decided I'd settle for the dirty plaster. Why don't you go on home, Lou, huh? It's an idea. Nothing's going to happen tonight. Oh, I suppose not. I feel restless. Did you slap McGrath around... Only once, Dave. Oh, you're improving. You could still find trouble that way. Well, he was trying to buy a killing from us. Yeah. You take it too hard, Lou. You'll never get fat like me. Oh, too bad. I was looking forward to it. Ah, go on home. I'm going. Uh, <clears throat> Lou. Yeah? 49 South Grover ain't on your way home. What makes you think I might be passing there? <laughs> Bet you my pension against a peppermint lifesaver. Pappy, I don't like peppermint. He would have won. McGrath's man out front of her house was holding down the same tree. I drove around the block to see if Boiler was still holding down the back. Martha Kent was in on the deal with McGrath. The decoy had to be, and she was. The girl in the Renoir was smiling. 
Maybe she was too polite to laugh out loud at me. Renoir painted beautiful things. No sense of reality. Boiler among the garbage cans would have been a more practical subject. But Boiler wasn't there. The alley closed in on me. I was in a hurry. And careless. I stumbled over a garbage can and almost missed him. Boiler was propped up against the wall, his legs straight out before him, his head slumped down over his chest. He might have been brooding about the blood that had poured out of that chest if he hadn't been so completely dead. I left him there. I wasn't in a hurry anymore. He'd been dead some little while. Whatever had been going to happen in Martha Kent's apartment would already have happened. I didn't care too much about finding out. The lock on Martha Kent's door was in fine shape. Except that the door wasn't locked. The living room was the way I remembered it. I had nothing to remember about the bedroom. But there'd be something I'd work at forgetting. She'd fallen back across the bed. The stain on the front of her dress hadn't been her dressmaker's idea. Her eyes were open. And when I bent over, I could have sworn they saw me. Hello. Mrs. Kent. I thought maybe I'd see you again. Hold it. Operator, police emergency. Lieutenant Dana, get a doctor to 49 South Grove or apartment 3C immediately. Got it? Yeah. Lieutenant. Better not talk. I... There'll be a doctor here in a couple of minutes. You've seen people like this before. I should be dead. Will you stop? No. What do you want me to do? Think about what my life has been. And what's happening to it now. There might be a chance. Uh, Are you trying to make me laugh? Uh, Lieutenant, you look funny. It's a habit my face has. I... You know who? Yeah. I'm tired. I want to go to sleep. You can tuck me in if you like. That's what I said when I was still alive. You said you wouldn't like. You lied, didn't you, Lieutenant? I lied. I knew. Please. It's all going so fast. Now, please. All right. I'll tuck you in. Thank Good night. The doctor was a little late. The homicide squad arrived and made noises and was very busy. There was a guy named Shakespeare who wrote a play. And when his character died, he said, The rest is silence. In my line, the rest is routine. Go on, Sam, get the cameras out of here. You ain't shooting a movie. Right. Terry, rush that print over to the lab, huh? Take it easy. Will you get the lead out. Get the lead out. Right. Dave was there, making like a sergeant. The men loved every pound of him. No reporters till later. Come on now, boys. Get rolling, huh? Lieutenant. Yeah, Dave? Snap out of it. Out of what? I'm feeling fine. Don't kid Pappy, huh? Sorry, Dave. Call it I'm tired and forget it. Okay. Well... Uh, the boys have been through the building. Did they have fun? Dug up a couple of neighbors, heard the shots. Thought it was a car backfiring. That was bright of them. Well, it gives us the time she was shot. One hour and eleven minutes ago. That'll help. 
Not the girl, maybe, but the district attorney's going to need it. All right. He's got it. And Boiler must have been shot a few minutes before that. Gives you the pair of them. Pinned down close, too. Close enough. Eddie Kent's out in the open now. Must have been holed up the last two months someplace in town. With her showing, it brought him out. He realized she'd thrown in with McGrath, so he Save figured... it for the report, Dave. Yeah, okay. We'll get him pretty quick now. Sure. So long, Dave. Lou, where are you going? Out. What for? I need a killer. There's the old one about the man who lost a horse. He said to himself, If I were a horse, where would I go? And then he went there. If I were Eddie Kent, I'd go to visit McGrath. I went. It was a nice night. The only thing wrong with it was people. There was a car parked outside of McGrath's house. It pulled away as I came up. I didn't have the patience for a chase, so I cut my wheel and... slowed it up. Max was climbing out of the other car, tugging at his pocket. I discouraged him. He fell down. I got the gun all the way out of his pocket. Two bullets gone. Within very recent history. There was nothing else that moved in the car. McGrath might still be at home. Worrying about his car, maybe. Max, what on earth? Dana. Inside. Now, look here. I said inside. All right. What do you want? Your car's in a bad way. Oh. Well, that crash. Yeah, I'm a careless driver. You could be drunk. I could be. That won't help your record any. You really think I'm drunk? If you're not, you're... you're insane. Oh, no. We just haven't met professionally before. Max, was he hurt? He'll live. I'm going to call a doctor for no. him. No. Now, look here. This is a completely pre... pre-, pre-, pre- Something bothering you? I haven't anything further to say to you, Dana. One man's opinion. Yours. I don't share it. You must have... <laughs> Uh, you must have, uh, looked into the car. I did. Well, that can be explained easily. Explain it easily. Eddie Kent was a killer. He apparently thought his wife and I had been a little too friendly. Had you? You know how it is, Lieutenant. No. Anyway, he came here and threatened to kill me, so Max beat him to it, that's all. The case of self-defense would stand up in any court. Sure. So there's no reason to act the way you are. Where was he delivering the body? To the aquarium? Well, uh, you see, Max's record isn't too good. He, he was afraid the police might not readily accept a self-defense plea. He wanted to dispose of the body. I tried to persuade him not to, but I failed. As a matter of fact, I was... Uh, just about to notify the police myself. Uh-huh. I think you'll find the bullets in Eddie Kent's body came from Max's gun. I know they did. Well, then, uh, we can relax, can't we? I've been relaxing for hours. How about the bullets in Boiler's body and Martha Kent's body? Well, they'd have come from Eddie Kent's gun, obviously. Uh, you mean the gun planted on Eddie Kent, don't you? What? What do you mean? Kent came here to see you first, for his share of the bank money. Kent died here. Max took care of that. But you still didn't own that 80000 It was Martha Kent left. You saw a nice piece of business opening up. Oh, you're, you're dreaming. A cop's dream. So you headed for her apartment. You had to dispose a boiler. He knew too much. You couldn't afford to have him around. And then you went upstairs and ended the partnership between you and Martha Kent... You came back, planted the gun you'd used on Eddie Kent, and instructed Max to dump his body where it wouldn't be found for a while. That way, no medical examiner could prove Kent had died before his wife. Well, that... That's very ingenious. You've got nothing to base it on. I've got Kent's body. Ah, good lawyer. I've got something else. An unlocked door. 
What does that mean? Martha Kent's door was unlocked when I got there. And the lock hadn't been tampered with. She wouldn't have opened that door to her husband. Not when she knew the trap she'd helped set for him. She'd have opened it for you, McGrath. Why? You've been fumbling in that desk long enough. Bring the gun up. I'll let you have first shot. Oh, you... You can't do anything to me. First shot. Well? Huh. Yeah. You do better with women. Don't worry. I won't slap you. All right. All right. How dirty can a man's hands get? They train you to make out a report when you're a cop. You learn how to put all the facts down in proper order. The names and the times and the places. You do it and you sign your name and it's a job that's done. Except where would you mention the fact that a dying girl's last action had been to smile at you? I don't like killers. You've just heard another in a series starring Dan Duryea as The Man from Homicide with Larry Dobkin as Dave. Mr. Duryea can be seen starring in Al Jennings of Oklahoma. In tonight's cast, you heard Gloria Blondell as Martha, Herb Butterfield as McGrath, and Barney Phillip as Max. Music was by Basil Adlam. from Homicide is transcribed and written by Lou Vitties, directed by Dwight Hauser. Be with us again next week, same time over most of these same ABC stations to hear Dan Duryea as the man from Homicide. America is sold on ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. More people smoke camels than any other cigarette. Make your own camel 30-day test, the one sensible, thorough cigarette test. You'll enjoy the rich, full flavor of camels' costly tobaccos. You'll see just how mild a cigarette can be day after day, pack after pack. And you'll know why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. Here transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, the ham and mayhem. It's mayhem. Not if it ruins a gag. Hi, Helen. Hi. What are you doing? Oh, trying to spot a client. I've done everything to get somebody up here. Set traps... Hung out of the window by my toes. Nothing. Oh, is it that bad, Rick? Has been for a week. Can I come over tonight and cry on your shoulder? I'd love it. Better wear a bathing suit. Are you going to cry that much? No, but the bathing suit will sure make me feel a lot better. You idiot. Yeah, I can't help it. I try so hard. Are you really coming over? If I cry long enough, I'll work up a heck of an appetite. I'll have Francis fix you a good dinner. I'll pay you back with the first client I get. We'll eat out. No, I'll have Francis fix you dinner. <laughs> what time will you be over? Uh, Mr. Diamond. Rick? Shh. I think I've spotted one. Client? 
I'm afraid to ask. It might scare him away. Are you Richard Diamond, the private detective? Are you interested in hiring him? I certainly am. Rick? We just made a score, baby. I'll see you tonight. Oh, wonderful. Bye. Well, uh, come in, sir. Come in. No sense in standing in a draft. Might catch pneumonia before we get around to my fee. Uh, my name is John Alistair. Well, sit down, Mr. Alistair. Pull up a wallet. A uh, uh, chair. Uh, thank you. Now, uh, what can I do for you? Uh, quite a lot, I hope. Two days ago, I made arrangements for my own assassination. Huh? It's really very simple. Well, so am I sometimes. Maybe you better be a little bit more specific. Well, I was bankrupt, in danger of going to prison. Uh, I have a family, a wife and two children. And an insurance policy. That's right. Mm. If I was to be killed, my family would be well taken care of. You said you were in danger of going to prison. Why? Well, I'll be perfectly honest. I embezzled money from my firm. Oh, embezzlement. Well, you can get a lot of years for that. Yes. So I decided to do away with myself, leaving instructions for my wife to replace the stolen funds. She could live quite comfortably on the rest. I knew suicide would revoke the insurance policy, so I went to the only underworld character I knew, a, a man named Gimpy. A long time ago, he'd been my bootlegger. Oh, yeah, I know. I nearly poisoned me once. I told Gimpy I wanted to hire a man to kill me, a professional assassin. Gimpy said it could be done, and I gave him $200. I told Gimpy to take care of the arrangements and not to tell me anything about the man who was going to kill me. I didn't want to know a thing. How it would be done or when. Well, what do you want me for? Well, something has happened. My wife's brother arrived last week from South America, a very wealthy man, and advanced me enough money to pay back the firm and make a fresh start. Well, then go tell Gimpy to call the gunman off. Have you read the morning papers, Mr. Diamond? No. Here, front page. Gimpy was shot to death last night. Oh. Well, oh, it's kind of tough, then, to tell Gimpy to call it off, hmm? I want you to find whoever Gimpy hired and stop him from killing me. Find a man with the only clue to his identity lying dead in a morgue? He could be one of 50 professional killers wandering the streets. One of 50 who would make it tough to be found even if you just wanted the time of the day. Oh, can you find him? I don't know. I can try. You must find him before he kills me. Well, I'll try my best. In the meantime, you stay here and lock yourself in. In this office? Yep, right here. Don't even let your wife know where you are. All right, if, if you think it's necessary. Oh, I think it is. And, uh, <clears throat> by the way, I, I charge a hundred a day in expenses. I guess his brother-in-law had given him enough money for a high-priced private detective because he handed me a hundred dollars and agreed to lock my door and not answer it for anyone but me. I left the office and headed for the Skid Row Bistro where Gimpy had died on the dirty floor. It was called the Black and Red, and the bartender was wearing an apron that looked like he'd been making hash on it. Yeah, Gimpy got killed here. Right over there, the clean spot near the bar. He bled a little. You know who gunned him? What am I answering your questions for? Because I'm asking him. That ain't enough. I got a fetish for living. Hmm. I'm a, I'm a private cop. Well, that's the worst thing you could have said. You better buy a beer or take a walk, huh? I'll buy you don't even have to change the ten bucks. You think I'd tell you something for a lousy ten fish? Yeah. Well, you're wrong. I don't know nothing. You were in here, weren't you? Yeah. On my stomach behind the bar. You saw it start, didn't you? You want me to tell you as much as I know? Unless you want to play another tune. We could dance. Ten bucks for what I know? You don't think it's worth it, huh? Nah. But I seen the ten and it made me greedy. Okay. Here. Live a little. Thanks. Well, Gimpy was standing over there drinking a beer. These two guys come in, and one of them walks up to him. What did they look like? Two guys, big guys, hats, coats with the collars stained up. The whole bit. Looked like just what they was. This one guy started arguing with Gimpy about some money. You hear the conversation? Yeah, something about wanting all the 200. Well, Gimpy gets a little nasty. He was like that, you know, a nasty little guy. Well, the guy gets tired of arguing and pulls a gun. Gimpy tries to climb the bar, and he must have been halfway over when a guy cut him in two. By then, I was flat on my face waiting for mine. But these two guys took off, and I called the cops. Wait to ten. You don't remember what either one of the guys looked like? Nah, I was mine to my help. Mm. Okay, thanks. Uh, hey. Yeah? Uh, I don't know whether it means nothing, but the guy who killed Gimpy was wearing a small red flower in his buttonhole. A red flower like a rosebud. I remember it. <laughs> Funny a guy like that should be wearing a pretty flower. Oh, 
what do you want? Why, Sergeant Otis, you've been taking your ugly pills again. Can't you ever do anything without the department's help? I thought you were supposed to be a big, smart private detective. Well, we all make mistakes. I thought you were supposed to be a gorilla. Oh, you did, huh? Yeah, but gorillas get bigger. Oh. Hello, up. Hello, Rick. What can I do for you? I got a little problem. Your department handled that killing over in the Black and Red Saloon? Skid Row? Yeah. Yeah, a small-time guy named Gimpy got himself blown up. Mm-hmm. Any line on the killer? No, we questioned the bartender who runs the place. He was lying on his face. Couldn't give much of a description. But checking up on Gimpy's friends and associates. The killer wore a small red flower in his buttonhole. Maybe a rose. How do you know? Bartender told me. Thought maybe you knew about it. Well, he didn't tell me. What are you interested in Gimpy for? Uh, he contacted the killer. I've got to find the killer, and I don't know who he is. You think maybe this guy with the flower is your boy? Well, he might be. Bartender said he was arguing with Gimpy about $200. Well, no, he didn't tell me that either. Just said they were arguing. You should have slipped him ten bucks. What do you have to find him for? Client. You got a client who wants you to find a killer? Yeah, and that's all I'm going to tell you. Now, give me what you got on Gimpy and his friends. I don't know why I should. Oh, stop pouting, fatty. I can't tell you anymore. Besides, if I find this killer, you solve the Gimpy killing, don't you? Well, yeah. Well, then let's have it. Okay. Gimpy didn't have many friends. The only sure one we've come up with is a woman named Belle DeCanto. Runs a small dancing school. Have you talked to her? Yeah, but she knows less than the bartender. Here's the address. Walt gave me Belle DeCanto's address, and I went over. It was an old two-story building on the east side with a rickety flight of stairs leading up to the dance studio. Belle DeCanto was sitting at the piano. I stood there smoking a camel, watched one of her young pupils perform a pretty sloppy set of turns. All right, Jeannie, that was fine. Over to the bar. Okay. Hey. Huh? Somebody. Oh, what can I do for you? I want to talk to you, Belle. Twenty bucks for ten lessons. I just want to talk. Why don't you take the lessons, mister? Gives you grace and balance. I look a little silly in tights, dear. Go do your exercises, Jeannie. Okay. But I still think you look great in tights, mister. We could do Swan Lake and things. I bet we could. Talk him into it, Belle. He's real cute. What do you want to talk about? Gimpy. You a cop? Private cop. I entertained the whole 5th Precinct all morning. I'm looking for the guy who killed Gimpy. I told the cops all I know. I don't know who killed Gimpy. Back straight, honey. Okay. I can't help you, mister. You know a man who wears a red flower in his buttonhole? Huh? Do you know a man who wears a red... I'm busy, mister. I got a lesson. Look, Belle. I don't know nothing. Now beat it. Maybe if I bought a course of lessons. I'm full out. Now get out of here. I told you to keep your back straight. Okay, okay. I'm keeping it. Belle... You gonna get out of here or do I call the law? Oh, Belle, what you throwing him out for? You shut up and keep your back straight. Listen, I'm paying good money around here. Get out now, mister. Okay. What you climbing on me for, huh? So what are you yelling? You'll get up there and do your better or bust this cane over your skull. You'll do what? I told your old lady I'd teach you how to dance and I will if I have to cripple you trying. You don't yell at me like that. Bye, you lovely people. Bye, honey. You don't yell at me. I paid my money. Who do you think you are? Who? Get up on that bar! Drop dead! It was pretty obvious my mention of the man with the red flower had set off Belle DeCanto's charming temper. And it was even more obvious that to Belle, the man with the red flower spelled some kind of trouble. The third and most obvious point was that I wouldn't get anything out of Belle even if I dropped her in a pit full of enraged mice. I started down the steps of the dance studio, heading for the street, and I stopped cold. Something on the third step set off little bells in the space in my head reserved for danger. There, on the third step, was a small red rose, and it hadn't been there when I went in. I stopped and thought about it. Maybe the man I wanted was in the building. I looked around... Only one other door besides the studio, and that led to Bell's apartment above. I went up there and looked around. Nothing. Then I got a pretty scary thought. Maybe the man with the red rose had tailed me, 
waited around, listening at the door. If he'd found me, maybe he'd found my client. I spent the next 20 minutes making myself hard to follow, and when I was satisfied no one was tailing me, went back to my office. Alistair. Mr. Alistair. Who is it? Diamond. Open up. Uh, How do I know it's Diamond? Well, you are being cautious. You gave me a hundred dollar retainer. I told you to lock yourself in my office and not to answer to anybody but me. Did you find out anything? Uh, Close it and lock it. Is something wrong? The man who killed Gimpy was wearing a red flower in his buttonhole. I met an old biddy who runs a dancing school, and when I mentioned the flower, she froze up like a clam in a barrel of glue. Who is this man with the flower? I don't know, but before he killed Gimpy, he argued with him about some money. Two hundred dollars. Well, that's the amount I paid Gimpy to hire the assassin. Yeah. I think the man with the flower is probably your killer. When I left the dance studio, I found this. Red Rose? Uh Uh-huh. I think maybe he's tailing me. He knows I came to see you. I don't know. I think he's found out I'm looking for him. Maybe figures I'm trying to catch him for killing Gimpy. Anyway, you're not the only one on the spot now. But what'll we do? If he's looking for me, there's no sense in letting him find you, too. You gotta get out of here. But where? Well, an out of the way hotel I know. Manager's a friend of mine. But what if this killer finds you? That's a good question. I hustled John Alistair out on the fire escape and we climbed down to the floor below just in case our boy with the red rose was waiting outside my office. We climbed into the seventh floor hall, made our way to the service elevator and down to the alley. A half an hour later, I'd deposited Alistair in room number 11 of the Bunker Hill Hotel in charge of the manager, a one-time safecracker named Herman Clip. I'd done a lot of favors for Herman, and he assured me Alistair would be safe and that no one would be allowed to see him unless his name was Diamond and he had the bluest eyes in the private detective business. It was six o'clock by the time I left the hotel, and I kept to the side streets in case the man with the red rose might be close. It was certainly one way of finding him, letting him find me. But I wanted to be ready for it, and I didn't want to be around my client when it happened. I went back to my apartment on 51st Street. Hello, chum. I've been waiting for you. Oh, that's nice. Lonesome? Eh, For a while. You had that nice big gun to keep you company. Sure, sure. Mm. You forgot to wear your rose. You got the wrong boy, Diamond. Drago's busy. Drago? Name won't do you any good. I'm going to kill you. Drago's the boy with the red rose? Turn on the radio. You were the guy with him in the bar when he killed Gimpy. Eh, That's right. Turn on the radio. Okay, okay. Look, uh, tell Drago he doesn't have to kill John Alistair. Alistair says to call it off. The radio, the radio. Oh, sure. Will you tell him? See, I tell him. But I don't think he's going to do any good. You see, he knows Alistair talked to you. We know you've been trying to find him. And we don't want anybody who can pin Gimpy's killing on us. I didn't tell Alistair anything. Sure, sure. Well, you got him hidden out, eh? Eh? We find out. Drago shouldn't have knocked off Gimpy like that, but he, he gets excited. Like running out of the bar before he knocked off the bartender. If we had knocked off the bartender right then, he couldn't have told you nothing. What about the bartender? He's in the river. Turn the radio up. I turned the radio up slowly. My mind working triple time. The guy behind me wanted the music to cover the noise, like a funeral march with a one-gun salute. I heard him get up behind me. All right, turn around. It had to be quick. I turned and gave him the radio right in the face. (laughs) I had twisted his gun right into his stomach. He looked up at me like a kid who was going to bust out crying because somebody had dumped over his blocks. Then he slid down on his face and died without a sound. I put in a fast call to Walt, told him to check his files for a killer named Drago. I told him what had happened and about the bartender who was probably floating on the river. Then I took off for Bel DeCanto's dance studio. The man i just killed had said Drago wasn't going to leave anyone around who might pen the gimpy killing on him. And Drago had left his red rose on the steps outside of Bell's studio. 
When I got there, the big dance hall was dark. So I went up another flight to Bell's apartment. Well, here goes. Bell was there all right, and Drago had been there. He hadn't left a rose, but he left a bullet instead. It was somewhere in Bell DeCanto's heart. Before we continue with Richard Diamond, here is an important question. How mild can a cigarette be? One puff won't tell you. One sniff won't tell you. It takes day in, day out smoking to find out how well a cigarette agrees with your throat. Only camels offer you this day in, day out smoking proof. In a coast-to-coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only camels for 30 days... Noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Make your own camel 30-day test, the one sensible, thorough cigarette test. Smoke only camels for 30 days and let your taste tell you how rich and flavorful camels are, puff after puff, pack after pack. Let your throat tell you how mild camels are, how well camels get along with your throat as a steady smoke. You'll see why people say... Once a camel smoker, always a camel smoker. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. And now, back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Well, here's all the information, Rick. The only man we got on file named Drago is a well-known hood named Tommy Drago. Mm -hmm. Seven arrests, two convictions, assault, and armed robbery. Can you find him all? Well, I put out an APB. Maybe we'll pick him up. You find the bartender? They're dragging the river now. Mm -hmm. The guy in your apartment has been identified as Julio Bassadi, arrested once with Drago, supposed to work together. Yeah. Why did Drago kill Bell DeCanto? Well, probably thought I'd told her something. Now we got to get this boy. He's killed three people in two days. He wants to add two more to his list. Me and my client. Where is your client? Oh, he's staked out in the Bunker Hill Hotel. He's safe. Well, we better pick him up and give him protection. He doesn't want the police brought in. But you can stake out a couple of men near the hotel in case Drago shows up. Right. Look, uh, Walt, if this Drago likes red roses, he must buy them someplace. Yeah? Well, have some men check all the flower shops. Have them circulate the description. The rest of the day and into the evening, the entire precinct turned out to look for Drago. Each man had a photograph, and they toured every flower store in the city, showing the photograph and asking questions. Walt and I even took one section, wore out a lot of pavement and several good inches of shoe leather, trying to find someone who might have been selling the roses to Drago. By six o'clock, we were back in the precinct, discouraged, and as Walt said... Oh, I'm beat. Yeah. You want some coffee? Yeah, yeah, might as well. We took in 12 shops. Here. Yeah. Thanks. Looks like the guy grows his own. Well, maybe he does. Swell, I'll put out a general to pick up every window box and flower pot in the city. We're bound to catch him in 10 or 12 years. Yeah, what do you want, Spikehead? Spikehead? Just thought it up. Oh. Well, did you just want to see if the buzzer works? Uh, no, I got an address on that guy Diamond shot. Julio Bassati? Yeah. Well, do you want us to hold a seance while you give it to us by telepathy? Oh, uh, 456 River Street, apartment 7. And you sure are getting grouchy. Walt and I piled into the squad car and took off for 456 River Street. There was a chance that the man who wore the roses might live with his partner, Julio Bassati. We found the manager... He led us into the apartment, and after 15 minutes of pretty extensive house wrecking, both Walt and I came to the same conclusion. Julio Bassardi lived alone and liked it. We hit the street pretty discouraged. 
Well, come on. Hey, uh, hey, Walt. What is it? Look, that old lady down the street. Well, what about her? She's selling flowers. Oh, oh well, yeah. let's go. That's flowers. Twenty cents a bunch. Flowers, gentlemen. Uh, do you have some red roses? Ah, uh, yes. Single red roses that I could wear in my lapel? Yes, twenty-five cents. Have you ever seen this man? What man? Yeah. Yes, Mr. Drago. I sell him a red rose every evening, fresh. You know where we can find him? Well, what do you want him for? Police. Has Mr. Drago done something? He's wanted for murder. Oh, no, how terrible. He seemed like such a nice man, so generous, he dressed so nicely. He's killed three people. Three people? Do you know where he lives? Three people... Yes, he lives in the next block. I don't know the number. I'll have to show you. Here, I'll take all the flowers you've got. The old flower woman showed us the building, and again we dragged another manager out to let us into Drago's apartment. This time we went in low, ready to shoot if Drago happened to be home. He wasn't. And once again we tore another place apart. Find anything? No, not yet. Get a load of this closet. Drago really dresses. Hey, Walt. Yeah? You find something? Ah, look at this telephone pad. What about it? The writing. Read it. Bunker Hill. Bunker Hill Hotel. That's where my client is. Drago's found him. Well, go check for the men you got staked out and see if they spotted Drago going in. I'll go in and see if my client's all right. Right. Herman. Herman. Oh. Rick. Over here, Walt. Herman is out cold. Herman? Yeah, the manager. Oh, he looks pretty bad. Yeah, he's really out. Drago? Your men see anybody? No, but he could have slipped in. Well, let's get up to my client. Well, come on. I'm looking for the key. What room? Eleven. Well, it's gone. I had my client locked in. Come on. Second floor. Here it is. Alistair. Alistair, it's Diamond. Diamond, Diamond, get me out of here. He's been here, he's got a key. Where is he? He tried to get in, but I had the chain lock on. Then he tried to break it down. I pushed the furniture in front of the door. Get me out, please. Just take it easy, we'll try and break it down. The furniture's still there. Well, get it out of the way. Yes, yes. I don't know where he went. Is there a fire escape? Fire escape? Yes, yes. There's an escape right outside my window. Good heavens, Diamond. Just keep moving the furniture. But... Escape. Just move the furniture. Well, yeah. you stay here. I'm going out on the fire escape. It figured. If Drago couldn't get past the furniture, he'd get in another way. I ran to the end of the hall and out on the escape. I turned the corner of the building and started for my client's room. He's on the escape. He's coming down. I can hear him. Get me out. Get me out. At first, I thought my client had heard just me. But then I saw him. Climbing down from the floor above, a gun in his hand, the polished barrel shining in the moonlight. As he reached the window, Alistair went crazy. He's outside the window! No! No, no, please! I leaned against the building and steadied my arm just as he broke the window. No, no! no, no. You killed him! You killed him, you killed him. Yeah. <laughs> Funny. What was done? Shot him right through his red rose. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. Across the nation, doctors in every branch of medicine have been asked this question. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? Again. The brand named most was Camel. Yes, according to this repeated nationwide survey, 
More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Yes, and camels are the favorite cigarette of many stars whose throats are their fortune. Reza Stevens, Mario Lanza, Martha Tilton are a few of the singing stars who choose camels for mildness. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this week we add a new name to the list of recipients of gift camels for hospitalized servicemen and veterans. It's the Military Air Transport Service, United States Air Force, which evacuates virtually all overseas wounded servicemen. Camels are also on the way to Veterans Hospitals, Lake City, Florida, and Nashville, Tennessee. U.S. Naval Hospital Ship Haven. Now, until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Dick Powell can now be seen starring in the RKO film Cry Danger. Tonight's adventure of Richard Diamond was written by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Our director is Helen Mack. Featured in the cast were Virginia Gregg, Wilms Herbert, and Arthur Q. Bryan. P.A. stands for two things, Pipe Appeal and Prince Albert. They go hand in hand. For Prince Albert's choice tobacco has a rich flavor and a delightful natural aroma. P.A. is crimp cut for smooth, even burning and it's specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. Get Prince Albert, the national joy smoke, America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the FBI. Follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. The makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Other cigarette has Camel's rich, full flavor, the flavor of Camel's costly tobaccos. And no other cigarette gives you this proof of mildness. In a coast-to-coast -coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only Camel's for 30 days, noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking Camel's. Make a note. Think of your throat. Try Camel's. transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Now, in my business, I run into a lot of people, make a few friends, and a lot of enemies. I remember a few weeks ago when one of those friends walked all the way over from 31st Street to tell me about his trouble and leave me a share of it. His name is Angelino Giuseppe, and he runs a butcher shop. Little guy with a big, broad stomach and a smile to match. I met him when I was on the force. He used to stop in and buy some cold cuts or a pound of bacon. I liked his smile, and I always hung around for one of his bad jokes. But when he came into my office that afternoon, pushing his big stomach in front of him, I spotted trouble right away. The smile was gone. Well, well, Angelino. Hello, Mr. Diamond. Haven't seen you in a long time. Come stay. Uh, sto male, sto male. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. Oh, what's the trouble? The pig's knuckles got arthritis? Pig's knuckles. <laughs> That's better now. That's more like my answer. Uh, you always are kidding. You you make it easy to smile. Yeah. I said, Dick. Grazie. All right, Angie, let's have it. What's wrong? 
Well, I'm going to ask you to do something. I can't pay you. Hmm? Uh, we'll talk about it later. Uh, you, you can take it out in a trade. That'll run into a lot of ham hocks, Angelino. But I want to pay you. Hmm. Well, I can always throw a barbecue. Now tell me about it. Well, you see, it's like this. I come to you as a sort of a representative from all the other butcher shops, uh, the, the independent ones. I see. I ain't the only one that's worried. So all the butchers got together last night and decided to do something about it. All of the uh, independent butcher shops? That's right. Hmm? Every week, a couple of guys come around and collect. Now, if we don't pay, we get our shops bust up, and if that ain't enough, we get our heads bust too. Hmm. Look, see? I still got three stitches right here on the top of my head. Hmm. Oh, I see. Well, that's a nice job. Doctor must have used a loom. <laughs> uh, I got this last week when these two guys came for the money. Hmm? I couldn't pay, so one of them hit me with a black jack. Oh, that's too bad. What about the law, Angelino? That'd give you the right kind of protection. Well, we discussed that at the meeting, uh, but we decided it was too dangerous. We've been warned. If we go to the police, we get hurt too bad. Mm -hmm. Well, we all got families, Mr. Diamond. We can't take the chance. Now, have the two men who beat you up been back? No, but they will be. Okay, let's go. Well, we're going someplace? Yep, we are going someplace. You don't know it, Angie, but you just hired yourself a new assistant. I have? You certainly have. Come on, I want you to show me how to carve a locks. Well, that's what happens when your reputation gets around the butcher shops. I'd been telling Angelino what a great detective I was for the past ten years, but I should have known he'd never take my word for it, so I had to prove it. We went out, grabbed a cab, and 15 minutes later, I was standing behind the butcher shop counter. Angelino handed me a white apron. I, I, I don't get it. Why you want to be a butcher? Angie, you want me to get a line on these guys who do the collecting, don't you? Well, sure. Well, I can only think of two ways. I could watch them and not look suspicious. Make like a butcher, or crawl in with the ground round. <laughs> crawl in. Think of what would happen if someone looked down for the price of ground round and caught it staring back at them. <laughs> it's got it stare. That's so funny. <laughs> oh, now, come on, Angie. It wasn't that funny. Well, a big... Oh, oh, oh. Customer. Huh? Nothing like learning firsthand. Let me handle the sale. Well, you think you can? Sure, sure, sure. Here she comes. Oh, uh, good morning, Mrs. Hennessy. Oh, good morning, Mr. Angelino. Well, business must be good. I see you have a new butcher. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, the, this uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Hangtooth. Uh, Mr. Hangtooth. Hangtooth? Good morning, Mrs. Hennessy. Is something I can do for you? Oh, uh, yes. How much is uh, the lamb shoulder today? Which one? What? Uh, look, m maybe you better let me... Uh, uh, relax, Angie. I'll make it. Which shoulder would you like, Mrs. Hennessy? Is there a difference, young man? Oh, yes. You see, this lamb here is really a ram. A ram? That's right. Hurt his shoulder playing against the Cardinals last season. We're also selling his shoulder pads at 21 cents a pound. Mr. Angelino... You'll find him hanging in the back with the spare ribs. Now, uh, Mrs. Hennessy, if you can tell me which shoulder you want, I'll wrap it up and send it off tackle between the liver and the... Well, I never... Of course you haven't. That's the trouble with you people. Here's a nice little ram that played his heart out. And... Oh, by the way, the heart is special today, 11 cents a pound. Angie. She's a gone, huh? Like laundry in a tornado. Now, what do you want to do that for, Mr. Diamond? She was one of my best customers. I wanted to get her out of here. I wanted to get her out in a hurry. Just as she came in, I spotted two guys heading this way. When they saw her, they backed off. Look, they're standing across the street right now. Where, where? Right over there. You see them? In front of the drugstore. Front of the... Aha! Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, that's them. It is? They're the ones that hit me. They're the ones that come around collecting. Oh, well, they're coming again. You better duck. I'll take care of it. Well, listen, please, you be careful. They're pretty rough monkeys. Now go on, Angie, and beat it. They're almost here. All right, all right. I'll be in the back. Okay. A mile, a mile, a mile can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you... Well, good morning, gentlemen. What can I do for you? Hey, where's Angelino? Oh, well, he's out buying some old buffalo. I'm the new assistant. Buffalo? Shut up. Well, tell me, new assistant, when will he be back? 
Well, it's hard to say, gentlemen. These uh, buffalo are in Wyoming. Oh, yeah? Carl, I think this guy's trying to be funny. You, my friend, win yourself a lamb chop. How do you have it, with or without the bloomers? Hey, you know some right? I think you're right. Hey, what's your name, laughing boy? Hangtooth. Hangtooth? Oh, I'm going to have more fun with that. Blows everybody. Well, look, Hangtooth, you know who we are? How many guesses? You won't need even one. We're in a hurry. We're collectors. Oh, wow. We put all the scraps out and back in a can. You can't miss it. I don't like you. Well, I have a friend. Maybe we could double date. Look, let's stop the clowning. If Angelina didn't tell you about us, it's going to be too bad for you. We're for some money. We get every week 25 bucks. Yeah, last week Angelino didn't have it, so he accidentally hit his head. We figured that all that blood would make him remember it this week. Well, I'm a sorry, friend, but Angie didn't say anything about it. Tell me, what does he pay you boys for? Oh, little things. Protection, mostly. You see, if he paid us last week, he wouldn't have hit his head. Hmm. You know something? I know a big, fat cop who would just love to hear all about this protection Angie's paying you for. You do, huh? Yeah, I do, huh? Well, look, seeing as how you're a new boy around here, maybe we ought to tell you first. Why don't you do that? Yeah, let's go in the back. I like it here. I listen better. Oh, you do, huh? Is that all you guys can say? Now get out from behind that counter. I want to explain the thing to you. Yeah. Go on, Red. Explain it to Mr. Hangtooth. Hangtooth. Uh, you'll have to pardon him. He don't hear so well. How's your hearing, Hangtooth? Depends on what I'm listening to. Well, listen to this real good. Seeing as how you're working for Angelino, you're going to need protection, too. So let's have the 25 bucks. I want to know what I'm buying. Oh, sure. <laughs> Hey, a rough one. Yeah, you bleed. Yeah, want to get rough, huh? Hang tooth. Hey, you're liable to kill him. Yeah, I'll let him alone. Hey, we better get out of here. Yeah, we'll come back for Angelino later. <laughs> Well, you really can't blame brave little old me for going to sleep at that point. One, I could have handled. But in that cramped space behind the counter, with both of them coming from different directions, I had to give it up sooner or later. And I did for about 20 minutes. When I finally snapped out of it, I looked up and saw three heads staring down at me. Two herring with Angelino in the middle. Uh, Mr. Diamond, you're right. Oh, lovely. Here, let me help you get up. Swell. Now, uh, look for my eyes, will you, Andy? I didn't know what to do. I guess I should have called the police. Oh, oh find time to tell me. Mm. <sighs> Let me sit down. Now, when I thought about calling the police, I also thought about my family. Those two men might beat up my family just like this. Yeah, I, uh, I guess you're right. Mr. Diamond, please, you better forget about this. It's uh, too dangerous. When they come back, I'll pay them the money and nobody gets hurt. Look, Angie, I can understand why you're scared. Those two headhunters aren't kidding, but you can't let them get away with it. I can and I will. I ain't taking no more chances. First they bust up my shop, and then they bust up me, and now you. No thanks. I got enough. Okay, Angie, but not me. What are you going to do? Well, I got a sore face and a nasty disposition. I won't get back to normal until I find those two guys and tie their necks in a bow. I left Angelino's shop and headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station. I wanted to look up two sure bets for the police gallery. One named Carl and the other Red. Two guys who went around scaring poor little businessmen like Angelino. By the time I reached the station, the aches from the beating were making me very unhappy... And when I walked into the squad room, I spotted something that didn't make things any better. Yeah, what are you... Holy cow, Diamond. Well, Sergeant Otis, I'm glad you noticed. Means I put myself together all right. What happened to you? Uh, don't be silly. I always bleed just before lunch. Well, how did it happen? It wasn't easy. Is the lieutenant in? 
Sure, go ahead. Well, thanks. Say, uh, Otis, when are you going to start shaving in the morning? Why? What's wrong? Your five o'clock shadow is four hours fast. Oh. Hiya, Walt. Wow. What hit you? Well, the bruises show up. I come on in Technicolor. Someone sure did a good job. Yeah. That someone is two guys, Walt. One named Red and the other Carl. Red and Carl. Yeah. I got closest to Red. Name matches the hair. Busted nose. About 190. Very nasty with a sap. And Carl? Dark. Greasy. Well-dressed, if you like the type. Big boy with a scar under his uh, right eye. I gave Walt the complete descriptions and briefed him on what had happened in Angelino's shop. We went down to the mug file and started going through pictures. Twenty minutes and eight dozen charming photographs later, I found what I was looking for. I showed them to Walt, and he said, Now, oh, you don't? Yeah, Carl Tate and Red Dillon. Here's the package. Dozen arrests, half a dozen convictions between them. Hmm, very impressive. A couple of muscle men. What do they go after you for? I've been pulling a protection racket on some of the independent butcher shops. Who do they work for? Uh, he used to work for Jack Arno before he got sent up. I know they're not working this setup alone. It's too big. No, they wouldn't be. Hey, Tiny Easter's in town. Tiny Easter? Oh, used to be Arno's right-hand boy. That's right. Came in about a month ago. I'd love to get something on him. Nobody's ever been able to nail him. Well, it adds up. Easter worked for Arno, and so did Carl Tate and Red Dillon. Oh, well, we can't pick him up just because two of his boys worked you over. He'd just say they weren't his boys. I don't want him picked up. I want Carl and Red. If Easter goes along with the deal, you could have him. What are you going to do? Get cleaned up and pay Mr. Tiny Easter a visit. What's his address? He's got an office on East 48th Street, 804. Thanks, Walt. Tiny's a bad boy. I'll take along my 38 just in case I have to spank him. I left Walt, went back to my office, took a clean shirt out of the closet, and washed up. Locked up again, went down to the street. I grabbed a cab, and 20 minutes later, I was standing in the reception room of Tiny Easter's office. A big guy with a bulge under his arm was trying to be as unreceptive as possible. So you want to see Easter? You have an appointment? No, I haven't got an appointment. Now tell Easter I'm out here. What's your name? Oh, you're going to get hung up on this. What do you mean? The name's Hangtooth. What? I see. Now make like an office boy and tell Easter I got a message for him from Carl and Red. You're a pretty fresh guy, aren't you? Yeah, and I'm going to spoil if I have to stand around much longer. You can spoil rotten for all I care. You're not going to see Easter. He's busy. Okay. You know, you get so excited, you'll ruin your stomach someday. Oh, I don't think so. You don't, huh? <coughs> Skeptic. What do you want? I'm collecting scalps. How'd you get by a lefty? Well, he's tied up with a stomach ache, swallowed a fist. Okay, so you got muscles. Also, you got a pushed-in face. Lefty do that? Carl Tate and his blood brother, Red. Oh? What you come to me for? They're working for you, aren't they? You smell like a cop. Name's Hangtooth. I doubt it. And good for you. I'd hate to go through that again. I'm a private cop. Well, now, nah, good for you. I was in a butcher shop when your two boys wandered in and started playing squash with me. I don't like to get pushed around, Easter, and I don't like your racket. I want Carl and Red, and if I get you along with them, the state will hang a medal on me. Looks like you got nothing to lose. Well, look at it any way you like. Now, what about your two playmates? I don't know what you're talking about, Shamus. Never heard of those two guys. I don't think you understand, Tiny. I'm pretty mad. I'm going to find these two guys, and I'm going to do it even if I have to be unpleasant with you. Just what do you mean by unpleasant, Mr. Hangtooth? You break a leg, that's unpleasant. Ow! Don't try to pull a gun on me. You busted my hand. Take your foot off. Drop the gun in the drawer. Okay. Oh, my hand's busted. Now take the hand out. Empty. Oh... Now, let me explain it again. If you go out and shoot 12 people tomorrow, I'm going to be sore about it. But when you start intimidating a bunch of hard-working little guys and their families, I go off like a skyrocket. And then when a couple of your cheap gunsels push me around, I explode. I tell you, I don't know these guys. Oh. Look, Easter, please believe me. I don't know them. You work with them in Chicago. Ah. 
I'm telling you the truth, Easter. I'll work you over till you look like an eggplant in a subway. Look, whatever your name is, I got boys. They'll take care of you. Who's going to tell them to do it? I am. With your jaw broken? Ooh. Now, where do I find Carl and Red? Oh, you knock all my teeth loose. I got 31 to go. <laughs> I guess you really don't understand. Yes, yes, I understand. Ooh. Now, where are they? You still need some encouragement? No. No, in the warehouse by the 14th Street docks. What warehouse? Rogers and Sons. Big sign on the top. You mind if I use your phone? Go ahead. Don't you know it's not polite to listen, Easter? Well, what do you want me to do? Go to sleep. No! Before we continue with Richard Diamond, here are a few words about smoking enjoyment. More people smoke camels than any other cigarette. That's right. More people smoke camels than any other cigarette. Behind camels' great popularity are the two things that mean steady smoking enjoyment. Flavor and mildness. No other cigarette has the rich, full flavor of Camel's costly tobaccos, tobaccos that are properly aged and expertly blended. And no other cigarette gives you this proof of mildness. In a coast-to-coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only Camel's for 30 days, noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking Camel's. Make your own Camel 30-day test. The sensible test, based not on a puff or a sniff, but on day-in, day-out smoking. You'll see how flavorful camels are and how well camels get along with your throat, pack after pack. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. And now, back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. I put in a call to Walt and told him what had happened. He said he'd send a couple of men down to pick up Easter and agreed to meet me at the warehouse. It was getting late in the afternoon when my cab pulled up near the river and I got out. A cold breeze was kicking up little patches of white on the water and the light fog was moving in from the Atlantic as I started down toward a big building with a sign on the top that read, Rogers and Sons Importing. The place was boarded up, but a window in the basement showed signs of recent use, so I jimmied it open and dropped down on the dark, cold pavement. I held my breath and listened. The place was as quiet as a tomb. So I moved across the room until I found a flight of stairs and went up to the main floor. I opened the door and listened again. Hey, it sure is getting cold in here. Yeah. How long are we going to have to stay here? Till Easter tells us to leave. Now relax. It was Carl and Red, all right. They were somewhere in the warehouse, so I kept on my toes and moved as quietly as possible toward the voices. You want to play some cards or something? Yeah, it's okay with me. I don't know why we got to hide out like this. Because Easter said to, that's why. We gotta stay cool till he finds out about that guy we worked over this morning. Hag to? Yeah. Might have been a cop. So what? We worked cops over before. I'm cold. Look, just steal the cards. Uh, yeah. What? He did, huh? Hey. Hey, what's the matter? Boss! Hey! What's the matter? I know, that was Easter. The guy we worked over was in his office, tied him up. He got loose, but the guy's headed down here. Hack to? Yeah. Just as Easter was going to say what to do, sound like he got in a fight. The cops. Yeah. I think we better get out of here. Afternoon, boy. Huh? Hack to? Hang to. Come back here, Carl. Uh, Help me. You shouldn't have pulled a gun, Red. Since when do you butchers carry rods? Since we get pushed around by guys like you. You're the doctor. I'm shot bad. I can't take it back. They'll all be here in a minute. You, you're a lousy butcher. I hope Carl pays you good. I'll see that he gets the chance to try. 
I left Red lying on his face and ran toward the front of the building. The only way out was that window in the back, and Carl was sure to be hiding somewhere in the dark, hoping to get around me and head for the basement. There were a dozen places to hide in that warehouse, but I had one advantage. He couldn't see me any better than I could see him. I stopped and listened. Come on, Carl. Red's hurt pretty bad, and the law's on the way. You gotta get me before you can get out of here. Carl! Come on, Carl, give it up! You're stuck and you know it! Carl! I had his position pretty well spotted. By his gun flashes, I could tell he was edging his way toward another large pile of packing cases. I moved off to my left, still keeping his approximate position in line with my gun barrel. It was my idea to circle him, but something changed my mind. A metal ladder stretched down from the ceiling and led up to a catwalk overhead. I went up, one rung at a time, half turned to keep Carl in line in case he made a break. After what seemed like hours, I reached the catwalk and started crawling on my hands and knees toward Carl's position. I was nearly over him when I heard the door open. Rick! Lieutenant? Yeah? Here's one of them. He shot up pretty bad. Rick! Come on, Otis. Maybe he's up that way. I couldn't answer him, and he was heading right for Carl. I kept looking down, hoping Carl would show himself. Walt got nearer, and I held my breath. Just then, Carl stepped out and aimed his gun at him. I beat him to it. Ah! Ah! Lieutenant, shut up. It's okay, Walt. I got him. Where are you? I'm up here on the... Oh. There, there he is, up there. Rick. Good grief. Yeah, good grief. Get Otis out of here, will you? <laughs> What's so funny, Lieutenant? If you knew Otis, you could rib Diamond for the rest of his life. <laughs> yeah? Walt. <laughs> come on, tell me what it is. Walt? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Get out of here, Otis. Oh, Lieutenant. You heard him, Otis, now beat it. Yeah, go on, Otis. Oh, chill. Won't you even... No, he won't. Now you beat it. <laughs> it's real funny, isn't it? <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> I just saved your life and you stand down there and you... Oh. <laughs> well, don't look down. Get the fire department. Don't you ever think about these things before you start climbing ladders? Well, it was the only way I could get the position to shoot. I just didn't think. <laughs> For a guy who can't stand high places. Walt. <laughs> well, it's your own fault. Fault, Smalt. Get me down. I'm getting dizzy. <laughs> it's only about 50 feet to the floor. Walt. Great big boy like you. If you don't get the fire department. Okay. <laughs> oh, you big fat ox. I hate you. <laughs> Dick Powell will return in just a minute. According to a repeated nationwide survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Again, doctors in every branch of medicine, doctors in all parts of the country have been asked what cigarette they smoke. Again, the brand name most was camel. Friends, make the sensible cigarette test. Smoke only camels for 30 days, and you'll see why so many people say, once a camel smoker, always a camel smoker. And remember, your best buy is camels by the carton. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Take the camel 30-day test, and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, many men who have served valiantly in our armed forces are hospitalized. And as a tribute, the makers of camels send them gift cigarettes to hospitals in the country and overseas. This week's camels go to Veterans Hospitals Dallas, Texas and Phoenix, Arizona. 
U.S. Naval Hospital, Pensacola, Florida, and to all hospitals operated by the European Command of the U.S. Army. Now, until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. be seen starring in the RKO film Cry Danger. Tonight's adventure of Richard Diamond was written by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Our director is Helen Mack. Featured in the cast were Virginia Gregg, Wilms Herbert, and Arthur Q. Bryan. Men, whether you buy the handy pocket tin or the big one-pound tin of Prince Albert, you're in for real smoking joy. P.A.'s Choice Tobacco has a rich taste and delightful natural aroma. It's specially treated to ensure against tongue bite, and it's crimp cut for smooth, even, cool smoking. Get Prince Albert, the National Joy Smoke, America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. When it's December and the winter has caught hold, Broadway comes up with a miracle. Silver trees grow out of the sidewalks. Men with beards and red velvet suits suddenly appear from out of the Bowery and dedicate themselves to being jolly. And reindeer roam the tundra of the spectaculars. It's a time of Crosby records, noses against department store windows, and wishing you'd kept up the Christmas club payments. Everybody's happy. Even the finance company sends you season's greetings. The atmosphere hadn't touched the alley, littered and dark, except for a stark cone from a flashlight held by a policeman. Up here, Danny. Shot twice in the back. Still breathing. Come on. Come on, Doc. Take a look, Doc. Let's put him on the stretcher. I don't think this one's got much time. Give me a hand here. Yeah. Easy. We have him in the hospital in five minutes. Know who he is, Mugglin? Yeah. His wallet says Ben Justin. Here it is. The ideas of what happened? I think he knows who shot him, Danny. He was saying he'll get even. Any names? Uh, no. Easy with him now. Just slide the stretcher in here. We'll ride with him. Let's go, Muggerman. Yeah. Okay, Joe, let's get this ambulance on the road. Kill him. Kill him with my back. Who are you going to kill, Ben? Watch it, Danny. Flat him uh, here, hold the bottle up like this. Yeah. Is it all right if I talk to him? You better hurry. Who shot you, Ben? Can you hear me, Ben? Ben. Wait a second. Hey, Joe, you can take it easy. Take your time. He's dead, Danny. Then the slow ride through swarming avenues, the slow tolling of the ambulance bell, because the rhythm of death is slow. Through the windows of the moving car, the procession of fleeting faces, of melting forms scurrying from the bitter touch of an unknown wind. Then suddenly, at a stop, because death in the city must wait its turn, the face peering in, avid for a furtive glimpse of pain, seeing only the shroud-covered man, turning away in regret. The ambulance moves again, and within it, silence. 
because there are no more questions that can be asked of the dead. At headquarters, the setting up of a file on Ben Justin. The word murdered, neatly typed in triplicate, then the fragments of his life drifting in to be pieced together, to be entered under the correct heading, on the correct line. Ben Justin lived in an apartment on West 86th. He was married to a woman named Evelyn. Go there. Ask her the question the dying man wouldn't answer. Ben didn't tell you? He was bleeding to death and he wouldn't tell you who killed him? No, Miss Justin. I like him for that. For a lot of other reasons, but this one's the best. Then you will want to help us find his murderer. No, uh-uh, that's your job. That's what you get paid for. They shot him down in an alley. Sorry, that... but that's how I feel about things. You get what you work for in this world. No one can do it for you. You want Ben's killer? Find him. That way he'll belong to you, just you. If you know something, Mrs. Justin, we can hold you. Now, wherever did you get an idea like that? How would I know who killed Ben? It's his secret. He's taking it to his grave with him. Maybe I didn't tell you. Ben's last words were that he would kill him with his bare hands. Ben can't do that now, can he? But you can do something, Mrs. Justin. You can tell me about Ben. You can tell me who wanted him dead. Tell you about Ben? That could take my lifetime. But I'll brief it down for you. Ben did good by me. Dressed me in fancy clothes, showy. Showed me off to his friends. Didn't mind if one made a play for me. Grinned it off. Grinned about it when we got home. Cuffed me a little, and we go to sleep laughing. That's about Ben. Doesn't help us much. Then try this. Ben used to work for the Imperial Insurance Company, an investigator. Go ask them about Ben. I bet those insurance people knew more about him than even his wife knew. It's their business. Imperial Insurance? On Lower Broadway. You can excuse yourself now, Mr. Clover. I want to go over my wardrobe, pick out a black dress for Ben's funeral. Silk... Yeah, Silk. He liked me in it. Uh, Yeah, it's very intriguing what you tell me, Mr. Clover. Look, why don't we go downstairs and chat about it over a cup of coffee? hmm? No, Mr. Cogan. Oh, You don't understand, kid. I haven't had my breakfast. How can I do my best for Imperial Insurance without something hot in my stomach? We're trying to find out who killed the man. For this, I have to miss my breakfast? I tell you, you don't understand. My wife sleeps in the morning. She doesn't make me... Ben Justin used to work for you. I want you to give me what you know about him. Now. Because it won't wait. On an empty stomach? All right. All right. Yeah, he worked for us. One of our hottest cases... You're a gully kissed us goodbye. You don't know anything about him after that. You're just... Uh... Look, kid, did I say that? I know a lot about Ben. Let me open my mouth a little, huh? It's open. A year ago, we put Ben on the Colton murder case. Remember it? Who doesn't? Mrs. Colton found murdered, shot to death in her house on Long Island. That one cost us, uh, the company, hundred grand. The police were handling it. Why did you put a private investigator on it? Oh, don't let it bother you. Justin flopped, too. He said he couldn't find a thing to prove that Mrs. Colton's nephew and his wife committed the mayhem. Remember Johnny and Dottie Reed? The lovable kids that all of us thought were the murderers. The state, us, till they were acquitted. No evidence, not even from our own boy, Ben. And after that, Ben quit. How did you know? Oh, I told you, yeah. He turned in a memo that we should pay the kids the hundred grand insurance the aunt left the boy. Shook hands all around, resigned. Then right away we find out he was making merry with the Reed kids. All over town, in their home. How do you know that? It was a password in our office, how Ben and his wife were always in the company of the kids. Why? The kids were acquitted? They have the right to make their own friends? For a hundred grand, we keep trying. (sighs) Do I get coffee now? Yeah. Yeah, Here's a dime. Let it be on me. Hello. What can I do for you? My name's Danny Clover from the police. Yeah. Is your name Reed? Yeah, that's right. I wanted... You've uh... got to look in your eyes. You want to talk to me, don't you? Come on in. And here. I know that look, Mr. Clover. The police and I have been chummy me before. Is your wife here? Vacuuming the rugs in the dining room. Daddy! Hey, Daddy! Yeah, what do you want? 
on, Johnny. Turn off the load and come in here. We got a caller. I hope you don't mind the way Dottie looks. <laughs> Holiday cleaning. What'd you say? Oh. Uh, this is Danny Clover, Dottie. He's from the police. I'll be honest with you, Mr. Clover. I'm busy. Well, just a few questions about Ben Justin. <laughs> Guess I'm right, Dottie, huh? Soon as I saw this morning's paper, I told you a policeman would be twirling his hat at the door. Then you talk to him, Johnny. I've got to get my work done. I'm afraid you'll have to hold it off for about five minutes, Miss Reed. Do you have a warrant? I don't need one. All I uh, want... <laughs> Dottie gets all mixed up. Ever since the cops scared her to death last year, well, she just could be lost, and the only person around, a cop, and she wouldn't ask him which way was home. Johnny isn't kidding. Cops. How well did you two know Ben Justin? We're not going to his funeral. Not even flowers, Mr. Clover. Funny. I heard you were pretty good friends. Two weeks ago, Johnny and I took turns yawning in his face. He still wouldn't go home. Then he used to drop in here often. Mm, maybe a couple times a month. <laughs> when I shook his hand after we were acquitted, he took that to mean buddy. He couldn't get through his head out of shaking anybody's hand. Ben now. Justin tried to send you to the chair. I don't understand. Neither did we. You inherited a lot of money when your aunt was killed, didn't you, Mr. Reed? You people can't leave us alone, can you? Hey, you shouldn't have asked that, Mr. Clover. Dottie's going to be upset all day. It's going to be like this for the rest of our lives. Dottie. No matter what we do, where we go, it's going to be the same way. Get him out of here, Johnny. Get him out of here. You heard him, Mr. Clover. You better get out. Dottie's busy. <laughs> If I turn on the radiator, Danny, it's cold in here. Huh? How can you stand it? There. Danny, you've been over and over the transcript of a year old trial maybe a hundred times. You want something juicy to read? Here, try this pulp. It's good, huh? Tells me the thrilling things detectives have happened to them. For two bits, it thrills even me. The things that go on. Mrs. Colton was killed with Johnny Reed's gun. Our ballistics man proved it. Brought it in evidence. Exhibit A. But no fingerprints. No fingerprints. And if you read the transcript another hundred times, there still won't be any. What are you trying to build, It Danny? bothers me. You mind, Muggervin? Danny, listen to me. The kid had a right to the gun. Messenger boy for a brokerage house. Briefcases full of stocks and bonds. Sometimes even money. A boy needs a gun in a career like that. They present him with it, courtesy of the house. And it killed his aunt, endowed two kids with $100,000. The gun could have been stolen from him, just like he said. His wife put her arms around him. He felt different somehow to her without the gun. That was the first they knew it was missing, just like they said in court. Yeah. I don't understand what you're after, Danny. The kids were acquitted. I know. They said they spent the day picnicking on the Jersey Palisades. Nobody could prove different. Nobody could prove they were at the murder house that day. They were acquitted. I told you I know, Muggerman. Then what's with you? You think you found a free and easy way to solve Ben Justin's murder? I take it back, Danny. I, uh, I didn't mean to say that. Why so chummy with the Reed kids? You mean Justin and his wife? You care about anyone else? Justin was a top insurance investigator. He couldn't find a thing to prove that the kids were anywhere else but eating ham and cheese sandwiches on the Palisades. That cinched it. When an insurance company... Danny, you gotta go. You just gotta. Here, I brought your overcoat. I'll help you into it. It's not too much, Tartaglia. Where am I going? To the residence of one Mrs. Evelyn Justin. She just phoned in, Danny. She was crying, then screaming. In between said cries and screams was sandwiched that someone was trying to kill her. I made her go slow so I could take her down in shorthand. Here, Danny. Her very words. Yeah. Get your coat, Muggerman. It's a cold ride. Down this hall, Muggerman. Come on. Right behind you. Wish I'd taken that call. Sounds real quiet in there. Locked, huh, Danny? Lean on the bell, Muggerman. Yeah. Danny! Danny, something happened. Take it in. <laughs> Mrs. Justin! Watch it, Danny. The place is a furnace. Mrs. Justin! Danny, you can't go in there. Don't be crazy. Yeah. I don't understand. What happened? We ring the bell, we blow the place up.
You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. There should be plenty of action on CBS Hopalong Cassidy show tomorrow night. Hoppy will be invading the land of the Gunhawks, and though this may not sound full of action at first, he'll finally play dead to capture a band of vicious marauders. Hopalong Cassidy, starring Bill Boyd, comes your way every Saturday evening on most of these same CBS stations. Join him in the land of Gunhawks tomorrow night. On the eve of the holiday, Broadway opens wide its loudspeakers, takes last year's tinsel off a back shelf, considers its tarnish, shrugs and hangs it in a doorway, in a shop window. Just above the summer resort sports shirt sprinkled with artificial snow and decked with dust-covered holly. It makes glints in the winter's sun, sways gently in the winter's wind, and it makes you all warm inside, doesn't it, kid? The warm-eyed women walking by, hugging the warm fur close to them, makes you merry, and the music floating out of the metallic throats. Good, huh, kid? But turn it up. That way you won't hear the dissonance of death. That way it won't intrude that explosion uptown. Anyone killed? No one knows yet, but when they do, it'll be given to you. Hot off the presses, shining from the Translux, gift-wrapped with red ribbons. But before that happens, they've got to clear away the charred litter, hold the crowds back, assure the lady her kid wasn't in there. You don't know where he is. And then finally a man comes up to you. It's all clear now, Danny. We can go in. They find anything? Uh-huh. They said in the kitchen. They said to watch ourselves. The walls are still smoldering. Okay, let's go, my Yeah. He said in the kitchen. Uh-huh. Watch it, Danny. Doe, don't look any Come different. on. Not much left, is it, Danny? You were here before. Not much left, huh? Broken. Up in smoke. Hey. Yeah. Mrs. Justin? Yep. Explosion must have done it, huh, Danny? The way she... The way... She was beaten up first. Slugged. See? Here. Mm -hmm. Here? Yeah. They made sure, huh, Danny? If we hadn't rung the doorbell, maybe they... Call it in, Muggerman. To homicide. I come bearing gifts from the boys in technical to you. You thank them for me, Gino. Goes without saying. Christmas is coming, Danny. Courtesy is the motto of the season. A fellow has Goes to... Goes without win. saying. What have you got? Gift number one. You are confirmed in your deduction that Mrs. Justin was slugged, left unconscious to... To, uh... Well, you were there, Danny. I don't have to spell it out for you. No, Gino. For this pearl, my thanks. This, a poet once Pertaglia. said... Pertaglia. Yeah, Danny. Gift number two. The doorbell was rigged to a booby trap of a type commonly used in the last... Hmm, Last. What am I saying? Ring the doorbell and boom, blast, poof. It was that professional. To the contrary, wise is Mr. Gordon from Technical. He says it was a clumsy imitation. Gordon didn't like it, huh? He sniffed his nose at it. However, in the matter of an inferno machine, what matters clumsy, huh, Danny? Anything else? Nothing else. Except an itching in my brain. Huh? Yeah. I am making out my Christmas list, and it itches me. What to give Mike Shrek, the bald-headed miracle detective from Philadelphia, for Christmas? Ah, the joy he has brought me. I should return it with a likewise. You... you got a suggestion, Danny? Only a question, Gino. How did you know it was Mrs. Justin you talked to on the phone? Well, she told me, Danny. Several times she told me. Well, what reason would I have to disbelieve what a lady tells me? You're trying to make out I'm a gulliver, Danny? You know... Pardon me, Gina. Likewise, I'm sure. When they tell you their name, see if you... Danny can... Clover speaking. Now, this is Swifty Crenshaw of the 34th Street Post Office, Mr. Clover. They referred me to you. Why? Oh, because I'm holding some undelivered mail for Mrs. Evelyn Justin. Bet you'd love to get your hands on it. Yeah, I would. Fine. Just ask for Swifty Crenshaw. Everybody knows me. Bye now. Who was it, Danny? A Swifty Crenshaw from the post office. Swift... Cren? See? See how you two can be a gulliver, Danny? (laughs) 
You Mr. Crenshaw? Uh, you bet. My name's Clover. I spoke to you on the phone a little while ago. You bet. Just wait here. Hey. Here you are. The mail addressed to Mrs. Ben Justin. Uh-huh. Uh, there's not much there. Circulars, a few Christmas cards from people who heed our message to mail early. One there that's sealed and the center tried to mail a third class. Postage due on that one, but I guess we can forget it, huh? Uh, I can save you trouble turning over that postcard. It's for a free grease job with 15 gallons of gas. Uh, that other is for a book overdue at the library. You've been having yourself a time, haven't you, Mr. Crenshaw? Hey, you bet. What's in this envelope? How do I know? Hey, it's no use holding an envelope like that up to the light. It's Manila. It's postmarked yesterday. Addressed to Mrs. Ben Justin. The old box 626, 34th Street Station, New York, New York. Return address. The same. She addressed it to herself? Uh, what's in it? You bet, Mr. Crenshaw. Hold on, please. Mr. Jasper is looking up the records now. Okay, okay. Tell him to hurry. Mr. Jasper will speak to you. Good. Mr. Jasper on the phone. What about it, Jasper? You say you have a carbon copy of a subscription form for today's Lady Magazine? Where did you get it? In an envelope. Come on, your girl said you were looking it up, Jasper. The form is used by your company, signed with the initials D.F. Who is D.F.? Donald Fraser. He would have gotten 400 points if he'd handed the subscription in. But why didn't he? Where does Donald Fraser live? 19 West 16th. He's a pretty good... Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> You better come along, Muggerman. Right. You ring the bell this time, Danny. No, I'll ring it. I read someplace if you crash in an airplane, the first thing to do is to go up in another one. No, you ring the bell, Danny. Thanks. What do you want? You, Donald Fraser? So, what do you want? We're from the police. Didn't you hear, Donald? We're from the police. Let's go inside. Sit down, Donald. You want a cigarette, Donald? I don't smoke. You drink? No, I can't stand the taste. He's got refined taste, Danny. You signed this magazine subscription form, didn't you? Or didn't you? I don't know. You know. You know, don't you? I signed it. All right. You took a magazine subscription on November 2nd, 1949. That's the date on this form. It's also the date Mrs. Colton was shot to death. So, what's that got to do with anything? It's got this to do with it. It's a magazine subscription for Mrs. Colton. You took the subscription. Who signed it? I'll tell you. You're not kidding. Let him alone, Margaret. I, uh, I came by Mrs. Colton's that morning selling subscriptions. Mrs. Colton said to come back later. She wanted time to make up her mind. When you came back, Johnny Reed was there with his wife. I said, leave him alone. Yeah, that's right. They were there that day. The girl yelled up to her aunt that I'd come back. Mrs. Colton said to take the subscription. The girl signed for her. That does it, Danny. Not quite. Donald, then, uh, then Ben Justin got to you, didn't he? He was investigating the murder and tracked down a lead that a magazine salesman was on the Colton block that day. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, the very next day. Before I had a chance to turn in the form in to Mr. Jasper. I, I, I shouldn't have done it. I know I shouldn't have done it. For a thousand dollars, the trouble I'm in. I didn't mean to do anything. He talked me into it. Oh, it's you. What do you want? Let's go inside, Mrs. Reed. Remember how busy I was yesterday? I'm busier today. That's too bad. I want to talk to you, and I want to talk to your husband. All right, come in. I've got an idea Johnny's going to throw you right out, and I want to watch. Johnny! Johnny! Yeah? Look who's here, Johnny. Huh? Oh. Hiya, Mr. Clover. Can I get you something? I just broke out a quart of beer. No, thanks. I want to talk to you alone. Ah, sure, sure, my pleasure. Uh, go make us some coffee, Daddy. I told him you were going to throw him out, Johnny. You're making a liar out of me. Just get the coffee, Daddy. Then you'll throw him out? 
If he annoys me. All right, Johnny. Now, what's a good word, Mr. Clover? What have you been doing with yourself lately, Johnny? Oh, this and that. I got enough money. I'm lucky with the horses. The money gets used up and replenished. I envy you. Yeah, I got a sister. That's fine. I'm glad to hear of it. Is this what you come all the way out here to talk to me about? You impressed me the last time I talked to you. <laughs> you kidding? No, I'm not. Say, uh, you think Dottie needs any help with the coffee? Yeah, probably. She's all thumbs. But she doesn't like you, Mr. Clover. Uh, maybe if I help her with the coffee. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you do that? Help her with the coffee. Uh, mine's with cream, Mr. Clover. Two sugars. What do you want? I just came in to tell you to get your hat and coat. That sounds familiar. That's right. You're under arrest. <laughs> hey, you're doing all right, Mr. Clover. You're under arrest for murder. Let me tell you why it sounds familiar, Mr. Clover. Because it's happened before. What happened before? A year ago, when Johnny and I were arrested for the murder of his aunt, the police separated Johnny and me. Then one cop came to me and said Johnny confessed. That way I was supposed to break down. They did the same thing to Johnny. <laughs> oh, as a policeman, you're a real nothing, Mr. Clover. A real nothing. <laughs> hey, let me laugh with you, huh? Uh, say, you remember what they tried on us before, Johnny, trying to make us confess? Well, your friend Clover just tried it again. <laughs> oh, Clover, Clover. All right, you had your fun. Don't you think you ought to go home now? I haven't had my coffee yet. Daddy makes such lousy coffee. It really isn't worth it. You know, I don't understand you. Throw him out, Johnny. That's what I mean. I came here to give you something for Christmas. Maybe I'm a little early. Maybe I should come back. If you're giving, we're receiving. What do you got? This. The magazine subscription form that your wife signed last year in your aunt's house. Where'd you get it? From Mrs. Justin's post office box at 34th Street Station. You got it figured, huh, Mr. Clover? Sure. It's proof that the two of you were at Ms. Colton's the day she was murdered. The piece of evidence the D.A. didn't have at your trial. Johnny, they can't try us again, can they? You, uh, planning to reopen the trial with new evidence, Danny? It won't be necessary. Justin bought this subscription form from the salesman. He was blackmailing you with it. Then a little while ago, he got afraid of you two, passed it on to his wife. That's where she had it, huh? That's where she mailed it for safekeeping after you killed her husband. You thought you destroyed it when your wife called headquarters and had me set off that booby trap. And now you've got it. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Danny. How much you want? How much were you paying Justin before you killed him? Don't bargain. How much? All of it. Everything you got. I want you to sign a confession, you and your wife. Let me sit down and think about it. Serve the coffee, Daddy. You gonna stir it with that gun? No. I'm gonna kill you with the gun. You want one slug or two? Johnny! Hey! Hey! Ah! Oh! This will put you out of your misery, Johnny! You can have half of it, Mr. Clover. All of it. You can have anything you want. I've got what I want. Let's get your coat, Mrs. Reed. In the midnight cold, Broadway echoes with sounds you hear only in darkness. The fleeting whispers that speckle places where there's no sun. People pass and touch you. You look down, and there are fingers of dust on your shoulder. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Anthony Barrett, Sam Edwards, Virginia Gregg, Michael Ann Barrett, Sidney Miller, and Jack Crucian. Now, here's Larry Thor. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's program concludes the present series of Broadway's My Beat. 
We thank you for listening and hope to return to the air in the near future when Danny Clover will bring you more adventures along the Great White Way. Next week at this time, most of these same CBS stations will bring you a new program featuring Edward R. Murrow, Columbia's famed news reporter. This new program will be called Report to the Nation. And during its 60 minutes, Mr. Murrow will bring you not only important war and political news, but also summaries of all that's bright and new in the world of music, the theater, sports, and the other colorful, varied fields of American life. You'll hear recordings of great speeches and great events in the week preceding each Friday night broadcast. Report to the Nation will report the news for CBS listeners in this unprecedented series of broadcasts. Be listening for Report to the Nation next Friday evening on CBS. Dan Coverly speaking. This is CBS, the Star's Address, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The day without color is only six hours old, and the restlessness begins to eat at Broadway. The waiting, the longing for the nighttime begins to gnaw, like hunger, like thirst. Because Broadway's night is a banquet loaded with delicacies. The scarlet wine of neon, the forbidden fruit of a trumpet scream, the lukewarm stew offered on a tin plate through an alley doorway. But Broadway's day, that's the drab time, kid, the empty time. The time of leaning against sun-warmed stone and waiting. And you wait with the rest of Broadway because it'll come. Something will come. And it does. You know that because Broadway nudges you with an elbow, winks, says, Follow me, kid. The day has turned bright. And it's not far away where the day is bright. On 39th Street, just off 7th Avenue in the Garment Center. The crowd is already there ahead of you, toothpicking its last bite of lunch, digesting the spectacle of a man sprawled on the pavement. The dress rack he'd been pushing lay beneath him. There was a scissors in his back. His blood sketched a new pattern on the bright, flowered silk prints. And the man, heavy in the shoulders, pushing a space into the crowd so you can be close to it, so he can fill you in on it. You got here fast, Danny. I was shown the way. Who is he, Muggerman? His wallet says he's Thomas Hart. Social Security card, YMCA membership, it all says he was Thomas Hart. These people know him. They call him by name. He don't answer for 20 minutes now, I'd say. Any of them see it happen? No, I asked around. They were all busy with shop talk, with wife and kid talk, with union talk. First thing they noticed was Sinclair Stylecraft's new sample spring line was spilled in the gutter. They kept the cabs and trucks from running over the dresses. Sinclair what? Sinclair Stylecraft. See? On address labels. Huh? A dress manufacturing place up the street. He worked there. They all told me that. And I didn't even ask. Uh, keep them back, Muggerman. They're waiting for us to act something out. Just keep them back. And after a while, one of the onlookers glanced at his watch and hurried away. Lunch hour was over, and he'd be the big man around the water cooler this afternoon. Something big just happened to him. He'd seen a man with a scissors in his back. And a girl looked up from the pavement, smiled across the crowd to a boy in a sports shirt, and walked away slowly. And a woman in a youthful hat took her place. In a few minutes, it was all over. Two men threw a blanket over the face of Thomas Hart and carried him away. Then, work to do. Thomas Hart worked for Sinclair Stylecraft. Ladies and Mrs. Dresses, down the street. 
Go there. Four flights up on a freight elevator. Nod to the gray-haired man holding the wheel in a comic book and get no answer. And through the rows of sewing machines where a hundred women spend eight hours a day with a dress pattern and a bobbin. Then finally ushered into the office of the man of destiny for the fourth floor, Mr. Justin Sinclair. Sit down, Mr. Clover, Danny Clover, police. About what happened downstairs? That's right. Uh, you want a cigar? Tell me about Thomas Hart. Sure, I'll tell you. You don't mind that I'm smoking, do you? Oh, Tommy, Tommy, Tommy. What's that supposed to tell me? Look, I've been in business for a long time. A man gets hard driving for a dollar. Takes a time like this to make me know what kind of a man I've gotten to be. I'm asking you to weep for the boy, Mr. Sinclair. I wish I could weep. That's just what I mean. I've forgotten how. Tommy was a bright youngster. So what if he was pushing dress racks around? I did it once. Tommy was interested. Tommy asked questions about the business. I'm sad, Mr. Cloven. Don't laugh at me. I'm more than sad. I'm horrified. Mr. Sinclair. Oh, come in. Come in, Stella. Miss Croft, Mr. Clover. Mr. Clover is from the police. Yes, they told me in the shop a policeman was here. That's why I... I'm glad you did. He wants to know all about Tommy. What do you want to know, Mr. Clover? Well, as much as you can tell me. Mostly why somebody murdered him. Tommy was an errand boy and pushed dress racks. I'm sorry he's dead, but frankly, he annoyed me. How? (laughs) Oh, Mr. Clover, come now. Look at Miss Croft, will you? Just look at her now. I'm looking. Does it annoy you, Miss Croft? Not yet. If you came into my office and stared at me, sitting at my drawing board, then if you grinned, then if you winked... You really couldn't blame Tommy, Miss Croft. Natural, normal. Don't you do it, Mr. Sinclair. (laughs) Quite a girl, huh? Quite a young lady. What else about Tommy? Not a thing. Me either. All right. Where does he live? I can tell you that. Follow me out. I'll get the address for you from our personnel man. Yes, you'll find Sinclair Stylecraft cooperative, Mr. Clover, anything, anything at all. Next time, knock soft, mister. You want something from Jonesy, the keeper of the garbage pails, the collective wrench will knock soft. They told me Thomas Hart lived here. Show me his room. Tommy? Tommy's dead. It's been the topic of the day for the tenants how Tommy's dead. He don't need nobody in his room. Now he's dead. Can't use him. Look closer, Jonesy. This is how a policeman looks who wants something. Huh? I don't care what your sickness is. Next time, knock soft. Come on. Come on. You knew Tommy? No, oh, sure I knew him. He never wrapped his leavings in the newspaper, not even a, a greasy brown paper bag. What else do you need to know about a man? But sometimes you'd open your door and peep at his collars. Sure I peep. You don't peep when you get the chance. Back off, Jones. Who'd you see? Who? Uh, well, once it was a guy with a dirty white apron and a sack of beer cans. <sighs> Up these stairs, he went whistling. Uh, give me a minute, I'll tell you what he was whistling. Uh, no one else? Sure, sure, someone else. With silk stockings and high-strapped shoes. But living as I live in a basement apartment, it got away from me before I could see the face. That never took a moment's happiness away from me, not seeing her face. What do I do? Uh, Tommy's room. <laughs> Crummy tenant, wasn't it? Crumbs bring exterminators. Exterminators cost the management money. Take your hands off Tommy's suitcase. Hmm. Something in this shirt pocket? What? Nose tissues? Tommy was always with nose tissues. I forgot to tell you. Money. Twenties, tens. Five hundred dollars. All in there is a wash basin. That calendar you're looking at, I got piled downstairs. You can take your choice. Don't rob a dead man's dream. There's an address scribbled under the picture. Directions. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Out of the way. Uh, that's address, all right. You think, uh, hmm? Knock soft, Jonesy. You want something, knock soft. <laughs> Mr. 
Yes. The nameplate on the door says this is the residence of Justin and Elizabeth Sinclair. Is that right? No, I'm Mrs. Sinclair. What is it you want? Well, my name's Danny Clover. I'm from the, the police. The... You're from the police. Well, come in, please. My husband phoned and said a policeman might be around. Oh, my. Girls, girls, we're raided. <laughs> oh, I was just fooling. <laughs> no, Mr. Clover didn't come here to break up our canasta game, did you, Mr. Clover? We're only playing for a 20th. This is Mrs. Westfall, Mrs. Meston, and Miss Natalie. Now, Miss Natalie does our hair after the game. She wins Can our... we talk someplace, Mrs. Sinclair? Well, of course we can. Deal me out, girls. In here. We'll close the door so we won't be disturbed. Now, now tell me all about it. All right. I came from Tommy Hart's room a little while ago. He had some directions penciled on a calendar. The directions brought me here. Well, but I don't understand. Tommy's dead. Maybe Tommy scribbled those directions before he was murdered, huh? Uh, Oh, of course, surely. Then Tommy must have been here on some occasion or another. Of course he was. What was the occasion? Dinner. You'd think I'd get someone in to cook dinner, wouldn't you? But I didn't. I never do. Now, I still cook, Mr. Clover, like I did before all this happened. All this, you know, left French provincial furniture and the set of books and sending my son to private school. When was the last time Tommy was here? Didn't my husband tell you? Why, it was last night. Just last night, Tommy was sitting in that chair you're sitting in now. With that girl draped over him, lighting his cigars and waiting on him hand and foot. What girl did that? Well, the girl Tommy brought with him to dinner. That bleach blonde from the shipping department. In my house, imagine. Why my husband tolerates it. What was the girl's name? Ginny. Ginny Morrow, I think. She works for your husband? I told you she did. In the shipping department. Check her or something, I don't know. He invited Tommy over because Tommy's bright. and Maybe someday he could learn the business. But why the girl? I don't know. What else can you tell me about Tommy? He ate everything that was put on the plate in front of him. What else? What else? Mr. Clover, I'm a married woman. I've got a son taller than me and... She took me by the hand to prove it. Back to the canasta table. The son was doing fine, wasn't he, girls? Wasn't he? And her life with Mr. Sinclair was all a girl could ask for, wasn't it, girls? What right had a policeman to come nosing around spoiling everything? The card game, the hairdos, making the canapes grow cold. Letting the ginger ale turn flat just because someone stuck a pair of scissors in her husband's errand boy. So I explained the rights of the dead. And the girls cried. Scooped up the cards, shuffled, re-dealt, and I got up. At Sinclair Stylecraft, ladies and Mrs. Dresses, a woman finished a seam, took the rimless glasses off her nose, rubbed her eyes told me Jenny Morrow, shipping, was on the loading platform having a smoke. You can keep looking at me, mister. The view is for free. Teeth, courtesy Dr. West Miracle Tough Toothbrush. Hair, courtesy Peroxide 10%. Eyes, cheeks, figure, courtesy Careful Planning. You're Jenny Morrow? For Eugenia. Mom called me Eugenia. Found the name in a book someone threw in the trash can. Dramatic, eh? Some questions I want to ask you, Jenny. Questions about... You're a policeman, ain't you? Yeah. Tell me about Tommy Hart. Mine hostess of last night blabbed to you, huh? Okay. How long did you know Tommy? Long enough to slap him a couple of times, slap his mouth. Then he says he'll make up to me. He'll take me to the boss's house for dinner. Big deal. You didn't enjoy it? Here I am, practically spilling my life's blood on you, and I don't even know your name. Well, Danny Clover. (laughs) It suits you. (laughs) No... No, I didn't enjoy the supper, Danny. I got the feeling... Oh, I'm crazy. I'm making it up out of my own head. What feeling, Jim? You ever had it? The feeling that you've been taken someplace just so as you could insult people with your presence? Just by being in a place you don't belong, it's an insult? Just by being what you are? But Mr. and Mrs. Sinclair invited you, Jenny. Tommy twisted an arm. That's how come I'm invited. Big deal. Tommy did that to you and he's your steady boyfriend? Oh, steady, what steady? That daisy go pin on Stella the designer, me. I was the last name on the list. Stella Croft? Stella, the designer of designs. Where is she? By the Pantages Theater on 42nd Street, in the third row on the aisle. An arrangement we got with the management, so Stella can steal the latest Paris creations from the Parisian actors. (laughs) Oh, Stella has a life. Maybe it'll come to me someday. I'll work on it. 
It was a five-minute walk to 42nd Street in the Pantages Theater. On the stage, a man in a plaid dinner jacket was having a little trouble hoisting a girl to his shoulders. But when he did, they were fine together, circling faultlessly to the music. By the time I got down front, the man was holding his partner over his head, spinning, smiling, and turning red. Stella Croft was there, all right, pad and pencil poised, staring at the act. The dancers bowed. Everybody applauded. Everybody was happy. Not Stella. Stella with a scissor stuck in her side. Lifeless Stella. Dead Stella. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Every Sunday evening, CBS brings you two of its top comedy stars, Jack Benny and Eve Arden. It makes no difference where you live, whom you know, what your job is. Everyone immediately feels at home with Eve Arden's romantic Harris school teacher and with Jack's careful spending, perennially youthful portrait of himself. CBS cordially invites you to join them this Sunday again when Eve Arden plays Our Miss Brooks on most of these same stations and Jack Benny and his gang are heard on them all. Now the second act of Elliot Lewis's production of Broadway's My Beat. Of an evening in springtime, Broadway stands on a street corner, sips its penny plain, and counts its blessings. The Yanks, the Giants, the Bums, only a ten-cent subway ride's distance, and usually worth it. There's bottled orange juice from sun-kissed California to be tasted for a nickel. And the rides are getting painted at Coney. And the moon that rocks down over Manhattan in April is a special kind of moon. And the music that lilts from doorways is a special music. And the girls are golden. There's more, too. It blinks around the translux and demands your attention for ten seconds. Girl, stabbed at the Pantages Theater. Police seek early arrest, especially me. Oh, it's you. I was expecting the Mestons. More canasta, Mrs. Sinclair? More people dead. The Mestons were coming to console us. They're good at it, make it enjoyable. I don't suppose that's why you came. No. But you want to come into my house and ask your ugly questions. Uh Uh-huh. Just stand right where you are. Justin, it's that cop I told you about, the one who... Does he have a right to come in? Of course, Elizabeth. Of course. The man has all the rights in the world. Yes, dear. Justin says you may come in. Sit down, Mr. Clover. Take the world off your back. Sit down and talk to Elizabeth and me. Cigars there at your fingertips. Anything you need, ask Elizabeth, Bob. Maybe Mrs. Sinclair would like to make you some coffee or a sandwich. Or... Anything that'll take her out of here, huh, Mr. Clover? Don't be embarrassed. You can talk in front of Elizabeth. She knows more about the man Sinclair than I know. Correct, baby doll? Yeah, you want to know about Justin's friendship with Stella, is that it, Mr. Clover? Before the scissors episode, I mean? Well, that's it. I didn't think we'd get around to it so easy, but that's it. You won't mind if I tell him, Justin. Not a bit of it, baby doll. Just hand me a cigar first. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. Any time, Mrs. Sinclair. This friendship, as you called it. It was you, Mrs. Sinclair. I remember because it surprised me, the name you gave it. You thought it. There was nothing between Stella Croft and my husband, Justin, except the normal relationship of an employer to his employee. Consultation over dress designs during working hours, approval, disapproval... The putting into production, the countersigning of the weekly paycheck. Nothing more, Mr. Sinclair? There was more, she'll tell you. There were the times my husband Justin took her to fashion shows, to dinners for the buyers at expensive places. There was the time of a manufacturer's convention in Atlantic City. Justin called me every morning, every night. Stella was pretty. Some people thought lovely. She brought us customers, made us richer. That was what was between Stella and my husband. Nothing more. You don't know why she's dead? No, we don't know. But it saddens us, Mr. Clover. Send him home, Justin. I'm tired. I want to sleep. If the Mestons come, tell them I'm sick. 
They'll understand. More legwork now. The pinching up of the bits and scraps that people leave behind. Get as many as you can and arrange them chronologically, by emotion, by habit, by appetite. Draw a line, one from the other, and peep at a life now nearly dead. For instance, go now to the apartment of Stella Croft. Walk the corridor that once brought Stella home. Turn the knob of her door. The girl in the room was wearing slacks. She watched me close the door. And blew a smoke ring from her cigarette. Watched it die. Then she smiled at me. Hi, Danny. What are you doing here, Jenny? Oh, taking the tour. Seeing how a girl lives when she works in the front office of Sinclair Stylecraft. Gosh, quilted blue satin. How did you get in here? Did you see the superintendent downstairs? Yeah. Did his eyes light up when he saw you? Uh-uh, huh? Jenny, how well did you know Stella Croft? Who gets to know a dame like that if you're another dame? Look, Danny, I'm not the type to be a Pollyanna. My mother told me, Jenny, never be a Pollyanna. Stand on your own two feet. You don't like somebody, don't like them. And that's how I felt about Stella, to a T. Because she had all this, because she was going out with Mr. Sinclair? So I was jealous. But this apartment is something to get jealous about. You're going to try your luck with Sinclair? <laughs> He's already noticed, Danny. The day that I wore that black velveteen with the peasant blouse, he spent practically the whole morning in the shipping department giving me a personal supervise. <laughs> you want me for anything more, Danny? No. Just be around where I can find you, Jenny. Oh, sure, Danny. I really would, Danny. I'd drop all my appointments. The apartment looked like Jenny hadn't touched anything. The place was impeccable, slick, like Stella Croft had been. Lacquered furniture, highly waxed, and full-length mirrors. I walked back into her bedroom, around it, fingering this and that. The small, intimate souvenirs a girl like Stella collects... Then over to a Pullman closet, opened it, and wondered for an instant why a woman needed so many shoes. Wondered. <laughs> wondered why it hurt so much. The brightness of it, the pain, the sharpness slipping so easily into my back. Then gave it up because I couldn't hold on to it. the finishing touch, Danny. The claim to fame of Dr. Sinsky. In medical school, it was always commented upon how Dr. Sinsky finished off his handiwork. <laughs> the bedside manner. I don't need it. Oh, that's right. You don't need it, Danny. Now hold on to something, Danny. It'll hurt. Yeah, yeah. Hold on to something, Danny. To me. It's gonna hurt. <laughs> he held on to something. To me. And it still hurt him. What is it with you, Dr. Sinsky? Maybe you need a refresher course in adult medical education. Uh, unruffle your feathers, Mother Tentacle. I'm all right. Yeah. Listen to him, Doctor. Last night he got a hole in his back from unsharpened scissors, and this morning he tells me he's all right. Okay, if I go back to my office, Dr. Sinsky. You'll need rest, Danny. I'll bear it in mind. Okay, check me in the morning. You hear, Danny? You hear? Yeah. The debt piles up, doesn't it, Doctor? What debt? What are you talking about? I'll count out the times you've eased the pain. I'll let you know. Uh, get him out of here, Gino. Yeah. Yeah, come on. Let's go, Danny. I'll go get permission from the captain to give a sick leave. and Then I'll, I'll conjure up a squad car, and we'll surprise the Mrs. Sergeant Artaglia in the middle of a mozzarella. And then we'll solve your, your, our wound together. And then... What made two people die like that, Gino? Tommy Hart, Stella Croft. Danny. Danny, you disappoint me. You are thinking on your sick leave time. What ties it together, Gino? Danny, if I tell you, you promise to let me manage your sickness? Huh? What ties it is Tommy Hart and Estella Croft were once married in that place in Maryland, you know, on that quick marriage plan? I ain't making it up, Danny. Mugovan dug it out of the records. It was a secret between you two? Oh, Danny, it don't mean nothing. They got an annulled the next day. That unties it. Danny, you're jeopardizing your good health. 
Good morning. Yes, sir. Can I help you? Hi, Danny. Hey. Look at me. Yeah, look at you. Since when did they move you out of the shipping department into the reception desk? Since this a.m. I told you. I got supervised into it. Oh. Tell Mr. Sinclair I want to see him. Sure, Danny. Watch me. See? What is it, Miss Morrow? There is out here at this moment the gentleman of the police department, a Mr. Danny Clover. Show him in. Show him in. Very good. To that door, Danny. Thanks. Hello, Mr. Sinclair. I'm a busy man, Mr. Clover, but I always have time to talk to you. Mr. Sinclair, how much of your affairs can you get in order in the next 15 minutes? My business, we never talk in riddles. It's how much, why, when, things a man can answer. What's on your mind? You, Tommy Hart, Stella. They worked for me, Mr. Clover, and they died. I'm going to pay for their funerals, and I'm going to find out if they had family. They'll be taken care of. We have a fund toward that. Tell the people at headquarters it might make an impression. Honestly, honestly, no. I don't know what you're talking about. Let's stop kidding each other, Sinclair. You're a man with tastes, from the lines of women's dresses to a lacquered apartment to a little employee who's now your receptionist. From Stella Croft to Ginny Morrow. Better find out if Ginny had a husband. I still don't follow you. Then I'll tell you. It's called the Badger Game. Listen to me, Mr. Clover. You listen to me. Tommy and Stella weren't married. Did you know that? You didn't know it, huh? I thought. I, I saw the certificate of marriage. The justice of the peace who married them. I, I thought... Marriage and all the next morning. Badger game. Stella invited you to make a play for her. You bit. Tommy walks in, waves a certificate of marriage. You pay him. Money. Invitations to your home. He gets greedier and greedier. So you kill him. I didn't have to. You don't know... What it was, Clover. That boy grinning into my face, taking over my house, making me... What is it, Justin? What's the matter? What happened? Make him understand. Make him understand. Mrs. St. Clair, your husband just confessed to killing Tommy Hart. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you kill him? It's all right, Justin. I'm here now. It's all right. You got Tommy out of the way, St. Clair. Why did you kill Stella? <laughs> Listen. I said it was all right, Justin. And I'll tell you why. Stella knew you killed Tommy. It didn't worry her very much. She just upped the blackmail ante. St. Clair, that's why you killed Stella. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't. You did? For what she was doing. Doing to my home, to my husband, to my boy, to my boy's name. Yes, and I stabbed you, too, for what you were doing to us. I killed. I'd kill again. What'll we do about the boy? You didn't think, did you, Justin? You just didn't think when you started it. When you saw that Stella, you didn't think. Please, please. The boy will be all right. We have money. It's more than you had when you started. He'll be all right, Justin. It's going to be all right. In the April night, Broadway echoes with sounds heard only in darkness. The whispers that speckle places where there's no sun. There's a touch on your coat, you turn. There's no one, nothing. Only the trail of dust on your shoulder. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent. The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's cast, Irene Tedrow was heard as Elizabeth Sinclair, Herb Butterfield as Justin Sinclair, Sylvia Sims as Ginny Morrow, Mary Shipp as Stella Croft, and Sidney Miller as Jones. <laughs> If you're in the mood for mysteries, you can try CBS almost any old evening. And there's a top-notch thriller on hand for you. Tomorrow and every Sunday, it's Charlie Wilde. Monday nights, the top Hollywood stars appear in original thrillers on the Hollywood Star Playhouse. 
Thursdays, there's a swell night for mystery and thrills on CBS. Suspense, Mr. Keene, and the FBI in Peace and War are heard on most of these same stations. Stay tuned now for Sing It Again, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Joe Walter speaking. This is CBS, where you laugh at Jack Benny every Sunday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. I get ten a day in expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb as Jeff Regan, the Lion's Eye, stand by for hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of The Gambler and His Lady. find it in Hollywood, on Taft Avenue. Four-story apartment building, the color of a rainy afternoon. They call it the Havenwood. It sags in the middle like a tired Frankfurter. That's where I live. Apartment 3K. Two rooms with a pull-down bed and a pair of windows that stick when it's hot. Oh, the view isn't much. Six strands of telephone wire and the head of a shaved-off palm tree. Beyond is the city, L.A., spread out on the map like a raw egg with a broken yolk. Oh, the town's all right, I guess, if you can afford the sedatives. The lion likes it. He set himself up as a receiving clerk for trouble, and I worked for him. It was about 11.15 Tuesday night when my phone began making itself felt. It turned out to be the lion breathing hard. It figured he was running his fingers over a greenback. The sound of a brand new $50 bill. Send me a record. What's the matter? You sound like you're flat on your back. How do you sleep? Who's sleeping? I'm working, and that's what you're going to be doing. Try me tomorrow. Throw on some clothes. You're going down to Venice Boulevard to see a lady. She's got daughter trouble. Well, marry her off. She didn't pay us 50 bucks for that. The problem goes deeper. How much? She'll tell you. I want it from you. I don't know it all for sure. Don't you ever check into things? I do the general work. You get the details. Yeah, you drag a wet rag over the 50, and if the ink stays on, we got a client. That's insulting. How would you know? Regan, you don't want to keep a lady waiting. Now get a move on. Give me the name. This is Eleanor Bascom, Pierpont Hotel. Yeah? And phone me after you talk to her. What for? I want to be sure it's legit. Do you care? Uh, better make that call to me tomorrow after 10. I'm sort of going to be tied up till then. Doing what? Sleeping. Well, I put on some clothes, picked up my car, and moved out to Venice Boulevard. The good humor men were all gone, and I had the street to myself. Twenty minutes later, I came to a stop beside a garbage can near San Pedro. Behind it stood the Pierpont Hotel. A two-deck pile of wood left over from the sinking of the Spanish Armada. There was a black and dirty white sign outside said rooms 50 cents, weekly and monthly rates. The names Eleanor and Georgia Bascom showed in the mailbox and gave a room 210. I climbed a flight of stairs and walked down a hall that looked like a passageway in a pyramid. It was dark and it took my cigarette lighter to turn up the numbers. 210 finally showed and I rapped on the door. A bush of black and gray hair pulled it open. It was wearing a red kimono and an impatient look, like a tax collector in January. She was pushing 50 and looked tired. Yes? I'm Regan, international detective. Oh, yes, the lions. I've been waiting for you. Come in. I'm Mrs. Bascom. Eleanor or Georgia? Georgia's my daughter. I I want to apologize for getting you out here this time of night, Mr. Regan, but it's urgent. The lion said that the girl's the problem, huh? Yes. How old is she? Twenty-two. Who's the man? How'd you know there was a man? Well, what other kind of trouble would she go after? She's a good girl, Mr. Regan. She always has been. Until now. Huh? That's what I want to know. Well, she's old enough to call her plays. 
That's not the advice I'm paying for. Where'd you get the 50? It took a lot of saving. All right, give me his name. Louis Desmond. Gambler, card sharp, bookie, all-around con man. He's got a card room out toward Gardena someplace, the Five Aces Club. What does your daughter see in him? Oh, it's this place, the way we have to live. She's tired of having nothing. I've tried, but she's looking for a change. And taking a wrong turn. I'm not sure yet. Yeah, other girls have it real tough. They go to work. Uh, well, we had a little trouble in the family once. It shows up if someone starts looking. When can I talk to Georgia? Well, you'll have to work that out yourself, Mr. Regan. What does that mean? She put some clothes in a suitcase and left earlier this evening. That, that's why I had to call you so suddenly. Mm-hmm. Where'd she go? Louis is a real bum, Mr. Regan. You talk like you know him. We've met. I want to know just what's going on. If Louis's forcing her into anything crooked. She force easy? A fur coat makes a young girl do a lot of things. Yeah. Oh, here's a picture of her. You may need it. Mm-hmm. Not very good, but only one I've got. I'll make it work. Well, that's about all, Mr. Regan. Get in touch with me as soon as you get something. Okay. Oh, Mr. Regan. Yeah. As you can tell, I'm the kind of person who sometimes gets hysterical over things, but I'm also the kind who demands results. You sound like a radio commercial. It was after midnight when I followed the fog out Vermont toward Gardena. The yellow lights were pressing, but they were doing about as much good as a pint of bourbon at a Shriners convention. I wandered around the flatland for a while before the Five Aces Club turned up by a bend in the road. It looked like a blue wart with a neon sign. There was a front door and a back one and a couple of pairs of shoulders standing at each. A little guy in a pinstripe gray was figuring the size of the wallets going in. Louis Desmond's office showed at the top of the stairway and I moved for it. But a muscle looking down on six feet was playing front man. He put a knotted hand on my arm and when he spoke it sounded like a gear factory doing double time. Slow down, Pilgrim. The room you're looking for is the other way. Yeah, well, this one says office. That's the trouble with you guys who read. Can't take hints. Spell it out. Beat it. Not until I see Louis Desmond. What's your business? I'll tell it to him. You owe him some dough? No, I don't. Then he ain't interested. He will be. Listen, Junior. Come I on, get him off of me, Hold punk. Up. Hey. What's all the noise, Patsy? Sightseer without a ticket. My name's Regan. Cup? Maybe. You want me to bounce him down the stairs, boss? Maybe. What do you want? Talk. That's always a waste of time. Not if it's about Georgia Bascom. Come on in. Never saw you around here before, Regan. No, I can't afford it. Oh, don't say that. Some people go out of here with more than they come in with. Yeah, you. <laughs> Guess you're right at that. Cigar? No, thanks. Well, what about Georgia, Regan? You tell me. That doesn't add. You came to see me. She's got a worried mother. They're all like that. Now, this one figures you're doing a little forcing. Oh. You'd know more about that. Give me a clue. Blackmail, maybe? (laughs) You're a kick. Arthur Godfrey'd love to get a hold of you. I come too high. Let me give you some good advice. Go home and pull a blanket over your head and say it's all a bad dream. You know, you talk a lot, mister, but you don't say much. What's the hold on Georgia? All right, wise guy. Honey. Come over here, baby. Regan, you know this girl? I've seen a picture. Georgia, this is a peeper named Regan. He come to rescue you. But what for, Mr. Regan? Fifty dollars. My mother gave you that to come and take me back? Something like that. But I can't go. Why not? Well. Go ahead. Show him, baby. Look, Regan, three carrots. With a wedding band to match. On what dice table did you pick those Stop up? Stop the noise, Regan. Congratulate the lady. Not on a bad mistake. Listen, Shamus. Oh, never mind him, Louie. He doesn't matter. When did the first come? Louie said soon. Tell Mama we're married and not to worry. We're going away for a few days. And Senora for some gambling and fishing. You won't enjoy it. Sure I will. You'll be in L.A. <laughs> The alley behind the Five Aces Club hadn't been dusted in a week. 
My brown flannel suit fixed that. Well, I picked myself up and made it for the car. Moving north on Vermont, I tried to add a couple of things. There was a funny smell in Louie's office when I first walked in, like rope on fire. Somebody had been there before me who smoked cubebs. Desmond worked on cigars. Georgia held a king-size pell-mell. Well, whoever it was still played it coy. About one o'clock, I started raising a small campaign with a lion's door knocker. His dream must have been a real good one because it took him ten minutes to get to the door. He was wearing a nightgown. He looked like a poor imitation of the Fisk tire ad. All that was missing was the candle. Regan, I told you not to bother me until after 10 a.m. It's no bother. Get out of here, let a man sleep. Your dreams will be bad. What do you mean? You just lost a client. What's the matter, the money phony? Georgia Bascom married Desmond. There's nothing I can do about it. Well, think of something. Say you married her first. You're out of your mind. So it's a bad idea. Get a good one. Yeah, I already have. What is it? You give Mrs. Bascom her case back. Well, you can't do that. Try me. Uh, Think a minute, Regan. She's come to us for help. A lonely woman with no place to turn... And trusts her trouble to International. You got that 50 spent? It's not the money. It's the moral obligation. Oh, stop it, will you? You don't give blood anymore since you found out somebody pay for it. You're getting out of line. You're the only guy in town who can turn a shaving cut into a bankroll. That's enough. Well, let's do it this way. You go over to Mrs. Bascom and give her the lowdown. Let her decide if she wants you to carry on or not. We sure go to a lot of trouble for a 50. I need a lot of new stuff around the place. Well, it's close to Christmas, right to Santa Claus. <laughs> I left the lion looking for a fountain pen and I drove out to Venice Boulevard in the Pierpont Hotel. The place still looked the same. A black Nash was parked up the block, a motor going. A couple of cats were doing a duet on a garbage can. I climbed the stairs to the second floor and I started down the hall for 210, walking real easy to keep the boards from creaking, but somebody else didn't care about the noise. There was a gun with a silencer working in Mrs. Bascom's room. I pushed the door in, but by then all I could hear was silence. The light showed an open window with a fire escape, and the wind was blowing the curtains. Mrs. Bascom lay face down on the bed, real still, and the holes in her blanket were turning wet. The lion really lost a client that time. Well, it didn't take Sanducci and the boys long to get there. The fingerprint man and the photographers went to work in the room. Sanducci picked me. He had a grouch on like a fat lady in an upper berth. What's the matter, Regan? You get lost? What do you mean? You're pretty far from home. Well, I get around. Who is she? Name's Eleanor Baskin. I know that. What's she do? Where's she come from? I don't know. What were you doing out here? She called in the lion. Her daughter ran off with Louis Desmond. Oh, he in it? How far? Ask him. Mrs. Baskin wants you to bring her daughter back. She wanted to know if the girl was moving into a racket. Was she? I haven't found out. <laughs> they should have known better than to ask a detective. Why didn't she call us? She was behind on her taxes. What do you do, Private? Sit up nights figuring ways to make my job harder? You through with me? No! Who killed her, Regan? I don't know. Bad choice of words. Go check a black Nash parked up the street. Got a license number? No, I haven't. Thanks a lot. Look, I'm no medium. I didn't know she was marked. Any other big ideas? A few. Well, keep them to yourself. They're all wrong. Now get out of here. Yeah. Say, Santucci. Yeah? The lion can handle another client now. So what? Want to sign up? slept. Coffee and warmed over biscuits at the drugstore took care of breakfast the next morning. Then I checked the phone book. Louis Desmond's home address turned up on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills, and so I drove out there. It was on a corner, a two-story colonial place with white colors and green shutters. The doorbell sounded like a second chorus at the Hollywood Bowl. The Japanese maid let me in, and I waited in the ante room. That's when I caught that peculiar smell again. Somebody had just been there who smoked those Q-Beb cigarettes. Well, a couple of minutes later, a tall blonde fighting 30 stepped up to me. She smelled like she just crawled out of a bottle of platine. It was a bright morning, but she had the kind of look that had you wishing for an eclipse. Well, what do you want? Louis Desmond. Census taker? No. What's he done? I don't know yet. Where is he? I don't know where he is. He didn't come home last night. Lots of work at the office? (laughs) Card room out in Gardena. Lots of work out there? He didn't say. He doesn't tell me everything. Should he? Depends on what you think of your marriage vows. Who are you? His wife. Mm -hmm. Want a drink, mister? 
Sure. What'll it be? Yours. Bourbon. You pour. I don't know when to stop. All right. Here you go. Hmm? To marriage. It's a mess. Hmm. Cigarette? Never touch them. Interferes with my drinking. Who smokes the cubebs? Is that what that stuff is? Yeah. That little guy walked in here looking for Louie and smelled up the place. Hiya, Stella. Oh, hello, Patsy. Just in time for a drink. Company? Yeah. Uh, what's your name, fella? He knows. You learn hard, don't you, Regan? What's going on? He's an eye. So what? So he gets a bounce. He's my friend. Beat it, Seamus, or I'll split you. Stay right where you are. This is my house, and I'll entertain who I want. With the boss's liquor? I've got some rights. Well, figure out what they are and try them on the boss. I don't like you, Patsy. Beat it, people. Get your paws off of me. Uh, come on, get them off. Stop it, Patsy. You... Stop it, I said. Well, you hit him pretty hard, lady. No, I didn't. His head's soft. Well, I left her picking up pieces of glass, and I drove back toward Hollywood. I was moving east on Sunset, trying to make some sense out of Desmond's domestic life, when I spotted that black sedan again. It was doing a real bad tag job on me. I pushed the pedal closer to the floor, but the sedan had better gas. It caught me going around a bend past Beverly Glen and started pushing me. Oh, it was a great place for a boulevard stop, but none showed. All it did was a reflection in my rearview mirror of the driver in the black sedan. It was feminine, and the voice spelled out Georgia Bascom. That's when she moved in for a closer look. You are listening to the story of the gambler and his ladies. Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator. Listen, this is good news. Good news for you if you're between the ages of 20 and 26 and a half, married or single, a high school graduate, and want to fly for the United States Air Force. Yes, the Air Force Aviation Cadet Program is offering you the opportunity to become a pilot officer in the mightiest Air Force in history. You can be one of the Air Force's men of renown. And there's more offered than the pride you feel in being a member of America's flying team. For after your 52 weeks of training... You'll graduate as a second lieutenant in the Air Force with an income of more than $300 per month. Remember, the Air Force offers you what it offered General Jimmy Doolittle, General Carl Spatz, and General Hoyt Vandenberg, now at 42, the Air Force Chief of Staff. Call at your local Army and Air Force recruiting station tomorrow. Apply to become an aviation cadet. And now, back to the story of the gambler and his ladies and Jeff Regan, investigator. things were moving as fast as the last reel in a western movie. The lion sent me out to see a lady who was having daughter trouble. Georgia Bascom had done a tie-in with a gambler named Louis Desmond. Only it looked real permanent. She was wearing his wedding ring, and the mother ended up carrying a couple of bullets and homicide moved in. That's when I met a blonde at Desmond's house who said she was Louis's wife. Well, I was working on the mess when a black sedan with Georgia at the wheel ran me off the road and the slugs began to fly. I peeled myself off the side of the hill, and I got in touch with the police. Sanducci took over and invited me to headquarters for some more talk. He put me in a little room with pale green walls and sat behind a big desk chewing a dead cigar. He was taking me all in like a Hoover vacuum cleaner on a dirty rug. Well, how do you feel, Regan? All right. You shouldn't. Why not? Looks to me like from here on in you're a marked man. I'll get along. (laughs) <laughs> It'll be real interesting to see how. All right, now look, have you got something to say? Maybe. Well, let's hear it. Relax, Regan. You're not going any place. You can't hold me. I was the one who got shot at. Well, that's enough. I'll work out a way to hold you for creating a disturbance. It won't work. Listen, you. The bullets we pulled out of your upholstery match the ones in Mrs. Bascom. So what? So we figure she was knocked off because she knew something somebody didn't want said. We also figure that applies to you. Yeah, well, that gets you nothing. All right, Regan. Play it your way this time. You'll come running back when the haters close in. Don't make book on it. 
Well, if you've got to get yourself knocked off, don't mess up our city streets. Yeah, I'll be real careful. Oh, and uh, wear a dark suit that save our morticians a little trouble. That all? Yeah, go on, be it, sir. Oh, Reagan. Yeah. Hey, Buffy, de tu padre. What's that mean? Your father's mustache. <laughs> Well, it was late afternoon by the time I walked out of headquarters. The sun was still working, but it was cold. The cab driver, with a lot of conversation, drove me to my place over on Taft. When I opened my front door, I smelled it again, those cubebs. A small face was sitting on my sofa sucking on them. It belonged to a guy who had to stand on a box to see over a fox terrier. When I shut the door behind me, ground the cigarette into an ashtray and turned on a nervous look like a pig in a football factory. Your landlady let me in, Mr. Regan. I hope you don't mind. I have to talk to you. We met before. We did? I don't remember. Just me and your cigarettes. Huh? Oh. You mind if I smoke? You just finished one. Oh, yeah, yes. Yes, so I did. May may I have a drink then? Just a small one. All right. Thank you. I I generally don't drink, but tonight I... Uh, (coughs) Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Now, I barely know where to begin. Well, you better figure it out. You haven't got much time. Yes, yeah. Well... Start with a name. Is that necessary? Yeah, it is. Loper. Max Loper. I'm a businessman. What kind? What kind? Uh, oh, furrier. Yeah, yeah, I'm a furrier, Mr. Regan. All sorts of furs. Ermines. Nice. Generally, I prefer sable, but it depends on the woman, you know? What does Georgia get? I beg pardon? Let it go. Yeah. I'm not the man I used to be, Mr. Regan. My fortunes have changed. Yeah, yeah, it changed. I... I think I'd better have that cigarette. Save it for later and start making sense. Well, I need help. Why come to me? Well, Mrs. Bascom thought enough of you to ask you to help her. You, you see, I know Mrs. Bascom. That is, I knew Mrs. Bascom. Her death was so sudden. It was forced. Yeah, so the papers say. But, Mr. Regan, I want you to know I didn't do it. Who said you did? Well, nobody yet. But I didn't do it. Look, why tell me? There's nobody else I can tell. Try the police. No, no, no. That's what I can't do. I want you to prove to them that I wouldn't do a thing like that. Loper, what's your tie-in with Desmond? But Desmond? Why? There, there, there is no tie-in. You were at his card room. I smelled your cigarettes there. You got nothing, I guess, and you went to his house. Mr. Regan, that's got nothing to do with it. I think different. But you're wrong. All wrong. Convince me. I didn't do the murder. That's what I want you to tell the police. Who did? I don't know. Well, now, I think you do. Come on, who killed George's mother? It, it was her stepmother who was killed. Give me some more. Oh, you, you got me all confused. Uh, I guess coming to you for help was a bad idea. Something was. I'll find somebody else who doesn't ask so many questions. I better go. No, no, not yet, little man. Uh, You've got too many answers. Take your hands off me. Now, Mr. Regan, I never used one of these, but the theory is simple. Just pull the trigger. Well, if you can find it. Don't urge me. Open the door. Go on. Sure. Now, step away. See you later, Mr. Regan. Hey, Loper. He made it to the staircase, and then the noise came. A couple of bullets flew up the spiral and caught him in the chest. He stopped in midair for a second like a yo-yo on a string, and then he toppled over and rolled down. By the time I got to him, he was all used up. Well, I called into homicide, brought some of the boys out, and they took care of him. A fat guy with a head like a plunger took him pictures for a paper, and a girl with a leaky fountain pen got the story. Took about an hour and a half to clear my place. But the minute the crowd moved out, the lion moved in. He had a sheet of paper in one hand, and his face was lit up like an old maid at a cocktail party. This concerns Louis Desmond and Georgia Bascom. You interested? Yeah. Desmond's got a wife, and her name's not Georgia. No, it's Stella, and she's a ripe candidate for a drunk tank. What else do you know about her? She's jealous. Well, there's no record any place of a divorce or of a marriage between Georgia and Desmond. That whole setup's a phony. Tell me why. Georgia's father, named Peter Bascom, was a furrier. And he was once in on a fur job with the same Louis Desmond. Go on. The old Bascom ended up with a bullet in him and Louis with a pile of dough. How did it work? I can't find out everything. You gotta do something. You know a Max Loper? Never heard of him. You got an address on this Georgia? The Arena Hotel, room 406, and Catalina off Wilshire. All right. The way I figured, an insurance company might be real interested to get hold of her. No, the gas chamber's got priority. We figured the swindled first. Collect the fat bonus, then let the city handle her any way it wants. Call me when you get it all sold up. 
What are you going to be doing? Resting at home. I'm all worn out. Yeah, well, that figures. You've been doing a little thinking. The Lorena Hotel, six stories of plush carpet and gold paint. It was night when I got there and the neon was on. The buzzer brought the door open and Georgia Bascom stood there carrying an overcoat. She had her purse under her arm and it figured she was leaving. When she saw me, she turned on a surprised look. Oh, Mr. Regan. You're moving out? Just a little errand. It'll keep. Shut the door. Now, see here. Shut up. Well, that's a lot of nerve. Don't let it bother you. They're bigger things. Like what? A fur job you and Louie are working on. What are you talking about? And a little murder. Throw your purse on the sofa. I will not. Come on, lady. It's getting heavy. Now open the closet door. Come on. There. I hope you're satisfied. I'm not much on fashions. Read them to me. Three airmen, three sable. Ten thousand apiece? More. Max loafers? Yeah. Well, you can't wear them all. You got a friend? I don't need one. All right, sis. What is it? Nothing. That's your version. You could be wrong. When'd you marry Desmond? Last week. Bad answer. He's got a wife named Stella. Bigamy will get him in trouble. Well, that's his problem. No, it's yours, too, if the courts can prove you knew. All right, I didn't marry him. Then why the wedding ring? Hey, you ask a lot of questions. Yeah, I do. Why don't you get out of here? Louie's not new on fur jobs. He knows how much work it is to palm him off. You're talking to yourself. Loper never got to outlive a double cross. What are you going to do with that? Nothing. Homicide will work it out. I didn't kill anybody. You'll work up a sweat proving it. Louie did it, honest. He killed my stepmother because she knew how the job worked. He gave it to Loper, too. He would... <gasps> Hiya, friends. It must be raining. The worms are coming to the top. Hello, Louis. Regan's got it figured out. I, I was just stalling him till you got here. Sure, Georgia. I know. Honest, Louis. Honest. I, I didn't mean to say you did the knockoffs. I... We'll talk about it later. You better finish it now. You're not going to be around. We'll see. They got a spot all staked out for you up north. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Regan, I got a set of instructions for you. I want you to be real nice and follow them. What's in it for me? <laughs> you kill me, Seamus. I'm holding all the cards. You want to rake in the pot. I, I better get going, Lily. We shouldn't be seen together right now. Uh, slow down, baby. I got something for you, too. But, Louis, I... <laughs> Big mouth. Oh, you did it! Oh, Big did it. mouth. Look, you, you didn't have to hit her more than once. She got off easy. Everybody's got 32 teeth. <laughs> Desmond moved us out of the apartment and down the hall. Georgia was beginning to sob, but Desmond wasn't impressed. He held the gun under his coat and walked behind us careful, like an elephant on a crate of eggs. The button brought the elevator, and the three of us went in. And then it started down. When the door swung open on the first floor, a whiff of bourbon came floating in, packing a thirty-two. Louie turned white. Stella! Stella! I told him if he kept messing around, he was going to have trouble at home. You want to give me the gun? No. What's your name, girlie? Georgia. Were you in love with Louie? I... I don't know. Well, go find out. <laughs> you want it now, Regan? It's empty. You know, lady, you fixed nothing. What do you mean? Where you're going, you'll all be together again. all over fast, like a dollar dinner. The coroner's office sent out some boys for Georgia and Louie, and Sanducci picked up Stella. Desmond had himself a pretty good thing. Do a tie-in with a furrier and move the furs across the border with nobody making a fuss. Oh, it was slow work, but 10000 a week's pretty good pay, and it was real safe. Loper wasn't going to say the furs were even stolen until they were turned into money. Of course, he never got to say it at all. Everything would have been all right if Stella didn't see green every time Louis saw blonde. Well, the insurance company thanked us for what we did to expose the fraud. The lion was unhappy. He said they should have shown their gratitude with something more lasting. They gave it to him. A 1949 pocket calendar. Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan with Herb Butterfield as Anthony J. Lyon. It's CBS at the same time next week for more hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Written by Larry Roman, produced by Sterling Tracy. 
Included in tonight's cast were Mary Lansing, Marvin Miller, Pat McGeehan, Lorette Philbrandt, Jack Petruzzi, Yvonne Patey, and Sidney Miller. Original music for this program is by Milton Charles. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Regan. I work for Anthony J. Lyon, International Detective Bureau. They call me the Lion's Eye. CBS brings you Jeff Regan, investigator, starring Frank Graham as Regan, with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. So stand by for mystery, suspense, and adventure in tonight's Jeff Regan story of The Lady by the Fountain. block above Wilton off Hollywood Boulevard there's a street called Taft and the first dirty gray apartment house on the right hand side is where I pick up my laundry 428 I'm finishing out the lease for a guy who's up at San Quentin waiting for the second week in December that's where the state's going to help him forget a blonde he never should have remembered well it's a place to live I've got a leaky faucet and a bed that comes out of the wall and that's where I was last Monday morning, about 6 o'clock, when somebody began pounding on the door. I figured the place was burning down, but it turned out worse. My boss. A couple of hundred pounds of black cigar stuffed into a blue suit. Regan, it's me. The lion. It's a nice morning. The sun's up. The birds are up. What are you doing? Just hoping somebody drop in. What do you want? Hey, get your pants on. We got lots of work to do. This is going to be a busy day. The last time you threw that line, I spent six weeks in a hospital. You're always suspicious of people. You should learn to trust your fellow man. You can't go through life not having faith in people. Follow my example. Every man is my brother, Regan. And if you figured there was a buck in it, you'd sell him to a chain gang. And I'll see him. And you'd be the first one to turn him in if he got loose. That kind of talk doesn't set well with me, Regan. Remember, I have you under contract international, and I hold your bond. You can let loose any time you want to. It's no season pass to come in here in the middle of the night. Now, now, there's no need for you and I to argue. I guess I'm a bit edgy. Been up all night long. Uh, mind... Yes, I do. As I said, I've been up all night long. <sighs> Thanks. Regan, somebody got Tim Vickers, vice president of American Casualty Company, out of bed at 3 o'clock this morning. He was at the same party with you? Hey, don't get old Tim out of bed unless there's dough involved. I looked into it. Headquarters tells me that a guy named Albert Colby made the call. Lives out in Bel Air. Fine family. Oil. Put it on the road. <sighs> I wish you'd buy better stuff. Well, last night, Colby got himself married to a tomato named Francis Shana. Somewhere around midnight, the new Mrs. Colby and 50 or 60 other guests are heisted as nice as you please. And the police are working on it. Goodbye. No, you and me, we're working on it. When they call American casually, that means whatever was taken was insured and they've got their own man on it. And it means they want it back bad enough to start paying a reward to anybody who can find whatever it is. And it means the insurance company and the police department will be working on it and they don't want anybody's all sticking their nose in it. Oh, those cops can't pick up reward money. And neither can those company guys. Now that leaves you and me, Regan. And international can use some extra dough. Try the Morris plan. I got a better one. You hop out to Colby's and get some details. I'll hang around headquarters and see what kind of story they've got. You set them up, but they never come off. If we find out what's gone, who took it, and get it back, we've made rent money. Yeah, I haven't had my breakfast yet. <sighs> hey, what's the matter, Regan? You look worried. I am. That's my only bottle. Oh, you got nothing to worry about anymore? Here, it's empty. <laughs> got as far as D in the alphabet. That's when they showed him how to spell dollar. And this Kobe thing had a dollar sign in front of it as far as the line was concerned. And that means it's no use arguing. So I threw on some clothes and drove out to the Kobe place. It turned out to be a lot of brick and grill work on top of one of those canyon roads right after you turn off Sunset into Bel Air. When I drove in the gate, I got a feeling somebody better check with London to see if Buckingham was still there. Two guys in uniform stopped me. I showed them my license. They let me through. 
I parked in the driveway behind three police cars and started looking around for the ladies' entrance. That's when I spotted a tall guy in a brown sport coat sitting on a cement bench right by a fountain. Up close, he looked sad, like an umpire on a rainy day. Yes, what can I do for you? I'm looking for a guy named Colby. Are you from the police? No. The insurance company? No. Well, we don't want any reporters hanging around All right, here. I'm no scribe. Now, can you tell me where I can find Colby? What do you want to see him about? You're him. Yes, I'm Albert Colby. My name's Regan, International Detective Bureau. Oh. What does that mean? Look, I've been through a very hard night, Mr. Regan. I learned a lot of things I didn't know before. What kind of things? The police tell me that when a group of jewelry is stolen, that it's more or less kidnapping. It's held in ransom until it's brought back. And that the procedure is to wait to be contacted by one of the thieves. That's one way. Yes, so I understand. It also can be broken up, disassembled, and sold on the market. Yeah. Very interesting and very sound economic structure. I'm surprised at the ingenuity of criminals. A lot of people are. You want to tell me how it happened? The man from my insurance office also told me there'd be uninvited private investigators around. And he told you to keep quiet until he went to work. In a word, yes. You want the stuff back, don't you? I do. But I believe the police and insurance company to be reasonably capable. Uh, just You're a wasting your time, Mr. Regan. Good morning. He was right. I was wasting my time. The lieutenant in charge made a statement a half hour later that told me no more than I'd got from the lion. It was easy to see they wanted to sit tight and wait for a contact. <laughs> they were playing it coy. And I gave up after a couple of hours and walked out and got in my car. That's when I met her. A tall brunette with equipment to match. She looked good in that sable coat, but she'd have looked good in a fishnet. She didn't waste any time. She climbed in beside me. I own one Cadillac and two Buicks, but they're all on the fritz. You can help me a lot. Want me to buy you the Super Chief? I want you to drive me to Wilshire and Fairfax. The cab boys might think I'm cutting in. Look, I don't know who you are, but I've been up all night answering questions and talking to a lot of nosy cops, and I'm tired. Be a good boy, huh? You were here when it happened? Do I have to go through all that again? If I take you to Wilshire and Fairfax, you do. All right. Mind giving me a name? Regan. All right, Regan. I'm Francie... <laughs> Francie Colby. I'm not used to the name yet. Best wishes. For what? Isn't that what they say when you get married? Yeah. You ever met him? Yeah, in your garden. Doesn't talk much. Hurts that way. What do you want to know, Regan? Mm, when it happened, how they did it, Oh, whoa, 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 boy. I'll tell you my story, and you pick out what you can use. Let's hear it. It was two hours after the ceremony. Everybody was out in the garden for the reception. I don't know where they came from, but there were three of them. What'd they look like? They were tall, wore masks. One handled a gun and lined up everybody, and the other two had pillowcases. They went down the line and took everything that glittered. Strictly jewelry. Anything big? 20000 from the rest of them. I was queen. Hmm? I was wearing a thing called the Colby Group. Necklace and bracelet belonging to Bert's mother. What price? Hundred thousand. Ooh. There'll be a real payoff on that. Oh. Oh, so that's your angle. What else? How'd these guys get away? They backed out, tipped hats, and left. Fourth man in their car? No. No, one of them went ahead of the other two. Anybody go after him? That's why I couldn't drive myself. All the cars were jammed. Phone lines got. Neat. I suppose so. Is that all you wanted to know? Enough. Um, tell me. What kind of friend have you got who drives a green coupe? Well, I haven't got any friend who drives a green coupe. Neither have I, but he's been following us ever since we left your place. What? Now, look, I'll stop at this next corner, jump out and run into the drugstore. You'll have to follow me. You're a nice guy, Regan. I, I hope you make the great on this. Now. So long. She made it to the drugstore, and he stuck with me. I turned right when I hit Santa Monica Boulevard, and that's when he began playing games. His front bumper tapped my fender, and I pulled over. He crawled out of his car. Heavy man in a suit that didn't fit him around the middle. I didn't like the way he smiled. What do you think of the new Mrs. Colby? Nice girl. You a friend of hers? No, no, never met her, really. You never met me either. That's where you're mistaken. Your name's Regan. You're with International Detective Bureau. You work for the Lion. Sent you out on a job. What did I have for breakfast? 
A lot of talk from the lion about the Colby case, right? You follow me just to tell me that? I wanted to make sure you heard it. Real sure. Well, you can unwrap your bumpers and get moving, Buster. I don't listen easy. That's what they tell me, Regan. Yeah. My name's Winters. I got that badge four years ago. It says American Casualty Company on it, and right next to it, there's a license that makes me one of their investigators. Right now, I'm working on one of their cases. You're wasting a lot of time. No, you're wasting the time, Regan. This is a one-man show. I'm handling it, and I don't want any private peepers snooping around trying to fall in the cracks. You talk like you got it all figured. I got so much of it, there isn't any left for you and the lion. You really know that much? I really know that much. Name me three hoods and black masks. I'll have their files by 6 o'clock tonight. Show me some important stuff called the Colby Group. I'll have that, too. Are they going to close it on talk? Regan, I went to a lot of trouble... To make sure you understood that you're not wanted. There's nothing in this for you or the land. No reward. Nothing. You're not wanted. Clear? Yeah. So clear, I'm taking your license number right now. From here, I go to 3500 Hope Street, City License Bureau. They're going to tell me if you're what you say you are. But no matter what you are, if you get my way, Buster, I'm going to look you up. And if you want to keep your arm, get it off of my car. <laughs> And I checked on him. He was with American Casualty Company, all right. And a phone call at their office told me he'd been put on the Colby thing. So I gave up on that one. It was like trying to do a toe dance in a pair of hip boots. It was about six o'clock when I got to the office. The lion was there. He looked unhappy. Like somebody'd fed him a wax sandwich. Where you been? I've been phoning all over town for you. I went to a double feature. I met a guy named Colby and a girl named Colby. They're husband and wife. Well, that's dandy. That's just great. You can forget them all. It's finished. We struck out. What do you mean? Know what happened in Chicago this afternoon? Want me to guess? A cop threw a couple of slugs into a bimbo named Mickey McIntyre. The other guys, Swede Swanson, gave up right away. Tie it up. Mickey and Swede were carrying some of the ice they heisted from the Colby place last night. They talked. And the guy Chicago's looking for now is named Pete Florio. Some gumshoe around Chicago's gonna tag him, and there goes our reward. Where'd you get all this? Robbery detail here was in on it. So it was over for us three hours ago. Any expenses after that are your own. And in the future, Regan, don't spend all day on a thing. Check with Shut me. up. <coughs> what did you say? Well, he was looking what? at the same thing I was looking at. The three bullet holes across the front of the man who was standing just inside the door. A heavy set man with a bad smile. He wasn't smiling this time. He was trying to talk. Oh, Regan, I... I got it all, but... You like it better than me if you... Who is it, Regan? What's he... Ed Winters, investigator for American Casualty. He in on this? He was. What do you mean? He's dead. Colby thing looked as phony as an undertaker in a pink derby. Colby and his wife, Francie, had a lot of conversation, but they didn't say anything. But the insurance investigator, Ed Winters, talked like he had something. Only didn't get a chance to tell his story. He fell in our front door loaded down with slugs. And it didn't take 20-20 vision to see that all the action wasn't going to be around Chicago, where they picked up two of the three hoods. The lion didn't waste any time. He locked the door and pulled the shades. Then he turned around to me. His eyes looked like dollar signs. Regan, this is a stroke of luck. We're in business again. You got it wrong. The coroner's office got something to do now. Look, we aren't calling up any office until we find out who killed Winters and why. You're out of your mind. Remember, there's a reward for that Colby stuff, and we can still collect with this insurance company guy out of the way. This is homicide now. Call him. And let some rookie walk into the answer? Not on your life. Regan, somebody here in town's in on this. Big. And you're going to find out who. What about him? He isn't going anywhere. Listen, we're the only ones who know about him. We can keep a secret for a while, and that gives us an advantage. He had a secret. He didn't play it smart. Do you realize what this can mean to us? About five years at Folsom. Let me worry about that. Don't you ever give up. Find out who bumped Winters Regan, and we've won the cup. You'll have to give it back. You cheated. Once the lion smells a loose dollar, there's no sense arguing with him. It's like trying to teach ballet to a herd of elephants. Well... 
I went through Winter's pockets, found a billfold and a driver's license, some keys. Nothing that had helped. But downstairs, his green coupe was parked by the curb. The front seat was wet and sticky, but there was a notebook lying there. The single name, Frank Kilmer, was scrawled on the top page, and below it, Pink Lady. That didn't mean anything either. Then I took it with me when I went back out to Bel Air. I found Colby out by the fountain again. He read the opening line. Hello, Mr. Regan. What do you want now? Information. All right, here's something up to date. They caught two of the three men in Chicago this afternoon. I know that much. And the Chicago police expect to arrest the third one, uh, uh, Pete Florio, any minute. And when they arrest Mr. Florio, that will be the end of it. You make it sound easy. <laughs> facts are facts, Mr. Regan. There's another version. Mm -hmm. What is that? Inside work. I don't know what you're looking for, and I don't think I particularly care. I'll just ask you to leave these premises and not bother me nor my wife anymore. Hello, darling. I didn't know we had company. Ah, fancy, sweetheart. This is Mr. Regan. I was just telling him I didn't like him. Hello, Mr. Regan. Have you heard the news? I'm going to get my jewelry back so things aren't so bad after all. That's what Brooklyn thought today. My, you sound vicious. I've met him twice, darling. He always sounds this way. He doesn't think the police will apprehend Pete Florio. Do you, Mr. Regan? You're a long way from the end, Colby. Well, if he feels that way, Bert, and it does happen to work out that way, you'll buy me another bracelet and necklace, won't you? <laughs> of course, sweetheart. Now, Regan, you can see how worried we both are about this whole thing. I'm certain there's nothing more for you to do. You're wrong. I got two things to do. Yes? Find out who Frank Kilmer is and look up the pink lady. Good night. Just a minute. We have to swing wild in the preliminaries. Colby and his wife figured to be in on the main event. I started with the phone book. It didn't turn up a Frank Kilmer, but it did show a pink lady nightclub in San Marino. It wasn't much. It was a little pale guy playing piano in one corner. Figured he'd never been out for a music lesson. I put the question to the bartender. Nope, never heard of a guy named Frank Kilmer. Just got here from Cheyenne myself. Worked at the Frontier for four years. Nice place. Yeah, sure, sure. Anybody else might know? I don't know, Pilgrim. Why don't you ask somebody? Oh, oh ask her. She's the cigarette lady. A uh, kitty. A uh, kitty. Yes, Tom. What is it? Oh. Uh, this is Mr... Regan. Uh, yes, Mr. Regan. He, he wants to ask if you ever seen a guy named uh, Frank Kilmer. <laughs> he don't know what he looks like. Oh. See? She don't Tom, know. why don't you go crack some ice? <laughs> We've got plenty of ice, Kitty. Enough ice to last it's all... It's going to be a hot night. Beat it. Oh, all right, Kitty. All right. And the music, Granny. You know the other guy, Mr. Regan? Maybe. What did he look like? He had a name. And he paid for his information. Yeah. His name was Winters. He was around this morning, knocking on my door. What do you want to know? What do you want to know? About Frank Kilmer. Oh. Go ahead. I'm listening. Wait a minute. Is Frank in trouble? He's a name on a scratch pad to me, lady. I don't want to get anybody in any trouble. Just tell me what you told Winters, okay? I met Frank two years ago. We used to go out once in a while... Then, oh, a little over a year ago, we didn't. What happened? He met somebody else. Yeah, he met somebody else. Who? A singer named Francie Shainer. Uh-huh. They picked up together, Frank and Francie. They were lousy, Regan. I hated her. Then what? They went over to Las Vegas one night and got married. When was this? Over a year ago. I haven't seen them since. But I saw Francie in the paper last week. All about her marrying some guy named Colby. What'd Kilmer do for money? Funny, I don't know. He had money sometimes, and sometimes he didn't. I lent him some. Why? Does the name Pete Florio mean anything to you? No. Should it? Mickey McIntyre? Sweet Swanson? Thanks, Angel. This helps. Regan, you meet lots of people. Maybe you understand things. Like what? Like... Like why she'd take him away from me and then not use him. Why would a girl do a thing like that? I don't know. Maybe she did use him. It was beginning to...
to shape up by the time I left her, but I needed more to go on. The old telephone book gave Francie Shaner, the new Mrs. Colby, an apartment address near Fairfax and Wilshire. I took a chance she hadn't moved all the things out yet. It was on the third floor, right next to the fire escape. And I pulled out a ring of skeletons. The third one did the trick. All the stuff was still there. Some of it packed. Some of it just spread around. In the desk drawer, I found a copy of the Nevada divorce action separating Francie and Kilmer. And in the bedroom, a picture. Tall, dark-looking guy I'd never seen before. It said, Love, Frank. I was still looking for things when I heard the front door open. I clicked off the light and waited. He was a tall, black shadow to me. I couldn't see his face. But that forty-five stood out like a wart on an egg. This didn't come near me, but I had better luck. It spun him around enough to start him back down the hall toward the fire escape. I had to take cover. I got to the fire escape in time to see him run out of the alley and jump in a car. Whoever it was, he was carrying one of my slugs in him. The place was beginning to crawl with people. I went back inside. I figured I'd better check with the lion before I started explaining to the cops. Yeah? I'm calling from her old apartment. I was looking through his stuff when somebody began throwing lead. Lead? Gunplay? Regan, how many times have I told you... Shut up and listen. I hit whoever it was, but he got away. The cops will be here any minute, and I'm going to have to do some explaining. And when I tell it, they'll want a story from you about that stiff in your office. Now, look, Regan, we're about at the end of this thing. What do you know? Francie once had a boyfriend named Kilmer. She married him, divorced him. Kilmer? Not Frank Kilmer. Give it to me. Pete Florio has an alias. It's... Frank Kilmer. I left my card with a skinny guy in blue pajamas so they could find me for the quiz games down at headquarters. It took me ten minutes to get out to that house in Bel Air. I parked outside the gate, walked through the garden to the back. Somebody had drained the fountain. Somebody was sitting there. And it wasn't Colby. Regan... It was Francie, and she had a big hurt. Regan. Regan. I'll have to get a doctor. Too. Too late for that. Who did it? Pete Florio. He thought I tipped Chicago. But you don't know. I know you were married to him when his name was Frank Kilmer. I know you worked this thing out with him. You kill Winters? Who's that? This is no time to lie. All I know is... Pete and I worked out the heist. I wore the jewels that night so he could get it. Only, he didn't take it. He ate it in the fountain here. Yeah, so Pete could come back for it after he straightened out with those other guys in Chicago, huh? Yes. But it didn't work that way. Regan. Regan. Where is it? Did Pete... So bad. And they're not making that model anymore. Don't move a finger. Plane service good from Chicago, Pete? <laughs> the best. I've been there and back in 24 hours. You get around, too, don't you? What's your name? Regan. Regan, I'm going to plug you. Stand up. You're making all kinds of mistakes tonight. My mistake was tying in with Francie. Passed up a hundred grand to stick that knife in her. Now I don't know where the stuff is. Somebody else had a part. Hot air. Wait till you try our gas chamber. Turn around. Now, stand real still. Uh, that's it. I want to watch your collar wilt. <laughs> it was Colby. One hand was hanging like he'd never use it again. Oh. The other one was doing all right. He just kept on. Oh. He grabbed for the bench, then slid down and shook all over a couple of times like he was saying no in a big way. It was finished. He was going to shoot you, Regan. He was going to kill you. I did right, didn't I? I did right? Yeah, yeah, you did fine. You saved the state some expenses. Give me that gun. Yeah, here. Same one you used on Winters? 
Yes. He came to me for money. He found out the same thing I caught you finding out. That my own wife had planned to steal from me. How did you tip to it? A week before we were married, I saw Florio, or Kilmer, whatever you call him, watching the house. I'd seen his picture in Francie's apartment. I, I found what they were planning. I listened in on the phone. And you wanted him to get away with it. So you could get the stuff out of the fountain before Florio got back. So you could stick the insurance company for the payment. I didn't think you needed dough that bad. Regan, it, it wasn't for me. It was for her. All she wanted was money. Now look at her. Regan, all I wanted was her. I didn't care if she stole from me. All I wanted was her. The lion and I spent the next 36 hours at headquarters trying to explain away that stiff in our office. It didn't explain easy. But they began to listen better after Colby showed him where he hid that necklace and bracelet after he took it out of the fountain. Chicago police told us their tip-off had been on a long-distance call. And that straightened that part out. Colby tipped him. He'd been hoping that Pete and all of them would get shot up in the pinch. Well, it didn't work that way. When I got back to the office, the lion was sitting there. He looked sad. Like a derby entry with a broken leg. Regan, I just got terrible news. We aren't going to get a reward. I knew that when I turned in Colby. The stuff never left the premises. Oh, we fouled out on a technicality. And I worked so hard. Sitting here with that stiff must have kept you real busy. It's your fault. You should have let Florio or Colby or somebody walk out of there with that stuff and then nab them. There's money all you ever think about. Well, what else is there to think about? If you got it, you're okay. If you haven't got it, you're a bum. Well, you can find somebody else to go around trying to make a gentleman out of you. I quit. You what? Oh, now, now, just a minute, Jeffrey, please. Let's, let's not fly off the handle. I, I'm just upset, that's all. I, I'm not myself. Yeah. Why, International couldn't get along without you. I couldn't get along without you. You're like my own son. I'm an old man, Jeffrey. You sure are. The rigors of the business, the scars of the battle are heavy with me. Jeffrey, I need you. Oh, sure. You'll stay? Yeah. Good. Here, stop by American Casualty on your way home. Give this to Tim Vickers. What for? For two days' work. Even if we can't collect a reward, we got something coming. You never learn, do you? That's a legitimate bill. Didn't I stand guard over the body of one of their agents all day long? I charged them union rate. What? The pallbearers are organized. It's a branch. What's the matter, Regan? You look worried. I am. I'm just wondering how they're going to explain you in the time capsule. <laughs> Jeff Regan, Investigator, written by E. Jack Newman, directed by Sterling Tracy, is heard at the same time each week over these same stations. Frank Graham plays the title role. Frank Nelson is Anthony J. Lyon. Original music is by Richard Arant. Be with us next week at the same time for another story of suspense and mystery and adventure with Jeff Regan, Investigator. of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. Murder and One to Go. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, stains is my stock and trade. If life's giving you so much punishment you're buckling at the knees, you need my help. George Valentine. Write full details. <laughs> Dear Mr. Valentine, do you remember Carol Gordon? Once she was as glamorous and famous as any movie star you can name today. Then some 18 years ago, when talkies came in, she faded out of the limelight. Dead? Perhaps. 
But if she isn't, I must find her. The only clue I have is that someone thinks he saw Carol Gordon about a year ago, down on Skid Row. The enclosed check is a return. is a retainer. And if you succeed in finding her, there will be a substantial bonus. Sincerely yours, Henry Crichton. Uh, Henry Crichton. Business management and artist representation. Carol Gordon? Uh Uh-uh, careful. Don't say you remember her, Brooksy. You'll give your age away. Well, I don't remember. Two world-shaking events took place in the 20s. The stock market crash and Carol Gordon. Her autograph always gets you two of Wallace Reed in the trade. And now Skid Row. Well, maybe this Mr. Crichton knows of a small part for her. Well, if he's gambling with $250 just to play Good Samaritan, I'd like to shake hands with that gentleman. And if he isn't, it might be a good idea to find out what's on his mind. Mmm. Pretty swank. Ah. Courier and Ives prints right out in the hall. The Dorset building. The agent's paradise. The house the 10% goes. George! Hey, I think that's coming from our client's office, Brooksy. Oh. He's dead! He's dead! In there! Oh, oh so horrible. All right now, sister. All right, take it easy. Get hold of yourself. Well, I'm... Try to calm down. Who's dead? Mr. Crichton. I just came back from lunch. I found him lying there on the floor. The fire poker next to it. His head is... Oh, won't you please call the police? Valentine, I know you were put on this earth to keep me from being bored, to see that I don't fall into a rut, but uh, please, let's keep this murder nice and simple. But take another look at this letter, will you, Lieutenant? You must admit Crichton might have been killed because he was determined to find Carol Gordon. Miss Brooks, I used to be a Carol Gordon fan. Why, it got so Mrs. Riley wouldn't let me go to the movies when her pictures were playing. Why, Lieutenant? But nobody's even thought of that woman in years and years. Crichton dead, Lieutenant. Well, being just a plodding, unimaginative copper, I'm going to have to stick to facts. Namely, Crichton got his head bashed in with a poker from which all the fingerprints were carefully wiped off. Well, that's quite a fact to be stuck with. There was a struggle and the plug of the electric clock on the desk was pulled out of the wall. Now, that sets the time of the murder at 12.35. And a half a dozen people saw Miss Jackson Crichton's secretary in the coffee shop all through the lunch hour. A lieutenant, I understand Crichton had quite an imposing list of clients. Yes, sir, and I'm going to talk to every one of them. No flights are fancy for me, pal. Uh, oh, incidentally, Valentine. Yeah? Uh, how are you going to go about tracing uh, Carol Gordon? Obviously, she doesn't want to be found. And she probably doesn't look anything like she used to. And Skid Row is a pretty big place, you know. George, I think the lieutenant is trying to imply that it's going to be like looking for a needle in a haystack. Well, what's so hard about finding a needle in a haystack? Well, huh? that's what I... What? All you do is get a magnet. The needle comes to you. Now, look, Mr. Cabranian, what'll it cost me to have you run this picture in your movie house tomorrow afternoon? You mean you're going to pay me, fella? What's wrong with it, fella? Oh, nothing's wrong with it, Mr. Cabranian. It was a super colossal production back there in 1928. Yeah, Romance in April, starring Carol Gordon. Never heard of her, fella. You? In the movie business and never heard of her? 1928, I was running a coffee pot. I wish I was still running it. Well, anyway, you wouldn't mind showing this picture for uh, $50, would you? There's just one thing we ought to tell you, Mr. Yeah, I knew this was coming, fella. Uh, there's no sound, no music in this picture. It's, uh, it's silent. It's something new, huh? You don't think for a moment I'd talk you into anything that would damage the reputation of Gabrenian's cameo theater, the gem of Skid Row. Are you kidding? I don't even advertise the picture we're playing. I just hang out a sign, soft seats, open all night, 15 cents. Then this ought to be right down your alley. The slumber of your selected clientele won't be disturbed by any noises coming off the screen. Just a little piano music for mood. Yeah, you might got something there. This is a gal who knows all the angles. Yeah. On her, they look good, too. Too bad the cameo ain't barbecue house like it used to be. You're a real nice filly, lady. 
Why, thank you, Mr. Gabrenian. I don't know whether to blush or whinny. Uh, what's that? Uh, <clears throat> now, what about it? Does romance in April play here tomorrow? It plays. Money in advance, fella. No objection to me selling the tickets? You sell, but remember the tickets are numbered. I'll know just how many people go in. Oh, you're a trusting soul, Mr. Gabrenian. <laughs> you said it. Yes, sir. Here's your ticket, sir. Go right in. Oh, thank you. Well, business is pretty slow, darling. Uh-huh. Well, you can't say Mr. Gabrenian didn't advertise the revival of romance in April. Yeah, with the late Mr. Crichton's money. So far, your magnets attracted nothing but the usual Skid Row characters. Maybe the whole oh, thing... Oh, wait a minute. Hold it, Brooksy. Can you tell me if the features started yet? In just a few minutes, sir. Good. One, please. Thank you. George, didn't you recognize yeah, Brooksy, yeah. We're beginning to draw a better class of people. Anthony Chapman, the movie heartthrob. Now, what would he be doing in a place like this? And trying to look inconspicuous. An interesting question, Angel. I bet the answer's even more interesting. I called up before, young man. I understand romance in April goes on at 2.15. Is that correct? Yeah. You've got two minutes to make it. Just like to be sure, time is money. At 15 cents? Is that correct? And I understand the picture runs an hour and 12 minutes. Yeah, that's correct. Someone else out slumming. <laughs> a little man in a big briefcase. Brooksy, what's your guess? Vice president of a bank? A successful insurance salesman? Or just a lover of the silent cinema? Uh, you know, I got a definite feeling we started something here. What? Hey! Oh. Look what we've got now, George. The carriage trade drawing up. Now I'm sure we ought to change prices before six. You can call for me in about an hour, Ralph. Yes, ma'am. One seat in the loge, please. Loge? I uh, doubt if we can build you one at a moment's notice. What? Oh, well, whatever you've got. Thanks. Thank you. Hmm. I'd say that was about $5,000 worth of mink on the hoof. Hey, look, a Brennan actually opened the door for him. I don't blame the man for being overwhelmed. Looks like all kinds of people don't mind coming to this popcorn cove to see romance in April. Uh, one ticket, please. It's 15 cents, isn't it? Yeah, and you're just in time for the picture. Let's see, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Hope you don't mind the pennies. That's all I have. Oh, they add up just the same. They are. I hope you enjoy the picture. Yeah, I'm sure I will. I take it you're a Carol Gordon fan. Yeah, and her severest critic. How'd you hear that, Brooksy? That's an angel, I think. Carol Gordon? Oh, that couldn't be, George. Well, I could be wrong. But there was something about her eyes. But she seemed so old and pathetic. Come on, Brooksy. Caprinian can take over the box office now. We're going inside and make sure. Broken Gabrenian's heart to hire a piano player for the day. That girl on the screen, Angel. Look at it carefully. Don't you see some resemblance between her and the woman we saw before us at the box office? Mm, sorry, George. I can't talk myself into it. Mm, yeah. Maybe I am punching a little too hard. Oh, she was beautiful, wasn't she? Even in that costume with a waistline down to her knees. And not a bad actress to compete with these titles. Ellen looked at the faded flowers and thought of the waste of her own life. <laughs> oh, brother. No! No! Sure. No! Oh, the waste of life! My life! What did I do? It was Carol Gordon. What happened? Come on, stick with me, Brooksy. Get out of here. Her room is right down the hall here, folks. Yeah, see, Brooksy, I told you she didn't just vanish. We were about giving up hope, mister. We've been over this block with a fine-tooth comb for the last hour. Hmm. can imagine the places you've been in, miss. Now, this here hotel don't rightly belong down in this neighborhood. 
Why do you know we change bed sheets and towels twice a week? Yeah, well, bully for you, but what, what did you say was the name she was using? Uh, Ethel Mills. That is if it's the woman you've been describing. And you know, funny thing. What's that? Huh? Well, about 20 minutes ago, while I was away from the desk, somebody left a bottle of champagne for her. Champagne? Yep, yep. All wrapped up fancy, too. Brought it right up to her. No other hotel around here gives room service like we do. Well, uh, here it is. She's in there all right. And I think I know what happened. What do you mean? Well, if Ethel has the bottle around, it don't last long. Well, something might have happened to her. In her frame of mind. Yeah, we better take a look, friend. Yeah, that's right, young fella. Don't want anything bad happening to the reputation of the hotel. Uh-oh. Mm, I'd like a light. Well, don't just stand there. Where are those towels you're so proud of? All right, over there. Oh. Come on. Try to sit up. I... I can't. They're hurting. Mm. Usually she don't feel like that until the next day. And the bottle's only half empty. Seems somebody left a card with it, too. Let me see that. To Carol Gordon. On the day of her triumphant return to the screen. Oh, wait, this wet towel ought to help her. No time for that, Brooksy. We have to get her to a hospital. But, George, she's only... Only been poisoned. One sniff of this bottle will tell you that. Poison? Somebody else followed her here from the cameo. Somebody who wants to see Carol Gordon dead. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about winter driving. If you find the January days are kind of chilly, don't forget, cold weather is rough on your car, too. It may mean a lot of grinding starting wear, an extra drain on your car's battery. But a sure way to get fast starts, to keep your battery from working overtime, and to keep operating costs down, is to use Chevron Supreme gasoline. For this high-octane motor fuel has special blending agents that give fast starts and speedy warm-up every time you use the starter. Besides lending a helping hand to your battery, Chevron Supreme gives fast pickup in traffic, smooth acceleration, and the extra power that makes your car great on hills. It's a premium quality gasoline, and it's climate-tailored for each different altitude and temperature zone in the West. That means you can depend on it the year-round for fast starts and smoother extra power wherever you motor. Get a tank full of Chevron Supreme gasoline tomorrow. Get it at standard stations and at independent Chevron gas stations, where they say, and mean, we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Someone hires you to trace down an old movie star named Carol Gordon. Even before you can get started, your client is found murdered. You pick up from there and finally locate the once famous beauty in a cheap Skid Row hotel. The payoff there is that someone's tried to kill her, too. If you're like George Valentine, you won't rest till you find out why murder is singing such a merry song of mayhem. Valentine, I don't care where you've got Carol Gordon. Get her down here to headquarters. Well, you can't blame the lieutenant for hiding her out when she left the hospital. Somebody's out to get her. Now, look, chum boy, I'm not too sure the lady didn't try to poison herself. Yes, yeah, so you've been saying, with bullheaded regularity. Well, you forget the elevator boy in Crichton's building. He recognized Carol Gordon's picture, put her right on the seat of the crime. Now, guilty conscience. I want to talk to her. Uh-huh. Maybe you got an answer for those three strangely out-of-place characters who showed up at the revival of Romance in April. Oh, Tony Chapman and Miss Ferris are both movie people. Maybe... Maybe morbid curiosity brought him down there. Who knows? Uh-uh, Riley. It seems a little more than coincidence that just when Crichton hired me to find Miss Gordon, those two should decide to take in one of her pictures at the cameo. Well, Also, uh... both Chapman and Miss Ferris were managed by Crichton. And what makes it even more screwier, they just became engaged to each other. And yet they show up at that theater at different times. I don't care how it sounds. Chapman has an alibi for the time of Crichton's murder. The attendant in the garage of his apartment house vouches for the time. As for Miss Ferris, well, as far as she's concerned, she has no motive. And the mousy little man who showed up at the revival. The one with a briefcase under his arm. I told you I saw him hanging around the hospital, too. <sighs> okay, okay. If and when we find this little gnome, I'll talk to him. In the meantime, you get Carol Gordon down here and fast. <laughs> Hey, 
are, Miss Gordon. My car is parked right over here. There's, there's really nothing I can tell the lieutenant, Mr. Valentine. Well, you just tell him the truth, Carol. And if he growls at you a little, don't let him upset you. Okay, here we are. The three of us can fit into the front seat. Oh, I, I know my story sounds a little weak, but I did drop in to see Henry Crichton on a personal matter. Once we were good friends. But when I found him like that, I didn't stop to think. I hurried down the stairs and out of the building. Yes, yeah, sure, I understand that. I don't know if I can turn around here on the hill. I think it's the quickest way back to headquarters. What's the matter? Hey, George! We're rolling down the hill. Somebody's been monkeying around with the brakes. They won't hold. Oh, try to keep it straightened out, George. We're going faster. We're going up on the sidewalk. Hang on. on. I'm going to crash. Oh. It's too close for comfort. Oh. Everybody all right? Oh. What about you, Miss Gordon? I'm Bye. just yeah, shaking up. Good lady. thing I picked out a wooden fence. What happened? Oh, we got drunk and driving. Looks like somebody tried to get all three of us this time. Yes, doesn't it? Oh, oh wait a minute. Huh? What's the matter? You see that Miss Gordon gets to headquarters. I just spotted someone I want to talk to. Okay, George. Hey, let me through here, will you? One side, please. Hey, you come back here. A few questions I want to ask you. Let go of me, please. I don't know anything. There's nothing I can tell you. Now, look, Buster, I've been dreaming about you in that briefcase. What makes you pop up all over the place? Well, I, I've been following you just to see that Miss Gordon was all right. But nothing happened to her. Come me. on, come on. Who are you? The name is Moody, sir. Walter Moody, you see? Here, here's my card. Walter Moody, 6th Street Grammar School, principal. I don't get it, friend. I am the oldest and the most faithful member of the Carol Gordon fan club. I venture to say the only member after all these years. Are you kidding? Oh, she was a fine actress. I have a great big shelf just full of scrapbooks. Her pictures, almost every line that was ever written about Miss Gordon. Hey, you know, this is just cockeyed enough to turn out to be useful. I beg your pardon. Would you help Miss Gordon if she were in real trouble? Oh, I'd do anything, sir. Anything. Okay, Mr. Moody. Let's begin by taking a look at that five-foot shelf of yours. You mean Carol actually used to correspond with you, Mr. Moody? Oh, yes. <laughs> My, personally. I used to send the information in a newsletter to fans all over the country. Hmm. This must have been a big event in their life, according to this communique. My dearest number one fan, something has happened here today in this beautiful little town that's made me the happiest girl in the world. Soon I hope to be able to tell you all about it. I've always been curious about that, Mr. Valentine. What did she mean? Hmm. Eudora, California, December 9th, 1929. You know, Mr. Moody... I may be able to satisfy your curiosity. Nineteen twenty-nine, December. Yep, I write here in Marekas. December ninth. Ethel Mills and Anthony Switzer. I can remember them too very well. Our first couples are married as justice of the peace. Anthony Switzer could be Tony Chapman. Why not? Huh? Look here, son. What's all the shooting about anyway? Mm, what do you mean, Pops? Well, just last week, fellow was here. Named Crichton. With a young lady. <laughs> Long blonde hair. You want the same information? I think you've really given me something to wedge with, Pops. Thanks a lot. Naturally, I can't deny it, Valentine. It's a matter of record. Maybe you didn't deny it, Chapman, but you certainly have done everything to keep your marriage to Carol Gordon a secret. Don't make me out a heel, will you? When talking pictures came in, Carol simply disappeared. After a while, I thought she was dead. You know, it would be a terrible shock to your fans, Chapman, to find out that you let your wife simply disappear when she may have needed you. Don't I know that? And now engaged to beautiful and blonde Miss Ferris. No one can say I haven't tried to find my wife. When I heard about one of her pictures being shown, I even went to the theater thinking she might turn up. Uh-huh. And when she did, did you follow her and leave a bottle of champagne so she could celebrate her triumphant return to the screen? Uh, but, what? I don't know what you're talking about. I lost her in the crowd after she ran out. It... You know, Chapman, you'd fit in nicely as the murderer of Crichton. 
If you didn't have such a perfect alibi... I've been through all that with the police. The attendant downstairs in the garage saw me drive in at 12.30. Yeah, I know, I know. You told him you weren't locking the car. Which I always do. But I'd lost my key. Still haven't got around to getting one, as a matter of fact. Okay, Chapman, okay. I'm just checking. Anyway, now I can work out something with Carol. Get a quiet divorce. Maybe... Tony, I've been waiting hours for you down in the lobby. What in the world uh, are you Oh, well, Valentine, I'd like to meet Arlene Ferris, my fiancée. Tell me, Miss Ferris... You make it a practice to become engaged to men you know are married? What? Why Tony. did you have to do that, Valentine? Arlene didn't know, and there's really no reason why she should. The whole thing might have been smoothed over. But you did know about Carol Gordon, didn't you, Arlene? You must be out of your mind. You and Henry Crichton paid a little visit to Eudora shortly before he was murdered. Arlene. Now, what was the deal? Were the two of you going to shake Chapman down after I located Carol? This isn't true, is it, Arlene? Why should I deny it? Seemed a very good idea at the time. Good Lord. Do you think I was infatuated with your worn-out boyish charm, your toupee? What? The caps on your teeth? Shut up, you... What do you well, think you are? Well, if you two are going to have an emotional wing-ding, you probably want a little privacy. Good day. Hey, Lieutenant... We can use this office in back of the garage. Go on in, Miss Gordon. Tell me, Valentine. Why a garage? Why didn't you call up and ask me to meet you in a Turkish bath? Oh, 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 please, Lieutenant. The ladies. Ah. Now, what's this all about? Well, I didn't think you'd have any objections to Miss Gordon making a phone call. Oh, for the love of Mike, why couldn't she have done it from my office? It wouldn't have worked that way. Oh, I... I don't know if I can say the things you told me, Mr. Valentine. I hate Tony. Hated him ever since he didn't lift a finger to help me. When he knew I was desperate. But just do your best, Carol. As an actress, your best is better than you think. I'm sure of it. Okay, here's his number. I'll dial it for you. Well. Hey, I'm... Oh, all right. Hello. Tony? This is Carol. Yes, I know this must be a shock to you. But listen, dear, let me do the talking. Tony, I've been unfair to you all these years. I should have come back and let you have the divorce. It must have been dreadful for you. Couldn't we do that now? Quietly, so that no one need ever know. Then you'll be free. Yes. Uh, meet me in five minutes. On the corner of State and McGovern. Please hurry. Goodbye. Oh, you were wonderful. Yeah. That ought to get Mr. Chapman down here in the garage with the speed of light. Light? <laughs> Why don't you try shedding some once in a while, Valentine? There shall be light, Lieutenant, I hope. Now, you ladies stay here in the office. Come on, Riley. Here's Chapman's custom job over here. Well, what do I do? Just stand here and admire it? What the... Come on back here, Lieutenant. We want to see this act without being seen. How, why'd you do that? Just a pious hope. And if I'm wrong, I'll... Wait a minute. There's Chapman. Get back at his car. That fool attendant must have locked it anyway. Having trouble, Buster? What? I'll take those keys. This one in particular. The one you said you'd lost. Your fancy alibi. Let go of this. Remember your manners, Chapman. Let Chum Boy have the key. What? What is this? A frame up? Oh, famous last words. Ah, that's the trouble with elaborate alibis. People are so forgetful. Or to say it another way, friend. You just put the finger on yourself. George Valentine will be back in just a moment to explain his reasons for naming Chapman as the killer. Meanwhile, quite a few folks have the impression that the only values an artist knows are color values. But not so with artist Wren Wicks of Beverly Hills, California. 
When it comes to economy and car operation, Mr. Wicks knows the value of RPM motor oil. Here's Mr. Wicks' statement, quote, It takes a lot of things to keep a car running. One thing is good motor oil. That's why I selected RPM years ago. It reduces wear, cuts repair bills, unquote. RPM motor oil will save wear in your car, too. will bring a new economy to your car operation. For this premium quality motor oil was developed precisely for modern high-speed engines. Chemical compounds in RPM keep your entire engine cleaner. They protect those finely polished, close-fitting parts. Protect them from corrosion, gum, lacquer, and carbon. If your car is about due for a drain and refill, give it a new lease on life by getting RPM motor oil. Remember, it's better for your car and for your pocketbook. Get RPM at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. How did George Valentine come to suspect Chapman? Right at the moment, that's a question that's also troubling Lieutenant Riley. Valentine, if I played hunches like you do, I, I'd be laughed out of the department. I have to stick to facts. Well, that's the advantage I have, Lieutenant. When a hunch doesn't pay off, there's only Angel here to do the laughing. Oh, I only snicker. How long are you two going to talk shop? For instance, the one hunch about running Carol Gordon's picture brought a lot of other things to the surface. Chapman must have come down to the cameo all ready to follow Carol if she showed up. He and his lethal champagne. Yeah, he also made a scooter out of my car. <laughs> yeah, yeah, quite a mechanic. Old lover boy even knew how to stop the clock in Crichton's office at the right time to make his alibi stick. George, I still don't know why you hunched Arlene out of the picture. Oh, she had too good a deal with Crichton, blackmailing Chapman to spoil it. Everything would have turned out as planned if Chapman hadn't found out what his business manager was cooking up. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, don't be so depressed, Lieutenant. I'll try to teach George a healthier respect for facts. <laughs> you shouldn't be bothering your lovely head with facts, Angel. Not with your corner on the market when it comes to figures. Why, darling. Oh, just stating a fact, sweetheart. Oh, you can say the sweetest things, dearest. <laughs> well, I've got a great big hunch my stomach can't stand much more of this, so goodbye, kids. <laughs> Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Brooksy. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Jeanette Nolan as Carol Gordon, John McIntyre as Chapman, Virginia Gregg as Arlene... Howard McNear as Moody, Louis Van Ruten as Gabrenian, and Dick Ryan as the manager. The music is composed and presented by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. Your Money or Your Life, another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger's my stock and trade. If you're on a spot where a step forward drags you two steps back, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, I'm taking for granted this is confidential, so here goes. A couple of days ago, I got so desperate, I stole to get some dough to pay off a debt. 
What I want most is to see the guy I borrowed from get what's coming to him for running a racket that smells to high heaven. Maybe you heard of him. His name is Douglas Harger, and I want to see something happen to him. If this hits you right, you've got a job. The only time I can talk to you is between 12 and 1 at Molly's Cafe on Pierpont Street. Signed, Fred Dundee. <laughs> Give it a look, Fred. Don't you see I can't play ball with you? Why not? You'll be getting paid for it. Well, I can't take that kind of money. Who did you steal it from? That's my business, Miss Brooks. And if you're worried about me making it my life's work, forget it. It was my first and last time. I know, Fred. And I'd like to help you, but... Oh, sure, sure. All the chili, Mike. I suppose that's what you fellas call ethics, huh, Valentine? Well, I... But it's all right for Harger to make all the dirty money he wants without anybody saying a word. How can you be so sure it's Harger who's running this loan shark business? I borrowed that money from Phil Pagano. He's always going in and out of Harger's Melody Club. He works for him. Yeah? You should hear his line. Go on, kid. Your credit is good. If the wife's going to have a baby, let her have the best. Huh? You got a whole month to pay back the two fifty. Of course, there'll be a hundred dollar service charge. But then we don't ask for no security, which you don't have. I tell you, I can't. Hold it, Fred. Take it easy. I know you think I was a schnook to take his money, but I wanted Peg to have everything good when she was having the kid. I couldn't borrow anywhere else because I'm in hock up to my ears now. But think of the chance you were taking when you decided to steal. Don't I know? But they wouldn't give me any more time. They didn't just threaten me. They, they said things that happened to Peg if I didn't raise the dough. Uh-huh. You know, there may be an answer to this. There's got to be, Valentine. It's not just myself. Think of all the other people who get squeezed and do things they never would have done to pay Harger back. That's why I couldn't just pay up and forget it. I want... I know, I know. You want something to happen to him. All right, tell you what, Fred. What? I'll take the job and see what I can do. Oh, that's swell. There's a little money left. I'll give no, you... No, Fred, no. You just make sure you hold on to that. Now I'm working for free. Well, good to see you again, Mr. Valentine. The Melody Club doesn't have many interesting visitors during the day. Come off it, Hager. And tell this muscle head to get off the couch and get out of here. I want to talk to you alone. Did I hear you call me? You should be more careful in your choice of words, Mr. Valentine. This gentleman is supposed to be my bodyguard. Although you'd hardly tell it to see him lying around reading comic books. Come on, Buster. Up you come. Outside. Let go of me. Put the gun away, Marty. We don't want to give our guests the wrong impression. You'd better go sit at the bar and soothe your chagrin. Okay. That's the way you want it. Well, Mr. Valentine... You are as friendly as ground glass today. Never mind the patter. I want $350 from you, and I want it now. Oh, a little strapped, eh? Well, I think you're a good risk. Glad to oblige. Oh, no, you got me wrong. I'm not borrowing it. You're giving it to me. For keeps. Oh, come now. Just as you have your principles, I have mine. I'm a businessman. I never give anything unless it's for value received. Yeah, well, you're going to make an exception. This is for someone who got hurt on one of your loan shark deals. What are you talking about? Your boy Phil Pagano bore down so hard on a friend of mine he had to go out and steal. Now, this is to square things for him. <laughs> Ridiculous. If out of the goodness of his heart someone I know lends money and collects it in his own way, that has nothing to do with me. 350 bucks, Harger. Let's have it. I could have you thrown out. Well, why don't you? You know how violence unnerves me, Mr. Valentine. <laughs> But as long as the sum is so paltry, I'll let you play Santa Claus. <laughs> if you had a conscience, Harger, I might be tempted to say it should feel better. Uh, here you are. Oh, may I ask, is this a single commission for a client, or do you have more quixotic and ambitious plans in the same direction? Why do you ask? Just curiosity? No, no, no. I just want to be prepared. As much as I despise any form of physical conflict, Mr. Valentine... I may be forced to make another exception to my principles.
Valentine, you may not have noticed, but the word on the door says homicide. Don't come to me about loan sharks. Riley, how can Harger operate a racket like this without your worthy colleagues putting the arm on You say it's Harger. I suspect it's Harger. It might well be Harger, but when we pick up one of those strong-arm bankers, he says it's a personal deal. Yeah? There's nothing in writing. The victims are too scared to say anything, and there's no mention of Harger. Now, go ahead. You arrest somebody. Lieutenant, you should have talked to Fred Dundee. <sighs> Look, Miss Brooks, we don't like the idea either, seeing the little people in this city being pushed around. A question, Lieutenant. One simple question. Oh, I know your simple questions. They take till doomsday to answer. Oh, wouldn't you say it'd take a lot of cold, hard cash to supply what you call these strong-arm bankers? Uh, there must be dozens of them covering the city. And they're ready to lend dough right on the line. You just name the amount. What are you driving at? Hager isn't headed for the poorhouse, but neither does he get his mail in care of Fort Knox. And he has so many other interests that take cash to run. Christopher Arena, his nightclubs, and all the rest of yeah, them. Yeah, in other words, somebody else has to be furnishing the wherewithal, the financier of the angel. Now, have you ever heard of anyone connected with him who could even vaguely fit that description? Not even vaguely. Oh, great. Well, there's nothing like being a pioneer and trying to find the answer to my own question. There's Pagano in there at the bar, Valentine. Yeah, I see him, Fred. He always hangs out here at Maloney's, 8 to 12 every night. So any sucker like me who wants money, I know where to find him. I think I can charm him out so you can talk to him alone, George. Or do I sound like I'm confusing myself with Betty Grace? Oh, he'll fall for you like a ton of bricks. He thinks he's a ladies' man, Miss Brooks. But you be careful of him. He's an oily little rat who carries a knife. A knife, huh? Hey, look, Angel, uh, maybe we ought to forget this. Look, I'll find another way to get you, man. Hey, Brooksy, what? Stop dead, mister. I've got an appointment with a gentleman. What can I get you, lady? Oh, nothing, thanks. Oh, hey, sweetheart. I'm good fit around here. And when they come like you, I can do better than that. Much better. No, I, uh, um, I only wanted to talk to you alone. Oh? Yeah. I need money. Need it real bad. Why me? Oh, names get around, you hear things. Somebody said I'd find you here. What seems to be your trouble, sweetheart? Probably nothing new to you. The show I was dancing in folded up. I held out as long as I could, and now I've got to borrow money. What's your name? What show? Vivian Dupre did a solo in Gals Can Be Pals, the Morrison Circuit. Your real name, I mean, Mr. Prey. Okay. Mary Sullivan. Do I get the money? I'll pay it back. Usually I work regular. All right. Don't get so nervous, Mary. Bill Pagano will take care of you. Uh, how much do you call money? Well, I'm afraid it's got to be at least 300. <laughs> Bill Pagano can still take care of you. Oh. And he's happy to. Oh, when can I have it? What do I have to sign, Mr. Pagano? Well, this is no joint to talk about something personal, sweetheart. Suppose we go over to my place and set up the deal. Well, I, I don't now, know. I you trust me, don't you, kid? Oh, you know I do, Mister Pagano. <laughs> what are we waiting for? Ah, here we are, sweetheart. Where did I get my key? Y yeah. The way you're looking around, you think he was expecting somebody. Oh, no. No, it's just that, well, the hall is so dark. Well, take care of that right now. Uh, Go ahead in, Mary. Oh, no, you first. Uh, okay. I don't know who you are, bud, but I'm going to... Shut up. And you, babe, sit down over there. What? Oh. oh, yes, sir. Copper? We'll talk when you take your hand off that knife in your pocket. Oh, so you heard about me, huh? Well, then you ought to know I let this knife do my talking for me. Now, wait a minute. Listen to me, handsome. Hager sent me to see you. Huh? You're lying. Yeah, I started working for him today. It seems he lost his respect for Marty as a bodyguard. You think I'm going to believe that? Hager says you've been charging extra interest on loans and holding out on him. You've shaken his faith in mankind, Phil. I never held out a cent in my life. Now, snap that knife closed. I want to have nice things to report about you. Well, that's a good boy. Before we do any talking, what about the babe here? Oh, well, I wouldn't want her to miss this for anything. Oh! Oh! All right. 
you're working for Hagge. But I want to know more than that. Hey, get, get off me. Take, take your knee out of my chest. Now, who finances the setup? Who's the top oh. man on the totem pole? I, I don't know. I don't know nothing. Hey, you, oh, don't. Who really runs the racket? Supplies are ready, cash. Come on, talk. All right. All right. Uh, I'll tell you. Stop it. Yeah. Leslie. Leslie who? Leslie Ramson. Out in Compton Hills. Okay. Thanks, Phil. You've been very helpful. I don't want to seem ungrateful, but I gotta do this. Sweet dreams, handsome. Well, what do I do? Cheer or just fold up like an accordion? Sorry I had to expose you to that bit of rough stuff, Angel. But even if it takes more of the same, I'm gonna clean this thing up. Compton Hills? But there's nothing out there but fashionable estates. Yeah, I know. But that's the next stop, Brooksy. We're getting up in the world. Leslie will be down in just a moment, Mr. Valentine. In the meantime, would you like to step in here and see some of my books? Huh? Oh, I, uh, sure, all right. Uh, may, uh, may I get you a drink? Uh, I'd ring for one of the servants, but it's their night off. No, 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 thanks. Did you mention it was important? Yes, yes, I told Leslie. You know, Mr. Valentine, I suppose most people would say that my life is an unpardonable waste. So much of it given to collecting books, living with them. But then, what is important, young man? In college, they drummed me out of my philosophy class, Mr. Remsen. Now, would you mind calling upstairs again and that see if... That won't be necessary. Oh, uh, Mr. Valentine, uh, have you met my wife? Huh? Leslie, dear, this is the young man who has been waiting for you. You... I mean... Oh. Hey, I'm Leslie. I'm sorry I'm not wearing a mustache. I understand you have some business you want to discuss with me, Mr. Valentine. Well, uh, yes. Uh, why don't you two stay right here in the library? Thank you, Paul. I have to phone my book dealer anyway. You know, Mr. Valentine, Leslie just can't understand my passionate interest in books. No? But uh, then again, I'm often baffled by her interests. Even though I understand them. Well, good night. I received a very enlightening telephone call while you were waiting, Mr. Valentine. Then you ought to know why I'm here, Leslie. Or uh, I suppose I ought to start calling you Mrs. Remsen. No. No, I like Leslie better. You seem to think I'm masterminding some sort of minor crime wave. Aren't you? (laughs) That was a melodramatic way of putting it. The question is, what are you going to do about it? We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Did you know that in the early 30s, the oil industry had to meet the challenge of new, high-powered cars? A plain mineral oil just couldn't lubricate the new, powerful engines properly. Engineers at Standard of California met the problem with compounded RPM motor oil, the oil that won't run away from internal engine hot spots that keeps a protective film on all parts when a car is standing cold, and that cleans your engine as it lubricates. One motorist quick to see the advantages of RPM motor oil is F.B. Stormont of Tombstone, Arizona. Mr. Stormont started using RPM in 1936. He states that he has been a constant user of this premium motor oil for the past 13 years. He's driven the same car all these years, Driven it close to 100,000 miles with only one major overhaul job in all that distance. That's really protection you can trust. And to give your own car this superior protection, stick to RPM motor oil. Ask for RPM at standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations where they say and mean we take better care of your car. Now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. You're not surprised to find a hard-bitten operator like Douglas Harger mixed up in the loan shark racket that has victimized your client. You're not surprised when you run into assorted forms of mayhem. What does rock you back on your heels 
is that the beautiful and wealthy Mrs. Leslie Remsen is apparently the banker and kingpin. But if you have George Valentine's recuperative powers, you counter with a surprise of your own. Now, Leslie, what does Harger have on you? I could see my husband took an immediate liking to you. I can't say I'd blame him, George. Okay, be evasive. I'll do the talking. I don't mind listening. He has to be blackmailing you one way or another. You wouldn't get mixed up in a filthy deal like this if you weren't forced into it. It can't be the money. Maybe I just like the excitement. You know what this shuffle means in human misery. Maybe I'm a psychopathic case. Oh. Well, maybe it's as simple as this. <sighs> it's almost worth being an arch criminal. To be kissed like that. Uh-huh. That's all it is, Leslie. You've got a low melting point. Well, the kiss was worth the slap. But it is the truth, isn't it? Leave me alone. A beautiful woman married to a man years older. That could be dynamite. Now, what was it? Letters you wrote to somebody? Is that what Hager's holding over you? Yes. They were quite inflammatory. In fact, I remember them more vividly than the man I wrote them Then you'd to. better find a way to get them back, sister, or you're a gone gosling. No one can prove anything, not even you. I beat it out of one of Hager's mugs, and the police can, too. The point is, there will never be any mention of Harger, only you. He'll make like he never heard of you before in his life. How did I get into this? George, you've got to get those letters back for me. Now you're frightened, aren't you? You can have whatever it's worth to you. Money, anything. No promises, Leslie. But I'll give it a whirl. I'll live up to my end of the bargain. You won't have to. It's all part of services rendered for another client. And a lot of other people like him. Now, look, Fred, I've got an idea. A way to take all the pep out of Harker. And if it works, what happened to you and Peg won't ever happen to anyone else. Let me have it. I'll do anything. I've got to get some letters out of Harker's safe at the Melody Club. Huh? Letters signed Leslie Remsen. <laughs> I don't know much about blowing safes. Now, I could try to scare him into giving them to me at the point of a gun, but he knows it wouldn't shoot him. Yeah? But, and this is where you come in. If someone with a nervous trigger finger and a man-sized grudge walked in... Hager would really sweat. I see what you're driving at. Sure, sure. You put on an act. You don't like the way you were taken for a ride. You're going to get even. You want him to open the office safe so you can help yourself. I'll put on an act that could get me a Hollywood contract. Now, Fred, you know there's a risk involved. But we've got to have those letters. You've got them. But there's just one thing. What's that? That gorilla, Marty. He's always following Hager around. He never lets him out of his sight. Okay, okay, that's my job. I'll get Marty off the scene. At 9.30 tonight, Hargo will be alone at the Melody Club. That's when you walk in. Pick up Marty Harris for questioning. That's right, Lieutenant, and keep him under wraps overnight. What am I supposed to sweat out of him? I want him out of the way, Riley. It's important. I suppose it would be rude of me to ask why. Oh, huh? not rude. I, I just don't want to bother you. Huh? <laughs> Since when? <laughs> Don't you remember, Lieutenant? This isn't in your department. George, down the alley. There's Fred now. Yeah, good. Hop in, Fred. Well, well they're all right here. Have any trouble? <laughs> Just trying to act nervous. I had to slug cargo to give me time to get out. That must have thrilled you no end. Drive around the block, Angel. Well, I don't want to sound faint-hearted, but wouldn't it be a good idea to put some distance between us and the Melody Club? Drop me off at that cab stand on you, Fred. Yeah? Beat it home to Peggy. You did a good night's work. Well, I'll take a bow when it pays off. I hate to think I'm just supposed to keep driving around the block. Park just before you get to the entrance of the club, Brooksy. I got a hunch Hager's going to come streaking out of there in a few minutes. Yeah, that's what I'm afraid of. Now, you stick on his trail. I got to know where he goes. You can call me at Leslie Remsen's. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Valentine, but you just missed Leslie. Oh. She seemed rather in a hurry, too. Well, do you know where your wife went, Mr. Remsen? Well, let's see. It uh, it could be the Dauphin Room, the Eldorado, Antoine's, or possibly Le Coq d'Or. Hmm. 
For a bibliophile, you know your night spots. As a husband, I know my weak spots. Not being able to keep up a hectic social pace, I try to substitute patience and a modicum of wisdom that comes with the years. Meaning just what, Mr. Remsen? Let's not spar. Meaning all things come to him who waits. I'm quite able and willing to wait for Leslie. Hmm. Hey, you're okay, Remsen. All right, I'll kick around those spots you mentioned and see if I can find Leslie. Oh, just a moment, Valentine. You probably think it's strange I never questioned you about, about your business with my wife. Well, I... Of course, I uh, have sense that she's in some kind of trouble. I'll... I'll even venture to say that you're here to deliver that little package. Huh? Would they be ill-advised letters? Leslie's very impulsive. Well, uh, as a matter of fact... Don't be embarrassed. I'm not going to ask to see them. They don't matter. It was foolish of her to get in trouble because of them. Mr. Remsen, why are you telling me this? Because I know you're trying to help her. That being the case, you ought to know how I feel. Oh, pardon me. Hello. Hmm? Oh, yes, yes, he's right here. It's for you. It's a Miss Brooks. Oh, thanks. Yeah, Brooksy? Uh Uh-huh. Both of them, huh? He met her there, the Gramercy room. No, use your head, Angel. No matter how many of Hogger's men are staking out the place, I gotta do this alone. Okay, I'll be right there. You must think I'm a fool, Douglas. You have no choice but to sign it, Leslie. You never asked me to sign receipts for money from any of your collectors before. (laughs) I've decided we should be more businesslike. Yes, and to avoid any stigma of blackmail, I'm going to let you have your letters back. Well, what's this gentleman trying to sell you now, Leslie? George. Sorry, we can't ask you to sit down, Mr. Valentine. Why, thanks, I will. (laughs) A business conference? George, Douglas said that if I sign these receipts... He'd let me have my letters back. Letters? What letters? Have you any letters belonging to the Lady Hogger? I made a mistake some time ago not teaching you to keep out of my affairs. I never make the same mistake twice, Mr. Valentine. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't be surprised if these were the letters you meant. George, you did get them. Uh-huh. So, that's why you wanted me to sign these, Douglas. You had to find some other way to keep me under your thumb. Nice try, Hager. You don't think you're going to keep those letters very long, do you? Oh, I know you've got your private goon squad sprinkled around. It seems quite a shame that my long-cherished principle of non-violence should go overboard this way. I'll take them, George. They won't dare touch me. Uh -uh, uh Uh-uh, uh-uh. Take it easy. Buster's playmates don't know the meaning of the word chivalry. You're a realist, Mr. Valentine. I admire that in a man. Why, Georgie! What a lovely surprise. What? The most wonderful thing just Look, happened. Brooksy, why didn't you well, do as I told you? Well, well, fancy seeing you here. And as I live and breathe, my old friend Douglas Hogg. Good evening, Lieutenant. It's a funny <laughs> thing, George, how I ran into Lieutenant Riley. You know, there's a big policeman's ball tonight. There's a big... No, I, I didn't. Uh, 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 sort of a spur-of-the-moment affair, you know. Yes, and he <laughs> wants us to come along as his guest, darling. Uh-huh. He's even got a squad car outside. A squad car. Yes, sir. Else, well, you'll join us, won't you, Leslie? Uh, yes, I'll be happy to. We'll be with you in a minute. Well, don't be long now. We'll wait for them at the bar. Why, you bet we will. <laughs> um, you wouldn't care to go to the policeman's ball, would you, Hugger? I'm afraid I shouldn't be very good company. You know, Valentine, I relish having you as my private nemesis. If it weren't for you, my life would be much too pallid and uncomplicated. I look forward to our next meeting. Good night. Yeah. I won't forget what you've done for me, George. May I have those letters now? No, Leslie. Find his keepers. What? Yep. I think I'll just hold on to them now. Oh, incidentally, your husband is waiting for you. You know, I do a lot to keep Paul from getting hurt. He's a very nice guy. Wait a minute. Hmm? I get it. Blackmail. With a good housekeeping stamp of approval. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. 
Oh, George, before you burn those letters, you might at least have let me peek at one of them. <laughs> you know, that's what I like about you, Angel. You're so unscrupulously feminine. Yeah, but seriously, George, do you think Leslie and her husband will make a go of it now? Oh, maybe. As long as she thinks I still have the letters, she doesn't suspect that Paul knows about them. Darling, you should run a column of advice to the lovelorn. Dear editor, my young man, who shall be nameless, keeps putting off popping the question, what shall I do? Signed, Anxious. Oh, I get it. Dear Anxious, after seeing your beautiful pictures, I'm convinced your young man is a half-wit. By no means, marry him. Insanity is hereditary. <sighs> you can't win. <laughs> If your car's battery begins to act a bit feeble toward the end of winter months, nobody's surprised. For the extra use of lights and short, stormy weather trips are an added load on battery juice. But one way you can be sure of giving your battery longer life is by using Chevron Supreme gasoline. This premium quality fuel puts command performance in your car. Fast starts with little or no drain on your car's battery, smooth acceleration, extra power, high octane power that makes it great on hills. And it's a battery saver wherever you drive in the West because it's climate-tailored. That means fast starts for your car in each different altitude and temperature zone. So for economy and for all-round command performance from your car, be sure to say Chevron Supreme Gasoline. Ask for it at independent Chevron gas stations and at standard stations where they say and mean we take better care of your car. In the course of next week's adventure, we find George Valentine in a cheap rooming house. Okay, Walt. I never play AC Ducey with a thirty-eight. And now you're being smart. Well, I see you've been packing. Yeah, leaving town. All on account of that crazy bottle. I shouldn't, I should have thrown it down a sewer, but no. I gotta go be nice to somebody, a guy I never seen before. Who gave you the bottle, Walt? And why? You're getting nothing out of me, mister. Nothing but this. Oh! That crazy bottle. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Brooksy. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Larry Dobkin as Harger, Gene Bates as Leslie, Ted Von Elts as Paul, Don Diamond as Fred, and Eddie Marr as Pagano. The music is composed and presented by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Stay tuned for The Man from Homicide, following a brief reminder. Henry J. Taylor, author, journalist, and ABC commentator, whose penetrating commentaries on world events is heard each Monday evening on ABC, is on a fact-finding tour of European countries. Periodically, Mr. Taylor takes trips abroad to get his own reaction to the feeling among the peoples of other nations about world conditions. On his current trip, he plans to visit eight countries. Remember to listen a little later this evening to Henry J. Taylor, one of the nation's best-informed news authorities, broadcasting from London on ABC. The Man from Homicide. According to Webster's Dictionary, homicide is the killing of one human being by another. According to Lieutenant Lou Dana... It's the beginning of a dirty, dangerous job that doesn't end until the killer is found. I don't like killers.
Every week at this time, the American Broadcasting Company brings you transcribed the star of stage and screen, Dan Duryea, as Lieutenant Lou Dana, the man from Homicide. You can get used to the dead. It takes time, but you can do it. You can get used to the men who've given up their lives suddenly to a knife, a piece of lead pipe, or a gun, or a broken bottle. In time, you can get used to all of that. But when the dead are very young, when you look down the beam of a police flashlight to see the death pallor spreading over cheeks that still wear a youthful fuzz, no, you never get used to that. They find him like this, Dave? Yeah, just like this, Lieutenant. Bum came up the alley looking for a place to flop, I guess. Saw him there. Must have been right after the kid got it. Excuse me a minute, Lieutenant. Right after the kid got it. Yes. The blood hadn't clotted yet. The large pool it made looked purple under my light. They bleed out fast when the throat is slashed. Picture boys are here, Lieutenant. In a minute, Dave. Yeah. Notice this arm? No. Oh, right here. Look. Yeah. What would you give him? Seventeen? Seventeen, eighteen. Oh, the peddlers start them young these days. Makes for more business later on. Seventeen, eighteen. Well, he got the man off his back. The hard way. Any, uh, anything on him? Oh, see. Ya. I don't think so. No. Here's his wallet, though. Nobody cut his throat just for money. Dough in it? A couple of bucks. No social security. Here's his draft card. Hold the light a minute. Oh, sure, Lieutenant. Okay. Donald M. Shellbarger, 1264 Martin. Well, guess I better go talk to his family. Yeah, nice job. Lieutenant. Yeah? How did he stand in the draft? I didn't look. Yeah. 4F. Twelve sixty four Martin was a tenement. No worse, no better than other tenements. It was after one in the morning when I got there, but you can usually find somebody up on a hot summer night. I found out that Don Shellbarger lived on the third floor rear. No answer at the door, so I settled down to wait. I must have been tired. Hey! Hmm? Take the load somewhere else to sleep it off, will you, Jack? <sighs> Oh, you live here? If you can call it living. Let's go inside. Hey, no, wait a minute. Police. Oh, copper. What is it now? We better go inside. All right. We'll go inside. Where were you tonight, Miss Shellbarger? Shellbarger, please. I lost that years ago. Gloria Gay. You got a badge? Yeah, here. Lieutenant Dana. All right. I was working. I'm a dancer. What, um, kind of a dancer? Just the kind you think I am. And where were you dancing tonight? What's the charge? Let it go for now. Let me see your arm, Gloria. Hey, you got a thing for arms. Hmm. Nice, smooth skin. You could have just asked me. I could have. Who's Donald Shellbarger, Gloria? Miss Gay, and he's my brother. What's he done now? Live here with you? Off and on, yeah. Mother and father dead? I don't know. My father took a potter when Don was four. My mother pulled out about three years later. I tried to take care of him since. You did a great job. City paying you a salary to mind my business? How long has your brother been taking dope, Miss Gay? That's a lie. Sure. You don't know how long, or you don't want to say? I didn't know. He hasn't been home much lately, but I didn't know. All right. 
Miss Gay, your brother was murdered tonight. No. You might have told me right off. You might have told me. I'm sorry. I'm a homicide detail, Miss Gay. My first responsibility is to catch murderers. Anything else has to come second. Eighteen. Eighteen he was. Know any reason for anyone killing him? No. I guess even I didn't know him too well. I tried to raise him, but you know. <laughs> no, you don't. Anybody else live in this apartment, Miss Gay? My husband, off and on. Care to explain that? There hasn't been anything between us for a long time, but I let him stay because he can't find another place. He's a... <laughs> you wouldn't understand that either. You got any idea where he is now? There's a bar over on Elm. It's just called Ed's. Frank's kind of handyman there. Frank? Okay. Anything else? That's, um... Uh... Don's picture? Yeah. Nothing else. I'll be in touch. Sure. And I'm sorry. Just leave me, will you? Just leave me. I left her. Standing alone in the tenement apartment with its water-stained ceiling and peeling walls. This was the home from which Donald M. Schellbarger, age 18, had tried to escape. Well, he finally made it. What catches most killers? Not big thinking. Routine. On my way to Ed's place, I stopped in headquarters to see how the routine was sifting out. Got something on the Shellbarger boy, Lieutenant. Yeah? Been checking with Henderson on narcotics. They had a warrant out for the kid as a peddler. Been watching him to try to pin down his source. Dave, where was Henderson tonight? Uh, he didn't say, Lou. Yeah. Well, there's the motive for us anyway. His supplier found out the kid was going to be picked up. He didn't want to be stooled on. Oh, he sure didn't. What's the record on the kid? Uh, not much. Arrest shoplifting eight months ago, probation. Suspicion car theft two months later, insufficient evidence. And since then, nothing. Not hard to figure, is it? Took a lot of loot to buy his, uh, medicine. Around $20 a day. The kid made it by stealing for a while. And then somebody showed him how he could get his for free. He got it, all right. Yeah. He notified his family... How'd they take it? Uh, he's got a sister. Well, I got a call to make it a bar. Ed's on Elm. You know it? No. Anything? A brother-in-law of the kids. From what I hear, he's nothing. <laughs> 2 30 when I hit Ed's place. A neighborhood bar, small and dirty. <laughs> 2.30 a.m. was after closing. But in bars like Ed's, it makes little difference. They just serve it under the counter in coffee cups. In answer to my question, the bartender nodded me over to Frank. Frank. Shabby clothes, bloodshot eyes, and racing form. Frank? Yeah, sit down. Anything good running tomorrow? Oh, tomorrow might be the day. Just might be the day. You know, I got a theory, you know, every day just one buck on a three-horse pile. Long shots, you see. See, someday I got a hit. Big. Don't I? Huh? I mean, don't I? Where were you tonight, Frank? Well, law? Yeah. Oh, right here, Captain. Right here all evening. Or in the back room, you know. Ask Mr. McPherson. He runs this place, see, and he'll tell you. He'll say, Frank, he'll say, Frank was here. That's where Frank was. Frank was here. McPherson's the owner? Yeah, huh? You married, Frank? Nothing's happened to Gloria. No. Roll up your sleeve, Frank. Left sleeve. Oh, sure. Sure, Captain. Sure. There. Hmm. You only take yours in a glass, huh, Frank? Beer. It's all I can afford, see? But look it now. It stands to reason. I'm going to hit it someday, now, don't it? Law of averages? Just three horses. That's not much to ask for, is it? And look it. Look at what I got picked out for tomorrow. See, right here. Now, look at Frank. This. What? The kid, Don. 
Did you ever look at his arm? Don? Oh, I know. No. Come on. You knew. Well, I I got the word here and there, but but I didn't say anything to Gloria, because he'll come around. Don will snap out of it while he's... Did you know how he got his money? No, 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 I didn't, Captain. Now, look, I swear I didn't. Talk, Frank. Please, please, look, I didn't. I'd, I'd tell you if I knew. Honest, I would. Look at Captain. He's almost like my own son. Oh, sure, he's had a little trouble, sure, but he'll snap right out of it any day now. He'll come Frank. right... The kid got it tonight. Oh. Bad? As bad as it can get. Oh. We found him in an alley with his throat cut. Oh. I need a drink. I need a drink. Frank stumbled his way over to the bar and I let him go. In the back of the room was a swinging door... I went through it, took a few steps down a narrow hallway that reeked of stale beer, and turned the knob on a door lettered office. Empty. Big surprise. But the odor of cigar smoke told me it hadn't been empty long. And in one wall was a peephole surveying the bar. I looked out. Frank was back at his table, hunched over his racing form. But he wasn't picking winners. He was crying. I took myself out of Ed's place. And Frank didn't look up as I got McPherson's address from the bartender. After persuasion. It was a good address. And his name wasn't Ed. It was Andy. He interested me. Just outside of the saloon, I got a break. Hey! Hey, you! Hey! My friend, Needle Nose. You're not happy to see me? Take your hands off me, Dana. You got very heavy hands. I told you that before. Take them off. You clean? Yeah, sure, sure, sure I'm clean, Dana. You got nothing on me. You know it. Shut up. What were you doing in this neighborhood, Nose? Just passing by? Matter of fact, I, I was just passing by. Not that it's any of your business, Dana, what I do or where I... I don't like you. I don't like your face. I don't like that needle nose of yours. Listen, Dana, you've got no right every time you see me to start fighting. Maybe if I keep it up long enough, you'll get out of town. i got friends on newspapers, Dana. They'd be glad to hear how you... Friends! You haven't even got acquaintances. What were you doing around here? Now, listen, Dana. Take your hands off me. I know my rights. Talk! You're one of the miserable rats who make wrecks of these kids. Where do you get your stuff, Nose? I got right side. All right. All right, beat me up, hit me. You're a big man, sure, hit me. See what good it does you. Go on. Okay. There are other ways, Needle Nose. Maybe you'll wish you had the slaps in the face. What ways? I got friends, Dana. Maybe you ain't so big like you thought. Maybe you... Hey. What's the ten dollars for Alone. Maybe I'm sorry I hit you. Ten bucks. Well, thanks. But I don't get it, Dana. Knows. Don't you get the feeling that maybe somebody's watching us? I do. Well, what's that got to do? How's it gonna look? Huh? I slap you around. We talk. I give you money. You took it. Gonna look like you're stooled, isn't it? But I didn't. You know I did not. I know, sure. But how does it look? Dana, you... you... You're shaking, Nose. Know what you better do? You better start running. Fast. But I... I... Yeah. Yeah. I stepped back into the shadows of a warehouse doorway to let Needle Nose get a good start and see who might start trailing him. It wasn't a smart move. I stepped into the wrong shadow. Something was dripping. Water. Blood. My blood. I didn't care. 
I wasn't curious at all. I had the idea something had happened to my head, but I didn't feel anything. I didn't feel anything up there at all. My eyes opened and I was lying in an alley with a rusted out drain pipe leaking alongside of me. But it just seemed exactly the right place to be. I wasn't gonna move. Four o'clock. I wasn't interested. Four o'clock. Headquarters wasn't far. And even though walking was pushing one leg in front of the other, it was good for me to walk. I could almost think by the time I hit the station. Lou! Lou, what happened to you? Games, Dave. Funny games. Oh, here, son. Sit down. No time, Dave. No time. Get out on all points on Needlenose Rackley. I want him found, and it's got to be quick. Get it on the air, Dave. Uh, and Dave... You want him found, Lieutenant? It won't be hard. You got him? Yeah. On a slab in the morgue. Four twenty. And I was just beginning to care about time again. Outside of Dave, I was the only other one in the room who did care. Think they put him in lower, too. He's not pretty, Lieutenant. Nah, he wasn't pretty alive. Roll him out, Dave. Right. There he is. It's a funny thing, Lieutenant. He had to die before we found out his real name was Henry. Henry Needlenose Rackley. For the second time in one night, I was looking down at a man with his throat cut. This time... I could feel responsible. If it wasn't for me, Needle Nose could have been still alive. Alive and ruining the lives of 18-year-old kids. I looked down. I didn't feel sorry at all. Put him back, Dave. <coughs> Almost five in the morning, I got around to the address I'd gotten from the barkeep at Ed's place. Andy McPherson. He was beginning to interest me more and more. Somehow, I doubted that McPherson was a sound sleeper. One of my keys fit the lock. It usually does. I looked in all the rooms, found nothing, so I sat down. My head was coming around to the point where it was hurting pretty good, and the chair was too modern to be comfortable. McPherson had more money than taste. Then a key turned in the lock. Come in. What? A social call, Miss Gay. I couldn't sleep. I had to talk to someone. I got ears. You're a cop. Yeah. And my apartment doesn't look like this at all. There's a little hole in the wall with only two keys. I've got both of them. Well, an early morning newscast. Why did you come here, Miss Gay? My job is finding your brother's killer. You're either on one side or the other. You don't think much of me. Oh, we won't argue it. What's McPherson to you? I've been going with him. How's he get his money? I never asked him. It was the same color as all other money. That's pretty doubtful. Look, Miss Gay. I want you to go to the Windsor Hotel on Elm. Register there in your own name, right now. I want to use you as bait. Will you do it? It's for Don? Yes. All right. Miss Gay... It's only fair to tell you that I tried this trick a few hours ago and got a man killed. Oh? Well? <laughs> you couldn't be that lucky twice. Five thirty. A few milk wagon drivers and streetcar jockeys were on their way to work. And a few late drunks were on their way home. 
For the second time in one night, I headed for Ed's place, and it was still open. They must have thrown away the keys to that place the day they opened it. A track sweeper was having a belt at the bar before starting work, and there in the corner was Frank. Clothes a little shabbier, eyes a little more bloodshot, and racing form a little more dog-eared. Frank. Hmm? All the law. I... Got those three horses picked out yet? I don't know. No, for the first time in my life, I got the feeling that maybe today isn't the day. I don't know. Frank. Hmm? About Gloria. What about Gloria? She took a hotel room, Frank. She... I think she found out something about Don's killer and she's scared. Want to know where she is? Well, sure I want to... I... Maybe you better not tell me. The Windsor Hotel. Now, maybe you better... Windsor Hotel. Be seeing you, Frank. I just wanted to let you know. Yeah, thanks very much, huh? Thanks very much. I got out of Ed's place all right. My head was booming like a circus parade, but I was smart enough to stay out of the shadows. At the Windsor... The night clerk was asleep in his chair, the register in front of him. Gloria Gay was in 202, second floor. Huh. Anybody could have stolen the whole hotel, but who'd want it? Up the worn flight of stairs with the walls painted an institution brown. I knocked on 202. Who is it? Lou Dana. I never thought I'd be glad to see you come in. Jumpy? Huh. Sit down. I don't think we'll have long to wait. How did you tell? Frank. You don't think Frank... I don't think Frank can keep a secret very long. Did you have to do it that way? No. But that's the best way I could think of. Do you chew gum all the time? Yeah. Getting on your nerves? You got on my nerves the first minute I saw you. Uh-huh. I've heard about you, Mr. Dana. You take chances. You don't wait for a killer to come out. You go in after him. What are you trying to prove all the time? I don't like killers. You married, Mr. Dana. No. No, you wouldn't be. You put on a little tin badge. You're the type that resigns from the human race. You wear it when you go to bed, Dana. What is it you don't like, Dana, yourself? Shut up. I heard something. Get in the bathroom, quick, and stay there. If anything happens to me, go out the window. I'll beat it. I guess I made a mistake. I guess you did. Come all the way in, McPherson. Let me get a good look at you. Who are you? You know who I am. Yeah. Big guy, aren't you? What'd you bring with you, knife or gun? Come on in and close the door. Sure, I'll close it. Thanks. Been a busy evening for you, McPherson. Take it easy, Dana. Now he tells me. A little different this time. I'm not Needle Nose, and I'm not an 18 year old kid either. A little different. All right, where is she? You want to know? Here I am. Take a good look. I killed your brother, but we can still be friends, can't we? I told you to stay out of this. You'd have been smarter to listen to the copper, Gloria. And I brought along a gun this time, Dana. I hope you got good teeth. You're gonna have to eat it. Get back where you were, Gloria. All right, hold it, hold it. I'm just as good with a gun as a knife, Dana. Now that freeze, copper. I said... Frank, watch uh, out, Frank! Uh, uh, oh, no! Uh, hold on to it, McPherson. Uh, uh, hold on uh, to uh, it and get your arm uh, broke. Uh, uh, oh, you uh, didn't hold on to it. 
Take care of Frank, Gloria. Is it bad, Frank? Uh, we get a doctor for you. You'll be all right. I didn't want to... Didn't want to tell him, Gloria, but... He made me. He made me. It's all right, Frank. It's all right. He made me to... You, Gloria? Yeah, Frank. J just this once? I didn't do so bad. Did I? Oh, you did great, Frankie. You did great. Uh, Frank. Frank. Three in one evening, McPherson. You're a dandy fellow. All right, all right, take me in. But I'm not talking to Not you. talking? I got a lawyer. A lawyer? McPherson had cost the state about $40,000 to electrocute you. And I'm just itching to save him that dough. Come on. You got a knife. Make a move for it. Come on. Oh, let me alone, Dana. Let me alone. Let him alone. Killed three people and now he wants to be let alone. Come on, McPherson. You're a big fellow. One move. No, I... Just that one eyelash. Come on. Let me alone. Take him in, Dana. He's all through. Yeah. I guess he is. I guess he is. I'll stay here with Frank. Six o'clock. Frank was right. Today wasn't his day. What does a cop think about after a case? Uh, right now, I was thinking about how a girl named Gloria might have looked before she'd been pushed around so hard and so long by the years since her father and mother walked out on her. And then I tried to think what Lou Dana was like as a kid so long ago. I couldn't remember. But I know what he is now. A cop who doesn't like killers. You have just heard another in a series starring Dan Duryea as the man from Homicide with Larry Dobkin as Dave. Mr. Duryea can be seen starring in Al Jennings of Oklahoma. In tonight's cast, you heard Gene Bates as Gloria, Bill Boucher as McPherson, and Joe Forte as Needlenose. Music was by Basil Adlam. The Man from Homicide is transcribed and written by Lou Vitties, directed by Dwight Hauser. Be with us again next week, same time, over most of these same ABC stations to hear Dan Duryea as the man from Homicide. Lou Cook speaking. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. In just a few moments, the man from Homicide, starring Dan Duryea. Henry J. Taylor, author, journalist, and ABC commentator, whose commentaries on world affairs are heard each Monday evening on ABC, is on a fact-finding tour of European countries. Periodically, Mr. Taylor takes trips abroad to examine activities at first hand. During the weeks he's in Europe, his Monday evening commentary, Your Land and Mine, will be broadcast each week from a different European capital. He speaks tonight from Heidelberg. So listen for Henry J. Taylor's penetrating analysis on your land and mine. A man from homicide. According to Webster's Dictionary, homicide is the killing of one human being by another. According to Lieutenant Lou Dana... It's the beginning of a dirty, dangerous job that doesn't end until a killer is found. I don't like killers.
Every week at this time, the American Broadcasting Company brings you transcribed the star of stage and screen, Dan Duryea, as Lieutenant Lou Dana, the man from Homicide. One way or another, people keep dying all the time. That interests doctors, insurance companies, and statisticians. But sometimes, people are helped to die. And that interests us. In homicide, we work at it. The death that comes because somebody was afraid, because somebody hated, because somebody killed. Pretty clear case of suicide, Lieutenant. The place was a pier jutting out into the bay. The time was two in the morning. The occasion? You don't often get an eyewitness to suicide, Lou, but this time we've got one. A cop, too. The girl they'd fished out of the bay was young. At one time, she might have been pretty. But that time was before the waters of the bay got at her. Yes, sir, one of our men saw her go in. They were working on her with a pull motor. What they needed was a miracle. Yeah. Uniformed man was maybe 50 yards from her when he heard a scream. He started towards her. She was easy to see. Counted the lamppost right near the spot she jumped from. By the time he got there, she was under. Lou? The sergeant was fat. Probably made getting clothes to fit him tough. I thought it was a good thing he didn't have to wear a uniform anymore. Lou! Oh, sorry, Dave. I guess I was dreaming. Stick of gum, Pappy? No, no, thanks. Lou, okay if the boys remove the body? She's dead. Yeah, it's okay. All right, boys, get her out of here, huh? All right, right. Come on, There was no identification on her, Dave? No. No labels on her clothes, no purse, huh? How about a hat? She was wearing one when she went in. Where is it? The hat? The hat. Well, I guess nobody bothered fishing for it. I want somebody to bother. Well, okay, Lou. I'll put a couple of the boys on it. But Call it attention to detail, Dave. I don't like it. Don't like what? That girl dying the way she did. She was young, Dave. Pretty. Death by drowning hurts. She picked it for herself. Maybe. She was too alone, Dave. Uh. Suicides don't usually look for company. They don't bother dying incognito, either. Well... Sure, I know. It could have been that way. Did you notice her hair, Dave? Was blonde. She'd had a permanent. Even the Baywater didn't bother it much. A recent permanent. Nah, something's working on you. Yeah. Suicides are tired and worn. Bitter sometimes. This girl's face was, uh... Untouched. She hadn't lived long, Dave. She hadn't lived much. Not nearly enough to find out what life was. Not nearly enough to ask for death. And Dave, she screamed. I went back to headquarters and waited. I wondered how it felt to breathe water instead of air. I wondered why any man chose to be in homicide. After a while, I stopped wondering and just waited. Lou? Yeah, Dave? No sign of the hat. You know, the bay is kind of big. Autopsy in yet? I got it. Thanks. Anything? Mm, Sure. She was drowned. Water in her lungs. Water that tested out as bay water. Well, that cleans it up, don't it? I don't know. Dave, get a hold of the cop or so I'll go in. Have him describe the hat to one of the lab men and have the lab man make a sketch of it. Sure, only why? I'm trying not to believe that life's so lousy a girl like that wouldn't want it. Her clothes were cheap. It's been a warm night. Why was she wearing a hat? Maybe you got something there. A bad taste is what I've got. Get me that sketch, will you, Dave? If nothing else, it'll look good in her file. The rest of the routine went along fine. 
pictures of her would go to the papers, and a request for identification would go with them. There might be trouble, though. The people who'd known her hadn't seen her dead. Her lungs filled with bay water. It, uh, makes a difference. Uh, here's your sketch, Lou. Thanks. Wow. This is quite a hat. Yeah. <laughs> Designer must have just heard about the birds and the bees. Not to mention the fruit. Elaborate and expensive. It's a wrong note, Dave. Too much hat. Oh, you're a stubborn man, Lou. Maybe the girl just blew a week's salary on that hat. Kind of a splurge. Just before she decided to die? Yeah. No one's come in to identify her, huh? Not yet. Not ever. You're guessing wild. No, I'm not. Why were the labels on her clothes removed? Dave, have copies of that sketch made. Put a few policewomen on the job. A hat like that means a designer. It's not mass production stuff like the girl's clothes. I want that designer found. Okay, Lou. And if we turn him up? Make sure our people don't get spotted as cops. Yeah. And then what? And then I'll go visiting. I never heard her scream, Dave. Just a report about it. But somehow that screams in my ears. I want to get rid of it. It took time, but the dead girl had all the time there was. Finally, I got an address. And a name. The name was printed large in gilt letters on a shop window. It read Vogue Millinery. Underneath, in small letters, Martha Wayne. I went in. Hello. Hello. I rather like to have a man stop in. I get so tired of... Well, women are fine. They're the ones who buy my hats mostly, but... Oh, you did want to see me about a hat. I did. You're, um, Mrs. Wayne? Miss Wayne. You design all these hats? Yes. <laughs> Guilty as charged. They're manufactured here? Manufactured is such a large word. They're made here. I usually have someone help me. Oh, isn't that a lot of work? Well, not really. You see, I make only one of a kind. Not very many at that. Then um, any hat bought here... Would be absolutely unique. You're thinking of surprising your wife. I'm not married. Well, you're thinking of surprising someone? In a way. I have a picture here. Oh? Look at it. I see. Oh, she's very pretty, of course, but well, the photograph isn't terribly good, is it? I mean, well, it looks distorted. Maybe. You um, don't recognize her? Recognize? Oh, oh, she must be a celebrity, and I'm very stupid, but no, I don't recognize her. No, she's no celebrity. She bought a hat here. She did? That's why I thought you'd recognize her. Oh, I have a very bad memory for faces. Now, if you showed me the hat she bought... I've got a sketch that might help. Take a look at it. Oh, you're, you're quite an artist, aren't you? This is one of your hats? Oh, I think so. Your... Your friend told you she bought it here? No. Well, then how ever You put you... labels in the hats you make, don't you? Oh, of course. I'm terribly dense. All you had to do was look inside the hat. And... You keep uh, records of the sales you make? Well, naturally. The kind of clientele I have. And besides, there's so many taxes we have to pay. I want the name of the girl you sold that hat to. Her name? But if she's a friend of yours... I didn't say that. Well, no, but I assume I'd that... like her name. I'm sorry. I don't think I can give you that information. Why not? I don't know that the lady would want you to have it. The lady's wishes don't matter very much. Not anymore. I beg your pardon? My name is Dana, Lieutenant Dana. My credentials. Oh. Well, there isn't anything wrong about... Your hats? That wouldn't be my business. I'm homicide. Homicide? Oh, then you'd be Lou Dana. 
You're the celebrity. Well, the papers run out of copy every once in a while. I didn't recognize you. Although I've seen pictures of you. You look younger and... The name of the girl? Oh, I'm sorry. My record's in the back room. If you'll wait a few moments. I'll wait. I'll be right back. It was a long distance from the cold waters of the bay to the warm, perfumed shop where Martha Wayne made hats. I wondered how the dead girl had got from one place to the other. It kept me from wondering about Martha Wayne and the things that had nothing to do with death. Martha Wayne was taking a long time. Too long a time. Miss Wayne? Miss Wayne? Miss Wayne! There was a back room. It held a couple of sewing machines, odds and ends of equipment, a desk, a chair, and an open window. The window looked out onto an alley leading to the next street. It was empty. As empty as the room I was in. Lieutenant Dana, I want an address for a Martha Wayne. She's not in the phone book, but she runs a hat shop on Miller Avenue. Yeah, that's right. Sales tax people would have it. Make it fast and call me here. The number's Arden, 48747. I'm in a hurry and I don't know why. Dana. Uh-huh. 39 Carlisle. Thanks. The house was an old brownstone. The steps were worn that led up to the stoop. The windows were shuttered. No one was in a hurry to answer the doorbell. The door was locked. The neighborhood wasn't good. Streets littered, sidewalks cracked, doors sagging. I tried a few keys. One of them worked. The lights weren't on. That figured... No one was home. I was wrong. For a while I felt fine. Things were soft and dark and warm. Nothing mattered. That was the way it would be when you died, I thought lazily. But I was wrong. It didn't last. Light came back, and sound, and pain. Lou. Oh. Lou. Oh. Lou, wake up, will you? Hmm? Lou? Hmm? Wake up. Uh. What? Oh. Oh. Uh, Hello, Dave. Uh, oh, you had me worried. I seem to be lying down. Yeah. On the floor. Dirty floor. Help me up, Dave. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks. Uh, for a minute there, I was scared. Nobody kills Dana. Now, that could be wrong. Sure, but I don't want to know about it. Why you did you... phoned in for this address, and then you didn't check in. I got worried. How long it's is it? It's 11, Lou. 11? Yeah. I must have been out for a good four hours. Correction, a bad four hours. Yeah. Dave, did you see anyone when no. you... No. Now, let's go look through the rest of the house. Now, you feel all right? I feel lousy. We'll look anyway. For what? A dark-haired girl named Martha Wayne. A girl who runs a hat shop. Right now, maybe, just a girl who runs. <laughs> We looked through the rest of the house. 
We didn't find Martha Wayne. I hadn't expected to. We found lots of other things, though. Well, that's it, Lieutenant. That's it. House full of antique furniture, old silver, paintings. Very high class. Very expensive. Also too much. A lot too much. Yeah, not a house for a family to live in. A warehouse, Dave. What I was thinking. A warehouse for stolen goods. Uh, we'll get the burglary detail on it. Ah, uh, they'll love us for finding the merchandise. Now, what does all this make Martha Wayne, Lieutenant? A receiver of stolen goods, at best. And at worst? A killer. The burglary detail came and loved us. The house that Martha Wayne had lived in was filled with the loot from half a dozen big robberies. That took care of that. We put out an alarm for Martha Wayne. That didn't take care of that. What's that thing you're fiddling with? Oh, this? Yeah. Uh, something I picked up in the room Martha Wayne lived in. It's a medal, Dave. Medal? Yeah. She's been a Girl Scout. Also a senior lifesaver. What flavor? <laughs> Trying to be funny. Relax, Pappy. I don't bite. I, I hope that's for me. Dana here. Yeah? Uh-huh. Yeah. Good. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. What was that? Burglary detail. Good old routine. The cop's best friend. Yeah. I'm not only getting fatter, I'm getting stupider. They've been worried about a cat named Barlow. A lot of burglaries bore his trademark the last few months. And they haven't been able to get anything on him, though. Well, what good is that? I don't know yet. I'll go ask Barlow. But a burglary already worked on They him. were gentle. All they had to worry about was stolen property. I won't be gentle. Lou, you better take it easy. Dave, there's nothing in my life except what? Death. Killers. Pain and violence. I'll take it as easy as I know how. But I'm not worrying about stolen property. I'm worrying about murder. Burglary had mentioned the yellow disc. It turned out to be a saloon with a girl singer, an out-of-tune piano, and a tough doorman. Yeah? I'm coming in. <laughs> Mention a name. Ralph Waldo Emerson. I don't like that name. I'm still coming in. Now, look, mister. Nobody gets in the yellow disc without an invitation. You ain't got one. I got this. A badge. A real badge. You know what? I bet you're a cop. You win the bet. You still ain't coming in. Let's find out. You know what this is? Yeah, a sap. Technically, a concealed weapon. Well, it ain't concealed now. You're frightening me. You're gonna get it. I've been sap before tonight. I'm getting used to it. Well, you must like it. Hey, 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 hey. My arm. Hey, you could break it. Don't suggest things to me. Uh, Drop the sap. Okay, okay. Uh, well, it won't do you no good taking me. You did a nice job. Walk in there, you got trouble. Maybe I like trouble. Okay. Okay, I'm out of your way. You're tough, sure. You could handle me. There's half a dozen guys in there. Open the door for me, huh? Oh, sure. Thanks. Suppose you announce me. Oh, okay. What name? Lou Dana. Lou Dana. No wonder you took me. You heard what I said. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lieutenant Lou Dana, that's this guy. Now get back outside. Yeah? A saloon. The girl singer left quick. A small combo played background music. A handful of men sat around at small tables. They all bulged at one place or another. Shoulder holsters, their hip pocket rods, concealed weapons. Most of them had a girl at the table with them. Their weapons weren't especially concealed. Dana. Make it lieutenant. I feel formal tonight. What do you want here? Not a thing. Then get out. You worried about what? Something happening to you. Thanks. 
Let's not play games. I run this place. I run it without cops. Keep right on running it. Which one is Barlow? I don't hear a word you say. Which one is Barlow? You got a warrant for him? All the mugs in town are turning legal. I never heard of anybody named Barlow. Which one? Move in on me and you'll stop asking questions. You'll get an answer. You won't like it. I'm crazy about answers. Any kind. Point him out. Okay. He's the one at the corner table. Thanks. Hello, Barlow. Hello. Let's go for a walk. Okay. Mm, you're coming easy. Why not? I wouldn't know. How about your little playmates? They must have been reading the papers about you. Mm, convenient. Come on. Since when you're doing burglary, Lieutenant? I'm not. Hey, no, wait a minute. Oh, no, no. We keep right on going. Or don't you believe what you read in the papers? We keep on going. Thanks, Mr. Barlow. Thanks. Hey, what are you stopping here for? This time of night, I'm crazy about the bay. Get out. I ain't interested in sightseeing. Get out. Okay, but under protest, see? Under protest. Come on. I want to get a closer look at the water. But I don't know what you've got in mind. I'll let you know in time. Right here ought to do. Up above and to your right, Barlow. That's a pier. Oh, thanks for telling me. Down here, we've got more privacy. Funny thing about that pier. Yeah? A kid jumped off it last night right into the bay. She drowned. What's that got to do with me? A cop saw her go over. With a little luck, she might have been saved. If somebody went into the bay from down here, nobody'd see him, Barlow. Hey, now, wait a minute. Oh, no, you're staying right here, Barlow. What, what do you want from me? An introduction to Martha Wayne. Martha? I don't know nobody named that. From down here, you'd go into the water smooth and easy. Can you swim, Barlow? No. Too bad. Hey, let go of me. try breathing water instead of air? But you let go. We're right near the edge now, Barlow. One push and... Oh, yeah. Oh. Who'd hear you out here at this time I... of night? Get... Okay. I'll take you to her. Why, thanks, Barlow. Thanks very much. <laughs> I don't know what you think you're doing. Very simple. You're a burglar. Martha Wayne's a fence. You steal the stuff, she disposes of it. The millinery store's a front. Oh, that's guessing. And besides, what's it got to do with homicide? That's what we're going to find out. Knock, Barlow. Okay. Who is it? Uh, Barlow. What are you... We're both coming in, Miss Wayne. Dana. Ah, you remembered. You're not an easy man to forget, Lieutenant. Thanks. This, uh, apartment's a lot nicer than the brownstone. What brownstone? Ah, uh, ah. Uh, you're listed as the owner. But there's no law against having more than one place to live. Tonight, everybody's quoting the law to me. Why did you bring Barlow here? He brought me. I, I had to. He, he would have drowned Shut me. Shut up. Okay, I'll shut up. Well, you were really anxious to meet me, weren't you? I still want the name of the girl who bought that hat from you. You're very persistent. So? Why not forget her, Lieutenant? Wouldn't be hard. I'd help. All this for a burglary rap? That's an act, Lieutenant, isn't it? Because you do respond when I'm close to you, like this. I respond all right. I remember the kid who went into the bay. The kid who what? Last night, a girl wearing one of your hats jumped into the bay. A cop on duty heard her scream and looked around. She was near a lamppost. He saw her go over. Well, that's very sad, but... It's more than sad. It's murder. Murder? But you yourself just told me she jumped in. She did. But she wasn't the one who died. She wasn't the one who... You're confusing me. No, no, I'm not. You run a millinery store. 
In that store, you have an assistant. Let's suppose that assistant is a girl. A girl who finds out by accident what your business really is. A receiver of stolen goods. Suppose that girl is young, naive. Tells you she's going to inform the police. What would you do? You're the one who's supposing all these things. You'd have to make sure she wouldn't go to the police. One way would be to murder her. But that's dangerous. People get executed for murder. So, with a little help, Barlow's, for example, you get the girl down to the bay and drown her. That would be murder anyway. Besides, the policeman saw her jump by herself. You drown her in the bay, in the water underneath the pier. Then you go up on the pier yourself. You're dressed exactly the same way she is. You wait until a policeman's around, some little distance away. You pick out a place near a lamppost. Then you scream. The policeman sees you. He starts towards you, but you jump into the water. The harbor detail dredges, comes up with the body of a drowned girl. The policeman would swear it was the same girl he'd seen go over. It wasn't. Very, very clever, Lieutenant. But only a guess. You could do it. You were a senior lifesaver. You swim well. The dead girl was already in the water under the pier. You hit the water, you swim away, climb out of the bay a few hundred yards from the pier. A perfect murder setup. A guess. Why would a suicide pick a lamppost? Why would a suicide scream before jumping? Not a guess. You'll never be able to prove it. Barlow isn't a very strong character. He brought me to you. And he'll testify. Hoping he might get away with a second-degree murder rap. Won't you, Barlow? I, uh, well, she did it all. I didn't know what she was planning. You see? I have nothing to say. No, you haven't. Not anymore. Not in this life. And it all came from a hat. The hat that was wrong. But the dead girl was blonde. You're a brunette, Miss Wayne. You had to wear a hat for a masquerade. That hat will hang you. That was all. They were booked, they'd be tried, and in due time they'd die. I finished my report and signed it. I didn't see the paper I was writing on. I saw a young girl with an untouched face and all of her life before her. Lying dead and watery on the rough wood of a pier. I don't like killers. You have just heard another in a transcribed series starring Dan Duryea as The Man from Homicide. The Man from Homicide is written by Lou Vitties, directed by Dwight Hauser. This program came to you from Hollywood. America is sold on ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Stay tuned for The Man from Homicide. Henry J. Taylor, author, journalist, and ABC commentator, whose commentaries on world events are heard each Monday evening on ABC, is on a fact-finding tour of European countries. Periodically, Mr. Taylor takes trips abroad to examine activities at first hand and to get his own reactions. During the week season Europe, his Monday evening commentary, Your Land and Mine, will be broadcast each week from a different European capital. He'll speak tonight from Rome, Italy. So listen for Henry J. Taylor's penetrating analysis on Your Land and Mine over your ABC station. The Man from Homicide. <laughs> According to Webster's Dictionary, homicide is the killing of one human being by another. According to Lieutenant Lou Dana... It's the beginning of a dirty, dangerous job. It doesn't end until the killer is found. I don't like killers.
Every week at this time, the American Broadcasting Company brings you transcribed the star of stage and screen, Dan Duryea as Lieutenant Lou Dana, the man from Homicide. The dead are lonely people. They don't eat, drink, chase blondes, or hit the night spots. Nobody keeps them company. Their quarters are on the crude side. And when they've died violently, they don't look good. When they check in with homicide, they put in their time at the morgue. I wonder if the cold marble of the slabs ever bothers them. The sergeant standing next to me had surrounded himself with 300 pounds of fat. But even that couldn't keep the cold out. Lieutenant. Have a stick of gum, Dave? No, thanks. I don't like his looks. We will it? <laughs> he ain't exactly in the best of shape. 45 slug? Yep. In the back of the head. Mm-hmm. Somebody wanted to make very sure. When and where, Dave? A couple of kids stumbled across him in the park around 11 o'clock tonight. Kids? At 11? Uh, 18-year-old kids. Boy and a girl looking for a quiet place. They found a quiet place. They also found Wee Willie. What's the uh, medical examiner's guess as to time of death? Around 7 tonight, give or take an hour. Dinner time. But not for Willie. I'd seen Wee Willie, and we got out of the morgue. The room I kept my desk in was warmer, but the chill was still in my bones. Dave. Yeah, Lieutenant. What was Willie Baines? Forty years ago, he was a kid in the slums. Ten years later, juvenile delinquent. And since then, petty larceny boy, small bookie, errand boy for the smart ones. Yesterday... The Crime Investigating Committee had him under subpoena. And tonight, under the sod. Who was he working for? Uh, we're not sure, Lou. Well, what was the Crime Commission going to ask him about? The weather? Captain Kowaleski checked through on that. One of the men on the governor's staff stuck Willie Baines's name on the list. Well? Yeah, uh, but he had gone home. We'll get a hold of him in the morning. Tonight. Uh, Lou. Yeah? Man's name is Skyler. Old family and stuff. Well, I'll make sure my fingernails are clean. Yeah, it's late. He might be asleep. Well, he can be waked. He's political, Lou. I'll try not to hold that against him. Come on. I'll tell you a secret, Dave. I've decided not to run for president. The Schuyler place avoided its neighbors by several acres of manicured lawn and a high fence. The house itself was made of gray stone. Well-trained ivy framed the windows. The front door was so highly polished you could see your face in it. I needed a shave. Yes? No, she didn't need anything. She had it all. What do you want? Mr. Schuyler? It's late. It is? Well... My credentials. Lieutenant Dana... Homicide. Homicide? Come in. Mr. Schuyler is in his room. Uh, what did you want to see him about? It uh, might be simpler if I discussed it with him. I suppose you know what you're doing. We'll leave it at that. But I can't understand what connection there is between... between homicide and... Professional connection. Mr. Schuyler won't be pleased at being disturbed. We Willie wasn't pleased either. Wee Willie. A man with a priority at the moment. Well, if it's important. Why not let your husband decide? My <gasps> Where's his room? Quick. Down the hall. Last door. Thanks. I went down the hall quick. The last door was standing open. Mr. Schuyler was wearing a silk dressing gown, leather bedroom slippers, and what looked like a smile on his thin lips, but wasn't. And two bullet holes in the head. An open window gave a fair view of the manicured lawns and the fence at the far end. Somebody was climbing it. 
He was over before my bullets got there. No! That fence is over a hundred yards away. Shh, shh, wait. Yeah. Now what? Hey. Skyler? I'd say so. Dead. He's got a right with two bullet holes in his head. Dave, when you I came in, did shots you... figured you might need me. And did you see a woman in evening dress? A woman? No. Come on. Mr. Schuyler will excuse us. Was there a woman here? Yeah, she made light conversation with me. Maybe because she thought I was a good conversationalist, or maybe because she had to give a gunman time to shoot his gun off. Ah, I left her here. Uh, nobody around now? No. She must have ducked out when you came in. Who was she? I called her Mrs. Schuyler. It looks like I was wrong. Get on the phone. Notify the department, Dave. What'll I tell him? Tell him we Willie's getting company. The technical men showed up and got the routine underway. They found out that the corpse was Schuyler. And they found out that the corpse was dead and that was all. Dave and I went through the dead man's files and found nothing. Out on the lawn, the noise and the smell of gunpowder faded. He went over the fence right about here. Uh, maybe he dropped his calling card. There's not a thing around, Lou. Uh, I better take a look at the fence itself. Shoot your light up here, huh? Okay, Lieutenant. Now, uh, hold it now. Yeah. Uh, there's rough stone on top. He must have hit it hard going over with my bullets singing behind him. Yeah. You got something, Lou? Uh, something. Yeah. Huh. Hunk of cloth. Half an inch by half an inch, maybe. Jagged edges. Could have been torn off his pants leg. Yeah, hardly enough to identify, Lou. That's for the lab to worry about. Dave, we're dead. I'd say. Baines was going to sing, and somebody objected to a solo and killed him. Skyler had picked Baines for investigation. He had something on his mind. Now, where's Skyler's mind now? Well, son, you're being rhetorical. And the girl... What's a description worth? She had nothing that would make her different from half a million other girls except beauty. And that doesn't fit into a police report. None of it's any good, Lou. I know, Pappy. So let's feed this cloth to the lab, half an inch by half an inch. I wonder if there's enough to make a hangman's rope out of it. The lab was good. They had the cloth pattern tabbed in an hour. It was a tweed, an expensive tweed. Sketches were made up and every local mill questioned. It took them four hours to hit the mill that had woven the cloth. Twenty minutes for a list of tailors they'd ship bolts to in the city. By that time, it was the next day. And twelve cops pounded pavement visiting tailors. Maybe I slept while on the chair behind my desk. I must have slept because I saw the girl's face and heard her voice again. It was quite a voice. Hey, Lieutenant. Yeah, Pappy? You ever try sleeping? Sure. Didn't care for it much, though. You got something? Eh, uh, it's a maybe on one of the lists. Boy by the name of Stan Cochran bought a suit made out of that cloth two months ago. Keep going. Well, he's a Detroit boy. Had a little something to do with the Collier gang out there. The question is, what's he doing in this town? Uh-huh. You got an address? Yeah, Slocum Arms over on Van Dyke. Mm-hmm. That's nice, Dave. Go find a bed and lie down. Now, you've been gone just as long as I have. Sure, Pappy, but I don't have so much to carry around. You're dead on your feet. I'll let you know if Mr. Cochran ripped any suits recently. <laughs> Once upon a time, Van Dyke had been a nice street where people got married, had kids, and died in bed. That was a long time ago. Now, drunks and dirt, blind pigs, houses, and uh, the Slocum Arms. A decaying palm and a cracked tub, cigar butts on the floor, and a quick turnover. Yeah? Stan Cochran. Stan, uh, who's that? Let's see your register. Give me a reason. I'm crazy about hotel registers. I don't like that reason. How about this? 
I don't like cops either. You and me both. The register. Okay. Thanks. That's funny. What is? All your customers got the same handwriting. Same? Oh, I can explain that. Go ahead. They can't write. Uh-uh. Hey, let me go. Stan Cochran. Look, I'm telling you, the name ain't for me. Look at your hands. I'll oh, wash me. him when I get home. Maybe he didn't feed you the right name. He's 28 years old, 5 feet 7 inches high, weighs around 160, brown hair, gray eyes, dresses a lot better than this dump would call for. Who is he? Oh, I don't recognize. What's the idea? Keep your hands away from that drawer. There might be a gun in it. Who is he? Well, I... Uh... Oh, oh. Shut up. Bend over towards me. We're holding a confidential chat like that. He's on his way out. What name did he use here? Uh, I don't know. You gave it away. What name? Steve Carter. Yeah. No imagination. Same initials. Gargle when you get home. Your throat will feel better. Goodbye. Mr. Cochran was wearing a tan gabardine. I admired it walking up Van Dyke. Half a block, and Mr. Cochran decided his gabardine was worthy of better places than Van Dyke. He hired a cab. I made my car, and Mr. Cochran and I went for a drive. Mr. Cochran paid his cab off and it left. I got out of the car and Mr. Cochran walked past the entrance to the orange turban. I ignored it too. Mr. Cochran picked out the first alley beyond the nightclub and went down it. I gave him time and sampled the alley myself. A thin trickle of moonlight picked out garbage cans, empty milk bottles... And Mr. Cochran knocking on a door at the end of the alley. The door was solid and bolted. I decided I'd use the front entrance to the orange turban. It was the kind of a place that had a cover charge. I wondered how Captain Kavaleski would feel about a cover charge. And then I had thoughts about Mr. Schuyler, and I didn't bother wondering. The head waiter had his doubts, but the place was open to the public. The table he gave me commanded a very good view of the wallpaper and the entrance to the gents' lounge. The girl playing the piano was like uh, half a million other girls, except she happened to be beautiful. The last time I'd seen her, we were in a gray stone house, and a man was about to die. This time... Good evening, Lieutenant Dana. If you say so. I'm Welsh. I own the turban. Hope you like it. Oh, I'm crazy about the wallpaper. The head waiter didn't recognize you, and I'd be like another table. Ah, this one will do. Lieutenant, I hope you're not here on business. I wouldn't know. Who's the piano player? The pi- oh, uh, Claire Mason. Beautiful, isn't she? And she even plays the piano. I'd like to meet her. Uh, I'll ask her. You pay her salary, tell her. Very well, Lieutenant. Hello. Mr. Welsh asked me to come. Sit down, Miss Mason. Thank you. It's even later. I beg your pardon? Then last night. <sighs> I'm not sure last I know. Last night was the night we met at Mr. Schuyler's. At uh, Mr. Schuyler's? Who is Mr. Schuyler, Lieutenant Dana? Oh, like that, huh? We, you and I have never met before. I wouldn't have forgotten if we had. You're very beautiful. And how did you spend last night between the hours of uh, 11 to 1, say? 
Why are Don't I... bother. You were here all the time. How many dead men have you ever seen? Uh, I don't think I've seen any. That's a shame. Everybody should see at least a few. Why? Then maybe more people than homicide would hate killers. Welsh got an office in the club? In the back of the building. Now, let's go visit him. I don't particularly want to. Your lawyer wouldn't be happy with your unwillingness. My... I don't have a lawyer. You will by the time you get to trial. I said let's go. I don't know what you're trying to accomplish, but... All right. I just want Welch to tell me that you were here all last night, too. It's through here. He'll tell you I was here. Now, I know he will. But once he tells me, you see, I'll have a couple of accessories. You and Welch. Accessories to... Murder. That's what it always is, isn't it? Would you mind? Oh. I uh, keep forgetting we first met in very high society. Sure. Lieutenant Dana. Yeah? Since Welsh will corroborate my story, what's there for you? Exercise. Look, Miss Mason, if this were a book, it might turn out that you uh, have a wicked twin sister. Or maybe somebody hypnotized you and the game you played at the Schuyler house wasn't your fault at all. But this isn't a book. We both know where you were last night. And one of us knows exactly why. The other has a very good idea. Welch is on the other side of that door? Yes. You're looking at me as if I were a can of somebody's ideal dog food. Am I? Yes. And you're wrong. I'm nobody's ideal. Not even a dog's. You sticking to your story? It, it's not a story. It's the truth. I've got just enough brains, Miss Mason, to know you're lying. I'm just enough of a fool to wish you weren't. Forget it. We go back to the script now. Keeps his door locked. Yeah. Go on, Miss Mason. Uh, it's Claire, Mr. Welsh, and the lieutenant. Oh, cute. What do you mean? Never mind. You know the answer to that one, too. Come in. Come in. Just doing a little bookkeeping. Make yourselves comfortable. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Welch, where was Miss Mason at 11 o'clock last night? There? Why, here at the club, of course. And how do you know? Well, because I was here myself. How about 7 o'clock? Uh, 7? That one you need a minute for. Take it. I don't know what you mean. At 7, Claire and I were dining together. But she told we me We were that dining you... together. Oh, neat. Very neat. What restaurant? No restaurant, Lieutenant. Claire happens to be a very fine cook, and she was kind enough to invite me to dinner at her apartment. Then she's got more talents than one. Why, you... Piano playing. Lieutenant, if you're going to be nasty... What else can I be? Look at the company I keep. Miss Mason, you're buying one alibi from Welsh. Know what he's getting in return? Two alibis. Two? Two? You know about Skyler. You were there. I've already told you I wasn't. Save it. Welch offered to pull you out of that one by saying you were here. It'd be my word against a pair of you. You took his offer. In return for that, you've given him an alibi for 7 o'clock last night. We were together. What happened at 7 o'clock last night? A little man named Willie Baines had part of his head shot off with a forty-five. <gasps> oh, that one you didn't have down in your little book, huh? I, I didn't know. Claire, the man's trying to trap you. Shut up. I've got my right. <laughs> How about Willie Baines's rights? How about Skyler's rights? I had nothing to do with them. Remember, Dana, you're not a jury. I remember that all the time. That's why I don't kill you. All right, Miss Mason. I have nothing to say. You've got lots to say. It went like this. Skylar was down here, saw you, decided your eyes held all the stars, and your lips were what a man dreams of. He also happens to be on the crime commission. He got hold of Willie Baines, and Baines decided to talk. About who? You know the answer to that one. Otherwise, you wouldn't have recognized Willie Baines' name when I threw it at you. I still have nothing... Let me... Baines was going to tie Welch in with the racket. Skyler told you. You worked for Welch, you told him. Mistaken loyalty or a cut in the profits? I... 
work here, that's all. Thanks. It makes it a little cleaner. You told Welch, and Welch started moving. He hired a gunman from Detroit. First, Willie Baines went at 7 o'clock. And then Skyler at 11. You were with Skyler at his house in evening dress. Or well, maybe you didn't know the program for the evening. I didn't. <laughs> that was for obstructing justice, Welch. Uh, I'm confused. Say the phony alibis work. Where does that leave you the minute Welch stops worrying about you? Oh, I don't care Where about does what... that leave you? Two dead men on your doorstep morning, noon, and night, waking and sleeping. Skyler, who loved you with two bullets in his head. Willie Baines, dead in Potter's Field. Oh, stop! Please stop it! <laughs> All right, Lieutenant. Claire. I was at Skyler's, you know that. You saw me. It's seven. Well, well, the lights. Claire, get down. <laughs> Don't move. The boy from Detroit was around. Claire. I don't feel good. Let me look at... Yeah. Don't... Don't leave me! I'm not. It wasn't Welsh. I had my eyes on him. It was the Detroit gun boy. Emergency. Lieutenant Dana. An ambulance, quick. The Orange Turban Club, back room. Take care of that and then send a patrol car over. All right. Lieutenant, I don't feel... There'll be a doctor here pretty quick. <laughs> what... What chance? You don't have to answer that one. I... I know. <sighs> this isn't going to be easy. But, Miss Mason, I'm a cop from homicide. I got a duty to perform. What? What are you so worried about? I... I I don't like it. I... There's a gimmick in the law. It says testimony by a witness not alive at the time of trial isn't admissible unless... the witness made the statement and signed it at a time when the witness knew he was dying. <laughs> then I'll make a very good witness, won't I? I'll write the dying declaration out. I, uh... Uh, name Claire Mason. Where do you live? The Ardmore Hotel. Do you now believe you're... you're about to die? Yes. Have you no hope of recovery from the effects of the injury you've received? Isn't there any... any... No. I have no hope. I'll write the statement. You'll have to try to read it. <laughs> All right. It, it says what you said before. Yes. Give me the pen. That'll make up for Skylar and Willie. It'll make up. Oh, I... I think maybe now. Maybe now, Lieutenant. Yeah? The way you figured it out. I wasn't so bad, was I? You weren't so bad. But Lieutenant, you and I, we know, don't we? That really I was part of... It. I don't know a thing except what's on the statement. Thanks, Lieutenant. Thanks. She thanked me, and she died. It wasn't fair. Dead, she looked even more beautiful. I got out before the ambulance in the squad car. I got out of the room and down the hallway to the door that opened out on the alley. I was late, but not too late. Welch and the gunboy Cochran would be waiting. They had to wait. 
Alive, I was their executioner. Dead, they'd be safe. I killed the hallway light. Slid the bolt open. Kicked the door wide. And I headed for the dirt on the alley pavement. I picked number one by the flares of his gun. Welch. Uh, he hadn't expected me to come through the door that low. The gun boy had been smarter. He pulled in behind the stack of barrels he'd used as cover. We were going to have fun. Cochran? Welch is out. It's just you and me now. Come out. No? Then I'll come after you. You got the girl. A neat job, Cochran. Real neat. Not a word, Cochran. I'm coming after you. Not like Willie Baines who tried to run. Not like Skyler who didn't know it was coming. Me, you've got to take from the front, Cochran. But to do that, you know what, Cochran? You'll have to come out yourself. Stand up to it and take a chance. How about it, gun boy? How about it, killer? All right. I'm on the other side of the barrels. I'm kicking them over, and when they go down, we'll each have a shot apiece. Fair enough, gun boy. Fair enough, killer. No! No! I'm coming out. Here's my gun. Don't shoot. Please, out. Please, don't, don't shoot. He crawled out on the dirty floor of the alley and cried. I didn't shoot him. They die harder and more often in the death cell. The boys arrived and washed the thing up. I went back to headquarters. I wrote up my report with pen and ink on white paper. I attached Miss Mason's dying declaration to my report and threw it in the outgoing basket. In due time, the district attorney would use it in a court of law, and a murderer would die. Fair enough. And Claire Mason, with the lights in her eyes and the warm lips, was dead. And would be forever dead, with all her beauty. I... I don't like killers. I've just heard Dan Durier as The Man from Homicide with Larry Dobkin as Dave. And Diamond was Claire J. Novello Welch. Music was by Basil Adlam. The Man from Homicide is transcribed, written by Lou Bitties, directed by Dwight Hauser. Be with us again next week, same time, over most of these same ABC stations to hear Dan Durier as The Man from Homicide. Orville Anderson speaking. This program came to you from Hollywood. America is sold on ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf, which follows transcribed in 30 seconds. What's on the menu at Duffy's Tavern tonight? Well, there's a full serving of laughs with Archie the Manager, played by Ed Gardner, and his unpredictable friends, Miss Duffy, Clifton Finnegan, and Eddie the Waiter. It's Duffy's Tavern later this evening over most of these NBC stations. And this Sunday, the big show comes your way once again with Bob Hope, Jimmy Durante, Perry Como, Jose Ferrer, Mindy Carson, Eddie Cantor, Meredith Wilson and his orchestra, and many, many more. And, of course, your MC once again will be Tallulah Bankhead. That's this Sunday for the big show. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we take you to the most famous brownstone house in New York City. The one located at number 601 West 35th Street. Oh, Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf. One something, Archie? Would you be interested in taking on a case involving a woman who was found stabbed to death in one of New York's fancier men's clubs? Can't you see I'm already occupied, Archie? My Oncidium hybrid is ailing. But, sir, cash. C-A-S-H. Remember, you need it to live on? Well, you're actually learning to spell. You'd better learn to count. We're broke. Thank you, Mr. Goodwin. Now, if you'll just go away and stop interfering. Oh, just a minute. Yes, sir? 
On your way out, switch on the fan. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's that one and only man of moves. The most famous detective in modern fiction. That corpulent, orchid-raising, beer-drinking gourmet who also happens to be a genius. Rex Stout's incomparable Nero Wolfe, starring Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight, Nero Wolfe's long-suffering assistant, Archie Goodwin, tells us of the case of the careless cleaner. I didn't know Clay Michelson very well at the time, though Mr. Wolf had hung one of the Michelson's paintings on the library wall. But then I guess we should have considered ourselves lucky not to have known him or his wife, Fila. Two weeks ago, they had a quarrel. Oh? Oh, Clay, darling. I didn't expect you home so soon. I thought you were going to the museum to see the Van Goghs. I decided not to, Fila. Oh. Well, if you were... Uh plan to paint this afternoon, I'll get out of the studio. I want to run some errands anyway. Why don't you make your phone call from here, Fila? Phone call? Who is he, Fila? He? Who were you waiting for this afternoon? Please, Clay, don't start that jealousy routine again. Don't try to kid me. You're being stupid, Clay. I'm stupid, all right, but I'm getting wise pretty fast. I'm through, Fila. I've had enough. I'm leaving you. So stay out of my way and keep your boyfriend out of my way, too, whoever he is, or I'll kill him. Yes? What can I do for you? Uh, uh, Sleepy. I want to have a drink and go to bed. I'm sorry, sir. The Garrison Club's a private establishment. No rooms available to the public. You think I'm drunk? Oh, no, sir. Why why do you suppose I came here? Well, I'm sure I wouldn't know, sir. I'll tell you why. I came here to see my old pal, Lou Saunders. That's why. You know Mr. Saunders? Do I know? Look, I paint them, Lou sells them. Mr. Saunders... Is your agent? I'm Clay Michelson. Just call Mr. Saunders. Clay, Uh, what in the world? Lou, tell this guy who I am. But I'm sorry, Mr. Saunders. It's all right, Mr. Martin. You see? Let's go have a drink. Yeah, yeah, sure, Clay. You know what, Lou? I left Fila. Yep, I walked out on her. Is there something I can do, Mr. Saunders? Yeah, have someone fix a bed in the other room of my suite. Mr. Michelson will be staying with me. At least for tonight. Mr. Wolf? Yes, Archie? It's Friday. Good. Fish for dinner, then. Nope. I was not referring to dinner. You were not? I can think of nothing more interesting at the moment. Oh, I can. My salary... Of course, according to the Julian canon. We're on the Gregorian, so let's stick to it. Today is Friday. Today I get paid. Archie, there's a drop. Oh, don't exaggerate. You can't be getting the cold shutters just because I'm asking for my money. I can distinctly feel fresh air flowing into the room. Well, it's possible I might have opened a window six inches. You're insane. Shut it at once. Nope. Are you trying to blackmail me? Think it might work? Never. And the window stays open. You're fired. I accept your offer. All you have to do is pay up. I've hired you again. Oh, Mr. Wolf, you've cleaned out the bank balance again? Well, that is... <clears throat> well, had you seen those Miltonians... Would I have voluntarily given up my paycheck for them? Orchids are very beautiful, Mr. Wolf, but blondes are... The door, Archie. I am unemployed. Confound you, it may be a client, and if it is, and we can uh, extract the fee. You follow me, Archie? I'm already on my way to the door. Mr. Wolf. I've got to see him at once. Well, come in. Thank you. Mr. Wolf, this is... My name is Saunders, Mr. Wolf. We've met before. Yes, I remember. As a matter of fact, you sold me a painting of Michelson. Yes, well, that's why I'm here. It's about Michelson, Mr. Wolf, that I've come. Frankly, I... I think the man's about to go mad. He and his wife have split up and... and Uh, Such a splendid artist, too. A pity. I don't know what to do. He's drinking like a fish. For two weeks, I've been letting him live in part of my suite at the Garrison Club, but uh, he's just steadily getting worse. I try a hospital. I can't. The publicity. Mr. Wolf, 
Claire admired you so that time we all had dinner after the painting transaction. I, I thought maybe you could talk to him. Maybe you could get him on his feet again. I'm not a doctor, Mr. Saunders. But I'm sure he'd listen to you. Excuse me a moment, Mr. Saunders. Here to Wolf speaking? Inspector Kramer. Uh, good evening, Inspector. Got a guy called Lou Saunders at your place? Garrison Club said he'd gone to your place. Yes, he's here. Well, see to it that he doesn't leave until I get there. He's hardly do that, Inspector. I have no reason to detain Mr. Saunders. There's plenty of reason. It so happens a woman's just been murdered in his suite. Murdered? Yeah. A Miss Hilda Lundgren. What's happened? Now will you hold him? Uh, do you know a Miss uh, Hilda Lundgren, Saunders? Hilda Lundgren? I've never heard of her. She seems to have chosen your suite to be murdered in. Oh, I, I'd better get right over there. Mr. Saunders says to tell you he'll be right over, Inspector. Now listen, Wolf. Good day, Inspector. Murdered? Murdered in my suite? Mr. Wolf, you've got to come with me. Uh, Mr. Goodwin will accompany you. After the formality of a retainer, Mr. Saunders. Oh, anything you say. Here, here, I'll write a check. Good, uh, 500. 500? Fine. My friend and assistant, Mr. Goodwin, will go with you. I have great confidence in his ability to bring back every detail of a murder, particularly where a woman's involved. <laughs> Okay, you photographers, picnic's over for tonight. Pick up your stuff and get out of here. You sound real mean today, Inspector Kramer. Well, if it isn't Nero Wolf's favorite stooge, what are you doing here, Goodwin? I got bored with my knitting. Look, I wasn't asking for humor. I'm Louis Saunders, Inspector. Saunders? Ever seen that woman before? I... Yes. Yes, I believe I have. I can't remember where, but the face looks familiar. Mmm, lovely-looking woman. Blonde and really built. Well, she ought to look familiar. She's one of the cleaning women here at the club. She is? Cleaning? Well, since one of gals like this been reduced to cleaning floors, what's happening to the world? There ought to be a law. Yeah, there is. She was killed with a knife, or haven't you had time to notice? Uh, that's not a knife, Inspector Kramer. That, that's one of Clay's Chinese letter openers. He used... What was that? Well, nothing. Nothing at all. Yes, it is a strange knife. What were you saying, Mr. Saunders? I just, just said that that looked like one of the letter openers belonging to one of my friends. Who is this Clay? Clay Michelson, the artist. You can't possibly think he'd do a thing like this. I think everybody did it until we know otherwise. When were you last up here, Mr. Saunders? Me? Why, just a little while ago. I changed my clothes just before I went to see Mr. Wolf. She wasn't here then? Well, I don't know. I didn't come into this room, just in my part of the suite. Your part? Who occupies this room? Mr. Michelson. He's been staying with me. Strange wound, no blood. What do you think you are, Goodwin, a medical examiner? Oh, but yeah, I Yeah, want... yeah, yeah, the killer probably wiped the blood away. Saunders, have you any idea where your artist friend might have run off to? I haven't seen Clay all afternoon. He spends a lot of time down in the bar. Well, he'd hardly may... sit in a bar if he's killed somebody. But... Why would he pick on the cleaning woman? Oh, this is no ordinary cleaning woman. Get a load of that figure. Watch She's... it, Goodwin. Watch it. You're liable to stretch your brain. But you're wrong. In spite of everything, Clay's still terribly in love with his wife. He he, he wouldn't... Oh, uh, hello. Where did you get in? Yeah, who's this? Clay. We're your friends, Lou. They won't serve me any more liquor down at the bar. I gotta find my flash. Mr. Michelson, it, may I introduce you to Inspector Kramer of the police? Who's this guy, Lou? He's Nero Wolf's assistant. Wolf? Police? Well, what do you all want? Somebody park overtime? Where's my flask? The one with my initials. I just bought it this morning. Mr. Michelson, do you know that somebody was murdered here in your room? Murdered? Why don't you guys go away and joke with somebody else? Where's my flask? You better get hold of yourself. I said there's been a murder. Understand? Are you serious? Yep. And I wouldn't be surprised if Inspector Kramer here considers you top suspect. Me? They think I did it? You better pull yourself together, Clay. Yeah, because I got a lot of questions. Excuse me, the phone. Now sit down, Mr. Saunders. I'll answer it. Hello? 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 This is Fila. I... Who is this? This is Inspector Kramer. Hello? Hello? Hmm. 
Who is Fila? Anyone know? Well, that's my wife. Your wife? I, I want to speak to her. Come back here, Michelson. Let me alone. I'm... You're not going anywhere. Now stay back there. You're wrong, Inspector. I am going somewhere. Junior's got a gun. Yes, Inspector. You should be more careful about your gun when you shove people. Now, look, Mr. Michelson. I'll I see want... Mr. Wolf myself. Stay back, Inspector. You haven't a chance. We'll nab you before you get a block away. Well, then I'll just jerk these phone wires. Yeah. And I'll lock the doors. That should hold you long enough. Good night. Hmm. Yeah, Here, Wolf speaking. Wolf Kramer. Indeed. Clay Michelson may be on his way over there. Hold him until I get there. Hold him why? Not more than ten minutes ago, he held me up at the point of a gun. He carries a gun? It was my gun. <laughs> Careless of you, Inspector. Ah. Goodbye. <laughs> Come in. Mr. Wolf? Yes? My name is Clay Michelson. Yes, I was rather expecting you. You've got to help me. They think I murdered someone. You shouldn't have run away from the police. I, I've been drinking a lot, but, but I wouldn't murder anyone. Feel would tell you that. No way. Was she the model in that painting of yours I purchased? What difference does that make? I tell you, they're after me for murder. You obviously love your wife deeply at the time you painted her. Oh, here you are, Mr. Wolf. It... Michelson. Clay. Good Lord, man. The police are on their way over here. He came for my help, Mr. Saunders. Oh, I'm glad he did, Mr. Wolf. But we left Inspector Kramer talking from a phone booth. He'll be here any minute. Then we have only a minute to decide why anyone would want to kill a cleaning woman. I didn't kill anybody. She was a beautiful woman, Mr. Wolf. I gathered that, Archie, from your unusual interest in the case. She was stabbed with a letter opener from Mr. Michelson's house. Which might add, Mrs. Michelson, to our suspect list. Fela? You can't suspect Fela. You're very gallant to Michelson. Just how was this beautiful young cleaning woman, this Miss Lundgren, stabbed? Um, in the heart. Her eyes were wide open, pupils dilated with shock. And Details I... later, Archie. Kramer will be here shortly. The moment I would like to know where everyone was. Well, Mr. Saunders was here with us, you remember. I don't know where Mrs. Michelson was, but I could go see her and find out. No, it won't be necessary, Archie. Mr. Michelson, where were you? Me? Why, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I can't seem to remember. It's hardly what we would call helpful. I, I was drunk. Maybe, maybe I went to Fela's. I've been over there lots this week trying to talk to her. I, I must have gone over there. Have you ever seen the murdered woman before? No, I never saw her before in my life. I've seen her before, Mr. Wolf. Indeed, Mr. Saunders. I seem to remember your earlier statement to the contrary. Well, uh, I didn't know her name, but when I saw her, I remembered her. I understand she was quite an alcoholic. Hmm. Unfortunate woman. Beautiful woman. Well, look who's here, Inspector Kramer. Oh, here you are, Michelson. And as usual, you didn't have the courtesy to ring the bell, Inspector. And give you a chance to get this guy out of here? Nothing doing, Wolf. Now, come on. We're going to headquarters. Mr. Wolf, you can't let him take me. I didn't do it. I'm afraid there's not much I can do about it, Mr. Michelson. Come on. You come along too, Saunders. i got to get a statement from you. Of course. This way. Come on. Very well. All right. I just got an angle. Really, Archie? Sure, it's simple. Saunders been going for this beautiful cleaning babe. Clay worms in. Saunders kills her. Perhaps there was jealousy somewhere in this case, Archie. Yeah, Wolf speaking. Mr. Wolf, this is Fela Michelson. You don't know me, but you once bought a painting from my husband. I've got to see you, Mr. Wolf. You've got to help me. Mm. This is Michelson. Have some of this delicious beer. Another can, Archie. And now, Mrs. Michelson, may I ask how you found out there was a murder in the first place? A policeman came to see me. He told me what had happened. That they were looking for Clay. I don't know what to think. He's temperamental, he's jealous, and he's sometimes violent. But I can't imagine anything like this. Not Clay. Maybe some of those friends of his, but... You uh, don't care for your husband's friends? No. They all live off him. They're leeches. Mrs. Michelson, did your husband come to see you this afternoon? This afternoon? No. You're quite positive? Oh, yes. That was his alibi for the time of the murder. He said he went to see you. Of course, he was fuzzy, usual effect of alcohol on the brain cells, but... Uh, 
Uh, Mrs. Michelson, might I be a little indiscreet for a moment? Indiscreet? Have you been seeing some other man? I don't know what you're talking about. Please, Mrs. Michelson, I'm afraid your face gives away more than you tell. I thought we were here to talk about a murder, Mr. Wolf. Indeed, but your husband's jealousy might well fit into that category. Oh, Clay, imagine things. You're a very beautiful woman, Mrs. Michelson. Now, if you will try telling me the truth, perhaps we can accomplish something. But I tell you... Uh... All right. So I thought I was in love with another man. Your husband suspected but didn't know, huh? No. Clay didn't know. He wouldn't have given me a divorce anyway. You sound as though you want your husband back. I did, but... I didn't even know where he went. Indeed, Mrs. Michelson. Archie informs me that the murdered woman was quite lovely. What are you trying to suggest? You said yourself you wanted your husband back. Yeah, one woman jealous of another, that's always murder. Why, that's stupid. Clay wouldn't play around with a maid. That's stupid. Clay loves me. I'm not jealous of anyone. No one, do you understand? Archie, if you'll see Mrs. Michaels at home... Yes, sir. Thank you, I can find my own way. I prefer Archie took you, Mrs. Michelson. You wanted my help, didn't you? I... Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Michelson. If you will just wait outside for a moment, please. What have you got in mind, Mr. Wolf? Try exercising your own judgment just once, Archie. You mean she's the one who's jealous? Perhaps, Archie. Perhaps she may want us to think she was jealous. Perhaps she actually doesn't want her husband back at all, only to pin a murder on him. Oh. You see, in this case, it would be simpler than divorce. Yeah? Yeah, she might just be trying to get rid of him. She might, Archie. But then she's a woman, so don't count on anything. <laughs> she might even be telling the truth. This is where I live, Mr. Goodwin. Nice. Very nice. I like Greenwich Village. I'm trying to figure out why Mr. Wolf sent you along with me. <laughs> I'm a sucker for beautiful women. <laughs> I wonder. Archie. Huh? Does Mr. Wolf believe me? He hasn't made an official statement yet. Nice furniture and things. You sound like an appraiser or, or someone looking for something. That's because it's November. Mr. Wolf sent you to search my apartment. You could be wrong. I don't... Oh. What's the matter now? Thought you said your husband hadn't been here today. He, he wasn't. And what's his flask doing among these papers on the desk? Very prettily decorated with his initials. He was looking for it at the club. Flask? I don't know what it's doing there. Yeah, sure. You're trying to help, Clay. Right into the electric chair. But... His only alibi was his being here this afternoon and you said he wasn't. Then what is his flask doing here? He said he just bought it this morning, so he must have been here today. I don't know what you're talking about. Where's your phone? Well, you've got things wrong. I don't know anything about that flask. I... The lights... Who switched off those lights? Feel her. Put those lights on. Put on those lights. Oh, oh, the lights are... Get to the lights. That flask... Gone. Nero Wolf speaking. Wolf, where's Fila Michelson? Fila, perhaps you might try the lost and found, Inspector. Now, look, I know she was over at your place. I thought you were interested in Clay Michelson. Well, I let him and Saunders go, for the present. They're clean until I get the medical examiner's report. Oh, when will it be ready, by the way? An autopsy takes time, you know that. Where's the Michelson woman? I believe she had a date with Archie. Why do you want her? I'm sure it never dawned on you, Wolf, but this cleaning woman who was killed was some dish. Maybe Mrs. Michelson was the jealous one. Your thinking is beginning to bear an amazing resemblance to Archer's, Inspector. Also, it maybe never dawned on you that Fela Michelson hasn't offered an alibi for the time of the murder. Hmm. You're right, Inspector. Yeah, you are. Come on, Wolf. Quit stalling. Where's Fela Michelson? Hmm? What? Oh, I really don't know, Inspector. But perhaps as a last resort, of course, you might try her home. Good night, Inspector. Ah, uh, inevitable the moment I'm comfortable. Come in. Mr. Wolf, 
Oh, thank heavens you're here. I always am. Where's Mr. Goodman? I don't understand how it happened. I swear I don't. What happened? I haven't got any idea how it got there. Got where? Calm down, Mrs. Michelson. I... Uh, Now, just what got where? Clay's new flask. Your assistant, Archie, he... He came home with me and that new initial flask was there. He thinks Clay was there this afternoon and that I'm trying to frame him or something. Oh, here you are. She's here, therefore. This is our gal, Mr. Wolf. She's been lying right down the line. I tell you, Clay wasn't there. Then why did you give me this clout on the head and grab the evidence and run? I didn't. I didn't hit you. I ran, but I didn't hit you. And I didn't take that flask either. Oh, next thing she'll say, there wasn't any flask. Stop gaping at Mrs. Michaels and Archie and open the door. Yeah, sure. Well, Mr. Wolf, they let Clay and me go for the... Leela. What are you doing here? After your visit this afternoon, Mr. Saunders, she decided to come down and see me. After my visit? What, what makes you think I was at Felix? It was Mr. Saunders, not your husband, who came to visit you this afternoon, wasn't it, Mrs. Michelson? I... I don't have anything to do with Mr. Saunders. Then might I ask why you called him today? I, I wasn't calling him. I was calling Clay. You told me earlier yourself that you didn't know where Mr. Magazine was. Well, I... All right. So what if it was Mr. Saunders who came this afternoon? As he has for many afternoons. What are you trying to get at, Mr. Wolf? Saunders? He and Fela? Yes, Archie. Mr. Saunders, the artist's friend and agent, happens to be the one who was making a fool of the artist. But that's all over. I told him. That's what I was talking to Mr. Saunders about this afternoon. I didn't want Clay to know. Clay would never have come back. All right, so it was Fela and me. I admit it, but that's not murder. I suggest that it is, Mr. Saunders. I suggest that one of you two murdered the cleaning woman. Whichever one of you carelessly left the whiskey flask in Fela's apartment. This is murder, Mr. Wolf. Not a joke. Not at all a joke. You see, our cleaning woman was not murdered by the knife found in her body. She was poisoned. What do you mean? Not by the knife? Poison. She undoubtedly drank from Michelson's flask while she was working in his room at the Garrison Club. But she was stabbed. True. However, Miss Lundgren was an alcoholic. Saunders mentioned that, and I checked with the club manager. But how does that prove there was poison in the flask? That she was poisoned? Archie, would you mind uh, repeating your description of the dead Miss Lundgren? First, uh, as to the wound. Okay. There was no blood. Someone advanced a fantastic theory about wiping the blood away. And now, Archie, the description of the body of Miss Lundgren. I mentioned the fact that her eyes were wide open, the pupils were dilated. At... Hey, dilated pupils? Yes, Archie. The lack of blood had already made me wonder about the entire affair. When you added the dilated pupils... What's special about dilated pupils? In death, that is a common symptom of poison by a certain vegetable drug... Of considerable potency. But what was the point of stabbing her? The poison did the job. However, the killer later used the letter knife in an effort to deceive the police. However, he unhappily forgot that the dead don't bleed. I think you're guessing, Mr. Wolf. Am I? All I can say is that I was at the pool in the early afternoon. Hmm. You're very certain you were at the club pool and the murder was committed, Mr. Saunders? Certainly. From one until three. Excuse me, please. Wolf speaking. Inspector Kramer, medical examiner's report just came in this minute. And get a load of this wizard. The dame didn't die of stabbing at all. I know. You you know? She died of drinking a fatal dose of poison known as deadly night shade. What? How do you know that? Inspector, do they know what time she died? Time? The medical examiner says 2.30. Thank you, Inspector. Oh, incidentally, if you care to drop over here, you may pick up the murderer. Goodbye. I heard him, Wolf. She died at 2.30. As I told you, I was in the pool at 2.30. Which is exactly how you prove yourself a murderer, Mr. Saunders. Oh, I prove myself... Even the police didn't know what time she died. Until just now. And the body wasn't found until the evening. How did you know she died between one and three? I, I, I didn't know, but... You I... probably were at the pool at the time. The maid drank the poisoned whiskey. You put in the flask of your friend Clay Michelson. I tell you, you're crazy. You planned to get rid of Clay, who stood in the way of your marrying Fela. When you came back to your room at three and found that the maid had drunk it instead, 
You stabbed her with Clay's letter opener to cover up the real cause of the murder and throw suspicion on Clay. Oh, this is nonsense. Ridiculous. That's and then, thing. when you learned that the woman for whose love you were willing to commit murder was through with you, you took Michelson's new flask to feel his home, confident that it would be found there. Yes, and then he attacked me and stole that flask again in order to make it look like Feeler had done it. Exactly, Archie. Mr. Saunders, the chances are that your fingerprints will be found on that whiskey flask. And they'll be able to trace the poison to wherever you purchased it. The chances oh, are... Oh, no, you don't. Careful now, all of you. Guns bore me, Saunders. Oh, yeah? I'm leaving. You are not... Clay! Clay! Yes, Mrs. Michelson, your husband has been there for some time. Clay, are you all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. Well done, Mr. Michelson. I think you proved that an artist's life may indeed be exciting. I have been an awful fool, Mr. Wolf. Mr. Michelson, you might remember for the future that unreasoning and unjustifiable jealousy sometimes creates the very conditions that it fears. You're being very kind to me, Mr. Wolf. How can we ever thank you? By prompt remittance of your check on receipt of my bill in the morning. <laughs> Good day, Mr. and Mrs. Michelson. Good day, Mr. Wolf. Good day. What's the matter, Archie? You look glum. Yeah. I always have the lousiest luck. Meaning? A hectic case with two beautiful dames. Michelson gets one, the undertaker gets the other, and what do I get? Hey, that reminds me. You got a fee. I get paid. <laughs> You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolfe, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was written by Cheryl Hendricks and based on the famous characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin, and Betty Lou Gerson, Howard McNear, Dan O'Herlihy, Vic Perrin, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Beautiful Archer. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's fun and laughs with the chimes later this evening when Ed Gardner stars in Duffy's Tavern. As usual, Duffy won't be there, but Archie the manager will definitely be on hand to spread his whimsical advice where it'll do the most damage. Tomorrow night, there's action on NBC with Herbert Marshall starring as the man called X in another exciting battle against the forces of international intrigue. Next, Sam Spade. Later, William Bendix on NBC. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf, who follows transcribed in 30 seconds. Later tonight, over most of these NBC stations, Duffy's Tavern comes your way. And on the menu at Duffy's tonight, there's a blue plate special of grilled English language, served up by the delightfully ungrammatical Archie. Plus, laughs garnished with chuckles, brought to you by Archie's remarkable crew. There's no cover charge at Duffy's Tavern. Just keep your dial tuned to NBC. And this Sunday means another broadcast of The Big Show. And your guests include Fred Allen, Douglas Fairbanks, Danny Thomas, and many, many more. Tallulah, of course, is your hostess on The Big Show. Ladies and gentlemen, that phone bell means adventure. Hello? Hello? Hello. The young man answering the phone is Archie Goodwin. The mountain of a man engaged in deep thought in the oversized armchair is Nero Wolfe. Mr. Wolfe, we've got a case. I'm not sure whether somebody's going to kill a rabbit or a rabbit is going to kill somebody, but either way, it's going to be murder. Please, Mr. Wolfe, even orchids have to eat. Oy. Yes, sir, Mr. Wolfe will take the case. As a matter of fact, he's working on it right now. Money, work, bah. Huh. Greatest detective in the world. Only trouble is, he is. Yes, 
Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Archie is right. Nero Wolf is the greatest detective in the world, and the fattest, and the least energetic. Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout, and brought to you over this NBC network in a new series of adventures by Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight, it's the case Nero Wolf likes to remember as the case of the friendly rabbit. He sometimes prefers his proverb scramble. It began in lots of places. Let's take a look at a few of them. In particular, the richly appointed library of a man named Veek. Mr. Veek, what's happening? Relax, Haynes, your blood pressure... I thought it was a gag, but... You really are shutting the club down. I'm shutting it down. Why? I got the joint roll and the suckers are pouring in. And next week, the governor's committee. Huh? It's moving out of Baylor County. Our joint enterprise is in Baylor County. I think the club needs a rest. Crime committees so rarely admire gambling. Oh, that's different. So it is. The club needs a rest. You need a vacation. Florida, perhaps? I don't like Florida. Pick any place you like, just so long as you get out of reach of a subpoena. The heat's on, huh, boss? You've just coined a phrase that may very well catch on. Get out and stay out of the state until I send for you. Okay, Mr. V. Sure, Mr. V. Marshal? Yeah? That about covers us in Baylor, am I right? Yeah, right. The dear governor's dear committee will be sorely disappointed. However, I doubt it'll give up quite so soon. I wouldn't think so. Therefore, have the truck driver deliver another shipment of carrots to the rabbit farm. Eh, Marshal? Okay, boss. Come in, Williams. Good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon. Williams, I'm disturbed. The crime committee, sir? It was doing well, very well. And then... I know, sir. There's a leak. Someone is passing on confidential information. Who? That's the problem. Who? Started three weeks ago. A three-man committee, Wilson, McCarthy, Tolliver. One of them, Williams? I'd stake my life, sir, no. Then who? You've forgotten Collier, committee secretary. You have reason to suspect him? No, nothing that means anything, except... You do suspect him? He's been watched, telephone calls checked, mail. I have no reason to suspect him, except that one thing bothers me. What's that? He has a small farm in Greendale County. He rarely went near the place in all the time he's been up here at the Capitol. But that suddenly changed. Three weeks ago? Yes, sir. He's been staying at the farm for three weeks. Is there anything unusual about that farm? Nothing unusual. Except Jimmy Collier has gone in for raising rabbits. Jimmy. Who is it? Oh, hello, Claire. You've been hiding from me. I... I've been out here with the rabbits. Jimmy, what's wrong? With what? You. There's nothing... You're lying. We grew up together, remember? We lived next to each other, Jimmy. We were going to be married. Hey, wait a minute. We still are, last I heard. You haven't heard recently enough. What does that mean? It means we're not getting married. But, Claire... You've been avoiding me. And you've been getting money, lots of money, from someplace. And in a shady way, I feel. All right, you know. So what? I've been concerned about your sudden devotion to these... These rabbits... And the kind of men you've been seeing. What do you mean? Like the one up at the house now, waiting for you. Oh, there's somebody waiting? That's why I came down here after you. I'd better get up there. He's a crook, Jimmy. Look, I... All right. I sort of got myself in a mess. I needed money and... But it's over, Claire. No more. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. I wish I could believe you. For your own sake. But I feel I can't. Not anymore. Archie. Yes, Mr. Wolf. I either stop breathing so heavily or... Take the evening off? Stop breathing. Old Dr. Tidmouse wouldn't approve of that. Who in blue and assorted blazes is old Dr. Tidmouse? My family doctor. May have escaped your puny mind, but you don't have a family. Answer the phone. Oh, but it might be a case. It might be very important. It might mean work, Mr. Wolf. Archie. W-O-R-K. You've got millions in the bank. Why worry? Confound you. Do you want me to answer their phone myself? Now you've got me. No, Mr. Wolf. Couldn't let you knock yourself out lifting a telephone receiver. Nero Wolf's office. Archie Goodwin speaking. What? What? Wait, Mr. Wolf is to go up to Greendale at... Oh, now look, friend. Mr. Wolf does not go anywhere, and that includes Greendale. He wouldn't stir out of the house for anybody short of the... 
Uh, what? I see. Yes, sir, in an hour. Goodbye. Mr. Wolf, brace yourself. You've got an appointment with a Mr. Williams at the Starlight Hotel in Greendale for one hour from now. You're insane. No, I'll admit I've been tempted. Sure, eh? Were it not for the fact that often the native hue of resolution is sickly door with a pale cast of thought... Quoting Hamlet will get you no place. I would fire you. And then who would drive you to the Starlight Hotel in Greendale? I'm not going to Greendale. Nevertheless, in an hour you will be there. And who, may I inquire, Cecil? The governor of the state. Is that all, Mr. Williams? That, Mr. Wolfe, is all anyone knows about the situation. Except the guilty man, of course. An admirably clear summary, Mr. Williams. Obviously, our meeting here at the hotel was necessary. I couldn't be seen entering your house, nor would it have been advisable for you to visit the governor. I can appreciate that. You're quite sure I need pay no attention to anyone on the committee except James Collier? Quite sure. Police surveillance of Collier is deemed unwise. He has suddenly taken interest in rabbits, but although keeping them may perhaps be considered suspicious, it is hardly in itself of value. You have no other evidence against Collier? I know we're clutching at straws, Mr. Wolfe. But there is a leak and work is being nullified. Something must be done. Hence the governor's call for you. Very well, sir. I shall uh, attempt to be more than uh, a man clutching at a straw. <laughs> I said attempt. Archie. And back. We shall stay at Greendale near Collier and his rabbits. Mr. Wolf? Mr. Wolf? Oh, naturally, I know that shutting your eyes and pushing your lips in and out indicates you're thinking feverishly, but there's nothing for you to think about. Three. Oh, I accept your correction. What are you thinking about? Hotel beds, they're notoriously flimsy. Oh, you gave up on the case so soon. Fiddlesticks. I already know exactly what role the rabbits play in our problem, therefore... We're going to drive out to Collier's farm? You are. While you test the hotel beds, fine. It'll be necessary for you to spend the night at Collier's place. You'll drive out there and pretend you've lost a cylinder or something. (laughs) Oh, a lost cylinder. Oh, fine. Confound you, Archie. You can invent something plausible as a pretext. And if you are properly charming, Mr. Collier will, I hope, invite you to stay the night. And during the night I sleep, hmm? Happily breathing the fresh country air. <laughs> Trust not. <laughs> okay, Mr. Wolf, I accept the assignment. I will learn all I can from Mr. Collier's rabbits. Incidentally, remember the play Harvey? I do. Why? Harvey was an invisible rabbit, a figment of a man's imagination. I hope this rabbit venture is more tangible, Mr. Wolf. It is, Mr. Goodwin. Will you desist and depart? Okay, okay. Oh, uh, if anyone calls, just say I've gone out to Greendale to cross-examine a rabbit. Hmm? Ah, Jay. I think you're going to be quite surprised. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Running out of gas, and me such a big boy. Hmm. Ah. <gasps> hello. Uh, hello. A tree, a friend of yours? The, the tree? Yeah, the one you're clutching. Oh, I, I was leaning against it. It's an idea, but not a good one. Trees are notoriously skittish. The instant you really need one, they're out sowing wild oaks or something. You sound as if you know a lot about trees. Oh, I do. I was brought up in one. Look, now, if you really have to lean, I can recommend No, thanks. I tried. Nice moonlight we're having. My name is Goodwin, and blondes call me Archie. I'm not blonde. Brunettes call me Archie, too. And what do redheads call you? (laughs) We'll just skip that, huh? And your name is... Claire. Claire. I approve. Now, you may not believe this, but I have just run out of gas. You think I might wangle some up at your house? My house? You mean Jimmy's house. All right, I mean Jimmy's house. Well, I I don't know. He might have some. Now, why don't we go up to the house and ask him? Well, all right. Mm -hmm. Jimmy who? Collier. Uh Uh-huh. I like to be formal when I'm borrowing gas. 
Would you mind waving your left hand in front of my nose? Waving, Mike? Yes, just try it. Don't worry, I won't bite it. All right. I did. And very gracefully, too. No ring on the third finger. You're not Mrs. Collier. There isn't any Mrs. Collier. Are you applying for the position? Mr. Goodwin, I... Now, remember what I confided in you about brunettes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Archie, you're a little rapid. Maybe. But I always remember what old Dr. Titmouse said. What did he say? Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Old time is still a-flying. Robert Herrick wrote that. He did? Dr. Titmouse is a liar. How much farther is this house? Well, it's just beyond those trees. I... Oh! What? Uh... Oh, I... There was something ran across the path. It brushed my legs. It frightened me so. Must have been a rabbit. I... I guess it was. Oh, I'm sorry. That was silly of me. Oh. Don't worry about it. Also, you will have noticed how much more satisfactory I am than a tree. We're clutching at it. Moments of stress, I mean... Archie. Mm Mm-hmm. But you'd better let go now. What I... And we'll get on to the house. See, I don't need a haircut, and you're not the right type for Delilah anyway. You mean something by that. Something nasty. Well, that depends. What I meant is you've already signaled whoever you're supposed to signal. Nothing frightened you back there. Why? That scream had a lot of carrying power. Oh, that's the house, huh? Looks peaceful enough. Archie, I... Who were you supposed to warn if anyone came up the path to the house? Well, no one. Something did frighten Honey, me. Honey, I've I... been lied to by experts, and you're not one. Ah. Oh. Think I ought to knock? No, we don't think I ought to knock. Dark inside. Except for a handful of moonlight filtering in through the windows. Kind of early for Collier to turn in, isn't it? I... Wouldn't know. Let's go find out. (gasps) Now relax, relax. Grandpa's making with the chimes. Time is... Yeah, ten o'clock. It's getting late. Come on. This would be the living room. Filled with early American furniture. The early Americans would be pleased. Nothing here. What's that door lead to? I... I don't know. Or won't tell? Smaller room. Darkest. Come in. Good to be here. Oh, you're not the bellboy. I'm sorry. I should have remembered to bring some beer. Indeed, and you are? I'm a fellow guest at this hotel, Mr. Wolf. My name is Veek. Veek, ah, yes. A criminal of moderate intelligence and in moderate pretensions. We won't quarrel, Mr. Wolf. I have something to offer you. You and your boy Goodwin didn't drive up to Greendale for the exercise. I dislike exercise. Shortens life. James Collier lives nearby. The Governor's Committee on Crime is unhappy. There's been a leakage of information. It hasn't helped them in their work. But it has helped you. You wouldn't have left your house in New York on any ordinary job. A request from the governor, however. Shall we stop fencing? Hmm. I don't have to fence with you. The committee's work doesn't particularly bother me. I've already made my arrangements for retiring from active business, shall I say. However, I don't want you messing around in the meantime. Indeed. In your effort to discover how the committee's information leaked out, you might also discover a number of things about me that I prefer to remain undiscovered. No one has employed me to do anything about you, sir? Not directly, but indirectly you might have to. I want to insure myself against any such possibility. I want to make a deal with you. I'm ready to supply you with the name of the man responsible for the leak and papers proving his guilt. I have them here. In return to which you expect... A quick conclusion to your activities and your return to New York, leaving my name out of your reports. I'm neither a public official nor a philanthropist. I should do nothing about you unless it becomes necessary. You may remove your hand from your pocket. You wouldn't dare shoot me. Now then, the name of the man. James Collier. Proof of his guilt? These... A series of reports on the committee's meetings in Collier's handwriting. Thank you. Good night, sir. Good night. And I hope for your sake that we do not meet again. Archie, answer it. Oh. 
Hello? Mr. Wolf? Yes, Archie? I'm at the Collier place. Since it takes only ten minutes to get there, may I congratulate you on your speed? I've been at the Collier place for nearly an hour. Doing what? Oh, meeting Claire, for one thing, discussing Rosebud. Your delay has been explained. Good night. And for another, I was being around when someone got murdered. Ah, you laid hands on the murderer? No, the room was dark. The time I got Claire untangled from me and started looking for somebody with a gun, he'd left. I see. And the dead man, of course, is James Collier. No, sorry. Found it, it had to be. Who was he? Total stranger. Archie. I'm not being difficult. There was no identification on him. Strange. A description. Early 30s, height maybe 5'10", weight around 175 pounds. Blonde hair, blue eyes, a very natty dresser. Suit custom tailored with a built-in shoulder holster. Don Juan shirts. Manicured but very dirty fingernails. And he... Uh Uh-oh. Company. The police? Very well, you tell them whatever you think proper, without mentioning the governor's committee, of course. You then bid them farewell and come to the hotel. Can't I say goodbye to Claire, too? You cannot. Confound you, Archie. Do you think I want to wait up all night? Police were not happy about letting me go, but I threatened to tell you on them, so they gave up. You have told me the entire story of what occurred at the Collier Farm, Archie? Mm Mm-hmm. All details. If you like, I wouldn't mind repeating the parts about Claire. Phooey. You may call it phooey, I call it love. By the way, did you know that it was Robert Herrick who wrote that book? Confound fall? you, be quiet. Okay, push your lips around, but you've missed something. I have? Mm-hmm. The burning question of the day. Good night, brother. Which is? Where is James Collier? Ah. Stop buying. The cops want him on suspicion of murder. The way it shapes up, he shot our unknown pal and then headed for the nearest border. Nonsense. Mean he didn't shoot our unknown pal? I mean, Collier's whereabouts are not a mystery. You know where he is? I know where he is. I don't believe it. You couldn't know. You haven't been out of the hotel. You haven't had any calls. Archie, I use my intelligence. If you had used yours instead of holding the girl... I still wouldn't know where Collier is. Never mind. I'm impressed. What do I do now? You get Mr. Vega on the phone. Huh? He's staying here at the hotel. Oh, old home week. Operator. Mr. Veek, please. Hello, Mr. Veek? Who is this? Mr. Wolf wants to speak with you. Just a second. Here you are, sir. Thank you. Mr. V, where were you at 10 o'clock? Why, on my way to the hotel. You checked in at... 10.15, and then came directly to your room. One other question. You have an employee, a man in his early 30s, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, and well-dressed. Am I correct? Yes, that is Marshall. No, that was Marshall. Good night, sir. Having done that, whatever it meant, we now go to sleep? Three, we go to the Collier Farm. Okay, but why? Because, Archie, uh... <laughs> the time has come to cross-examine the rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> Found you, Archie. You're not driving a truck. Be careful. Truck drivers are careful. Also, they're courteous. Indeed. Furthermore, they will always stop to help a motorist in time of trouble. Archie, are you training to become a truck driver, or have you fallen in love with a truck driver's daughter? Her name is Susie, a hair the color of wheat fields at high noon. Never mind turning purple. I'm about to change the subject. Boss, I have a theory. Stick to truck drivers. As follows. Our boy Collier, who'd been selling information to Veek, had a change of heart and decided to turn ethical. But Veek's man, Marshall, at Veek's orders, tried to apply pressure, so Collier shot him and headed for Canada. Uh, and the girl's robe. Must have brightened my life. Uh, oh, you mean about her playing sentry? Well, she's in Veek's employ, too. Sorry. Don't like my theory. It's charming. It merely happens to be wrong. It merely happens to be. Why is it wrong? Because Archie of a dead man's dirty fingernails, Marshall's fingernails. Oh. Well, you made me bring you to the rabbit hutches. We have arrived. There are the rabbits. Go ahead, cross-examine them. Hmm, good many hutches. A large pen for the rabbits to run about in. Notice that they're all cowering at the far end of the pen, ran as we entered. That's because they don't like us, maybe, huh? (laughs) One of them, however, seems to be friendly. The one up here, and at the corner opposite us. Oh, yeah, there is one here. 
He's not friendly, Mr. Wolf. Indeed? He's dead. Somebody stole in his skull. Interesting. What's interesting about a dead rabbit? He may be dead now, Archie, but he was friendly. Too friendly. Claire, this is Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf, this is Claire. Claire, I'm Archie. Ah, uh, chair, Archie. A chair. Try this one. Be gentle with it. If you break it, all the early Americans will hate you. It was her. Uh... Steady. Oh, uh. well, now then. Mr. Wolf, I'm dreadfully tired. The police have... Are idiots. What? For example, do they know that you were posted as sentry outside this house in order to warn James Collier of any intrusion? Well, they don't... I wasn't. I... Do they know that James Collier and the dead man Marshall were quarreling? No. Do they know that James Collier had armed himself in preparation for this meeting with the gunman? That isn't true. It I... is true. I don't have to say anything. You've already said more than enough with your actions, my dear. What, what do you mean? According to Archie's report, and Archie is always meticulously accurate, when you and he opened the door of the room in which the murder took place, you screamed at the shots. Well, of course. Any girl would scream with... Then you clung to Archie with sufficient force and for sufficient length of time to prevent him from chasing the murderer. Why? I... Because you had seen and recognized the murderer as the man you loved. It was too dark to see anything. True. Therefore, you didn't have to see the man. You thought you already knew who the killer had to be. That, that's a lie. You're shielding James Collier, aren't you? I'll never admit any of it. Never. May not be necessary. Archie. Yes, Mr. Wolf. Get all of that policeman outside and remember what happened to one particular rabbit. Well, uh, look around for freshly dug earth. Midnight. What What are we waiting for? A return? Archie's? No, it'll take him longer. Well, then who's? <gasps> Mr. Veeks, of course, complete with revolver. Come in, Mr. Veek. It couldn't have been easier. No one outside, only the two of you here. I warned you, Wolf. Fiddlesticks, you merely tried to use me as a prop for an alibi and a rationalization for a motive. I don't understand Mr. That... Wolf does. Indeed I do. Did you really think me fool enough to believe your proposal, Mr. Veek? It was plausible. It was nonsense. You pretended you were handling James Collier, plus the proofs of his guilt, over to me in an effort to keep yourself out of the picture. But your proposition was silly. No matter how much I might have wanted to help you, I would have been powerless once James Collier went before a jury. You are too intelligent not to know that. That couldn't have given you enough to go on. It didn't. You yourself gave me more. I did. When you came to my room, you told me you knew Mr. Goodwin and I had come to Greendale, checked in at the hotel. I did. However, when I phoned you later and asked for an account of your movements between 10 and 10.30, you replied that you had driven to the hotel, signed in, and came directly to my room. Obviously, you already knew of my presence in the hotel. How? I, uh... Only one way you could have known. You had seen Archie at some time prior to the time you checked in at the hotel. And the only place where Archie was... Was here, at the farm. Yes, which told me Mr. Veek had been here at the time of Marshall's death. What was Veek doing here? Only one thing. Murder. <gasps> then he killed the gunman. No other possibility. But Jimmy, I thought he did it. James Collier couldn't have killed Marshall because at the time he was killed, James Collier was already... Already dead. Archie! What's this? Me, Mr. Veek? Let's play. Undrop that gun first. My arm! Oh. That's nice and cooperative, so... Oh. You'll be quiet for a while. A cop is back in the rabbit pen, Mr. Wolf, guarding Collier's grave. Grave, Archie? Yeah, with James Collier in it. Oh, poor Jimmy. Veek knew the expose was coming. He had to shut Collier up. So he had his gunman, Marshall, kill Collier and bury him in the rabbit run back of the hutches. You spotted that, boss, because of... The dead rabbit. The others scurried away from the man who bore James Collier's body to that lonely spot. But one rabbit overcame his fear. He was too friendly. And got killed for it. 
There was that and... And the dirty fingernails of Marshall, the gunman who killed and buried James Collier. Your description indicated extreme neatness. The dirty fingernails were a wrong note. Yeah, indicated he'd been digging. So we know now, don't we? Vic killed his own trigger man to frame a dead man for it. Collier would be thought guilty. He'd be hunted among the living. And all the while... Oh, I'm... I'm sorry, Claire. It's all right, Archie. I didn't love Jimmy. That was all washed up. Mr. Wolf, I understand everything, except why did Jimmy suddenly start staying at the farm with the rabbits? He knew he'd be watched. He couldn't risk conveying his information by telephone or the mails. Nor could he be seen holding conversation with men who might be traced to Veek. But who would suspect a truck driver delivering carrots for the rabbits as being the go-between for Jimmy Collier and Veek? Nero Wolf. Which is why I hope there's an adequate bed in this house for Mr. Wolf. I'm sure I'll be able to find one. Splendid, Archie. You will have the police remove Mr. Veek and then... And then maybe Claire would like to uh, go gathering rosebuds, huh? By moonlight? I... Would like to. Sure. I shall go up to bed now. I've seen the moonlight more times than I care to remember. However, while you and Miss Claire stroll through the moonlight, Archie... Yeah? You might remember that rosebuds have thorns. <laughs> You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin, and Martha Shaw, Hal Gerard, Herb Butterfield, Howard McNear, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you The Case of the Impolite Corpse. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's no cover charge at Duffy's Tavern. Just keep your dial on this NBC station this evening as Archie the Manager, played by Ed Gardner, and his remarkable friends serve up another blue plate special of grilled English language, fresh laughs and whimsy a la mode. Another Friday fun favorite is the delightful Life of Riley, starring William Bendix as the beleaguered Chester A. Riley. Now it's Sam Spade. Then, the magnificent Montague on NBC. Time now for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the Mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Cafe Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men. Alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, Fall Guy. Three o'clock in the morning is just about the same all over the world. The streets and buildings and rooms and people are full of sleep. And even in Cairo, Egypt, you can't expect anything different. The whole town's packed with a kind of air that moves all around so you can't hear it, like a lady in a soft dress. I don't generally sit up and wait for three in the a.m., but last night was different. I was working on the books in my place above the tambourine when things got noisy. From my window, I made out a couple of Egyptian police waving pistols in the air. I didn't know what the show was about, but whoever they were shooting at figured to be the leading man. I didn't have time to pick him out, because just then he picked me. Open up, Rocky! Rocky, it's me, Johnny Service. Open up, quick! 
Help me, Rocky. Help me. They're after me. Uh, short change. Somebody at the club, Johnny? This is serious. I'm on a spot. You can tell by the noise you ought to keep a curfew. They were shooting at me. They won't give me a chance to talk. It's that cop Greco. He's bucking for a promotion. I'm one more strike. All right, take I... it easy, Johnny. They're coming here. Help me, Rocky. I've always been a hard luck guy. Greco would kill me just for the fun of it. You know what he's like. He won't give me a chance. Nobody will give Johnny Servi a chance. Rocky, please. We're old pals, you and me. You give me a chance. Please, Rocky, huh? Okay, Johnny. Oh, thanks. I haven't got time to hear your story now, Johnny. But if this is a wrong thing, I'll break you like they never could. I wouldn't get you in any trouble, Rocky. Honest. I'll tell you everything just the way it... Open it, man. Open up. It's Greco. All right, in the closet there. Close the door and don't breathe. Yeah, Rocky. I got you. Open up again. It's the police. All right. Ah, you look hot, Greco. The stairs too much for you? I am looking for a friend of yours, Mr. Jordan. He came in here. Huh? Which one? Johnny Servey. And I will take him dead or alive. It doesn't matter to me. Now, step aside. Ah, uh, you got a warrant, Greco? I don't need one with you. Tonight you do. You will please step out of the doorway. I'm coming in. Uh, you... <laughs> You're too shovey even for a policeman. But I am a policeman, and I want Servey any way I can get Back him. to your beat, Greco. One moment. Rocky Jordan might have been shot accidentally in the line of fire. If you make out the report, is that what it would say? That is exactly what it would say. Do I come in, Mr. Jordan? Uh, I don't argue with a police special. Sure, come on in. Greco! I better tuck it away, Greco. Sam still runs the department his way. Hmm. Well, Greco... So we've lost him, eh? No, Captain Sabaya. He is hiding here in Mr. Jones' cafe. Uh, hiya, Sam. Everybody gunning around tonight? Jordan, are you hiding this man? We know he is a friend of yours. Oh, I got a lot of friends. Have sir. you seen Johnny Servi tonight? Jordan, an important diplomatic official was robbed at the International Club tonight. The charge is against your friend Servi. It is a serious situation which might bring about complication. Now, Jordan... Is this man here with you? I can make him answer that question, Captain. Greco, we represent the law. We do not violate it. You ought to remind him more often, Sam. He forgets easy. Within the hour, I will have a warrant issued to search these premises, Jordan. For your sake, as a guest of the Egyptian government, I hope we do not find Johnny Servey here. I hope so, too. All right, Greco. You mean we are not going to search this place now? We will do everything the law enables us to do. Jordan. Yeah? Friendship is a most admirable attainment. It is the single proof that men are no longer barbarians. Sometimes, however, it is taken advantage of. And then it is a sin against civilization. Hmm. Good night, Sam. Good night, Jordan. I heard their story, Johnny. Hope you write a better one. You covered for me swell. Come on, give it to me. Give it to me. All right, all right. You know, I reckon the chips were Ed Solomon at the International Club. Yeah? Well, tonight a guy from one of the embassies takes the plunge. Loses more than he's got with him. He leaves his briefcase for security. Well, I figure the briefcase, full of important papers, will bring him back with the money he owes the house. What does that lead to? Well, the next thing I know, Greco in a couple of uniforms are knocking on the door, telling me how I robbed the embassy guy of his briefcase. You made a break for it? Well, I told Greco what really happened, but he wanted to write it his way. It'd look good, him hauling me in. Even better if I came dead. People talk in places besides Cairo with an embassy guy in the deal. Greco would get a promotion and I'm his water boy. He did real good, Johnny. What happens now? Big Ed Solomon, he owns the International Club. Greco wouldn't tangle with him, and Ed could do all my talking to the right people. Now, you can help me, Rocky. Keep going. Ed Solomon lives in an apartment on the river. Will you see him for me, Rocky? Will you tell him what happened and get me out of this... Uh, I'm not going to get any sleep anyhow. Oh, you're a pal, Rocky. And I sure can use a pal. Yeah, Johnny. That's what scares me. I made sure none of Sabaya's boys were hanging around. Then I hustled Johnny Servi into a cab and dropped him off at a friend of mine's laundry shop. I didn't figure Sam or Greco would go through somebody's dirty burnooses looking for him. Then I headed over to the Nile Street apartment house where Big Ed Solomon lived. It turned out to be one of those chunks of white granite and copper window frames that makes Cairo, Egypt, look like a, a suburb of Michigan Boulevard. Inside, you know, it took a lot of British pounds and American dollars to keep the place up. I waited over a carpet that dragged on me like a Florida swamp and finally found a door marked Mr. and Mrs. Edward Solomon. I figured 500 pounds a year for a good lease. 
She was pretty. Black hair and green eyes. Twenty-four, maybe. But she could have looked sixteen. Yes? Oh, I hate to bother you this time of morning, but it's very important. I've got to see Ed Solomon. Who's calling? Rocky Jordan. Oh, come in, Mr. Jordan. I'm Connie Solomon, Ed's wife. Yeah? Perhaps I can help you. I'm doing this for a friend, Johnny Servey. He's in trouble and Big Ed can help him. Oh, I understand. Well, I'm sorry my husband's not here, Mr. Jordan. I've been sitting up waiting for him. Uh. I haven't seen Ed for five days. Oh? I've heard of you, Mr. Jordan. You run a cafe here in Cairo. You're an American like myself. Uh, let's get back to your husband. Where is he? I don't know. I'd like to see him, too. Well, the world's full of people who want to see him. What's your story? Well, I used to sing. Three years ago, I was stranded at the Shepherd Hotel. One day, a big man came in and heard me and sent me flowers after the show. Well, that'd be Big Ed. After that, he kept coming in and, well, I, I began going out with him. And when he asked me to marry him, I married him. And I didn't ask him what he did for a living or how he spent his time. Oh, he was good to me and he's always been good to me. And well, now he's gone. You sound like he's gone for good. We've never been parted more than five hours since our marriage. He's given me everything. He's done everything for me. You never ask questions? Never. You you want him, Mr. Jordan, and, and I want him. You know where to look and who to ask. Oh, find him for me, please. Well, from pictures I've seen of Big Ed Solomon, he'd be a pretty hard man to lose. Rocky, I'm scared. A partner of his, a, a man named Axman, was here last Monday night. That was the night Ed left and never came back. Axman? Mm -hmm. He's new to me. I was in the bedroom. I thought I heard them quarreling, and when I came out, Axman had his hat in his hand and was leaving, and Ed went with him. Uh, is that all? Oh, I haven't seen him since. <laughs> Do you think anything's happened to him? Do you think he's all right? I think you ought to try the truth. What? All the pictures I've seen of Big Ed Solomon were of a big man with a pipe in his face. I don't see any pipe racks around here, but I see where they might have been. Why, And if you... I went to the closet, I bet I wouldn't find any of Ed's clothes. What would you and Ed argue about? The same things we've been arguing about for three years. He drinks too much and he plays the horses too much. And besides, he hit me. Ah, oh, that's better. So I finally got fed up and I told him to get out. Only now you want him back? Long enough to serve him with some divorce papers and get a property settlement. Yeah, thought it'd be something like that. But about Axman, I wasn't lying. He hates Ed, even if they are partners. Well, it's something from the old days. Well, Axman walked in when Ed and me was having our knockdown. If he wanted to bump Ed, he could do it, and well, somehow he fixed it so it looked like I'd done it. He's that kind. It'd make me look pretty sick if Ed turned up dead somewhere. Yeah, it would. Uh, wait a minute. You still want to see Ed, don't you? Yeah. And you're going to look for him? I told you I got a friend who needs... Yeah, that's what you said. Well, remember everything I told you, will you? Yeah, sure. You had a convincing story to begin with. You ever try acting? Yeah. Yeah, once I... Yeah, there's no future in it. <laughs> Maybe you're right, Connie. Hey, when when this is all over, let you and me have a drink somewhere or something, huh? Sure, why not? I'd, I'd like to meet a nice guy. A real nice guy. Once. Yeah, just once. Oh, when I left her place, the morning sun already had the hangover crowd on the ropes. And it looked like a pretty busy day for me. I'd covered for Johnny Servey, and the only way I could square myself was to find Ed Solomon and clear things up. So I started looking. I ran up a tab at five different places asking questions. Everybody talked, but nobody said anything. That is, until I ran into Sam Sabaya at the Courtney Club. He was standing at the bar, sucking in one of those long Egyptian cigarettes. His eyes didn't shift when they saw me. He just came my way like they were pulling him around. When he stopped, the tuft on his fez hadn't moved. We search your place, Jordan. Huh? Find enough liquor? Jordan, I have known you for a long, t long time. You, you have a code that puzzles me. Mm -hmm. and perhaps it is the difference between the East and the West. Whatever it is, the end is always the same. What are you trying to say, sir? I know that you were hiding Johnny Servey when Sergeant Greco and I were looking for him tonight. I know that you have hidden him somewhere else in the city. Uh, I posted no men to watch your cafe. I hope you can produce Servey when I ask for him, Jordan. Why don't you try an American cigarette, And sir? I hope you have done the right thing this time. I'll handle Servi if you handle Greco. Jordan, there are some people who are controlled only with patience. Good night again. Oh, or rather, 
Good morning. See you, Sam. Mr. Jordan. Hmm? Mr. Jordan. What? Where'd you come from, Buster? Oh, no, Buster. I'm Jeannie. I've been searching for you, Effendi. I have some information. Oh, I've already got plenty of that. This is of special interest to you and your friend. What friend? Inshallah. Yeah. Akatakai. Effendi, Mr. Edward Solomon is a man of peculiar habits. I do not understand them. Come on, Jeannie, let's have it. In Cairo, he maintains a beautiful apartment and a lovely wife from your own country, I believe. Yes, I met her. But on the edge of the desert, away from the Nile, at a large oasis near El Fayum, he also maintains a home. Not many persons know about it. Not even the beautiful Mrs. Solomon. You seem to know all about it. Ah, kiss me. It is fate. I am in a business that makes such information, my <laughs> Business. Mr. Solomon went to his desert home five days ago with a Mr. Axman. Is that all? That is all you need to know, Mr. Jordan. Well, if it isn't enough, I'll want my money back. Effendi, I am superbly honest. Here, my home address, in case you wish to talk further with me. You act like this is a sure thing. Nothing is certain in this life, Mr. Jordan. Not even friends. <laughs> You've been peeking in Sam Sabaya's diary. Effendi, I do not understand. Well, skip it. Neither do I. When I left the little guy with all the information, nothing looked right. Johnny Servey's story, Connie Solomon's story, even Sam Sabaya's talk had a rattle in it. But no matter what Sam said at the bar, he was making a deal with me. He meant to have Servey. That meant I had to find Ed Solomon. So I got my car and drove up to El Fayum. The place looked tired and old, like it was a million years away from Cairo. The only thing new about it was a petrol station serving it up out of big five-gallon tins. The guy in the white pants and shirt didn't bother about a hat. I uh, guess he liked the sun. Hey, uh, George. Asalamu. Alaikum. Asalamu. Save it, pal. I never use it. You come from here, but somebody taught you a different alphabet. Huh? I had the swami trick in the carny once. Lousy racket. Yeah? What do you do now? Pour gas out of them tens you want some. Those look like uh, quartermaster marks. What difference does it make? You need gas to get back where you came from. All right, you got gasoline. Uh, what about coke? Try inside. The girl will take care of you. Oh, thanks. Don't mention it, Jordan. Did you say Jordan? I don't know. Did I? Uh... Oh, darling, I cannot go on. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought you were Paul. Paul? Who's that? Paul Kehu. This is his place. Oh, yes, I just met him. Nice fellow. He said I could find a Coke in here. Oh, yes, of course. You are traveling far? No, no. No, no, just to the oasis. Oh, that is just over the dune. But there is no one there this time of year. Oh, I heard different. Oh, perhaps uh, you had your own home there? I'm looking for a guy. Big Ed Solomon. So Solomon? You are a friend of his? I oh, never met him, lady. Let me tell you. Car's all ready to go. Oh, thanks. Lisa, don't you think you ought to see how the fire's doing? Fire? What fire? Build one. Of course, Paul, of course. Goodbye, sir. Lisa is too friendly. I like friendly people. So they tell me. Keep the car here, will you? Huh? Uh, going to the oasis. I don't see any road. I'll have to hoof it. It's right about half a kilometer. Your feet will get hot. Oh, I'll bet you got some foot powder. Doc Shaw himself, you want some? Yeah, when I get back. Search yourself. See you around, Allie. <laughs> Big Ed Solomon's house was there, all right. Well-ordered palm trees surrounded by an all-white job with a lot of grill work. I pounded on the door. Nobody answered. I smelled an oil lamp burning somewhere, so I pounded on the door some more. And some more people didn't answer. When I put my hand on the latch, the door opened. People and no people, and I went in. You can believe it or not, somebody was there, right in front of the fireplace. Only he was dead. One side of his head was bashed in. No, you're wrong. It wasn't Big Ed Solomon. It was a guy I'd never seen before in my life. You 
are listening to Fall Guy, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. For the most exciting mystery, turn first to CBS. There, your mystery programs will be full of the thrills you enjoy, full of the surprises which keep you absorbed in the story until the final climax. On Tuesday night, CBS, at 8.30, turn to a full hour of top mystery. Mr. and Mrs. North first, then Mystery Theater. Two unusual programs, a full-hour voyage into the chilling realm of crime and punishment. Beginning at 8.30 on Tuesday night, CBS. Now we return to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, Fall Guy. Sometimes you don't know just why you do things. Anyhow, when the police came looking for my friend Johnny Servey, I covered for him. Things like that don't exactly set with the law, so I had to find Johnny's boss and try to clear him. So I started out hunting Big Ed Solomon. All I found was a dead man I'd never seen before. I stood there and looked at whoever he'd been. Nothing in his pockets, labels cut off his blue suit, not even a patch or laundry mark. None of it made sense. I began looking around for a poker or a hammer or something. What I found was a heavy chunk of palm branch that had been polished for a lamp base. One end of it was stained. It was about then I heard somebody come in the door. When I turned around, I was looking at Paul Kiru, the gasoline swami I just met back at El Fayum. Mm-hmm. Oh, huh. He looked at the dead man, at the piece of wood in my hand. But I was looking at the luger he was pointing at me. Through being friendly, Jordan. This guy's all used up. Know him? Never saw him before in my life. I did. Name's Tom Axman. Friend of Big Ed Solomon. Tom Axman? You killed him? Uh-uh. You did. Why, you... Uh-uh. There was a big fight. I don't know what it was all about. Just heard parts of it from my place. You conked him with that piece of wood. Pretty neat. I saw it all. And Lisa, she saw it too. And that makes me the patsy. You're it, Pally. Let's go find ourselves a cop. Carol waved the Luger at me, and I started ahead of him for the door. He was good at doing frame-ups, and he was good at running things. But he was only an amateur when it came to pushing a man with a gun. I waited to feel it in my back. It was there by the time I got to the door. And that was his mistake. Hey, come back here. I shoved him against the wall, but he held onto the gun. There wasn't anything for me to do but make a break for the oasis. Come back, Jordan. Come back here. All the rest of that day, it went on in the oasis. Cairo crashing around looking for me. I hid behind date palms and in the underbrush. Found out a lot of things that bug experts would have gone buggy about. But as far as helping Johnny Servey or finding Ed Solomon, I was doing no good at all. As soon as it got real dark, I figured it was safe enough to cross the patch of sand and hit the highway. Cairo must have figured the same way, because I didn't hear him crashing around anymore. So I went back to see Paul Cairo's wife, Lisa... Who's there? Easy, baby. It's me. Oh, Mr. Jordan, it is you. Paul is looking everywhere for you. He says you killed a man, Tom Hexman, over in Mr. Solomon's home. Yeah, that's what he's saying. But you did not kill him. I know that. Yeah? You must leave here right away. Your life is not safe. The way you're talking, neither is yours. I came here with Paul two weeks ago, and everything that has happened has been strange, especially the disappearance of Mr. Solomon. Hey, what about him? Have you seen him? A few nights ago, he came here with Mr. Axman. They had been drinking, and they were arguing when they went over to the cabin. Oh, I've heard that before. What else? I've not seen them since. But Paul has Mr. Solomon tied up in one of the cabins. He's been taking food to him. Then who killed Axman? I'm afraid it, it was Paul. You've only got some of it. we better get to Cairo and see Sabaya. Your husband has my keys? Yes, yes. Uh, Solomon's car here? Yes, and the keys are in it. Where's the car? In back. Come on. Of course... This will mean the end of everything between Paul and myself. He doesn't strike me as good husband material. Love is a strange emotion, Mr. Jordan. It makes what is wrong very right. Can't put that on a police blotter. Yes. Yes, I know too well. I... 
I don't know that I should go back to Cairo with you or not. Lady, all he'll give you is a lot of grief. You know that. But I love Come him. on, come on, get in. I... It was Cairo off in the dock somewhere, shooting at anything that moved. Lisa fell off the running board. I scrambled down, but when I got one look at her face, I knew she couldn't use any help. So I shoved the car into gear and burned tires straight for the road to Cairo. It took me two hours to get there. The guy at the laundry said Johnny Serby had taken a powder ten hours before. The sergeant at the desk said Sam Sabaya was where he couldn't be reached. Well, that left only one guy to see, Genie, the information boy who had sent me on the chase to the Oasis. I pulled his card out of my pocket and found his place off in the native quarter, in between a phony rug maker and a lady barber. Oh, 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 Mr. Jordan. Buster, I've been up almost 24 hours without sleep. I saw one dead man and one woman killed. I don't feel good and I want more information. Oh, Mr. Jordan, I told you where Mr. Solomon could be found. I gave you information. Uh, uh, you didn't give it all. Please, the friend, the thing you find, Mr. Solomon. I found a playmate of yours who likes to shoot people and beat their skulls in and hang phony raps oh, on me. Oh, the friend, Oh, start it, talking. Please, I know nothing of a man who would do such things. I know nothing of that man. When a punk like you comes silent up to me and tells me out of a clear sky where to find my man and doesn't argue about what I pay him, that means he's already been paid. And they only pay you for working. You... Oh, I am above reproach, Mr. Jordan. I would never become involved in a killing or murder. Yes. No. Who paid you to send me up to El Fayum? Who paid you to frame me with a murder? It was me, Rock. I didn't tell him, Mr. Zerby. I didn't tell him. Shut up. That 38 makes you a foot taller, Johnny. Easy, Rock. Easy. I'll use it right here if I have to. I think you would. Paul Caro phones me from El Fayum. Said you lambed out twice. You're awful tough, Rocky. Too tough to call a friend. Here, take this and buy yourself a new fez, Yenny. And forget you ever saw Jordan. Oh, yes, Mr. Sir. Yes, sir. All right, Rocky, let's get going. Long drive ahead of us. I'll be able to drive it blindfolded someday. Someday. I'm still the fall guy? I hate to do it to you, Rocky, but you're it. This is my chance not to be a punk anymore. I take you back there and we call Sabaya. Me and Cairo fix it up like you did it all. Now, come on. Cairo will be getting anxious. Well, you can't say I didn't help my pal, Johnny Servi. And you can't say I didn't find my man. Even if he was sitting in that same cabin with a couple of corpses on the floor. Big Ed Solomon needed his shave, but his face was a funny color. Maybe that was because he was looking at two bodies, Axman's and Lisa's. I guess Cairo had brought Lisa over from where she dropped by the car. He was standing there with a couple of big tears in his face, holding a gun against Big Ed's back. Johnny, I thought you'd never get here. Come on, let's get this over with. I'm sorry about Lisa. Never mind. Never mind about her now. Let's get this finished. Don't be nervous, Cairo. Meet Rocky Jordan, Ed. He killed you. Hi, Jordan. You're the fall guy, huh? Tough luck. Where'd you find him, Johnny? Where I said I'd find him. You still killing the wrong people, Cairo? Not quite finished, pal. Two down and one to go. I'm next, huh? Sorry, Ed. Business. The bill of sale's all signed. Me and Cairo will take over the international club where you and Axman left off. Yeah, that's good enough reason... Hey, Jordan, we're going to let him rub us, me out, and then pin all this on you, or we're going to do something about it? Take it easy, Ed. I think we ought to do something about Watch it. Watch him, Cap. Watch him. Big Ed Solomon was good. He stopped the first two slugs from Cairo's gun and the first two out of Johnny's, all in the chest. By that time, I'd gotten hold of a poker and brought it into Cairo's face. He looked sick in a big way and went down without a word. When I looked around, Big Ed had twisted the gun from Johnny's hand. I think he was already dead when he pulled the trigger. No, Ed! No, no! No! Rocky. Rocky, help me. I did once, Johnny. Remember? Yeah. Yeah, no. Why'd you pick me, Johnny? The embassy trick was level. I got the idea a couple of days ago. Figured I could get you looking for Big Ed. You set it up with Cairo. <laughs> well, Rocky, you aren't a patsy anymore. No, Jordan. You are not a patsy anymore. 
cops and everything. <laughs> Hi, Captain. Guess I didn't work it so well. You were wrong when you first started, Servi. Yeah. Nothing I ever did ever worked out. Hard luck guy. Rocky. Yeah. Rocky. You were a good guy. I guess I was. Oh, you just played in the wrong team, Johnny. You never were. Let's go, Chosen. Yes, yeah, Sam. From here on, it's a monologue. Well, Sam and I picked up the pieces later on. It was like Johnny said. The embassy thing that night was true enough. Greco wanted Johnny bad. But Johnny got ideas and figured me for the patsy in his deal with Kiru. He had the guy tip me off to where Big Ed was, and Cairo put Big Ed under lock and key, killed Axman, and waited for me. You know how it happened from there on out. Lisa got in the way, I got in the way, and Johnny got in the way. Sam looked sad when it was all over. Uh, maybe I did, too. You go out on a limb for a pal, and next thing you know, somebody's chopping down the tree. It's CBS again at this same time next week for another story of adventure and intrigue when we take you back to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. Jack Moyles plays the title role with tonight's story by E. Jack Newman, edited by Larry Roman and Gomer Cool. Rocky Jordan is produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Richard Arant. Larry Thor speaking, this CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Uh, this is Hillary Fuchs, CPA. You left word for me to call Mr. Dollar. I don't seem to recall the name. I'm with Universal Adjusters. They asked me to look into this Wendover claim. Universal Adjusters? Insurance Adjusters? That's right, insurance. I understand you filed a claim in Mrs. Wendover's name. Mrs. Wendover hired me to handle her affairs a few days ago. Who do you want to talk to, me or Mrs. Wendover? Anybody who can make me understand why Mrs. Wendover let a $50,000 policy lie around for two years before she filed a claim. I'll try. I don't know whether I can convince you or not, but I'll try. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, 518 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Tears of Night matter. Expense account item one, $92.50, airfare and incidentals, Hartford to Miami Beach, Florida. My plane got in at 11 p.m., so I went to a hotel and got some sleep. I put in a call to Hillary Fuchs, certified public accountant, as soon as I woke up. Then I had some breakfast and took a cab out to his office. It was a pleasant four-mile trip along a beautiful white sanded ocean front, and it cost me, item two, three bucks even. Come on in here, Dollar. The air conditioner's working here. Hillary Fuchs was a big man in his late 40s. He was semi-bald, had a good sunburn, and smelled faintly of scotch whiskey. The office he led me into was cool and dark and elegantly furnished in bamboo knickknacks. The desk was cluttered with a stack of financial statements and legal papers. This is quite a thing, I guess, Dollar. 
By the way, I didn't find any universal insurance adjusters in the phone book. We're located in Hartford, Connecticut. Hartford? You're a long way from home, Dollar. They sent you all the way to Miami Beach about this? Yep. Seems like a pretty expensive way to handle it. Pretty expensive claim. $50,000. Would it do any good to tell you it's legitimate? Sure. But I'm hired to check it out just the same. (laughs) In other words, you don't believe me. Well, look at it our way, Mr. Fuchs. The claim came into the office day before yesterday, and we have 72 hours to act on it. Okay. What can I do? First off, tell me your connection with Mrs. Wendover. She hired me to put her business affairs in order about 10 days ago. First time I ever saw her. She said the Treasury Department had advised her to get some expert help. They were on her about back taxes, and that's it. Oh, I see. Tell me about Noah Wendover's death. He died two years ago, last April 14th. By the way, it's just coming to me. Did you people... I mean, did the insurance company know anything about him being dead until that claim came in? No. Nope. No wonder they sent you all the way from Hartford. Well, uh, Wendover and his wife took a party of eight out on their boat for a ten-day cruise. Wendover had an attack of appendicitis at sea. There wasn't a doctor aboard. The appendix burst, and he died before they could make the nearest port. Mm-hmm. Let me get back to the original question. Why all this time before Mrs. Wendover filed claim for benefits? Well, you really got to know Mrs. Wendover, I guess. She's a little crazy, a little wacky, a little strange. These are your impressions of her? It's a consensus. I asked her around after she came here the other day. The story is that she and Wendover had a pretty good thing in their marriage. They were wild about each other. They spent money like water, and they had plenty of it to spend. Then one day he died... Kind of threw her. Maybe it's still throwing her. I don't know. Sure, sure. Somewhere along the line, in the last year, Mrs. Wendover's met somebody else. Oh? I don't know who he is because I wasn't paying any attention when she mentioned his name. But she's sort of coming out of it and she's going to marry him. Uh-huh. So she wants to get her business affairs in order. From the look of things, nobody's done much about them since Wendover's death. You see all that stuff in the desk? Yeah, I noticed it. It's all hers. She brought it to me in three big hat boxes. Stocks, bonds, bills, deeds, I don't know what all. I know she's in a little trouble with the government. Not because she hasn't got the money to pay them, but just because she hasn't bothered with anything like that. Hmm? Anyhow, one of the first things I came across was the insurance policy thrown in there with all the rest of the stuff. And look, you see these checks? Yeah. Almost $90,000 dividends on some oil stock. Doesn't even bother to open her mail or cash her checks. Well, a lot of people around the country, including your insurance company, are going to be startled when I finish straightening all this out. I sent the policy claim in as a matter of course. That's my explanation for it being two years late. (laughs) Well, that's a pretty good explanation. Look here. She completely forgot she loaned an $8,000 automobile to a friend in Tampa 14 months ago. I asked her about it, and she said she thought she'd left it at the filling station. What? And here... The boat Wendover died on, worth $60,000. She sold it to a fisherman last year for 5000 Yeah, I get the idea, Mr. Fuchs. Yeah. So you filed the insurance claim in her name along with a dozen other matters that should have been taken care of two years ago. Yeah. You play golf? No. Well, I do, and I'm tired of looking at this pile of stuff. Mind if I look at it? Well, help yourself. All yours. I'll be at the club. Do whatever you have to. By the way, what do you have to do? Verify this death certificate in the coroner's report. Well, then you will honor the claim? I'll file my report, and it's up to the insurance company to do as they see fit. You're kind of cagey, aren't you? Uh, that's why they pay me. <laughs> oh, uh, Mr. Fuchs. Yeah? Is there some kind of bank balance in this stuff, current? Well, you'll find it there, but I'll tell you, in cash, Mrs. Wendover's worth about $950,000. I doubt very much if she's trying to cheat the insurance company out of 50000 you can't ever tell, though, can you, Mr. Fuchs? No, nope. can't ever tell. After he left, I got on the telephone and talked to officials about the coroner's autopsy and the death certification on Noah Wendover. They all seemed to be in order. Then I went through the papers on Fuchs' desk. They seemed to be in enough disorder to verify what he told me about Elise Wendover. I left Fuchs' office about 4.30 and went back to my hotel, carrying a picture of a woman who had existed in a state of limbo for two years or more, so far as responsibility and attention to business went. Johnny Dollar. Uh, Hillary Fuchs, can you come over to my office right away? I just left there. What's up? Mrs. Wendover, she's having a fit. Come on over. (laughs) 
Expense account item three. Three more bucks, more cab fare back to Hillary Fuchs' office. I pulled up in front at exactly 5.30 and noticed a 1956 white Cadillac convertible parked in front. For no reason at all, I took 30 seconds to peek inside. The registration told me the car belonged to Elise Blair Wendover. She had left her purse on the seat and the keys in the ignition. A mink stole was thrown carelessly over the back of the seat. Anybody could have taken the stole, the purse, the car, the whole works. Mrs. Wendover was living up to her advance notices. Come in, come in. Fuchs looked pale and shaken. He fumbled around for a cigarette until I handed him one of mine. He lit it up and tried to get a grip on himself. Mrs. Wendover's in there. Well, what happened? Well, I had some papers for her to sign, and she dropped in a little while ago. Uh-huh. I told her about you. I, I explained to her it was certainly reasonable the insurance company would want to investigate a claim that had been delayed 25 months. Well? She blew up, got kind of hysterical about it, said she wanted to see you right away, that she had something to tell you. Go easy on her, will you? Well, why do you say that? Oh, it's just that... Well, if I'm wrong about her, I'm glad, but I don't think I'm wrong when I say she's right on the edge. Just on the edge of it. Feeling better, Mrs. Wendover? The pale girl with the coal black hair, seated stiffly in the chair in front of Hillary Fuchs' desk, was not feeling better. She could have been 16 or 36. It depended on where you were standing when you looked at her. She had a mouth that was too full, shoulders too wide for the strapless sundress, a pair of sandals, a clanking costume bracelet, and black eyes, round, big, bright, too bright. This is Mr. Dollar, Mrs. Wendover. I understand you're investigating my husband's death. I'm here to verify the facts so that eastern states can act on your claim. Don't you believe he's dead? Yes. Don't you? Oh, yes. I saw him die. Yes, he's dead. How much money do you owe me? The claim is for $50,000. Will you pay it? Well, I, I presume it will be paid from all I've seen so far. Of course, that part of it's up to the insurance company. Of course. And they have men sitting at desks... Reading reports about claims all day long. Ah, uh, yes. My dad owned an insurance company once, you know. Those men sitting at their desks, even my dad sat at a desk. I wonder something. Would one of those men sitting at one of those desks write, okay, on my claim for Noah's benefits if he knew about me? Uh, sit down, Mrs. Wendover. Maybe you'd like a drink. You have one, Mr. Fuchs, would they? Well, I, I have to be indefinite about that, too, Mrs. Wendover. What would put a question in the mind of an adjuster if he knew about you? I'm indolent, and I'm irresponsible. Mr. Fuchs can tell you that. I'm not quite dependable, am I, Mr. Fuchs? Oh, we're getting straightened out, Mrs. Wendover. And then, of course, that wouldn't make a difference. I mean, not really. A great many irresponsible, indolent, undependable people file claims. There's something else. I'm a curse. Are you? Oh, yes. It's a very bad thing, a curse. People around me, people I love, just seem to die. Why do you think you're a curse? Noah died, and I loved him. And Daddy, I loved him. And my brother Jim, all dead. No one can stay alive around me. I thought I should tell you that. Yeah, well, I appreciate it, Mrs. Wendover. Well, then we don't have anything more to discuss. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar, Mr. Fuchs. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, Johnny, hey, where are you going? I'm going to drive her home. You were right. She's on the edge of something. I can't quite figure it yet. Uh, brother was killed in Korea. Her father died of a heart attack ten years ago. I got that much from the papers on your desk. Lord, where'd she ever get the idea? Oh, that... I don't know. I've heard of things like this happening. I'll phone you later. Right. Wait a minute. I'll drive you home, Mrs. Wendover. Oh, that'll be nice. She smiled brightly, still too brightly, and we drove along. She didn't tell me which way to turn, what direction to go, and I didn't ask her. I liked it that way, no one saying a word. I was listening to something else anyhow, something inside of me, loud like a cannon firing twice a second. It was my heart making all the noise. Oh, it's happened a couple of times before, and it meant trouble coming up. I knew it. My heart never makes a mistake. Mr. Dollar, do you think he'll die too?
Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, right out in the broad daylight, I have a look at the tears of night. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hillary Fuchs, Dollar. How's Mrs. Wendover? So far, so good. Dollar, can you talk? Yeah, sure. She's in the other room. Do you think she's all right? Mentally, I mean? I think she's all right enough to get by. I think she's scared to death of something or somebody. That business of the curse? Yeah. You know there isn't anything to that. There's something to it for her. She thinks she's somehow responsible for her husband's death, for her father's death, and for her brother's death. On the way here, she mentioned, just like that, that someone else was going to die. Or words to that effect. Who? I don't know. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Tears of Night matter. It had started as a routine investigation. A claim filed for $50,000 on the death of Noah Wendover, Miami Beach, Florida. The question, why the two-year delay in making claim? The answer turned out to be interesting. Briefly, it involved a distraught woman who had neglected not only the insurance, but everything else in her life for two years. A woman obsessed with the idea she was a curse. Do you like soda or water? Uh, Soda, please. Thanks. Cheers. Good luck. Mm. What's your name again? Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, that's right. Mr. Fuchs introduced us, didn't he? Do you think he'll be able to straighten out all my business affairs for me? Yes, I think so, Mrs. Wendover. Including the insurance? Including the insurance, yes. Well, you're worried about the claim, aren't you? (laughs) Well, I'm paid to worry about it. I'm not so worried now as when I first came to Miami Beach. I think I understand why it took all this time for the claim to be filed. You mean you've met me and you think I'm kind of... You know, not all there or something. 
Well... I suppose Mr. Fuchs explained how badly I've managed things for the last two years. He showed me how you've let your affairs go to the devil, if that's what you mean. I'm glad you finally turned it all over to him. I think he'll take care of it for you. I behaved rather badly in Mr. Fuchs' office, didn't I? Well, I wouldn't say that. Poor Mr. Fuchs. He was frightened, I think. I don't know what it is, really. I mean, he mentioned that you were in town investigating my claim on Noah's death. I felt I should talk to you. That's why I had him call you. I wanted to tell you about the curse. There's no such thing, you know, Mrs. Wendover. I know. I know. I couldn't have been responsible for Dad's death. It was a heart attack many years ago. I was away at school in New York. And Jim, my brother being killed in Korea, I couldn't have had anything to do with that. And Noah. Oh, I loved him very much. I'm not cursed, am I? No, no, you certainly aren't. All of these deaths around you have been tragic, doubly so, because you seem to have been very fond of the people. But you aren't responsible in any way. I like you. You're very nice. If you have any questions you want to ask me about Noah, I'd be glad to answer them. I really would. I'm all right now. Really, I am. Well, when we left Mr. Fuchs' office, you talked a lot about that curse business. Yes, I'm ashamed. Were you still thinking of that when you spoke to me in the car? Did I speak to you in the car? Yes. You know... I can't remember riding in the car at all. I've been standing here talking to you, and I've been wondering all this time how we got here. Do you mind if I help myself? No. We drove over together from Hillary Fuchs' office. I drove you here. Oh. Oh. Some things I just blank out. I've talked to a psychiatrist, you know. I mean, I've been under treatment for several months. He says I established a strong pattern when Noah died of shutting things out, of just forcing my mind to become blank. He's trying to help me get over it. What did I say in the car? You said you were cursed and you wondered if he would die. Oh, dear. Who's he? Teddy. Teddy, uh... Teddy Davis. I'm going to marry him when he asks me. Oh. And I know he will. I love him very much. Well, why do you think... Teddy might die. Because of people dying around me that I love? He doesn't believe in the curse, does he? Oh, no. He's something like you, in a way. Nice. He makes me laugh at it. He says it's ridiculous. Because it is. Somehow I feel comforted. Now, look. You marry this fellow the minute he asks you and forget about being cursed and everything else. He'll take care of you. I better go now. Mr. Dollar. Yes, Thank you. I need sometimes very much to talk to someone like you. Thank you. J. Dollar, Oracle. Go out and marry so-and-so and live happily ever after. I like the little kiss she gave me. I like the way she squeezed my hand. I like the perfume she was wearing. I like the way the intense, hard brightness had gone out of her black eyes and she was just a nice woman being a woman. I liked all that. What I didn't like was the idea that she could be the other way, believing in the curse and believing she was somehow responsible for people dying. When I left her, I knew that part wasn't ended. I knew it would come back. Come on in, Dollar. I sort of stuck around wondering if you'd come back here. How is she? She's okay now. Fuchs, I'm sending in my report on this policy tonight. I'm recommending they honor it. I've got enough verification. Okay, that's fine. I sure appreciate your help on this, Dollar. Let me buy you dinner. No, no, thanks. I'm getting the first plane back to Hartford. Why not wait until tomorrow? You've got a reason, haven't you? Yeah, I guess so. Mrs. Wendover? Oh, I've met people like her before. Don't ask me where or when, but I've seen them. And there isn't anything to a curse, but trouble seems to follow them. Big trouble. My business here is practically finished. I just want to get out and get away. Can I use your office for about an hour? Sure. It's all yours. Dollar... I feel the same way. I spent a half an hour typing up my report on the Wendover claim and another ten minutes on the phone asking for an airplane back to Hartford. They said they'd call me right back and I poured myself some of Fuchs' whiskey and sat down to stare out at the night. Lights burned up and down the white beach. People strolled up and down, looking at the water, holding hands. 
And I was sitting alone in Hillary Fuchs' office, waiting for a phone call and thinking about a curse. Hi. Hi. Who are you? Anybody else here? No, why? You were kind of late. So do you. What's on your mind? You? Costigan wants to see you right away. I'm supposed to take you over. Whoever Costigan is, tell him he doesn't want me. You don't tell Sam things like that. You know, it's been a long time since I shook in my boots when a skinny hood like you stood around acting tough. If you've got some business with Hillary Fuchs, look him up at his home. This is Fuchs' office. You're behind his desk. You'll do. Now, come on, mister, and don't show me how loud a certified public accountant can growl. I just might swing this thing on your head. <laughs> That's better. You got a hat? No. I know Costigan wants to talk to you, but I'd sure like to belt you on just for the practice. I'm not Hillary Fuchs. Come on, let's go. Hey, yo, you're, you're going to break my arm. I'd like to, just for the practice. No, you... Now then, it's Costigan. Is he the one from Chicago? Uh, Sam's been there. Answer. The Sam Costigan kicked out of Chicago a few years ago? Yeah, yeah. What does he want to see Fuchs about? The Wendover Dame. What? Something about the Wendover Dame. I don't know what it is. He just wants to see you. Okay, what's your name? Frank Scanlon. Here. You put this thing in your pocket. Pull it out again in front of me and I'll brain you. Now, let's go. Huh? Now I want to see Sam. Well, sure. Sure. Anything you say. I followed Frank Scanlon out of the building to a waiting car. A black packet with side curtains. It was a nice touch for this day and age. But it didn't make much sense. None of it did. It was illogical in the beginning, middle, and end. Most of all, I didn't make much sense. I should have been in my room packing. Instead, I was on my way to see an old-time grifter and hoodlum named Sam Costigan. Because someone had mentioned the name Wendover. You want to smoke? I use my own. Suit yourself, fella. Scanlon was a thin one with sharp, narrowed eyes. Too much padding in the shoulders, too much snap to the brim of his hat, too much point to the toe of his shoes. The thirty-eight had taken away from him and handed back made a considerable bulge in the front of his coat. About six miles out of Miami Beach, he turned off the main highway onto a dirt road. About a mile of that and up ahead, we saw lights. The lights became a fine old colonial mansion, every room aglow. Two or three guards were watching the entrance to the front. They all needed shaves. No one said anything. Yeah? It's me, Feely. Uh, this here is Hillary Fuchs, uh... Sam wants to see him. Come on in. How are you feeling, Mr. Feely? <laughs> what kinds of punks are on nowadays? I wouldn't get frisky with him if I was you. He's a pretty touchy fella. That's so. Yeah. Oh, this way. Come on. He led me into the main foyer where a hat check girl with a lot of red hair stood ready for the evening's business, which hadn't begun yet. On the right, what had been the dining room of the old house was now a circular bar that could seat 25 or 30. To the left in what had been the parlor and library, I counted two crap tables, two roulette tables, and two blackjack stands. Beyond all this, on a screen porch, a five-piece combo made music. A few tables and head waiters stood around looking bored. Scanlon led me upstairs, and we stopped in front of a wide white door marked private. I thought he was going to knock. Instead, he whirled around very quickly and stuck the same old thirty-eight about two inches into my ribs. Now, let's stand steady. Feely! Eddie! You giving you trouble, Frankie? Nah. I, uh... I will, Buster. I'll give you plenty of trouble if you want it. Hear how he talks to me? I'll crack him up a little for you if you like, Frankie. Nah. He got business with Sam right now. We'll take care of our business with him later on. However you say it, Frankie. I just wanted you to remember that. I will. The same way I remember a dirty newspaper story. <laughs> you know something? I'm looking forward to you. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, there is a curse that goes with the Wendover name. Goes wherever it is. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. I'll take that wise guy. Mr. Frankie Scanlon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll tell him. What was that you yelled on the phone? You heard it. I heard you say Johnny Dollar. I told you a long time back I wasn't Hillary Fuchs. You told me a lot of things. If I'm going to see Costigan, trot him out. Just open the door and walk right in. I'm right behind you, see? Hello, Sam. Johnny. Johnny Dollar, what's he doing here, Frankie? You, you mean this isn't Fuchs? Get out of here! Get out of here before I throw something at you! You heard the man, Frankie, blow. No, sit down, Johnny. I won't bother shaking hands. You tried to put me in jail the last time we met. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Miami Beach. Two, the Universal Adjustment Bureau, 518 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Tears of Night matter. I'm going to sit down here behind my desk and have a drink, Johnny. And while I'm having it, I'm going to ask you a question. Save your breath. I'll answer it anyhow, Sam. Sam Costigan sat hunched behind the big mahogany desk, glaring at me with a pair of small pig eyes half hidden in a beefy red face. Both hands rested out in front of him, flat. I told him how I'd come to Miami Beach to look into an insurance claim made by Elise Wendover, how I'd been in the office of Hillary Fuchs, her business manager, when Frank Scanlon had walked in, mistaken me for Fuchs, waved a gun under my nose, and insisted I come with him to see Costigan. So here I was, and so what about it? Ah, uh, help yourself, Johnny. Well... That's a pretty nice joint, Sam. How long have you been in business in Florida? Oh, about two years. How's the gross? Isn't it as good as running beer in Chicago, but them days are gone forever. I make out all right. Two crap tables to rule that table's a couple of games. A bar and restaurant break it up even. Man, I gotta be careful. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah, cheers. Well, you seem to have enough muscle outside and around to keep you comfy and cozy. Yeah, punks, all of them. Look at that Frankie Scanlon that dragged you over here. Crazy, that one. But he's the best of the lot, the best I can get nowadays. Not a good muscle living the business. You could retire. Yeah, I might do that one of these days. No. Tell me about your hookup with this window over there, man. No hookup, Sam. 
She claimed benefits on her husband's life insurance. The claim should have been made two years ago. I investigated. It's okay. Made her? Yeah. Screwball, huh? In some ways. She's all right. Well, maybe it's as good you're here as this Fuchs guy. I wanted him to handle some business for her, but uh, maybe you can handle it. Yeah. You ever see this before? No. Oh, it's a little bit of necklace called the Tears of Night. It's worth a big hunk of cash. These four diamonds are good stuff. Your friend, Miss Wendover, left it here a week or so ago when she wanted for a plunge at the roulette table. Anything to say? It's a very pretty necklace, Sam. Okay. We both know she's screwy, a widow with a lot of dough, and a boyfriend named Teddy. Teddy Davis. He paints. Well, she sent me a check for the five G's she lost that night, and I wanted Fuchs to take his thing back to her, but now I got you instead. I want you to take it to her, huh? How about it? Is that all? That's all. I got my dough, she gets her tears of night back. I couldn't trust any of my punks with it, and I don't like to be seen in public, so uh, you just take it back, huh? It's very simple. <laughs> Why? Don't ever go on the stage, Sam. Why not? You can act, but you can't lie. You just can't lie at all. And it takes a good liar to be a good actor. Now that you've told me how simple it is, suppose you give me the unexpurgated sequel. All right, so a check bounce. Oh, stop it, Sam. She can't issue a check without a counter-signature by Hillary Fuchs. He hasn't issued one check on her account since he took it over ten days ago. So if this thing is hers, explain it all to me, will you? The way it is. Uh, I want another drink. Yeah, you're right, Johnny. There wasn't any check. Miss Wendover called me a couple of hours ago and said if I didn't have this thing back to her tonight, she'd call a load of cops and come out and tear us to join her parts. She sounded like she'd do it, too. I mean, well, you, you matter. You, you can't tell what she'll do for a woman until her neck. Screw her, you know? Not so screwy if she dropped 5000 and left that. And now she gets it back for nothing. I just want to get it off my hands. If she came out here with a cop, I'd be closed for the season. And I'm getting old. Hey, you, know, you know where she lives? Mm-hmm. I was there earlier tonight. Yeah, take the ice tour, and I'll chalk it up to experience, huh? Then you can grab a cab back and come on back out here, and I'll see that you have a good time on the house. How about it? I'll take it to her, but I won't come back here, Sam. Oh, Skyland Feely, them guys, huh? They worry you? You do. What? Well, I don't believe your last story either. The only thing I believe is that this is Mrs. Wendover's necklace. <laughs> so I'll take it to her. Sam. Yeah? You better get someone beside Feely at that table after this. You're telling me. You're telling me. He was mopping his face when I closed the door and went downstairs. By that time, the customers had started to roll in. Young, fresh-faced men with sallow eyes and quick movements, anxious to step up to the tables and lose money. Women in strapless dresses, anxious to show off their newest suntans and help whatever man they were with lose money. Old men, old women, dressed to the teeth. It was a sick old scene from a sick old play. Expense account item four, six dollars. Cab fare from Sam Costigan's gambling club to Elise Wendover's apartment. Oh, Teddy, I thought you'd never get here. The performance begins at ten o'clock, and you know how the traffic is, and if we're going to have a bite, do we... You aren't Teddy at all, are you? I'm afraid not, Mrs. Wendover. Where's Teddy? I don't know. Oh. What are you looking at? Your throat. Really, Mr... Mr... Dollar. Johnny Dollar. I met you in Hillary Fuchs' office. We talked here later on. Remember? Of course I remember. Well, really, Mr. Dollar, I'm only waiting for Teddy to come by so we can make the first show at the plaza. I better telephone him, don't you think? Yes, you do that. Good night, Mr. Dollar. The white ermine cape she was wearing and the black strapless thing needed a final touch. She had it. A diamond necklace. In fact, the tears of night, the one I had in my pocket, was hanging around her lovely neck. Downstairs in the good light of the lobby, I snapped open the necklace case. Mortuous it read, House of Jewelry. A gloomy word with a gloomy address. The sign on the window of the House of Mortuous gave a phone number in case of emergency. Item six, ten cents, one phone call about my emergency. I made it vague to Mr. Mortuous that thousands of people might die before six o'clock in the morning unless I could talk to someone about a piece of jewelry. It went over. Item seven, fifty cents, cab fare to the Sandy Beach Hotel on the less expensive side of Miami Beach. 
You find me a bit indisposed, Mr. Dollar, but on the phone you said it was a matter of jewellery. Therefore, Hannibal Mortuous is at your service. Now then, sir, what is so urgent? I came to ask you about a diamond necklace. I found your name stamped on the inside of the case. House of Mortuous. A most respected name in diamonds as well as all the lapidary arts. Most respected. Fine jewels and the name Mortuous are... Oh, I do beg your pardon. Continue, Mr. Dollar. I want you to take a look at this. Hmm. <laughs> And how, sir, do you come in possession of the tears of night? A man named Sam Costigan, who runs a gambling club, asked me to deliver it to a lady named Elise Wendover. Do you know her? A lovely body propelled by a ridiculous mind. This matter you have just described bears me out. For shame, such conduct. A gambling house. The tears of night are porn. Then this is the real thing. It isn't phony. Mr. Dollar, I'm a gemologist. The house of mortuous. Of course it's real. Take a good look. When an artist creates a dazzling thing of beauty such as this, would he be so unlikely as to forget the time, the patience, the agony of his creation? Eh? See here, look here, under the light. Four weeks, Mr. Dollar, four weeks working night and day just to drill that anchor for a simple molding. But ah, see how each stone is carefully mounted to capture every single pinpoint of light. Beautiful, beautiful. An incomparable masterpiece for the money. Well, I'm just curious, Mr. Mortuous. How much money? About $10,000 on the wholesale market. What did Noah Wendover pay for it? 25000 I saw another one just like it tonight. They look ridiculous. The finest workman at best would only create a crude resemblance. This kind of artistry demands an artist, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> and I am that artist. But it could get by, a copy of it. To the unpracticed eye, to the layman perhaps, yes. Latet in anguis herba. Latin. Yeah, well, all I know is Agricola. A snake in the grass, eh? Something wrong? Yeah, mildly put, something wrong, yes. Well, how much do I owe you for your time, Mr. Mortuary? Well, nothing, nothing. It was my pleasure. You know, glancing at that again reassures me of the value and dignity of my work. Anywhere it is magnificent. Uh, but I'd waddle. You say something is wrong. What? Mrs. Wendover, you say you met her. Several times. She ever mentioned anything to you about a curse? 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 No, I can't say that she did. I, may I ask you a question? Yes, yeah, sure. Are you a friend of hers? In a way. Off and on. <laughs> I know what you mean. One is never quite certain with Mrs. Wendover whether one will be recognized or not is one. <laughs> well, it's late. Yeah, well, I'm just leaving. No, you, you, you misread me, sir. I wasn't speaking of my own comfort. I, I noticed the fog is coming. It is dark outside. This is a lonely area. Uh, that is a valuable object. Uh, are you armed? No. If you are at all concerned for the safety of that piece, I have a small safe in my rooms. You may have the key if you'd care to leave it overnight. I'll take it with me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just as well, probably. Suggestion only. You will leave satisfied, I trust, Mr. Dollar? Oh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Mortuous. My pleasure, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> remember, omnia mortuous bonum vocal est. Uh. All speak well and mortuous. A pun, sir, a pun. Good evening. Downstairs in the dismal lobby of the Sandy Beach Hotel, I looked out beyond the dirty glass windows to discover that the fog had indeed come in and surrounded the area with a choking darkness. The concern of Mr. Mortuous for his artistic creation told me to bang on the night bell and ask the night clerk for some wrapping paper and 50 cents worth of stamps. Expense account item eight. Item nine, phone call for a cab. Just before it arrived, I dropped the tears of night addressed to myself at my hotel in the lobby mailbox. I don't think the two hoodlums waiting outside saw me do it. I didn't think they saw me at all. But they followed my cab when it took me back to my hotel. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, and the old curse comes up with an old-fashioned flourish. See you then. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Your number is ringing, Mr. Dollar. Oh, thanks. Hello? This is Johnny Dollar. Uh, Dollar? I thought you went back to Hartford. I meant to, but I got tied up in Mrs. Wendover's business affairs again. Uh, What now? Can you come over to my hotel right away? It's one o'clock in the morning. I know it. Well, can't you grab a cab and come over here? Hardly. Why not? A couple of Sam Costigan's boys followed me here. I think they might like to do a little target practice on me. Oh. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, 518 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Tears of Night matter. Expenses continued, items 10 and 11. $10, scotch and soda, plus a pitcher of ice and glasses. I had them filled, chilled, and waiting when Hillary Fuchs knocked on the door of my room. His eyes were still puffy with sleep, and he had a trench coat thrown over his pajamas. What's this all about, Johnny? You said Mrs. Wendover, somebody followed you. What? I want you to tell me what you can about the tears of night. The tears of what? Tears of night. A piece of jewelry owned by Mrs. Wendover. A necklace. Four diamonds on black onyx. Silver chain. What the devil would I know about something like that? In her accounts, her bills, her property. You're her business manager. You must know something about it. I never heard of it. You better straighten me out. Uh, Try some of that. This is all too fast for me. Okay, I'll bring you up to date. I came here day before yesterday to investigate Mrs. Wendover's claim as beneficiary of the death of her husband. She forgot to file it for two years. Now, you explained why. I bought that. It's a legitimate claim. But I didn't buy her story about being cursed, or I didn't buy your idea that she was on the verge of blowing a top. No, I'm not so sure. I'm just along for the ride. Well, you left me in your office last night. A little while after you left, a man named Frank Scanlon came in and stuck a gun at me and said Sam Costigan wanted to see me. Costigan, the gambler? The same. Scanlon thought I was you. He took me over to Costigan's place. What's this got to do with insurance? Nothing. But it has something to do with Mrs. Wendover. Costigan had a necklace, the tears of night there. He said Mrs. Wendover left it as a pawn a week or so ago. Oh? He told me Mrs. Wendover called up and threatened to come out with policemen unless Costigan returned it. And as long as I was there, Costigan asked me to take it to her. I went over to her place, and what do you know? She was wearing the tears of night. I don't get this. Well, have another drink, neither do I. By the time I got there to her apartment, Mrs. Wendover hardly remembered my name or that we'd met in your office. She was waiting for her boyfriend to show up. Incidentally, his name's Teddy Davis. Is he after her money or what? Search me. I never met him. Well... I skipped out of there and looked up the jeweler who'd made the necklace, a man named Hannibal Mortuous. I heard of him. He speaks Latin or something. That's the one. He told me the necklace I had was the real thing. Now, I want you to tell me who made up the one Mrs. Wendover was wearing. I don't know anything about it. Well, it had to be made up sometime within the last week, and you've been handling her a business affairs. I don't know a thing about it, Johnny. <sighs> All right, come here. Take a look. Do you know anything about those two birds outside there? No. Well, one of them's a character named Feely. He works for Costigan. The other one I saw at Costigan's club. They tail me from Mortuous's place. Probably been on me all night long since I picked up the necklace. Where is it now? I mailed it to myself from Mortuous's hotel. <sighs> Those two out there, you better call the police if you think they're after you. Oh, nothing I could tell the police that would hold them up half a second. Mainly, I wanted to ask you about all this before I went on with it. What do you mean, go on with it? Go back to Mrs. Wendover, to Costigan, find out what's real and what isn't real? This isn't your line of duty. Why? <sighs> oh, I've been thinking about that. I don't know why. Maybe it's Mrs. Wendover, those eyes of hers, and that talk about the curse. I got a feeling she needs help in this matter. Somehow she needs help. What can I do, Johnny? Go to bed. I'll let you know what happens. Now, where's your car? In the parking lot back of the hotel. Give me the keys. I'll use that. Hey. Make yourself at home, Mr. Fuchs. Go to bed here. Oh. Yeah? Every now and then, walk over and look out that window and have a drink. They'll think it's me, and that's a good thought for them to have. Okay, what else? 
Well, if they start for the lobby, call downstairs and have them send up the house man and get the police. I don't think they will, but remember that. Well, why would they, they want... still think I've got that piece of jewelry on me. We shook up another drink, and I borrowed Fuchs's trench coat and left. I found his green Chevy without too much trouble, since there weren't too many cars out in the lot that time of morning. I looked at my watch, and it said 2.35. I drove around front past the two hoodlums, still keeping up their silent vigil, and found a street that looked familiar. Twenty minutes later, I was in the parking lot beside Elise Wendover's apartment building. It was still dark, still foggy, and too late I found out too crowded. Somehow, the pair of hoodlums were waiting for me after all. Hey, this is him, Philly. Got a match, Dollar? Toby asked you if you got a match. He's a dummy, Toby. Don't answer. Got a match, Dollar? What'd I tell you? He's a dummy boy. You don't look like no dummy boy. You're nearsighted. Take your hands off. He's a dummy, all right, ain't you, Dollar? See, Toby? I told him about you being nearsighted and he wouldn't answer. He don't talk. Go on, smart boy. Tell Toby how sorry you are about him being nearsighted. Talk. I heard you talk before. Told you he was a dummy. Hey, uh, tell me something, dummy. All insurance guys like you. Toby asked you a question. He wants to know if all insurance guys are like you. I don't like him. He asked questions and he ain't told us nothing. Hey, uh, maybe we find out something we went through his pockets, huh? Yeah, yeah. Even a dummy's got pockets. Ain't that right, dummy? Hold him, Toby. Yeah. All right, boys, you played the scene good, and I'll see what I can do for you, but I haven't got the necklace. Hey, he talked. Yeah, yeah, you make him talk again, Toby. Now, don't make him talk too much. We know if the stuff ain't on him, it's in his room. We can pick it up any time. <laughs> That's it. Easy, Toby, easy. <laughs> Oh, he talks real nice, Feely, but he don't say much. Hey, you think maybe he's tough? Could be. No, I wasn't. And I didn't feel like talking in that quiet little parking lot where the only noise was them pounding on me. I told them I didn't have the necklace anymore, but they didn't care about that. They wanted to find out the hard way. The hard way for me. <laughs> I remember trying to wake up a couple of times. I dreamed I was driving along in a big Cadillac. Frank Scanlon was on one side of me, Sam Costigan on the other. Hannibal Mortuous was in the front seat. He had his jeweler's glass out, looking at the tears of night. I tried to see who was behind the steering wheel, and I gave that up because the steering wheel was a roulette wheel. Then we had a blowout, and the whole car vanished with everybody screaming, Demortuous, Demortuous. Somewhere around six in the morning, I began to get a feeling... Several feelings, and all of them hurt. It just turned dawn, and I rolled over on my side to watch a man who hadn't seen me step into his car with a fresh shave and a fishing pole, pull out of the lot and disappear. Somewhere, vaguely, I heard the sounds of early morning traffic. A streetcar clang somewhere. Nothing much happened for a while. Then it came to me it might be a good idea to get on my feet and find a telephone and get hold of a doctor and see how long I had to live. Somehow I managed by holding onto a fence and stumbling against cars to make the front entrance to Elise Wendover's house. I made the elevator, self-service my way up to the ninth floor, and staggered toward 913. <laughs> I would have been better off in the parking lot. Elise Wendover was there, sitting in a large chair by the window. She still wore the black strapless dress and ermine piece she'd had on the night before. The drapes were drawn, the door was slightly open. Light from the hall seeped in. She had a telephone on her lap. The receiver was off, held idly in one hand. She looked at me. <laughs> but she was looking at nothing. Hello. Hello. Hello, oh, Mr. Dollar, it's you. You've been in an accident. You're hurt. I don't think you'll need this. Oh. Well, then, Mr. Dollar. Well, then... I suppose you've met some people tonight who know a great deal about me. A gambler? A jeweler? Did they tell you about Teddy Davis? He's really a dear, Mr. Dollar. Quite the nicest boy I've met since Noah died on the boat. Noah and I had so many things together, Mr. Dollar. I do think he enjoyed being alive with me. I mean, I cried when Noah died. 
I really did. I cried like a little baby. Of course, I cried when I heard my brother was killed in Korea and when Daddy died in his office with a heart attack. I shouldn't really cry anymore. I mean, after all, I am cursed. I told you that. Yes, I told you I didn't believe it. There's no such thing. But there is. You'll see. This is Wendover. No, I have Teddy. He's really a dear. I do think he will be a very prominent artist someday. He paints you. No? Teddy asked me to marry him tonight. That's nice. You marry him. And Teddy isn't interested in my money. Could you believe that? What is my mom? <laughs> I can't seem to get my tongue adjusted to my mouth. Did that ever happen to you, Mr. Todd? Yes, sometimes. Perhaps I should see a correctionist. I... I'm glad you came by again, Mr. Dollar. I told you once that sometimes, sometimes it means an awfully, awfully lot to speak to someone. Mr. Costigan. Mr. What? Mayor. What about Mr. Costigan? Later. 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 I know it must be strange to you, but, 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 but some people live for nothing but money and some people to die for it. Stop it. Stop it. Now tell me what's happened. Tell me what's happened so I can help you. They do look so funny. They're so very funny. I've seen them count money so often and so much money, and I really believe that it's honestly all they live for. Only, only, only. <laughs> She pointed across the darkened room. Her black eyes glistened with no semblance of reason left in them. It took me five seconds to find the light switch. Stretched out on the floor of her apartment. They look funny, all right. Feely and Toby. Both of them as dead as you can get. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the tears of night... Come home. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Good morning, darling. Hello, hello. We should get married today. Is your name Teddy Davis? What? Who is this? Where's Elise? My name's Johnny Dollar. I'm in her apartment. What? Hey, what? Now listen to me. I'm an insurance investigator. And there have been a couple of murders here. Murders? In 
Elisa's apartment. She's going to need you and all the help she can get to bring her out of it. Mostly you. I've called Homicide and they're on their way and it might be pretty rough for her. I'll be right over. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Tears of Night matter. It was a long morning, and a lieutenant of police thought I was crazy when he met me in the apartment with two dead men and the hysterical woman. My face was bruised and black and blue from the beating the dead men had handed me the night before. The lieutenant, his name is Brady, had a time getting hold of Hillary Fuchs to back up my story. But Teddy Davis was a different matter. He showed up with a doctor and lawyer. And through their combined efforts, Elise Wendover was removed not to police headquarters, but to a private hospital. It was obvious from powder tests that Mrs. Wendover could not have fired the forty-five, which ended the lives of Feely and Toby. Obvious to me. Lieutenant Brady was a skeptical man. You stay right there and keep your trap shut. I'll figure out what to do with you in a minute. All right, come on, get those baskets out of here. I say, Dollar. Hi, Teddy. How's Mrs. Wendover? Oh, that remains to be seen. She's screaming about that darn curse again. She thinks she had something to do with these murders. Dollar, I, I don't know quite how you fit into all this. I do know I'm terribly indebted to you for calling me. Now, what can I do for you? Are you in trouble? I don't think so. Brady's just excited. He can't see where I should be involved, so he suspects me. Of what? Oh, he doesn't know that. He's a policeman and he suspects everybody. But don't you worry about it. You get back to her. I really do have a good lawyer. He can work on it if you give the word. I can't just walk out of here feeling that you're in jeopardy. Now, what can I do? I thought you were over at the hospital, Mr. Davis. I was. I came back to see what I could do for Mr. Dollar. You can scram now. Watch whom you're talking to, Lieutenant. This man is my friend. Hey, are you kidding? Not a bit. Take it easy, fellas. Take it easy. You said your name's Dollar. Insurance dick. Let's see your buzzer. Okay, out of Hartford. What's the job? Mrs. Wendover's husband died two years ago. She just got around to filing for benefits last week. We were curious about it. Go on. Well, can't you see, Mrs. Wendover? Let him, huh? As near as I can make out, Mrs. Wendover's overlooked a lot of things since her husband's death. Taxes, bank accounts, whatnot. Hillary Fuchs can tell you that much. This curse business she mumbles about. Well, she lost her husband. Before that, her brother killed in the war, and her father before that. You know, you don't seem to pay much attention. I explained all of it. I'm going to pop you in the cooler if you open your mouth again, Mr. Davis. <laughs> Go on. How about the insurance? Well, all okay. I was ready to leave town last night. As a matter of fact, I'd called for a plane from Fuchs' office. But a man named Scanlon came in, mistook me for Fuchs, and said Sam Costigan wanted to see me. Costigan's got a gambling place on the other Yeah, 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 we know about it. Go on. Well, Costigan gave me a necklace, the Tears of Night, said it belonged to Mrs. Wendover. He asked me to bring it back to her, said she'd pawned it at the roulette table. When I got here, Mrs. Wendover was wearing the Tears of Night, or something that looked just like it. Well, I was curious. I looked up the jeweler who had made it, a man named Mortuous. He said I was carrying the real thing. When I left his place, a couple of men from Costigan's place followed me. Who? Those two who were killed, Feely and Toby. They caught up with me outside of this apartment house and tried to shake me down for the necklace. But I'd mailed it to myself at my hotel. So they worked me over and left me there. When I came to earlier this morning, I came up here and found Mrs. Wendover sitting here in a state of shock. The two stiffs in her room. That's it? Yeah, Brady, that's it. How long have you been an insurance dick? Fourteen years. You bonded? Yes. Okay. Are you going to let him go or aren't you? Shut up. Shut up and I'll tell you both what I'm up against here. I know Mrs. Wendover couldn't have had anything to do with the killings. I know you, Dollar, couldn't either. Then go out and find who killed those two men. Those two and the other one. Huh? Costigan was gunned down a couple of hours ago. About three o'clock in the afternoon, Brady released me and Teddy Davis drove me back to my hotel. The clerk at the desk looked at my bandaged face and turned eight shades of white when he handed me my key. I thanked him and told him I'd kept a date with a barracuda. I was feeling kiddish. Also a little dizzy and a little tired. I was looking forward to a hot shower and ten hours sleep when I walked in my room. 
Oh, Dollar, I've been expecting you. Come in, sir, come in. Well, hello, Mr. Mortuous. Uh, I've been uh, amusing myself with this pocket chess set of yours. Mexican, eh? Sit down, sit down. You've had a hectic night. Your boys were pretty rough, Mr. Mortuous. Philly and uh, Toby are uh, two men of another world, Mr. Dollar, not of our world. Allow me to apologize for their actions. I want more than an apology. They almost beat me to death. And so unnecessary, too. You know, I underestimated you, Mr. Dollar. Such an ingenious method of protecting the tears of night. Why, sir, by the simple expedient of placing it in an envelope and mailing it to yourself from my hotel lobby, you hired as guardians the entire United States Postal Service, not to mention the armed forces. Yeah. Want one of these? No, 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 thanks. I'm one of those faint-hearted persons who cannot abide liquor until after six in the afternoon. What happens now? Do we wait for the mail? We do, huh? Precisely. Then while we're waiting, maybe you'll be kind enough to tell me about the double cross. <laughs> if you can bear my vanity, Mr. Dollar, I, I have invented a new word, triple cross. It has a ring to it, eh? That sounds likely. You see, Mr. Scanlon approached me last week and asked me to duplicate the tears of night Mrs. Wendover had truly pawned at the gaming table. Naturally, I became suspicious. Let me guess what you became suspicious of. Oh, well, it was fairly obvious that Mr. Scanlon was planning to double cross Mr. Costigan. That is, when the time came to Return Mrs. Wendover's necklace, he, Scanlon, I mean, uh, intended to return the bogus piece I made up. And you got into the act. Uh, that is when I first conceived my own plans, yes. Unfortunately, Mr. Costigan learned of the little deceit going on around him, and Mr. Scanlon was forced to shoot him. So Scanlon shot Costigan. How about Toby and Feely? Uh, Mr. Scanlon again, abetted by the last of the house of Mortius. You helped him kill them, then planted them, and Elise went over his apartment. Oh, dear, a crude touch, I thought, but it had a purpose. With two cadavers in a living room, she was very unlikely to discuss her bogus necklace with the police. And I doubt very much if she knew whether she was wearing the original or an imitation. Flighty girl. That's the lousiest thing the house of Mortuous ever did. She walked in and found these two there, and the doctor doesn't know whether she'll ever be sane again. Oh, dear, dear, dear. If you had merely returned the necklace to Mrs. Wendover, it would have been a simple thing to effect an exchange. And none of this would have been necessary. Ah, uh, well, then, bygones are bygones. Yeah, sure, I know. You just sit here and wait for the mail. No, 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 no. We wait for the mail. What about your playmate, Scanlon? Why isn't he waiting with you? Scanlon? I'm afraid I'll be sought for a murder of two or three this night. I'm certain the police will find his body before the day is out, but I did need him to help me carry the bodies to Elise Wendover's apartment. Uh, Elise, uh, tell me something, Mr. Dollar. Does that name Elise bother you as much as it bothers me? Uh, give me a woman with a name like Celeste or Josephine or Roxanne. <laughs> Those uh, are names for the creatures. But Elise, yeah, twaddle. Where are the police going to find Scanlon? Oh, in my hotel room, which I departed hastily once the room clerk had informed me of your ingenious method for protecting the necklace. I shot him there. Oh, you were cheap, Mr. Mortuous. Cheap, sir? I don't understand. A $10,000 necklace. It's not quite a king's ransom, is it? <laughs> the tears of night are worth closer to $100,000. I'm afraid I misinformed you as to their value. I didn't want you to become suspicious. I suppose you think you'll get away with it. Oh, well, I'm an old man. Attended to a destitute and bankrupt jewelry firm with nothing ahead. A few grim years and finally a whimpering end. Requiescit in passe. Ah, live. That's what I want to do, live. And this is my opportunity to live like a king. And young man, I've taken it. Many. Vidi Vici. Oh, you're crazy. You're crazier than a mosquito in December, Mr. Mortuous. <laughs> They'll grab you before you make the airport. No, I don't think they will. <laughs> I shall leave here and turn the tears of night into cash. With a well-laden purse, I shall guarantee to elude the police over half the world. In two years, maybe three. Ah, oh, yes, they'll get me. But I'll have spent the money. And what more could a man ask than a perfect fulfillment of all his wishes, eh? I ask you, sir, as one gentleman to another, what more could a man ask? I... Cautious, Mr. Dollar. I do shoot well. Answer it. Tell them to go away. I'll be right beside you. All right. Open it. Oh, I'm sorry, Dollar. I've got a gun. Scanlon. I thought I'd find you waiting for the mail. You dirty... 
You didn't do such a good job on me. Caution, Mr. Scanlon. I have a gun to... I'll last long enough to let you have it. Your loss of blood has made you groggy, Mr. Scanlon. Uh, but still good enough to... Uh. Scanlon rolled over and lay still. Watch was kind of grunted and uh. leaned back against the wall. Uh. He had a pained look on his face. Uh. Uh. Mr. Dollar. Uh, Mr. Dollar. I do believe I've been shot. I'll, I'll need a little assistance. I, 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 I can't seem to hold my feet, sir. I can't seem to hold my feet. Sir. I still. It, it, it was an awkward plan at best, eh? <laughs> Demotuous nil nisi bonum, Dora. Or if your Latin still escapes you, speak well of the dead. Let me have the police. Expense account. Well... Expense account total, $405.16. Details, Mrs. Wendover will recover. Remarks, I'll stand for the last two days of expense myself. I didn't have any business sticking my nose in the jewelry end of it. But if you make me pay for them, don't ever try to hire me again. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week, the matter of a reasonable doubt. A case of many doubts, and believe me, all of them are most unreasonable. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Victor Perrin, Jack Crucian, Jay Novello, William Conrad, Frank Gerstle, Marvin Miller, and Will Wright. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino and Carl Fatina. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Jimmy Sayer at Inter Allied Life, Johnny. Oh, hi, Jim. How are you? The way I feel now, the way I'm going to feel depends on you. Okay, let's have it. Remember a guy named King Tut? Egyptian mummy they dug out of a tomb full of treasure a few years ago. That's right. Well, don't tell me you held a policy on him now, Jim. <laughs> oh, seriously, now. You'll also remember there was supposed to be a curse on anybody who molested his tomb. Yeah, supposed to be. But, of course, anybody knows that stuff's a lot of malarkey. Is it? Isn't it? Better reserve judgment, Johnny. 
until you hear about the curse of Kamashek. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Inter-Allied Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenditures during my investigation of the curse of Kamashek matter. Expense account item one, one dollar even. Taxi to the office of Inter-Allied Life to talk with Jim Sayer. The conference was brief and not very enlightening. I'd much rather have you see Mr. Turnbull and get the story from him yourself. As I said in the beginning, he's a very important client. What's more to the point... He can tell you about it much better than I can. Jim, to coin a cliche, you're being just as clear as mud. Also, by the way, he specifically asked for you. Oh, how come? Well, it seems he liked the way you handled the Parkinson case a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah, Emily Parkinson, the widow who died. Yeah, and... yeah, that's the one. She was his sister. And, well, go down and see him, Johnny. I, I honestly can't tell you anything more than I already have about the thing. James, you have told me nothing. But he can. And you can pick up a nice fee on it. As a favor to me. No, for that nice fee. Jim promised to phone Eric Turnbull that I was on my way, and I ran of items two and three, four dollars and twenty cents, for a quick lunch and train fare to Stamford. There I was met by a chauffeured car and driven to Turnbull's house. Far out of the town on Birchbrook Road, it was set on one of the biggest, most beautifully landscaped pieces of property I'd ever seen. The fine old home looked as though it had stood there in all its straight-laced dignity for a hundred years, and stolid against the changing world would stand for another hundred. In sharp contrast, a lithe, clean Studebaker Golden Hawk was parked in the sweeping driveway at the front. Haskins, the chauffeur, had explained on the way that he doubled his butler, so I wasn't particularly surprised when he opened the door for me. Since he received a call about your coming, sir, you are to go right in while I take the motor car to the garage. Unless... He glanced at the Golden Hawk quickly back of me, then, having left the word unless hanging in midair, climbed back behind the wheel and drove off. Well, he said go right in. Inside, the house was a classic. From the tile-floored reception room with its walls of oak and the broad staircase leading to the second floor, I could look into the huge living room, finished in polished mahogany with a leaded glass window at one side and thick oriental rugs on the floor. A fireplace that seemed to take in a whole wall and fine mahogany furniture that glowed with a beautiful patina. Beyond that, I could see the library, golden and walnut. And sitting at a broad desk was a man, his face red with anger, shaking his fist at a very attractive girl of 22 or 3 who stood before him, obviously distressed by what was going on. Don't call me Uncle Eric. I'm not your uncle now, and by heaven, if I have my way, I never will be. (coughs) You're not married to him yet, my girl, and if I have anything to say about it, you... Oh. Oh. Mr. Dollar, isn't it? Yes, sir. Mr. Turnbull? That's right. Come in, come in. And Dorothy, Mr. Dollar and I wish to be alone. The girl stood there for a brief moment, looking at the man with an expression of utter futility in her face. Then, without so much as a glance at me, he turned and left by the door that I had just entered. Come in, Mr. Dollar. Come in, please. Thank you. I'm sorry about this. Somewhat embarrassing to you, I'm sure. But it's... Well, it's something I'll have to tell you about later. Sit down, please. Thanks. May I pour you a drink? I must confess, I feel I could use one at the moment. No, no thanks, Mr. Turnbull. I uh, think I'll pass. I suppose it is a little early, but... Well, good luck. Now. Jim Sayer, an inner ally, tells me you have an insurance problem. Actually, not yet. I'll be perfectly frank with you, Mr. Dollar. Please do. I'm asking you to help me not as an insurance investigator, but as a man I feel I can trust. <laughs> But you don't really know me, Mr. Turnbull. Oh, on the contrary, I do very well. As a result of your handling of the case of my widowed sister, Emily, when she died a few years ago. As a matter of fact, you and I met very briefly at the time. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, Emily Parkinson. The case involved a lot of phony relatives who filed claims on her estate. Yes, that's right. And your clever trapping of those false claimants and their cheap attempts to gain part of Emily's fortune was... 
I understand that several of them are still serving sentences. Yeah, I believe so. Which is quite what they deserve. If there's anything I detest in this world, it's dishonesty. Well, I, uh, I guess most of us feel that way about it. Of course we do, if we have any shred of human dignity. Yeah. But now, uh, what is your problem? It uh, concerns Donald, uh, Emily's son, my nephew. I had expected him to arrive here before you, but suppose I go ahead anyway. Go ahead. Well... When her husband died, Emily was left with a considerable estate and their only child, Donald. The uh, estate's worth nearly a million now. Mm -hmm. With not too many years ahead of us, she wasn't well. She had lavished everything on the boy. The best of private schools, travel to Europe, all the things that befit one of our social and financial status. Before she died, she carefully put all of the money into a trust for Donald. A rather unique arrangement, which I control until he reaches the age of 30. What would happen if he didn't survive you? Would it all pass to you? Uh, uh, yes, yes. But of course I have no particular need of it. When I sold Turnbull Enterprises some years ago, I, I think you can see that I'm pretty well fixed investments, you know. Yeah. At uh, any rate, since his mother died, Donald has been living here with me in accordance with her request that I care for him. And I've been glad to do it, for I love the boy very dearly. How old is he, by the way? Uh, Twenty-five. He'll be twenty-six in October. And what's he doing for a living? Now, that's the whole point. There's no need for him to work for a living, as you put it. But in college, against my better judgment, he majored in archaeology and Egyptology. Oh. What did you want him to study? <laughs> Business and finance, of course. Forgive me for being so blunt, Dollar, but I see no sense whatsoever in his taking the fortune that his father spent so many years building up and squandering it on a lot of... of... Oh. oh, Donald, come in, come in. I received word at the club you wish to see me, Uncle Larry. What is it this... <laughs> Oh. Mr. Donald, this is my nephew, Donald Cronin. How do you do, Mr. Donald? We've been talking about you, Donald. Oh? As a result of a newspaper item I just read, to the effect that you're preparing for another expedition. That's right, sir. I'm going to the ancient city of Thebes in Egypt. Egypt? Since my trip last fall, I've done a lot of reading and research in New York and London. I'm convinced I've located the ancient tomb of the pharaoh Kamashek. An advance party's already begun excavation. I'll join them there. Do you realize the cost of this, this thing? Uncle Eric, it promises to be one of the most important archaeological finds of the century. You mean it might be if I let you go? If you let me go? Uncle Eric, perhaps Mr. Dollar... Mr. Dollar can hear anything I have to say to you. You see, Dollar, we're finally getting to the point. Uh, yeah. Donald, I'll make no bones about it. I'm quite fed up with your wasting your time on these stupid, pointless expeditions. That's not the way the museum feels about them, sir. Well, that's the way I feel about oh, them. Wait, sir, please. Uh, Donald, isn't that your collection for Yucatan that the museum recently acquired? Why, yes, sir. My party and I were able to... I'm sure we don't care about your party and you. You're not only wasting your time, but your money. The money your father struggled an entire lifetime to gain. That money was left for me to spend in any way I see fit. Provided your handling of it meets my approval. When you're 30 and the estate passes completely into your hands, you can do anything you like with it. Buy the Brooklyn Bridge if you want. You probably will. But until then, I am legally in control of it. And now, finally, I have every intention of exercising that control. At least to the extent of seeing you don't squander any more of it on these foolhardy expeditions. I take it you've made several, Donald. Yes, sir, and he's opposed me in all of them. Because sooner or later you've got to learn that as the wealthy son of a family, it's up to you to carry on the tradition that's been set for you. To increase the fortune that's part of your family name, build even greater financial power, not to throw it away. Do you call my contributions to science and history a waste of money? Oh, now look, my boy, there's nothing selfish about my attitude in this matter. I'm thinking only of you and your future. The family name that you alone are left to uphold. Well... Now, why don't you give up this asinine idea of going to Egypt? No, sir. What do you mean, no? Let me finish. There's no point in your saying any more, Uncle. I'm going to explore the tomb of Kamashek. Now, listen here, you I've young made Andre. all the arrangements, obtained the sponsorship of the museum, notified the universities that are interested in my work. I say you're not going. And I say I am, sir. You young fool. Don't you realize that I'm in a position to cut you off and out a penny? If you think I care, Uncle Eric, you're crazy. Then by heaven, I will. So help me, Donald. I've tried to avoid this kind of situation, but you and your idiotic bullheadedness, your utter disregard for the responsibility and importance of your family, social status have made it inevitable. Now it's come in spite of all I've tried to do, and by heaven, I'll cut you off without a... Wait a minute. Donald, where are you going? Egypt. In the moment or two before Eric Turnbull recovered his poise enough to speak to me, my mind raced. This whole situation offered a big flock of wild possibilities. Obviously, the two were at sword points, had been for some time. Apparently, and I began to wonder about this, Turnbull had no need of Donald's money. 
Yet he seemed determined to keep him from spending it. And on what looked to me like a very worthy expedition. If Donald died, Turnbull had said, the estate would pass to him. Oh, and something else I wanted to find out about. The girl who'd been there when I arrived. But why? Why? Why did I want to know or need any answers? What could this whole affair possibly have meant to me? I'm no family counselor. I'm an... In- I guess I spoke that thought out loud. I'm an insurance investigator. Yes, Dollar. Which is another reason why I need your help in this affair. But I, uh, I just don't see it, Mr. I'm Turnbull. I'm afraid I must apologize for that little scene a moment ago. Well, there's no need to. It was interesting, to say the least. Well, we didn't touch on the one thing that I wanted you to know about. That girl, Dorothy Harkness, his so-called fiancé. <laughs> ah. Thanks to a generous allowance, plus fees from the museum and some of the universities, Donald's insured his life for $100,000. 50000 for the museum. And a like amount for the girl. Through inner allied? Yes. I'll put it to you bluntly. She has prodded him to go on these expeditions. And I believe she somehow hopes to engineer his death during this Kamashek project in order to collect on that policy. Do I make myself clear? If anything was clear about this situation, I certainly couldn't see it. More things had come flying at me from out of left field during the past half hour than I could cope with. And I wanted time to organize some kind of thinking. So I used a corny old device, glanced at my watch, said something about being late for an appointment back in Hartford. I apologized, promised to talk with him again tomorrow when there'd be more time. Haskins drove me back to the station and courteously waited until the train pulled in, then left. And it was then I noticed the little Studebaker Golden Hawk that I'd seen at the house pull up beside the platform, and the girl, Dorothy Harkness, jumped out and ran over to me. Mr. Dollar? I had to wait for Haskins to leave so he wouldn't see me. Oh? I must talk to you. Please call me. Here's the number. Is this about Donald? Yes. Because of the danger he's in. From Mr. Turnbull? No. And you must believe me. From the curse of Kamashek. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a little order starts to come out of the Department of Utter Confusion and a promise of murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. I have your call to Stanford, sir. Oh, thank you, operator. Hello? Oh, Mr. Dollar, I'm so glad you've called. Well, you seem pretty anxious to talk about something, Miss Harkness. I am, about Donald and his uncle, and Donald's plan for the expedition to Egypt. To dig up the remains of the old Pharaoh Kamashek? Yes. Can you come over here to see me, please? Oh, when I talked to you on the station platform a while ago, you said something about the curse of Kamashek. Yes, Mr. Dollar. Isn't that nothing more nor less than superstition? No. Huh? I'm afraid that in this case, Mr. Dollar, it can mean nothing more nor less than murder. I'll take the first train. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) 
From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Inter-Allied Life Insurance Company, Crutchfield Square, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, The Curse of Kamashek Matter. Expense account continued. Item 4, 320, cab to the station, train fare from Hartford to Stamford, and cab to the modest but attractive apartment of Dorothy Harkness. The short trip gave me time to think. Eric Turnbull, wealthy retired businessman, called me in on this case. Turnbull, uncle of young Donald Cronin, entirely in control of a large trust fund for the boy. Turnbull, who was determined to prevent him from making an expedition to the tomb of Kamashek, on the excuse that he suspected a plot against the boy's life. Engineered by Dorothy Harkness, who was not only Donald's fiance, but a beneficiary of his hundred thousand dollar life policy. So a talk with Dorothy Harkness seemed very much in order. Oh, come in, Mr. Dollar. I'm so glad you were willing to come and talk with me. How are you, Miss Harkness? You make me sound so old. It's Dorothy. Won't you sit down? All right. Thank you. But before we go any further, Dorothy, I think you ought to understand that I'm an insurance investigator, and so oh, far. Oh, I know that. Donald told me his uncle was going to send for you. But there's been no claim file, no reason for one. I know. Mr. Turnbull does, well, kind of unusual things now and then, and I guess this is one of them. Unless he's trying to prevent whatever might cause a claim to be filed. Mr. Dollar, I don't know what Mr. Turnbull has told you about me, but I'm sure it wasn't good. I'm afraid we don't get along very well. Well, it's uh, pretty obvious he doesn't like your interest in his nephew, Donald. I've known Donald since school, Mr. Dollar, and we... We hope to get married. At least Donald does. Oh? And what about you? Uh, well, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I got the impression from Mr. Turnbull you were doing a pretty good job of getting Donald into your clutches. But that isn't the way it is at all. We've been seeing a great deal of each other, and Donald has asked me to marry him. And I'm fond of him, Mr. Dollar, terribly fond of him. But so far as marriage is concerned, I, I'm not sure. What do you mean? I can't help wondering all the time if he isn't hoping to marry me just as a... well, as an escape from his uncle. Uh-huh. Would you marry him? If I was sure of, of him. You'd be sure of an awful lot of money, Dorothy. What? The minute he reached 30, that is. Mr. Turnbull has poisoned your mind, Mr. Dollar. What money Donald has or may have has nothing to do with it. That sort of thinking is filthy. I, um... I guess you mean that, don't you, Dorothy? Yes. I think I've loved Donald ever since my father brought him into the museum. Your father? Yes, he's curator of archaeology. Well, how does he feel about Donald and you? His only interest in Donald is in the money, the financial support he gives the museum. Oh. Since that's... mother died, he's become a grasping, self-centered old man whose only interest is in the museum. I see. So I don't live with him anymore. Well, then I take it he opposes any thought of your marrying Donald. He wants me to string him along, raise money and scientific contributions. But Donald is making something of himself. Instead of wasting his life in idle luxury as Mr. Turnbull would have it. Or would he rather have Don increase the family fortune? No. No, just not spend it. That's all he cares about. So if anything should happen to Donald, there would be more left for Mr. Eric Turnbull. And that's why I called you. Because I'm afraid that if Donald does go on this expedition to Egypt, something will happen to him. Oh, now, wait a minute. Turnbull has objected strenuously to this latest expedition. You don't know them yet. Either of them. They're of the same stock, and they're both stubborn, determined, and willful, and his uncle is clever. Clever enough to play on this stubbornness. Capitalize on it. What's that supposed to mean? He knows that the surest way to keep Donald from doing something is to insist that he do it. It's always been that way. Are you sure you haven't been reading too much psychology? It's true. And in spite of Donald's academic maturity, he's almost like a child in some things. Emotional, sometimes. That... That's another reason why I wonder if Donald really wants to marry me. If he loves me enough. Or if he's simply rebelling against his uncle. You feel, then, that Mr. Turnbull is opposing the expedition to be sure that Donald will make it? Yes. Because he doesn't quietly reason with Donald, talk things out. He shouts, he storms, he threatens. And that gets Don's back hair up, huh? It makes him more determined to go than ever. Wouldn't it do the same to you? <laughs> Maybe so. And I'm afraid that if he does go... He'll never come back. You honestly don't want him to go? No. Just what do you think might happen to him? This curse of Kamashek you mentioned? I think that would be the excuse for his uncle to have something happen to him. Well, what is this curse? 
Do you remember King Tutankhamun? Well, I remember hearing and reading something about him, old Egyptian pharaoh. His tomb had a curse on it, too. But because they believed it would yield important historical data and some of the treasure of those ancient dynasties, an expedition went to the Valley of the Kings and excavated it anyhow. You're really hip on this stuff, aren't you? Because of Donald's interest in it, I guess. But listen to me. One after another, people who were involved in that expedition died under very mysterious circumstances. Yeah, I remember. Even Lord Carnivan himself. They said that he died from the results of a mosquito bite and pneumonia. But the other deaths were not so easily explained away. Not even by able scientists and doctors. You believe in the curse of King Tut, then? And now the curse of Kamashek? No. No, I don't. But from what you just told me... There have been too many other tombs, all bearing warnings, where the people who dug into them touched the treasures in them, even touched the remains of the kings, had no harm at all come to them. Well, then I'm afraid I don't see what you're driving at. This, Johnny. Any mysterious death of someone who's explored one of these ancient tombs will be accepted as a result of the curse, don't you see? It's an open door to murder. You know something, to me it all sounds a little far-fetched. No. Because of Eric Turnbull... Because I'm sure he wants Donald out of the way. For his money. This terrible friction between them, this antagonism that's been building up for years. And it's reached a point where either one of them would be glad to see the other out of the way. But Eric Turnbull is the only one who's evil enough to do something about it. Well, I gotta admit, the sparks kind of flew between them when I saw them together. And don't forget it would be to his uncle's advantage if Donald were to die. He needs the money? Well, no, I guess he doesn't. Well, what about you? I'm doing all right at the museum. I'm earning enough to live on, and I'm happy in my work. Just the same as I understand it, you'd collect half of Donald's life policy. I hate you for even thinking about such a thing. I'd hoped you would help me save Donald's life. Funny, though, isn't it? Funny. Harry Turnbull is my employer in this case, if there really is a case. Because he's smart. He's clever. He's clever enough to know that calling you in would help cover up anything he might do. I right, look... Suppose Eric Turnbull did want, did plan to get rid of Donald. How? I don't know. But this I do know. And it's the thing that has scared me. On his last expedition, and he didn't realize it until afterwards, one of the men in his party, a man he'd selected himself, turned out to have been paid separately by Mr. Turnbull. Why not? He probably wanted somebody there to look after Donald without his knowing. Listen to me. This man caused a couple of accidents. At least they call them accidents that could have cost Donald his life. Oh, no, Dorothy, look. No, please. no. No, I can see that you don't believe anything I've told you. Dorothy, I think you're just building up something in your imagination. You don't doesn't... believe me. But at least do this. Remember, no matter what happens, remember what I've told you. Somebody was lying. That was a cinch. But who? And why? Unless one of them really was plotting against the life of Donald Cronin. I couldn't get it out of my head that at least Eric Turnbull didn't need whatever money would come from Donald's death. Dorothy Harkness, on the other hand, would gain what to her would be plenty. Sure, nearly a million would go to Turnbull. But that would mean much less to him than the 50,000 insurance would to her. Well, there seemed to be nothing more to say to her at the moment, so I left her, took a cab back to the station. That's item five, 65 cents, and telephoned to the house on Birchbrook Road in the hope that Donald would be home and I'd have a chance to talk to him. Hello? Oh, Mr. Turnbull, uh, this is Johnny Dollar. Oh, splendid. Where are you? Well, I'm at the station, but I was calling to try and... Splendid. Haskins will drive the car down to meet you immediately. Well, uh, now... I knew that if you thought it over, you'd be willing to take on this case. Uh, yeah, sure. You just wait right there. Haskins will be along in a few minutes. Goodbye. Come in, Mr. Dollar. Well, thank you, but before we, uh, before we talk about this... Sit down, thing... won't you? Now, from what I've been able to learn, Donald is planning to leave for Egypt immediately. I, uh, checked with a friend at the Explorers Club in New York where the boy's been staying these past few days. Oh, I thought he always stayed right here with you. Well, he does, except when he's preparing for an expedition. Then you are going to let him go. Well, how can I stop him without making him look foolish in the eyes of his colleagues? The museum, the universities are so interested in his work. Yes, I have to let him go. But with you beside him there... Oh, wait a minute. Of course, I'll expect you to be with him during the entire expedition. Well, now, look, I... Remember this, no expense is to be spared in the protection of my nephew's life. 
I uh, had to go down to New York to see David Wilt. He's my stockbroker, Harris Dillman Company. While I was there, I stopped at my bank and arranged to have some 5,000 in American Express Chavers checks ready for you. All you have to do is go down there and sign them, pick them up. If you need more, cable me. You don't waste any time, do you? I know Donald. He's very stubborn, determined, and willful. <laughs> in his present frame of mind, he might pack up and take off at a moment's notice. I want to be sure you're at his side. Okay, you're the boss. But, Mr. Turnbull... Yes? You still haven't told me why you think his life is in any more danger on this expedition than on any of the others he's undertaken. Because that girl, Dorothy Harkness, is smart, is clever. And because of something that happened on Donald's last expedition in Yucatan. Oh? He didn't realize it until afterwards. But one of the men in his party, a man he'd selected himself, turned out to be a friend of this Dorothy Harkness. Not 20 minutes ago, I heard exactly... Now, listen to me. This man caused a couple of accidents. At least they called them accidents. That could have cost Donald his life. And Mr. Dollar, though lacking any proof, I am convinced he was put up to them by the beneficiary of his insurance policy, Dorothy Harkness. Did I say somebody was lying? Somebody had to be lying. And by now, that old feeling was beginning to come back to me, that hunch, whatever it is, that told me somebody was planning to kill Donald. Harry Turnbull, Dorothy Harkness, who? Something told me I'd better get to Donald Cronin, but fast. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, suddenly the reason for a carefully planned murder becomes crystal clear. And a race against death becomes a race for my own life. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is the operator at the Explorers Club. Oh, good. Have you been able to... Sorry, Mr. Dollar, but I haven't been able to reach Mr. Donald Cronin for you. Well, hasn't he been there at all? He was in and out all morning, but he refused to answer any calls then. Since you first telephoned, he hasn't been back. Well, do you know when he will be back? No, I don't, sir. All right, then leave a message. I'll meet him there at the club. Is it very important that you see him, Mr. Dollar? It's important that I keep him from being murdered. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Inter-Allied Life Insurance Company, Crutchfield Square, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the curse of Kamashek matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item six, $9.80, train to New York, quick lunch and taxi to the Traders Bank and Trust Company. There I picked up the American Express Traveler's checks that Eric Turnbull had left in my name, had left for expense money to take me to Egypt, 
to make sure his nephew Donald Cronin lives safely through an expedition to open the grave of the ancient pharaoh Kamashek. The bank teller's brief remark gave me something to think about. Hmm. How old, uh, how sign, Mr. Dollar? Mm, yep. Yes, now, let me check the amount for you just once more. All right. One thousand, two thousand, three thousand, thirty-five hundred, four... Forty-five, forty-seven, forty-eight, and five thousand dollars each. Mm-hmm. Yes, here you are. Good, thanks. And as I'm sure Mr. Turnbull knows, this will close out this particular account completely. I thought about that remark a little later when it began to tie in with some other things I learned. Right now, item seven eighty cents cab fare to the Explorers Club. Donald had not yet returned, so I left another message for him, asking him to sit tight until he heard from me. And I meant sit tight. Because apparently, after the latest argument with his Uncle Eric, he was quite likely to hop off to Egypt on short notice. This I didn't want. As a matter of fact, at this point, I wasn't sure I approved of his expedition at all. Both his uncle and his girlfriend, Dorothy Harkness, had told me they thought his life was in danger. And each accused the other of plotting his murder. I was about to leave the Explorers Club when I was buttonholed by a short, kind of cute-looking old character in gray striped suit, tatters all vest, spats, believe it or not, and all but a monocle. Uh, I say there, old man. Uh, yes? If you'll pardon me, I believe I overheard you inquiring at the desk for Donald Cronin, didn't I? Oh, yes. Do you know him? I most certainly do. Uh, But excuse me, I'm Percival Thronghurst Scatterday. Mr. Scatterday, I'm Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Donald told me that he'd met you at his home. Uh, Tell me, do you plan to accompany him on the... Expedition to Thebes? Well, uh, yes. Excellent, excellent. It should result, you know, in one of the most important archaeological finds of the century. Think of it. The tomb of Kamashek. Yes. Do you know where Donald is now? Treasures, artifacts, and that should put to shame the ones that were excavated from the tomb of Tutankhamun. Yes, I'm sure it will, but now... If history has told us the truth about Kamashek, uh, 18th dynasty, I believe... Not that I wouldn't know, but now, uh, Mr. Scandaday... It's important that I reach Donald Cronin just uh, as no, soon no, as... No, 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 now that I think of it, Kamash... Kamashek was 12th dynasty. Uh, Mr. Scandaday, uh, if... Uh, but, but he couldn't be, because that was the era... Oh, yes, yes, I remember now. It was the 18th, the same period in which the great temple of Queen Hatshepsut was erected at Daya el-Bahari at Thebes, of course. Uh, you've seen that, of course. No, I haven't. Oh, magnificent, enthralling. Now, look here, sir. Uh, but now, Mr. Dollar... I've got to reach Donald Cronin, so if you'll excuse me... Uh, Mr. Dollar, please, you say you are going with Donald. You do know about the curse of Kamashek. Or do you? Yes, yes, I've heard of it. Oh, then you'll certainly arrange not to be present at the opening of the sarcophagus. Why? Well, as I'm certain you know, all the preliminary work has been accomplished by the advance party, of course. So I understand. Uh, the antechamber of the tomb was opened over a month ago. So? Well, it simply means that as soon as Donald arrives, they will penetrate to the sepulchral chamber and the sarcophagus itself. Well? Uh, Mr. Donald. It was engraved on the stone slab, barring the way to the last chamber, Mantak Ko Fore El, and so on. Oh, it's not supposed to be. Uh, the warning, my boy, the warning. That whosoever violate the tomb and desecrate the body of the noble pharaoh by contact therewith shall quickly die. You don't believe in those things, do you? Mr. Dollar. As I always understood it, those warnings were just put there to discourage thieves from robbing those old tombs. Uh, Mr. Dollar, I only ask that you remember what happened to those who violated the tomb of Tutankhamun. Oh, well, couldn't the deaths of the people who entered that tomb be due simply to coincidence? Or rather, things, uh, circumstances quite apart from their having done so? Of course, of course, they could, but were they? Mr. Dollar, I assure you that if it were not for the warning of the curse of Kamashek, I would be the first to want to enter that tomb. Instead, I have refused to go on the expedition at all. Uh, Take care of Donald. Well, that's what I'm being hired to do. And of yourself, sir. Yeah, sure. Now, sorry, but I'm anxious to reach Donald, and you say you've seen him here at the club? Yes, only last evening. He was here making some of his final preparations. Well, do you know where he is now? Yes. Well, where? At his uncle's place in Stamford, Connecticut. You're sure? Uh, as sure as I am that you've not heeded my warning about the curse of Kamashek. But I beg you, Mr. Dollar, for the welfare of Donald Cronin and yourself. Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks. If this were a mystery story instead of an accounting of expenditures on a case, I'd tag Percy Scatterday as a prime suspect for whatever might happen later. Like the man who tries to throw you off his own trail by suggesting that somebody else is gunning for you. 
But I decided he was just an old fogey who'd been turned down on the Kamashek expedition, was trying to justify his own shortcomings with the tales about the curse. But you know something? I was wrong. I should have listened to him a little more understandingly. Item 8, 75 cents, taxi to the office of Harrison and Dillman and Company to see David Wilt, the man Eric Turnbull had named as his stockbroker. The reason? The remark the bank teller had made about closing out an account. As it turned out, my timing was perfect. Uh, sit down, sir, sit down. I'll be with you just as soon as I finish this phone call. Oh, sure, thanks. Hello. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, but someone just stepped into my office. If you'd rather be left alone, I'll... No, it's all right. Now, as I started to say, if you dispose of the gold metal mining stock, your holdings will be reduced to practically nothing. Yes. Yes, that's right. Well, but Mr... Yes, but Mr. Tur... Look, you sure you wouldn't rather I come back another time? Very well, very well. It's just that I hate to see what was once a very strong investment program. Very well, Mr. Turnbull, if you insist. Turnbull? Yes, yes. Goodbye. Now, now, sir. Eric Turnbull, Mr. Wilt? Oh, yes, but... Now, just a minute, sir. It was very remiss of me to mention a client's name in front of you, at least under the circumstances. Whatever I may have said on the phone just now was quite confidential. Yeah, I'm sure it was. I can only ask that you discreetly forget anything you may have heard. Not by a long shot. What's this? Who are you, sir? Dollar, I believe, the receptionist said. That's right, Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. And that conversation told me just what I came here to try to charm you into telling me. Mr. Dollar, please remember this. That was entirely confidential. None of your business. Here, my credentials. Yeah? Well? Now, you remember something. So far as Eric Turnbull is concerned, my coming here is entirely confidential. None of his business. Goodbye, Mr. Wilt. So the wealthy Eric Turnbull wasn't so wealthy after all. Big investments in the stock market, he'd said. But they didn't look so big anymore. And the closing out of bank accounts. Item 930 cents, phone call to Dorothy Harkness. Yes, Mr. Dollar? I just called to tell you, Dorothy, that if it'll be any satisfaction to you, I'm going to make the trip to Egypt. Oh, thank heaven. Then Donald will have some protection against the machinations of his uncle. Oh, gal, that sounds like a line out of an old melodrama. I know you don't believe me, Mr. Dollar, but I'm so sure that Eric Turnbull is plotting against Donald's life. You know something? I'm beginning to feel a little that way, too. Then you did believe me. In spite of the way you poo-pooed everything I said, are you... Are you and Donald leaving together? I can't seem to find him. Do you know where he is? Have you tried the Explorers? No, not there. Well, he'll surely call me before he leaves. Well, if he does, have him get in touch with me. Where, Mr. Dollar? Right now, I'm going out to Eric Turnbull's house. After that, I'll be back in Hartford. (laughs) Item 10, $7 even, train fare back to Stamford and taxi to the Turnbull residence in the hope that there I would find Donald Cronin, the real principal in this case, and the one person I hadn't yet talked to. But it was Eric Turnbull who met me at the door. Mr. Dollar, I'm glad to see you. Come in, come in. Have you seen my nephew, Donald? Well, no. Isn't he here? No. Nor is he at the Explorers Club. I've called him several times. I'm worried about him in his present frame of mind. I'm worried about him, too, Mr. Turnbull, but not for the same reason. Because of that girl, Dorothy Harkness. Here, sit down. No, that isn't what I meant. In his present frame of mind, he's likely to jump off on his flight to Egypt without... Look here. I wonder if he's with her. No, that much I do know. Oh, I wish to heaven he would call if anything happens to him. If anything happens to him, you'd love it, wouldn't you? What? What did you say? I've done a little checking up on you, Mr. Turnbull, since I last talked to you. What do you mean? In a case as involved as this, it's necessary to check all the angles. Everything, everyone, even the man who hires you. Has that girl been poisoning your mind against me, too? Your banker, from whom I picked up the American Express checks, let it slip that your account is in pretty bad shape. Non-existent now, as a matter of fact. Go on, Mr. Dollar. And your stockbroker, quite inadvertently, made it all too plain that the big investments you told me about aren't so big after all. Mr. Dollar... All right, tie that in with the fact that if anything does happen to Donald, you'll come into his estate. You've said enough. But it's true, isn't it? You laid so much stress on Dorothy and the museum getting his 100,000 life insurance, but you're the one who would really benefit by his death. Dollar, you have talked with one banker, with one stockbroker. Why, in your snooping around, didn't you talk with the others who hold my accounts? Like who? Like... That's none of your business. But if what you are implying were true, why in heaven's name would I ever ask you to come in and protect my nephew? As a cover-up? I should knock you down with my bare fists, and believe me, my boy, I could do it. Now listen to me. I'm listening. If I didn't have any money, how could I afford to give you the 5000 in expense money, pay whatever other costs may be involved in your employment? 
And why do you suppose, in spite of this high-handed attitude of yours, I'm still begging you to stay on this case? See, Donald, Mr. Dollar, talk with him. You'll find that in spite of the angry scene between us, I'm concerned only with his welfare, that I want to protect him, that I want you to protect him. Wait, wait, that's Donald. Now, let me take it. Well, now, just a minute. Johnny Dollar. Oh, uh, Mr. Dollar, I was calling Mr. Turnbull. Mr. Scannady? Uh, yes, at the Explorers Club. Uh, Mr. Dollar, I've just talked to a couple of fellow members who saw him off. Saw him? Donald Cronin? Yes, last night. His plane has probably reached Cairo by now. Uh, fooled all of us, didn't he? Yeah. Thanks. Well, thought you'd want to... Well? Donald left for Egypt last night. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Then please... Please, I beg of you, go. In heaven's name, go to him. Stay with him. Protect him. For a long moment, Eric Turnbull simply stood there, sobbing, pleading with his tear-filled eyes. And suddenly, I don't know why, I found that I believed him. I wish now that he'd been lying. Two lives might have been saved. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a flight into darkness, and when day has come, there's blood on the desert sands. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Have you found Donald yet, Mr. Dollar? Have you been... Oh, this is Dorothy Hartman. Yeah, I know. And no, I haven't found Donald Cronin. He wasn't at his uncle's place? Johnny, you must find him. Talk to him. Talk him out of making the trip to Egypt. Dorothy. If he does, he'll die. His uncle will see to it that he dies. Look, Dorothy. You must find him and stop him. I'm afraid it's a little late for that. What? He took off on a direct flight to Egypt early yesterday. Oh, no. Has at least a 36-hour start, at least. Johnny, you must go after him. On the first plane, I can get to Cairo. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Inter-Allied Life Insurance Company, Crutchfield Square, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the curse of Kamashek matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item 10. Taxi, train to New York, and cab to the airport. $9.45. Item 11. Round trip plane fare to Cairo, Egypt. $1,305. I was tired, and the steady drone of the four powerful engines lulled me to sleep in no time. 
I think I might have slept most of the way to Paris, which was to be our first stop, except for hunger pans and the appropriate ministrations of a very attractive stewardess. Usually on such a long flight, I try to make friends with everybody aboard, just to shorten the trip. And I did this time, except for one man who sat four or five seats behind me. He was a rather hefty individual, dark-complexioned, about 30, I'd guess, who didn't budge from his seat during the entire flight. And every time I approached him to pass the time of day, he immediately made like he was asleep. So he wanted to be alone. But when I settled down into my seat, next to a lovely petite brunette named Carolyn, who was... Now, that's beside the point, except for purely personal reasons that I'll pursue further when I get back to the States. Uh, Yeah. The point is that in primping a bit and replenishing her lipstick, she held up a small mirror compact... And reflected in it, I could see that the dark complexion man was not only quite wide awake, but watching me every second of the ride. In a rather strange way, too. Concentrated. Like you'd watch a fly you're planning to swat. Then every time I'd turn around, he'd promptly shut his eyes and feign sleep again. Finally, it was early evening, we sat down at Le Bourget, the airport on the outskirts of Paris. Since this was Carolyn's destination, during the short layover, I helped her get her baggage and extracted the promise of a date in New York when she returned in the fall. Yeah. Yeah, I guess Paris does it to you. Well, anyhow, after she piled into a taxi, I wandered around for a bit thinking and decided to reboard the plane, look up the dark, silent passenger and have it out with him. But apparently I'd waited too long. As I passed a narrow sort of alley beside a baggage shed, he decided to have it out with me. In here, darling, quick. Huh? What? In here, where we won't be sane. Oh, now, just a minute, fella. Who are you? What do you want? Just this. What you... What you... You... Stop. you don't... Stop. All right, now. Now, what was the big idea, mister? You gonna talk or do you want some more of this? All right. All right, I'll talk. Well, who put you up to this? Come no, on, come no, on. No, I can't tell you that. You want to bet? What? All right, now, start talking. I said... All right, I'll talk, I'll talk. It was Turnblow. It was Turnblow. What? Turnbull? Here. Yeah, that's right. Frederick Turnbull. Why? Oh, should I know? I, I do a lot of strong arm for him. Go on, go on. So he pays me good to get you out of the way, so I should ask questions? Well, maybe he'll have a few to ask you if you ever get back to the States. Now roll over. Huh? Oh. No. Hey. All right. <laughs> Yeah, hey, wait. What are you doing? That's right. It's my passport. That's right, mister. That's exactly what it was. When you get back on your feet, you can try to figure out how to go on from here without it. Listen, you dirty... Sorry, buddy. I gotta catch a plate. <laughs> I suppose I should have turned the unfriendly thug over to the French police, but figured he'd have trouble enough lacking a passport to keep him out of my way for a while. The only charges I could make against him would be for assault. Time was of the essence, too since Donald Cronin actually was two days ahead of me and it was important that I join him at the tomb of Kamashek as soon as possible. At least so I thought. Until I entered the main building of the airport again and heard my name being called on the PA system. The information desk showed me where to take a transatlantic phone call. Johnny Dollar. Dollar, this is Eric Turnbull. Well, well. Thank goodness I was able to reach you during your power stopover. I'm glad you did, Mr. Turnbull, because there are a couple of things I want to talk to you about. When you uh, return, Mr. Dollar. What's the matter with right now? And may I suggest that you take the first plane back here that you can get? First, I want a little explanation for a beating I just took from... Wait a minute, wait a minute. What did you say? Come back here and we'll settle our accounts. The, the, the case is closed. The... What? Donald is dead. Where? How? I just received word from one of the members of the expedition. In Egypt? Yes, the... The curse of Kavashek has been fulfilled. Or was he murdered? I'm afraid it was the same mysterious death that's overtaken so many who have violated those old tombs. Well, I don't believe it. Any more than you believe in that so-called curse the last time I talked to you. I know! I was wrong. Heaven forgive me for letting the boy go. Look, Mr. Turnbull, things just don't make sense at all. Come back, Mr. Dollar, and we'll talk about it here. Listen to me. Yes? Before I decide what I'm going to do, I want to know why you hired a thug to try to put me out of the picture. What? I I, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, you don't. Well, he made it plenty plain that he's handled strong-arm jobs for you before. That's impossible. Gave me your name as the man who's hired him many times, Frederick Turn... 
Whoa. Hold it. Hold it a minute. Dollar, I'm, I'm very sorry, but I haven't the least... Maybe I will go back to New York at that. Mr. Dollar. It suddenly dawned on me that I must have been slightly befuddled by the partial beating I'd taken earlier. You know, when the thug made his little confession a few minutes before. I'll talk, I'll talk. It was Turnblow hired me. Frederick Turnblow. Frederick Turnblow, he'd said, instead of Eric Turnbull. Sure, they sound alike. But a guy who's done a lot of strong-arm jobs, knows the guy, the right name of the guy that hired him, that can mean only one thing. Someone had instructed that thug to say he'd been hired by Turnbull. But who? I canceled out the rest of my flight to Cairo, made reservations back to New York, and then while waiting for that plane, ran up item 13, $82 American. On phone calls to whomever I could dig up among the Egyptian government authorities who had been overseeing the excavation of Kamashek's tomb. What little I learned was pretty much summed up by the British doctor who had been a member of the expedition. Very mysterious, Mr. Dollar. You see, because of the superstition about violating the tomb, only two of our people even touched any of the bones we found within it. Yeah? And incidentally, that is all we found. The tomb had been thoroughly ransacked by thieves, or well, probably centuries ago. Yeah, but you were saying, Doctor. Oh, yes, yes. Only two touched any of the remains. One was a native carrier, as soon as the bones had been properly sprayed where they preserved it. Uh-huh. And the other was Donald Cronin, who, for some reason or other, wrapped up the bones and sent them by air to his uncle, a uh, Mr. Eric Turnbull in the United States. Oh. Well, go on, go on. Well, that's really all, Mr. Dollar. Except, of course, that both of them have died of some strange malady that the authorities have not been able to determine. And that's why the tomb has been officially closed again. Hey, listen, tell me something. Could the bones have been accessible to anyone before those two touched them? Yes, to anyone in the party. Well, I don't tell me that you suspect... Oh, listen, mister, I don't know what I suspect. But I don't believe it was any curse of a long-dead pharaoh that killed those two men. Even in view of what happened to those who entered the tomb of Tutankhamen for some years ago, and then the tomb of... King... Look, tell me this, will you? Have any of the expedition returned to America? Well, of course, the authorities have here no reason for holding them. You haven't answered my question. No. Well, only the two young men that Donald brought along with him. Who were they? Uh, Carl Fortina. Oh, who's he? From New York. Like Donald himself, he's an archaeologist. And the other? One of his colleagues at the museum in, uh... Hmm, I believe it's in Stamford. What's his name? Oh, he's a young osteological expert, son of a curator at the museum, as I recall. What? And his name is Walter Harkness. Well, I'll be. But surely you don't think... Doctor, it's... you go right ahead and hang those two deaths on good old King Kamashek. Me? I'm going after a couple of live suspects. <laughs> There was plenty of time before the New York plane for a quick look for my heavy-handed pal in the alley where I'd left him. But he'd either crawled away or been picked up by the gendarmes, and I didn't have time for a session with them. Item 14, 150 for some food. Then aboard the plane, and we took off. Ah, it was a rough case to figure. Actually, of course, the insurance angle was done and over with. It ended with Donald Cronin's death. And two people would benefit by his death, both of them number one suspects. One, his uncle, Eric Turnbull, who would now take over the million-dollar estate. The other, Dorothy Harkness, who would gain a big chunk of life insurance money, along with the museum, of course, that her father... Who oh, hold everything. Her father, Adam Harkness, who opposed her marriage to Donald, who looked on him simply as a source of income for the museum, who... Hold everything is right. There was the son, too, Walter Harkness, who ducked back to the States the minute Donald died. How did he fit into this? Believe me, in spite of all the talk in it, the belief in it, the one thing I was sure had nothing to do with the whole matter was the curse of Kamashek. Nevertheless, call it hunch or whatever you like, the more I thought about it, the more certain I became that I'd find all the answers in a package that Donald had mailed back to the States. A package containing the bones of Pharaoh Kamashek. Mr. Dollar. Hello, Haskins. Mr. Turnbull, then? Yes, and I'm sure he wishes to see you. It's a frightful thing about Master Donald, isn't it, sir? How does Mr. Turnbull feel about it? Terribly broken up, sir. 
I'll bet. Go oh, back, back. Please come in. He's in the library. Thanks. He just received a package the poor boy sent to him before he... Wait, Haskins. Has he opened it yet? He was examining the contents when the doorbell... Good heavens. Mr. Turnbull. He's fallen from his chair, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Dollar, he's... Oh, no. Yeah, Haskins. He's dead. Now here's our star to tell you about the final episode of this week's story. Before I do, please let me thank you for the letters you keep sending us about the program. So many come in every day that it's become quite a chore to answer them, but you know something? I love it. As a matter of fact, your letters are appreciated by all of us who are involved in the production and presentation of the show. Our director, the writers, the various members of our cast, and our excellent technical crew. So please don't stop. Tomorrow, the wind-up. And a sorry example of what the lust for money can sometimes do to nice people. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar starring Bob Bailey is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dr. St. Clair returning your call, Stinky. Oh, hi, Leonard. Where have you been, Johnny? It's been years. Yeah, I know. Listen, can you give me a hand? Who got poison this time? Two of them. I hope it's poison. And that you can prove it for me. We'll try. What do I do? Meet me here at the home of Eric Turnbull in Stanford, Connecticut. Okay, but Johnny... Give you the address in a minute. But Johnny, what do you mean you hope somebody got poisoned? Because if they didn't, I'm going to go off my rocker. What? Because the only other possible cause of death could be a curse. The curse of Kamashek. Who? An Egyptian king who died a couple of dozen centuries ago. What? Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Inter-Allied Life Insurance Company, Crutchfield Square, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the curse of Kamashek matter. Expense account continued. I called Dr. Leonard St. Clair, an old school chum, because I knew him to be one of the foremost toxicologists in the country. And I was telling the truth. I hoped it could be shown that some kind of poison killed Donald Cronin and, subsequently, his uncle, Eric Turnbull. Both, apparently, had believed in the curse of the old Egyptian pharaoh, a curse that was to befall anyone who violated his ancient tomb on the banks of the Nile. Donald had done this in excavating the tomb. But his uncle here in Stamford had only touched the bones that Donald had airmailed to him. He was opening the package that Master Donald... God rest his soul. That Master Donald had sent him just before he died, there at the tomb in Egypt. 
I brought them in here to the library for him, sir. Go on, Haskins. Well, then you rang the doorbell. I, I left him with it, and uh, when you and I came in here... Yeah, dead. And from the curse of Kamashek, Mr. Dollar... No, Haskins, I don't believe it. A friend of mine, Dr. St. Clair, will be here shortly, and he'll be but able to... But shouldn't we notify the police? No, sir? no, no, later. But, but leave my poor employee's body just lying there? For the time being, yes. Until Dr. St. Clair examines it. Eh? As you wish, sir. That's what I wish. Haskins. One person in this confusing mess I hadn't given a second thought to. As it turned out, there wasn't time, for Len St. Clair arrived a few minutes later in a car equipped like a miniature laboratory. No doubt as a result of the police work he was frequently called on to do. First, of course, in his capacity as an M.D., he made a thorough examination of Eric Turnbull's body for purposes of death certificate data. Those poison all right, Johnny. I'm sure of it. At least as sure as I can be, short of making an autopsy. But what kind of poison, Len? And how administered? Well, at the risk of making it sound like a dime novel, I'd say it was an extremely rare, uh, well... Well, what? Come on. Well, it's something I haven't heard of in years. Related to the old Indian arrow poison. It's very difficult to detect. Can you make sure? Yes, if you'll help me drag some of my equipment in from the car, including a cage of white mice. Wh- what? Yeah, on which to experiment with samples of the stuff. Samples from those old bones out of the tomb? Mm, that's right. Now, from what you've told me, only two people have touched the bones since the minute they were discovered in the tomb. Three. A native carrier, Donald Cronin, and now the late Eric Turnbull. And they've all died. But, Johnny... Yeah? The poison I'm thinking of would hardly have been put on those bones in the time of the pharaohs. Oh, and by the way, I hope no one's touched them here. No, I've left them just as they are in that mailing wrapper. Good. Because it could be fatal. I'll carefully scrape them when we get the equipment in here. We brought in what Len needed for his work, including the white mice. Then I closed him in the library and left him to his experiments. To a bit of research, too, for he'd brought in a couple of thick books on toxicology. As a matter of routine, I phoned the local coroner and then tried to reach Dorothy Harkness. Her number didn't answer. I was about to drive over to her little apartment when Len came out of the library. I was right, Johnny. Curaba arsenium. That the name of the stuff? Uh Uh-huh. In its powder form, absorbed into the pores of the skin, it could be fatal almost immediately. And listen to me. Yeah? Somehow, between the time the bones of that old king were discovered and the time that Donald Cronin touched them, somebody put that poison on them. How? Without endangering himself. By keeping it in aqueous solution until the bones were sprayed with it. Sprayed with it? Wait a minute. Yeah? Sprayed with it, huh? A doctor, an Englishman who was on the expedition, told me that the bones had been sprayed with some kind of preservative, even before the native carrier touched them. You thinking what I'm thinking? Yeah, right. Instead of preservative, it was the poison. Well, who sprayed them? I've got a wild idea, Len. But if it's right, it'll sew up this whole case. I wonder who that is. Well, while you're finding out, I'm going back and recheck these tests. But only as a matter of routine, because I'm sure I'm right. I beg your pardon, sir. Yeah, Haskins? Uh, Miss Dorothy Harkness is here, sir. Huh? And her young brother, Walter. Shall I ask them in, sir? By all means. It's a terrible thing that has happened. Is that really the way you feel about it, Dorothy? What? Yes, yes. What do you mean by that, Mr. Dollar? I'm Walter Harkness. Well, come right in, Walter. Because I have a sneaking suspicion you're the boy I've been looking for. What? Your conscience finally begin to hurt you? Would you like to sit down and write your confession now? What are you talking about? Or did you and Dorothy just come here to put on a front? You know, as a cover-up? I don't know what you're talking about. Johnny, what are you saying? Sit down, both of you, because I'm going to be saying plenty. Look here, Mr. Dollar. Sit down, I said. Now sit down. All right, Dorothy, we'll begin with you. Johnny, I don't understand. Now listen to me. From what you told me, and I've no other reason for believing it except that you told me, Donald Cronin was in love with you. It was true. At any rate, he made you part beneficiary of his $100,000 life insurance policy. Half of it, I believe. A cool $50,000. Johnny, how can you say you're even Oh, be quiet. Mr. Dollar, I'm coming to you right now, Walter. You're working for the museum where your father is curator of archaeology. The museum that has depended quite a lot not only on Donald Cronin's scientific contributions... But his monetary help as well. Well, that may be true, but now look here. The museum. The other beneficiary of Donald's insurance. Also $50,000. Mr. Dollar, if you're implying that I had anything to do with Donald's death... You can shut up, too, and let me talk. 
This is the first chance I've had to begin to tie this case up. The first time any of the crazy elements in it made sense. No, wait, tell me this. Eric Turnbull was opposed to Donald's interest in the museum, wasn't he? Well, yes. Sure. And I'll bet my bottom dollar that if something happened to both Donald and his uncle, the estate worth nearly a million was willed by Donald to the museum. That's true, Johnny, but there's no... No wonder Eric Turnbull was afraid for Donald's life. Because he knew who would ultimately benefit most by his death. No wonder he hated you, Dorothy. Johnny! Oh, Johnny, you can't mean you think that I would... No, 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 no. I think you were only being used as a tool, Dorothy. You told me yourself how your father opposed your marrying him. How his only interest was in getting money for the museum... Is that true, Walter? Yes, Mr. Dollar, that is true. But if you mean to imply that I or any of us was involved in Donald's death... Walter, the more I think about it, the more I'm sure you are directly involved. Now, sit down. It's a lie. I swear to it, Mr. Dollar. You're wrong. It's a lie. We'll see about that. Because there's one thing you may have overlooked. I know what killed Donald Crump. You... you do? Oh, yes, Walter. Just as well as you do. But I don't. I... I haven't the least... The, the curse of Kamashek? The curse Johnny? of Kamashek. Not by a long shot. Was it, Walter? I told you, I haven't the slightest... All right, then I... tell me this. Immediately the pile of bones was found in Kamashek's tomb before anyone touched them. I refuse to touch them. Be Will you listen to me? Before anybody touched them, somebody sprayed those bones with a so-called preservative. And I mean so-called. Well, I don't know why you should. Oh, well, that's common practice these days, in case you don't know it, but I fail to see... What, what was supposed to be a preservative was in reality a deadly poison. What? Oh, come on now, Walter. But you're wrong. You must be wrong. It's impossible. You know, you're very convincing, I must admit. Well, it's true. I applied that preservative, Mr. Dollar. Oh, you did? Yes. Aqueous solution, wasn't it? Of course. And I'll bet you washed your hands very carefully immediately afterward, didn't you? <laughs> yes, of course I did, because I was told to. By whom? By... Oh, no. No. Walter? What is it? Holy... Tell me, Walter. Walter! Yes? Do you know anything about a man who tried to intercept me on my way to Egypt? To make sure I didn't get there until the bones of the pharaoh were sent to Eric Turnbull and that Donald Cronin died? No. No, I don't, believe me. Then answer me this one. Did you make up the, we'll call it, preservative that you used over there? No. Then who did? And who told you to be sure to wash your hands immediately after using it? Well? Walter! Oh, no! I, I'm afraid so, Dorothy. Oh, no! Better tell me, Walter. I beg your pardon, Mr. Dollar, but Mr. Harkness Sr. is here, too. Mr. Dollar, I'm Adam Harkness, curator of archaeology at the museum. Well, well, Mr. Harkness, I'm really glad to see you. Dorothy, Walter, Mr. Dollar... I've come to pick up the bones from the grave of Kamashek that I understand Donald Cronin sent to his uncle instead of to me through some misunderstanding. Oh, yeah, sure. I had a notion you'd want to pick up those bones, Dr. Harkness. And I'll give them to you on one condition. Oh? What is that? That you take them out of the package in which they arrived here with your bare hands. That you carry them out of this house also in your bare hands. Well, that's a strange... Will you? Of course not. Why? Why, because such priceless relics are too fragile, too... Too full of a deadly poison that you had them sprayed with? Kuraba arsenium, I believe it's called. I don't know what you're... Walter, what have you been telling us? It's true, isn't it, Father? Well, Dr. Harkness... Daddy! I don't know how you found out, Dollar, but I'll tell you this... You won't ever live. Wait a minute, put that thing down. Father! Wait a minute! Daddy! Daddy! Johnny? <sighs> you stopped him, all right, Len. But I think he'll live. Good. I knew all the police work I've been doing would come in handy sometime. Thanks for barging in at the psychological moment. Well, I was only coming in to confirm the results of my tests. But I guess Dr. Harkness had already done it. Yeah. So, I guess the museum will profit mightily from half the insurance and all of the estate of Donald Cronin. The museum, that is, without Dr. Adam Harkness. Expense account total, including transportation back to Hartford, $985. Remarks? 
Well, doesn't mean a thing, I know, but uh, I kind of wonder what I might have found if I'd been assigned to investigate the deaths of the people who excavated some of those other old Egyptian tombs. Tombs that had a curse on them. <laughs> Interesting thought, isn't it? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a search for $80,000 that was never there. And a body that was never there. Yet both of them had to be found. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Heard in this week's cast were Paul Dubow, Alan Reed Sr., Dick Krenner, Virginia Gregg, Ben Wright, Forrest Lewis, Eric Snowden, Barney Phillips, James McCallion, and Les Tremaine. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. transcribed. The National Broadcasting Company presents Earl Stanley Gardner's A Life in Your Hand. Who knocked on the door? Was there a struggle? Where was the map? Listen while we place A Life in Your Hands. You never know when you step from the safety of your home when you may witness a violent death and be called upon to testify as to what you saw and heard. Murder is a dark enigma that strikes fear into the heart of man. Strange, baffling, mysterious. But the darkest crime one man can invent, another man can unravel. Such a man is Jonathan Kegg, created by Earl Stanley Gardner, the world's most popular writer of mysteries, creator of Perry Mason, Doug Selbin, and other outstanding characters. Anything else, Miss Rogers? Here's something, Mr. Kegg. A note from the alumni secretary at the university. He suggests you come visit a few days. Every time I go up there, I'm tapped for part of a new baseball diamond or a stained glass window in the chapel. You never seem to mind, Mr. Kegg. It's worth it to talk with some of my old professors again. At least you'd be away from murders and crime. Maybe so. I can't think of any reason why a killer would pick a town that small or a campus that quiet. But you never know. You never know when you may be called upon to testify to an act of violence in which you have become involved quite innocently. Even now, somewhere in that small town, perhaps at the college, there may be a crime in the making. Oh, will that phone ever stop ringing so we can get on with this? Dr. Allenby. No, no, I have no comment. I told you newspaper people before, I have nothing further to say about my discovery. No, no, I told you I have nothing to say. Goodbye. Hello. Hello. Is this the desk? 
Mrs. Crow, if anyone else calls, tell them I've left the faculty club. I can't be reached. Thank you. Now, back to my speech, Barlow. I was summarizing, I believe. Let's start the recording. You have just compared Kalara Temple with other important discoveries when I stopped the machine. These recordings on tape are certainly perfect. And my discovery of Kalara Temple will at last prove my theory. Namely, that the Mayan people came from the Orient, through what we now know as Alaska, down the Pacific coast into Mexico and Yucatan. Further, and equally important, our findings will disprove much of the error, invention, and deliberate fantasy created by that prolific author of Journey to the Hidden Valley and the Golden Serpent. I am sure you can all identify the master of misinformation to whom I refer. That was a very pointed barb at Mr. Weimer. That was my intention, Barlow. Weimer's a fraud. A disgrace to anthropology. Yes. Why doesn't the machine go on? The tape is still running. The pause is when you stopped for a glass of water. Hmm? Oh, yes, yes, so I did. Uh, I didn't lose their attention either. You can't blame them. As you said, the greatest discovery since King Tut's tomb was opened in 1922. Uh, by now, I am sure you are wondering about my future plans for excavation. I will lead an expedition to the interior of Yucatan as soon as possible. We will return with a golden treasure that will beggar the dreams of Spanish conquistadors. Thank you for your attention. Exceptional paper, Dr. Allenby. Yes, yes, Barlow. Well, nice of you to record it for me. I was glad to do it. Good of you to feel that way. Uh, now, what's wrong with the machine? When the tape runs out, it always sounds like this. <laughs> There's no excuse for that confounded noise. There we are. Yes. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you again. I have made a copy of your speech, Doctor. What would I do with it? I have no machine to play it on. I mean a transcript, a typewritten copy. Well, uh, tell someone else to bother me. And never mind the copy, Barlow. I'm coming. Wait a minute. Who is it? Dr. Allenby? Yes. Message for you. Hi, Doc. Rocky's the name. Rocky Martin. Like I told you on the phone. You said you had a message. It's from me, Doc. This faculty club is private. How did you get in here? Through the front door, tipped my hat, and slipped the bouncer a five. But the idea, I'll, I'll help relax, you. Relax, Doc. Take it easy. Something I can do, Dr. Allenby? Stay here, Barlow. I want you to hear every word of this conversation. Now, Martin, say what you have to say and get out. Okay, Doc. I see here in the paper you found yourself some antique that's loaded with pots and pans made out of gold. Come to the point. I know guys who would finance a trip to Yucatan if they could get their hands on a piece of solid gold treasure. Now, you know where the stuff is? I know who'll back the trip. This is preposterous. He's suggesting that you turn over the treasure of Kalara to hoodlums. Get out! We fence the stuff for you and give you a cut. Will you leave my room? We're not through talking. I believe I can end the conversation. Hand me the phone, Barlow. Give me that, oh, you oh, punk. Oh, oh. Ah, that's better. It says here in the paper you've got a map of the place, Doc. Well, maybe that'll do. I'll ask my business partners and I'll check back with you later. <laughs> Take it over. So long, uh, Dr. Allenby. Telephone the police. Tell them to arrest that man and... No, no, this is ridiculous. I'll simply tell the doorman I refuse to see him again. I... How did he know about my speech anyway? The newspaper. I mentioned... He did the... say that. Let me see the paper. I'll go on to my room now. Barlow, and... you stupid... You did this. My entire speech, word for word... You and that infernal recording machine. At no time did you mention that the report was confidential. I've been charitable with you, Barlow. I've overlooked your incompetence as my assistant. And your jealousy. Knowing full well you're a fool, a clumsy student, and a worse teacher. Now, by heaven, I'll... Weimar. If I were you, Barlow, I would thrash the brilliant Dr. Allenby. Get out of here, Weimar. 
I read your speech, Doctor. It was never supposed to be printed. So, these things you say behind my back... Stay away from me. You call my work errors, inventions, deliberate fantasy. You dare speak of me in this manner. You are a fraud for 25 years while you stayed on your campus, read your books, and showed off before your students. I lived in jungles, endured fever, fought with the natives, studied, and wrote. Now you tell me I'm a fraud. You who found the Temple of Kalara after you read my report telling approximately where the center of Mayan culture was located. That's a lie. Did you read Mr. Weimer's report, Dr. Allenby? Get out. Get out, both of you! I go. But I'll never forgive you. I'll repay you when the time is right. Good night, Dr. Allenby. I'm a liar. And a fool. Good evening, the desk. Gordon Weimer, please. Mr. Panford, do you have a Gordon Weimer registered? Uh, Weimer? Oh, oh, yes. Room 407, Miss Crow. I'm ringing, Mr. Weimer. Thank you. Dr. Allenby told Chief Norcott two men are bothering him. Allenby's an old fuss budget. I heard him talking to you, Mr. Panford. How did I know he wouldn't want to see any reporters? His speech was in the paper. Only the man wasn't a reporter. He said he was. I'm sorry, there's no answer in 407. Any message for Mr. Weimer? No. No, thank you. The man said... Dr. Allenby was expecting him. Five dollars and you were sure. <laughs> I certainly can't blame Dr. Allenby for... Good evening, the desk. Is that you, Mrs. Crow? Hello, Professor Barlow. I'm dictating a letter and I've come upon a word I can't spell. Maybe one of us will know. Uh, Professor Barlow can't spell a word. No. What is it? What's the word, Professor? You remember years ago, they opened a tomb in Egypt, a king's tomb in one of the pyramids. Uh, they called him King Tut. King Tut. T-U-T. That's all I remember. I'm sending this letter to another professor and quoting Dr. Allenby. I just can't say King Tut. The full name is Tutankhamen. Oh, dear. He has to have the full name. Uh, Tutankhamen. Tell him to call the library. Uh, Mr. Panford suggests you call the library. That's a very good idea. Uh, the number is uh, College 4920, isn't it? Would you get it for me, please? Uh, just a minute. I'm ringing the library. Library. Uh, go ahead, please. Would you mind checking the spelling on the name of... King Tut of Egypt. It's pronounced Tutankhamen. Oh, we're about ready to close. Almost ten o'clock. I would appreciate it. Uh, well, I'll have to go to the reference room. Take me a few minutes. I don't mind waiting. Suit yourself. Is she going to look it up for you? Uh, yes, I told her I'd hold the line. I hope that won't tie up your switchboard, Mrs. Crow. I'm not very busy. I could hold the call here. Ring you when she comes back. No, no, don't trouble. I'll just go on dictating my letters. All right, Professor. Let me see. Uh, Mr. Robert Kennett, Harbin and Line Publishers, 120 Park Avenue, New York. Uh, dear Bob, I hope by now you have looked over my latest draft on the manuscript and find it to your approval. Imagine that. Professor Barlow thought we could spell uh, Tutankhamen, uh, or whatever it is. One of the few around here that gives a help any credit. Most of them treat us like... Just a minute, just a minute, young man. Where do you think you're going? I told you once tonight, pal. I've got business with Dr. Allenby. He told me to keep you away from his room. That's so. Now you get out of this building before I call the police. Okay, okay. There's lots of ways to skin a cat. What does that mean? Skip it, Horatius. See you around. Did you see him? The same man. He tried to break in here again. That's nerve for you. Today, Dr. Allenby presented his paper to the Archaeology Society and caused a sensation. You know how the tyrant can spellbind a crowd. Well, this time he outdid... 
Good evening, the desk. Uh, this is Gordon Weimer, room 407. I'm checking out in a few minutes. I want my bill ready so I can pay when I leave. Thank you. Get 407's bill ready. He's checking out. Uh, to Mr. James Roche, 1423. How long should it take to look up a simple word in a reference book and... Uh... Good evening, the desk. Hello. Hello. This is the desk. Uh, hello, uh, Dr. Allenby? Oh, this switchboard. Uh, Pan, something's wrong with Dr. Allenby's line. Appreciating your cooperation, I remain truly yours, John Barlow. I can hear Mr. Barlow all right. But... Hello. Uh, uh, hello, uh, Mr. Barlow? Hello, this is the library. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I'm listening. Uh, the spelling on that word is T-U-T-A-N-K-H-A-M-E-N with an umlaut over the U. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. What's wrong with this switchboard? Uh, hello. Hello, Dr. Allenby. Dr. Allenby. Mr. Panford. Dr. Allenby doesn't answer his phone. It's off the hook, but I can't get him to answer. That newspaper fella. Maybe he got in the back way. Call the police, Miss Crow. I'm going upstairs. Hey, be careful. Be careful, Mr. Panford. Dr. Allenby was lying near the table, face down, arms outstretched with a dagger in his back. His telephone was lying on the floor beside him. When did the police arrive? A few moments later. Thank you, Mr. Panford. That'll be all. A coroner. Coroner Broman. Yes? Yes, what is it you want? Well, my what? name is Jonathan Kegg. I'm an alumnus of the university, and I have many friends here. I'd like to offer my services. In what capacity? I often serve as amicus curiae in cases of this mm. kind. Amicus... Oh, yes, yes, of course. I believe I recall your name, Jonathan Kegg. Uh, well, certainly, pull up a chair. Thank you. Oh, quiet. <laughs> quiet, everybody. Now, this gentleman is Mr. Kegg. He has a national reputation for serving as an amicus curiae, a friend of the court. He's kindly offered to help me in this inquest. Understand now, he represents no one. He simply uses expert knowledge and experience and his ability to cross-examine to get at the truth. Anything more, Mr. Craig? I believe that covers it. You go right ahead. A call, Rocky Martin. I'm not satisfied with some of his answers. Mr. Martin, will you return to the stand? Will you tell us again what you did after you were ordered to leave the faculty club? The first time or the second time? The second time. I drive to the nearest place that's open, buy a cup of coffee, and uh, try to figure out what to do next. Maybe I call my partners and tell them I'm getting the brush off. Maybe I forget the whole thing. Can you prove you were in a cafe at the time Dr. Allenby was killed? One of the girls on the counter might remember me. I gave her a little routine. She says, uh, get lost. We'll check on that. Now, will you tell us why you came to the campus to see Dr. Allenby? I stopped in town for a hamburger. I see in the paper about a professor who knows where to lay hands on buried treasure. <laughs> Being a small boy at heart, I figured it'd be good to pick up the dock and go digging. I call long distance a few other guys who say they'll bankroll the trip if the dock guarantees a payoff. What next is logical. I go see the dock. And he refuses to cooperate? He is insulting. He calls me a hoodlum. Me! So you threaten to return and take the map that shows where the treasure is located. I say maybe the map will do. Chief of Police Norcart has testified that Dr. Allenby telephoned and said you threatened to take the map. He asked for police protection. Maybe the doc was upset. Ask the little guy over there, Mr. Barlow. He heard what I told Allenby. Why did you try to see Dr. Allenby again? Give him a little time and people change their minds, you know. What was his answer? Like I say, I never popped the question. I never got upstairs. That will be all. Next, please, Professor John Barlow. 
Professor Barlow, Mr. Martin says you were present when he talked to Dr. Allenby. I was. What happened at that meeting? Mr. Martin entered the room as I was about to leave. He presented his proposition to Dr. Allenby, who flatly refused to be a party to it. Mr. Martin mentioned something about the map and said he intended to return. Was his manner threatening? He's a large man. He resented Dr. Allenby's refusal to cooperate. Was Dr. Allenby concerned? He said it was ridiculous. When did you leave Dr. Allenby's room? After Mr. Weimer came to see him. Mr. Weimer? Yes. A professor from another university. Did he threaten Dr. Allenby? He said he would never forgive Dr. Allenby and would repay him when the time was right. When did you leave Dr. Allenby? 9.30 or so. I was flustered. You see, I had displeased him by giving a copy of his speech to the newspapers. Did you argue? Dr. Allenby had a violent temper... But I have weathered his storms for over 25 years. You left his room and went to your own? Yes. I had some letters to dictate. You stayed in your room? Yes. You were on the same floor near Allenby's room? Yes, a few doors away. You heard no unusual sounds? No loud conversation? No. I really can't remember. Thank you. That will be all. Mr. Gordon Weimer, please. Mr. Weimer, you were in Dr. Allenby's room on the night he was murdered and you threatened him. That is correct. Why did you go there? I was called a master of misinformation. Then you had a case for libel? I had every motive for murder. Where were you when Allenby was murdered? In my room, packing. Was your room on the same floor as Dr. Allenby's? I refuse to answer. I would do anything in my power to keep his justified executioner from being captured. Quiet. Quiet, please. Coroner Broman, I would like to request a recess until tomorrow morning. At that time, I would like to cross-examine an innocent bystander to the Allenby murder. In compliance with Mr. Keg's request, this coroner's jury is now adjourned. And we'll meet again tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. Jonathan Kegg is about to call another witness. That witness could be you. If it were, could you remember what you heard? It would be vital that you do, for in this coroner's inquest, you would hold a life in your hands. In this national election year, there is one obligation of democratic American citizenship which leads all the rest. This all-important obligation is to go to the polls in November and vote. It sounds easy, and it is. First, make sure that you are a qualified voter in your community. Yes, you must register. Then choose the candidates for whom you're going to vote, and choose them wisely. Don't wait until Election Day is here. Begin now to weigh and to consider the qualifications of each candidate for each office. If you do this, you will know and know well the names and the qualifications of each candidate for whom you wish to vote. Yes, this one obligation of democratic American citizenship leads all the rest in this national election year. For we strengthen our free government and demonstrate its vigor to the world when we cast our ballots. Be sure you are registered now. And be sure you vote this November. Jonathan Kegg has called as his next witness a woman, Mrs. Lottie Crow, switchboard operator at the faculty club. The coroner's jury is in session, and Jonathan Kegg asks his first question. Do you recognize the three men seated directly in front of you? I do. Uh, There's Professor Barlow. And the next, uh, his name is Martin. Rocky Martin, I believe. And, And that's Mr. Weimer. And the night of the murder, Mr. Weimer asked for his bill and, and tried to leave. 
Uh, the police came. He, he resented being detained. When he heard what had happened, he started to cheer. I believe Mr. Weimer called you earlier in the evening. A few minutes before Dr. Allenby was murdered. He said he was leaving. I was surprised he was in his room because I had rung a little while before. There was no answer the first time? Uh, no, sir. This Mr. Martin, are you sure he left the building? He walked toward the door. That's all I saw. Coroner Broman, Dr. Allenby was murdered a few minutes before 10 o'clock. At that time, Mr. Weimer did not answer the telephone in the room where he said he was packing. Also, the police report the waitress at the cafe does not remember Mr. Martin. Now, Mrs. Crow, there were other calls. Will you tell us about them? Professor Barlow called. Yes? He couldn't spell a word. That king from Egypt, uh, King Tut. He needed the full name and the library checked it up for him. Professor Barlow called the library waited while someone found the spelling of Tutagaman. Uh, he asked us first. Uh, Mr. Panford suggested the library. So you looked up the number? Uh, no. Professor Barlow had it handy. What time was this? Uh, a little before ten. He was still waiting on the phone when Dr. Allenby's light flashed. This testimony definitely establishes the presence of Professor Barlow in his own room at the time of the murder. Now, I want you to remember each sound you heard on the switchboard. Say, one minute before the call from Dr. Allenby's room. Mr. Weimer called. A minute before Allenby's phone fell to the floor? Yes, sir. What was his room number? Uh, 407. Uh, go on. Professor Barlow was still dictating his letters. While he waited for the librarian? Yes. Then Dr. Allenby's light went on, and I answered, but I couldn't hear anything. I thought the switchboard was broken again. What did you do? I kept saying hello. Anything else? I opened the key. I could still hear Professor Barlow. Then the librarian told him how to spell the word, and the professor thanked her and hung up. Nothing else? No other sound? Uh, that switchboard makes funny sounds once in a while. I, I did hear a sound, like applause. People clapping. Like applause. People clapping. Since the time we talked last night, Mrs. Crow, I have had a chance to record on this tape machine a crowd applauding. Now, will you kindly listen and see if this is what you heard? No, no, that's not right. It, it, it was lighter. Further away. I, I don't exactly know how to tell it to you. I, what's that? Well, nothing to be alarmed about. The tape has run off this roll. The end is flapping against the machine. No, don't turn it off. That's it. That's what I heard. Thank you, Mrs. Crow. That will be all. Mr. Barlow, you have a tape machine? I dictate all my letters. As Mrs. Crow told you, I was doing my letters while I was waiting for the library. I'm glad you finally remember your call to the library, Professor Barlow. Yes, of course. Now that it was mentioned, I... Coroner Broman, the testimony of our innocent bystander Lottie Crow can be interpreted in only one way. Professor John Barlow killed his friend, Dr. Allen. A man of your standing should be careful about accusing people, Mr. Keg. Dr. Allenby and I were... were hated enemies, mostly because he never noticed you. I was his assistant. And had taken his abuse for 25 years. You saw two other men who might be blamed for his death. You did what you wanted to do for a long, long time. I was in my room. It was very simple. You needed three minutes to walk down the hall, pick up a dagger Dr. Allenby kept on his desk, and kill him and return. You knew Mrs. Crow and Mr. Panford would be flattered and remember that you asked for a spelling. You knew the library would take at least three minutes to find the answer. And Mr. Panford suggested the library. Professor Barlow had the phone number at his elbow. He would have had the idea himself if Mr. Panford were not resourceful. I see nothing to deny you have no proof. You knew every switchboard operator checks long calls to see if the parties are still talking. And so you were heard talking, dictating letters, tape recorded hours before. But I could hear him. You heard the tape recorder, Mrs. Crow, while Professor Barlow was down the hall murdering his friend. He didn't get back in time. There was an unexpected struggle. Dr. Allenby's telephone fell to the floor. Barlow hurried, but the tape had run out and was flapping against the machine. He picked up his telephone, talked to the librarian, and hung up. I... Deny it. How do you spell Tudank Amun? T-U-T-A-N-K-H-A-M. With an umlaut over the U. That is right, Professor. And you learned that spelling years ago. No archaeologist or anthropologist in the world would miss it. I... I hated him. He would claim my work. He said I was stupid. Not even a good teacher. 
Coroner Broman, I recommend that you instruct this jury to find that William Allenby died at the hands of his assistant in the anthropology department, Professor John Barlow. An anthropologist who couldn't spell King Tut's full name. Was that what got you on the track, Mr. Keg? Well, if you remember, that fact was not mentioned until Mrs. Crow took the witness stand. That's right. The tip-off was Professor Barlow. He said he was the murdered man's friend. He was anxious to help find the killer. No trace of hate. And yet he admitted he had weathered 25 years of Dr. Allenby's storms. If anyone is persecuted and held down long enough, hate builds and someday it flares up. I still think King Tut had something to do with it. Professor Barlow should have remembered the curses of death found in the tomb of Tutankhamun. He uh, might have asked the library how to spell a different word. Good night. A Life in Your Hands is created by Earl Stanley Gardner with script by Doug Johnson, directed by John Cowan. Jonathan Kegg is played by Carlton Cadell, with musical effects by Adele Scott, conducted by Whitey Bertwist. This has been a partially transcribed Bell production. And this is George Stone inviting each of you to be with us again next week, at a new time, on a new day. The time will be 9 p.m. Central Daylight Time, The day will be Wednesday. Listen, for then the National Broadcasting Company will again place a life in your hands. Next Thursday, Roy Rogers returns to NBC.